8. John Ross, Goo Whiskowy. From McKenney and Hall's copy of the original painting of about 1835. Under the provisions of the late treaty the Delawares in Kansas, to the number of 985. Removed to Indian Territory in 1867 and became incorporated as citizens of the Cherokee Nation. They were followed in 1870 by the Shawano, chiefly also from Kansas, to the number of 770. These immigrants settled chiefly along the Verdigris, in the northwestern part of the nation. Under the same treaty the Osage, Ka, Pawnee, Ponca, Oto and Missouri, and Tonkawa were afterwards settled on the western extension known then as the Cherokee Strip. The captive Nez Perses of Joseph's band were also temporarily located there, but have since been removed to the states of Washington and Idaho. In 1870 the Missouri, Kansas and Texas Railway, a branch of the Union Pacific System, was constructed through the lands of the Cherokee Nation under an agreement ratified by the government, it being the first railroad to enter that country. Several others have since been constructed or projected. The same year saw a Cherokee literary revival. The publication of The Advocate, which had been suspended since some years before the war, was resumed, and by authority of the nation John B. Jones began the preparation of a series of schoolbooks in the Cherokee language and alphabet for the benefit of those children who knew no English. In the spring of 1881 a delegation from the Cherokee Nation visited the East Cherokee still remaining in the mountains of North Carolina and extended to them a cordial and urgent invitation to remove and incorporate upon equal terms with the Cherokee Nation in the Indian Territory. In consequence several parties of East Cherokee, numbering in all 161 persons, removed during the year to the Western Nation, the expense being paid by the federal government. Others afterwards applied for assistance to remove, but as no further appropriation was made for the purpose nothing more was done. In 1883 the East Cherokee brought suit for a proportionate division of the Cherokee funds and other interests under previous treaties, but their claim was finally decided adversely three years later on appeal to the Supreme Court. In 1889 the Cherokee Female Seminary was completed at Tahlequah at a cost of over $60,000, supplementing the work of the male seminary, built some years before at a cost of $90,000. The Cherokee Nation was now appropriating annually over $80,000 for school purposes, including the support of the two seminaries, an orphan asylum, and over 100 primary schools, besides which there were a number of mission schools. For a number of years the pressure for the opening of Indian territory to white settlement had been growing in strength. Thousands of intruders had settled themselves upon the lands of each of the five civilized tribes, where they remained upon various pretexts in spite of urgent and repeated appeals to the government by the Indians for their removal. Under treaties with the five civilized tribes, the right to decide citizenship or residence claims belonged to the tribes concerned. But the intruders had at last become so numerous and strong that they had formed an organization among themselves to pass upon their own claims, and others that might be submitted to them. With attorneys and ample funds to defend each claim in outside courts against the decision of the tribe. At the same time the government policy was steadily toward the reduction or complete breaking up of Indian reservations and the allotment of lands to the Indians in severalty, with a view to their final citizenship and the opening of the surplus lands to white settlement. As a part of the same policy the jurisdiction of the United States courts was gradually being extended over the Indian country, taking cognizance of many things hitherto considered by the Indian courts under former treaties with the United States. Against all this the Cherokee and other civilized tribes protested, but without avail. To add to the irritation, Companies of armed boomers were organized for the express purpose of invading and seizing the Cherokee outlet and other unoccupied portions of the Indian Territory, reserved by treaty for future Indian settlement, in defiance of the civil and military power of the government. We come now to what seems the beginning of the end of Indian autonomy. In 1889 a commission, afterward known as the Cherokee Commission, was appointed, under Act of Congress, to negotiate with the Cherokee Indians. And with all other Indians owning or claiming lands lying west of the 96th degree of longitude in the Indian Territory, for the cession to the United States of all their title, claim. 
or interest of every kind or character in and to said lands. In August of that year the Commission made a proposition to Chief J. B. Mays for the cession of all the Cherokee lands thus described, being that portion known as the Cherokee Outlet or Strip. The proposition was declined on the ground that the Cherokee Constitution forbade its consideration. Other tribes were approached for a similar purpose, and the commission was continued, with changing personnel from year to year. Until agreements for session and the taking of allotments had been made with nearly all the wilder tribes in what is now Oklahoma. In the meantime the Attorney General had rendered a decision denying the right of Indian tribes to lease their lands without permission of the government. At this time the Cherokee were deriving an annual income of $150,000 from the lease of grazing privileges upon the Strip, but by a proclamation of President Harrison on February 17, 1890, ordering the cattlemen to vacate before the end of the year. This income was cut off and the Strip was rendered practically valueless to them. The Cherokee were now forced to come to terms, and a second proposition for the cession of the Cherokee Strip was finally accepted by the National Council on January 4, 1892. It was known to the Cherokees that for some time would-be settlers on the lands of the outlet had been encamped in the southern end of Kansas. And by every influence at their command had been urging the government to open the country to settlement and to negotiate with the Cherokees afterwards, and that a bill for that purpose had been introduced in Congress. The consideration was nearly $8,600,000, or about $1.25 per acre, for something over 6 million acres of land. One article of the agreement stipulates for the reaffirmation to the Cherokee Nation of the right of local self-government. The agreement having been ratified by Congress, the Cherokee Strip was opened by presidential proclamation on September 16, 1893. The movement for the abolition of the Indian governments and the allotment and opening of the Indian country had now gained such force that by act of Congress approved March 3, 1893. The president was authorized to appoint a commission of three, known later as the Dawes Commission, from its distinguished chairman, Senator Henry L. Dawes of Massachusetts, to negotiate with the five civilized tribes of Indian Territory, viz., the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, for the extinguishment of tribal titles to any lands within that territory. Now held by any and all of such nations and tribes, either by cession of the same or some part thereof to the United States or by the allotment and division of the same in severalty among the Indians of such nations or tribes respectively as may be entitled to the same, or by such other method as may be agreed upon. To enable the ultimate creation of a state or states of the Union, which shall embrace the land within the said Indian Territory. The commission appointed arrived in the Indian Territory in January, 1894, and at once began negotiations. At this time the non-citizen element in Indian territory was officially reported to number at least 200,000 souls, while those having rights as citizens of the five civilized tribes, including full-blood and mixed-blood Indians, adopted whites. And Negroes, numbered but 70,500. Not all of the non-citizens were intruders, many being there by permission of the Indian governments or on official or other legitimate business, but the great body of them were illegal squatters or unrecognized claimants to Indian rights. Against whose presence the Indians themselves had never ceased to protest. A test case brought this year in the Cherokee Nation was decided by the Interior Department against the claimants and in favor of the Cherokee. Commenting upon threats made in consequence by the rejected claimants, the agent for the five tribes remarks, it is not probable that Congress will establish a court to nullify and vacate a formal decision of the Interior Department. A year later he says of these intruders that, so long as they have a foothold, a residence, legal or not, in the Indian country they will be disturbers of peace and promoters of discord, and while they cry aloud, and spare not. For allotment and statehood, they are but stumbling blocks and obstacles to that mutual goodwill and fraternal feeling which must be cultivated and secured before allotment is practicable and statehood desirable. The removal of the intruders was still delayed, and in 1896 the decision of citizenship claims was taken from the Indian government and relegated to the Dawes Commission. In 1895 the commission was increased to five members, with enlarged powers. 
In the meantime a survey of Indian territory had been ordered and begun. In September the agent wrote, the Indians now know that a survey of their lands is being made, and whether with or without their consent, the survey is going on. The meaning of such survey is too plain to be disregarded, and it is justly considered as the initial step, solemn and authoritative, toward the overthrow of their present communal holdings. At this writing surveying corps are at work in the Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw nations, and therefore each one of these tribes has an ocular demonstration of the actual intent and ultimate purpose of the government of the United States. The general prosperity and advancement of the Cherokee Nation at this time may be judged from the report of the Secretary of the Cherokee National Board of Education to Agent Wisdom. He reports 4,800 children attending two seminaries, male and female, two high schools, and 100 primary schools, teachers being paid from $35 to $100 per month for nine months in the year. Fourteen primary schools were for the use of the Negro citizens of the nation, besides which they had a fine high school, kept up, like all the others, at the expense of the Cherokee government. Besides the national schools there were twelve mission schools helping to do splendid work for children of both citizens and non-citizens. Children of non-citizens were not allowed to attend the Cherokee national schools, but had their own subscription schools. The orphan asylum ranked as a high school, in which 150 orphans were boarded and educated, with graduates every year. It was a large brick building of three stories, 80 by 240 feet. The male seminary, accommodating 200 pupils, and the female seminary, accommodating 225 pupils, were also large brick structures, three stories in height and 150 by 240 feet on the ground. Three members, all Cherokee by blood, constituted a board of education. The secretary adds that the Cherokee are proud of their schools and educational institutions, and that no other country under the sun is so blessed with educational advantages at large. At this time the Cherokee nation numbered something over 25,000 Indian, white, and Negro citizens. The total citizen population of the three races in the five civilized tribes numbered about 70,000, while the non-citizens had increased to 250,000 and their number was being rapidly augmented. Realizing that the swift, inevitable end must be the destruction of their national governments, the Cherokee began once more to consider the question of removal from the United States. The scheme is outlined in a letter written by a brother of the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation under date of May 31, 1895, from which we quote. After prefacing that the government of the United States seems determined to break up the tribal autonomy of the five civilized tribes and to divide their lands, thus bringing about conditions under which the Cherokee could not exist. He continues. Then, for a remedy that will lead us out of it, away from it, and one that promises our preservation as a distinct race of people in the enjoyment of customs, social and political, that have been handed down to us from remote generations of the past. My plan is for the Cherokees to sell their entire landed possessions to the United States, divide the proceeds thereof per capita, then such as desire to do so unite in the formation of an Indian colony. And with their funds jointly purchase in Mexico or South America a body of land sufficient for all their purposes, to be forever their joint home. I believe also that for such Indians as did not desire to join the colony and leave the country provision should be made for them to repurchase their old homes or such other lands in the country here as they might desire. And they could remain here and meet such fate as awaits them. I believe this presents the most feasible and equitable solution of the questions that we must decide in the near future, and will prove absolutely just and fair to all classes and conditions of our citizens. I also believe that the same could be acted upon by any or all of the five civilized tribes. The final chapter is nearly written. By successive enactments within the last ten years the jurisdiction of the Indian courts has been steadily narrowed and the authority of the federal courts proportionately extended. The right to determine Indian citizenship has been taken from the Indians and vested in a government commission, the lands of the five tribes have been surveyed and sectionized by government surveyors. And by the sweeping provisions of the Curtis Act of June 28, 1898, for the protection of the people of the Indian Territory.
The entire control of tribal revenues is taken from the five Indian tribes invested with a resident supervising inspector, the tribal courts are abolished, allotments are made compulsory. An authority is given to incorporate white men's towns in the Indian tribes. By this act the five civilized tribes are reduced to the condition of ordinary reservation tribes under government agents with white communities planted in their midst. In the meantime the Dawes Commission, continued up to the present, has by unremitting effort broken down the opposition of the Choctaw and Chickasaw, who have consented to allotment, while the Creeks and the Seminole are now wavering. The Cherokee still hold out, the Ketua Secret Society, 47, especially being strong in its resistance, and when the end comes it is possible that the protest will take shape in a wholesale emigration to Mexico. Late in 1897 the agent for the five tribes reports that there seems a determined purpose on the part of many full-bloods to emigrate to either Mexico or South America and there purchase new homes for themselves and families. Such individual action may grow to the proportion of a colony, and it is understood that liberal grants of land can be secured from the countries mentioned. Mexican agents are now, 1901, among the Cherokee advocating the scheme, which may develop to include a large proportion of the five civilized tribes. By the census of 1898, the most recent taken, as reported by Agent Wisdom, the Cherokee Nation numbered 34,461 persons, as follows, Cherokee by blood, including all degrees of admixture, 26,500, intermarried whites, 2,300, Negro freedmen, 4,000. Delaware, 871, Shawnee, 790. The total acreage of the nation was 5,031,351 acres, which, if divided per capita under the provisions of the Curtis Bill, after deducting 60,000 acres reserved for town site and other purposes, would give to each Cherokee citizen 144 acres. It must be noted that the official roles include a large number of persons whose claims are disputed by the Cherokee authorities. The Eastern Band it remains to speak of the eastern band of Cherokee, the remnant which still clings to the woods and waters of the old home country. As has been said, a considerable number had eluded the troops in the general roundup of 1838 and had fled to the fastnesses of the high mountains. Here they were joined by others who had managed to break through the guard at Calhoun and other collecting stations, until the whole number of fugitives in hiding amounted to a thousand or more. Principally of the Mountain Cherokee of North Carolina, the purest blooded and most conservative of the nation. About one half the refugee warriors had put themselves under command of a noted leader named Utsala, Lycan, who made his headquarters amid the lofty peaks at the head of Oconalufti, from which secure hiding place. Although reduced to extremity of suffering from starvation and exposure, they defied every effort to effect their capture. The work of running down these fugitives proved to be so difficult an undertaking and so well-nigh barren of result that when Charlie and his sons made their bold stroke for freedom General Scott eagerly seized the incident as an opportunity for compromise. To this end he engaged the services of William H. Thomas, a trader who for more than twenty years had been closely identified with the Mountain Cherokee and possessed their full confidence and authorized him to submit to Utsala a proposition that if the latter would seize Charlie and the others who had been concerned in the attack upon the soldiers and surrender them for punishment. The pursuit would be called off and the fugitives allowed to stay unmolested until an effort could be made to secure permission from the general government for them to remain. Thomas accepted the commission, and taking with him one or two Indians made his way over secret paths to Utsala's hiding place. He presented Scott's proposition and represented to the chief that by aiding in bringing Charlie's party to punishment according to the rules of war he could secure respite for his sorely pressed followers. With the ultimate hope that they might be allowed to remain in their own country. Whereas if he rejected the offer the whole force of the 7,000 troops which had now completed the work of gathering up and deporting the rest of the tribe would be set loose upon his own small band until the last refugee had been either taken or killed. Utsala turned the proposition in his mind long and seriously. His heart was bitter, for his wife and little son had starved to death on the mountainside, but he thought of the thousands who were already on their long march into exile and then he looked round upon his little band of followers. 
if only they might stay, even though a few must be sacrificed, it was better than that all should die, for they had sworn never to leave their country. He consented and Thomas returned to report to General Scott. Now occurred a remarkable incident which shows the character of Thomas and the masterly influence which he already had over the Indians, although as yet he was hardly more than thirty years old. It was known that Charlie and his party were in hiding in a cave of the Great Smokies, at the head of Deep Creek, but it was not thought likely that he could be taken without bloodshed and a further delay which might prejudice the whole undertaking. Thomas determined to go to him and try to persuade him to come in and surrender. Declining Scott's offer of an escort, he went alone to the cave, and, getting between the Indians and their guns as they were sitting around the fire near the entrance, he walked up to Charlie and announced his message. The old man listened in silence and then said simply, I will come in. I don't want to be hunted down by my own people. They came in voluntarily and were shot, as has been already narrated, one only, a mere boy, being spared on account of his youth. This boy, now an old man, is still living, Wasatana, better known to the whites as Washington. A respite having thus been obtained for the fugitives, Thomas next went to Washington to endeavor to make some arrangement for their permanent settlement. Under the Treaty of New Dakota, in 1835, the Cherokee were entitled, besides the lump sum of $5 million for the land ceded to an additional compensation for the improvements which they were forced to abandon and for spoliations by white citizens, together with a per capita allowance to cover the cost of removal and subsistence for one year in the new country. The twelfth article had also provided that such Indians as chose to remain in the East and become citizens there might do so under certain conditions, each head of a family thus remaining to be confirmed in a preemption right to 160 acres. In consequence of the settled purpose of President Jackson to deport every Indian. This permission was cancelled and supplementary articles substituted by which some additional compensation was allowed in lieu of the promised preemptions and all individual reservations granted under previous treaties. Every Cherokee was thus made a landless alien in his original country. The last party of emigrant Cherokee had started for the West in December, 1838. Nine months afterwards the refugees still scattered about in the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee were reported to number 1046. By persistent effort at Washington from 1836 to 1842, including one continuous stay of three years at the capital city, Thomas finally obtained governmental permission for these to remain. And their share of the monies due for improvements and reservations confiscated was placed at his disposal, as their agent and trustee for the purpose of buying lands upon which they could be permanently settled. Under this authority he bought for them, at various times up to the year 1861, a number of contiguous tracts of land upon Oconolufti River and Soco Creek, within the present Swain and Jackson counties of North Carolina. Together with several detached tracts in the more western counties of the same state. The main body, upon the waters of Oconolufti, which was chiefly within the limits of the session of 1819, came afterward to be known as the Quala Boundary, or Quala Reservation. Taking the name from Thomas's principal trading store and agency headquarters. The detached western tracks were within the final session of 1835, but all alike were bought by Thomas from white owners. As North Carolina refused to recognize Indians as landowners within the state, and persisted in this refusal until 1866, Thomas, as their authorized agent under the government, held the deeds in his own name. Before it was legally possible under the state laws to transfer the title to the Indians, his own affairs had become involved and his health impaired by age and the hardships of military service so that his mind gave way. Thus leaving the whole question of the Indian title a subject of litigation until its adjudication by the United States in 1875, supplemented by further decisions in 1894. To Colonel William Holland Thomas the East Cherokee of today owe their existence as a people, and for half a century he was as intimately connected with their history as was John Ross with that of the main Cherokee nation. Singularly enough, their connection with Cherokee affairs extended over nearly the same period, but while Ross participated in their national matters Thomas gave his effort to a neglected band hardly known in the councils of the tribe. In his many-sided capacity he strikingly resembles another white man prominent in Cherokee history, 
General Sam Houston. Thomas was born in the year 1805 on Raccoon Creek, about two miles from Waynesville in North Carolina. His father, who was related to President Zachary Taylor, came of a Welsh family which had immigrated to Virginia at an early period, while on his mother's side he was descended from a Maryland family of revolutionary stock. He was an only and posthumous child, his father having been accidentally drowned a short time before the boy was born. Being unusually bright for his age, he was engaged when only twelve years old to tend an Indian trading store on Soco Creek, in the present Jackson County, owned by Felix Walker. Son of the congressman of the same name who made a national reputation by talking for Buncombe. The store was on the south side of the creek, about a mile above the now abandoned Macedonia Mission, within the present reservation, and was a branch of a larger establishment which Walker himself kept at Waynesville. The trade was chiefly in skins and ginseng, or sang, the latter for shipment to China, where it was said to be worth its weight in silver. This trade was very profitable, as the price to the Indians was but ten cents per pound in merchandise for the green route, whereas it now brings seventy-five cents in cash upon the reservation, the supply steadily diminishing with every year. The contract was for three years' service for a total compensation of one hundred dollars and expenses, but Walker devoted so much of his attention to law studies that the Waynesville store was finally closed for debt. And at the end of his contract term young Thomas was obliged to accept a lot of second-hand law books in lieu of other payment. How well he made use of them is evident from his subsequent service in the state senate and in other official capacities. Soon after entering upon his duties he attracted the notice of Yanaguska, or drowning bear, Yanagunski, bear drowning him. The acknowledged chief of all the Cherokee then living on the waters of Takasagi in Okanalufti, the old Katuwa country. On learning that the boy had neither father nor brother, the old chief formally adopted him as his son, and as such he was thenceforth recognized in the tribe under the name of Will Usti, or Little Will. He being of small stature even in mature age. From his Indian friends, particularly a boy of the same age who was his companion in the store, he learned the language as well as a white man has ever learned it. So that in his declining years it dwelt in memory more strongly than his mother tongue. After the invention of the Cherokee alphabet, he learned also to read and write the language. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL, 9 Call, W. H. Thomas, W. L. U. S. D. I. From photograph of 1858 kindly loaned by Captain James W. Terrell. In 1819 the lands on Tecassegui and its branches were sold by the Indians, and Thomas's mother soon after removed from Waynesville to a farm which she purchased on the west bank of Oconalufti, opposite the mouth of Soco. Where her son went to live with her, having now set up in business for himself at Kuala. Yanaguska and his immediate connection continued to reside on a small reservation in the same neighborhood, while the rest of the Cherokee retired to the west of the Nantahala Mountains, though still visiting and trading on Soco. After several shiftings Thomas finally, soon after the removal in 1838, bought a farm on the northern bank of Tecassegui, just above the present town of Whittier in Swain County, and built there a homestead which he called Stacoa. After an Indian town destroyed by Rutherford which had occupied the same site. At the time of the removal he was the proprietor of five trading stores in or adjoining the Cherokee country, viz., at Kuala Town, near the mouth of Soco Creek, on Scotts Creek, near Webster, on Chiawa, near the present Robbinsville. At the junction of Valley River and Hiwassi, now Murphy, and at the Cherokee Agency at Calhoun, now Charleston, Tennessee. Besides carrying on a successful trading business he was also studying law and taking an active interest in local politics. In his capacity as agent for the Eastern Cherokee he laid off the lands purchased for them into five districts or towns, which he named Bird Town, Paint Town, Wolf Town, Yellow Hill, and Big Cove, the names which they still retain. The first three being those of Cherokee clans. He also drew up for them a simple form of government, the execution of which was in his own and Yanaguska's hands until the death of the latter, after which the band knew no other chief than Thomas until his retirement from active life. 
In 1848 he was elected to the state senate and continued to serve in that capacity until the outbreak of the Civil War. As state senator he inaugurated a system of road improvements for Western North Carolina and was also the father of the Western North Carolina Railroad, now a part of the Southern system. Originally projected to develop the copper mines of Ducktown, Tennessee. With his colleagues in the state senate he voted for secession in 1861, and at once resigned to recruit troops for the Confederacy, to which, until the close of the war, he gave his whole time, thought, and effort. In 1862 he organized the Thomas Legion, consisting of two regiments of infantry, a battalion of cavalry, a company of engineers, and a field battery, he himself commanding as colonel, although then nearly sixty years of age. Four companies were made up principally of his own Cherokee. The Thomas Legion operated chiefly as a frontier guard for the Confederacy along the mountain region southward from Cumberland Gap. After the close of the conflict he returned to his home at Stokoa and again took charge, unofficially, of the affairs of the Cherokee, whom he attended during the smallpox epidemic of 1866 and assisted through the unsettled conditions of the Reconstruction period. His own resources had been swept away by the war, and all his hopes had gone down with the lost cause. This, added to the effects of three years of hardship and anxiety in the field when already almost past the age limit, soon after brought about a physical and mental collapse, from which he never afterward rallied except at intervals. When for a short time the old spirit would flash out in all its brightness. He died in 1893 at the advanced age of nearly ninety, retaining to the last the courteous manner of a gentleman by nature and training, with an exact memory and the clear-cut statement of a lawyer and man of affairs. To his work in the state senate the people of western North Carolina owe more than to that of any other man, while among the older Cherokee the name of Will Usty is still revered as that of a father and a great chief. Yanaguska, properly Yanugunski, the adopted father of Thomas, is the most prominent chief in the history of the East Cherokee, although, singularly enough, his name does not occur in connection with any of the early wars or treaties. This is due partly to the fact that he was a peace chief and counselor rather than a war leader. And in part to the fact that the isolated position of the mountain Cherokee kept them aloof in a great measure from the tribal councils of those living to the west and south. In person he was strikingly handsome, being six feet three inches in height and strongly built, with a faint tinge of red, due to a slight strain of white blood on his father's side, relieving the brown of his cheek. In power of oratory he is said to have surpassed any other chief of his day. When the Cherokee lands on Takasagi were sold by the Treaty of 1819, Yanaguska continued to reside on a reservation of 640 acres in a bend of the river a short distance above the present Bryson City, on the site of the ancient Ketuwa. He afterward moved over to Okanalufti, and finally, after the removal, gathered his people about him and settled with them on Soko Creek on lands purchased for them by Thomas. He was a prophet and reformer as well as a chief. When about sixty years of age he had a severe sickness, terminating in a trance, during which his people mourned him as dead. At the end of twenty-four hours, however, he awoke to consciousness and announced that he had been to the spirit world, where he had talked with friends who had gone before, and with God, who had sent him back with a message to the Indians. Promising to call him again at a later time. From that day until his death his words were listened to as those of one inspired. He had been somewhat addicted to liquor, but now, on the recommendation of Thomas, not only quit drinking himself, but organized his tribe into a temperance society. To accomplish this he called his people together in council, and, after clearly pointing out to them the serious effect of intemperance, in an eloquent speech that moved some of his audience to tears. He declared that God had permitted him to return to earth especially that he might thus warn his people and banish whiskey from among them. He then had Thomas write out a pledge, which was signed first by the chief and then by each one of the council, and from that time until after his death whiskey was unknown among the East Cherokee. Although frequent pressure was brought to bear to induce him and his people to remove to the west, he firmly resisted every persuasion. Declaring that the Indians were safer from aggression among their rocks and mountains than they could ever be in a land which the white man could find profitable, and that the Cherokee could be happy only in the country where nature had planted him. 
while counseling peace and friendship with the white man, he held always to his Indian faith and was extremely suspicious of missionaries. On one occasion, after the first Bible translation into the Cherokee language and alphabet, someone brought a copy of Matthew from New Dakota, but Yanaguska would not allow it to be read to his people until it had first been read to himself. After listening to one or two chapters the old chief dryly remarked, Well, it seems to be a good book, strange that the white people are not better, after having had it so long. He died, aged about eighty, in April, 1839, within a year after the removal. Shortly before the end he had himself carried into the townhouse on Soko, of which he had supervised the building, where, extended on a couch, he made a last talk to his people. Commending Thomas to them as their chief and again warning them earnestly against ever leaving their own country. Then wrapping his blanket around him, he quietly lay back and died. He was buried beside Soko, about a mile below the old Macedonia mission, with a rude mound of stones to mark the spot. He left two wives and considerable property, including an old Negro slave named Kujo, who was devotedly attached to him. One of his daughters, Kataosta, still survives, and is the last conservator of the potter's art among the East Cherokee. Yanaguska had succeeded in authority to Yangua, Big Bear, who appears to have been of considerable local prominence in his time, but whose name, even with the oldest of the band, is now but a memory. He was among the signers of the treaties of 1798 and 1805. And by the Treaty of 1819 was confirmed in a reservation of 640 acres as one of those living within the ceded territory who were believed to be persons of industry and capable of managing their property with discretion. And who had made considerable improvements on the tracks reserved. This reservation, still known as the Big Bear Farm, was on the western bank of Okanalufti, a few miles above its mouth, and appears to have been the same afterward occupied by Yanaguska. Another of the old notables among the East Cherokee was Tsunulahanski, corrupted by the whites to Junaluska, a great warrior, from whom the ridge west of Waynesville takes its name. In early life he was known as Gulklaski. On the outbreak of the Creek War in 1813 he raised a party of warriors to go down, as he boasted, to exterminate the Creeks. Not meeting with complete success, he announced the result, according to the Cherokee custom, at the next dance after his return in a single word, Detsinu Lahungu, I tried, but could not, given out as a cue to the song leader. Who at once took it as the burden of his song. Thenceforth the disappointed warrior was known as Tsunu Lahanski, one who tries, but fails. He distinguished himself at the horseshoe bend, where the action of the Cherokee decided the battle in favor of Jackson's army, and was often heard to say after the removal, if I had known that Jackson would drive us from our homes. I would have killed him that day at the horseshoe. He accompanied the exiles of 1838, but afterward returned to his old home. He was allowed to remain, and in recognition of his services the state legislature, by special act, in 1847 conferred upon him the right of citizenship and granted to him a tract of land in fee simple, but without power of alienation. This reservation was in the Chiawa Indian Settlement, near the present Robbinsville, in Graham County, where he died about the year 1858. His grave is still to be seen just outside of Robbinsville. As illustrative of his shrewdness it is told that he once tracked a little Indian girl to Charleston, South Carolina, where she had been carried by kidnappers and sold as a slave, and regained her freedom by proving, from expert microscopic examination, that her hair had none of the Negro characteristics. Christianity was introduced among the Ketuwa Cherokee shortly before the removal through Worcester and Bodineau's translation of Matthew, first published at New Dakota in 1829. In the absence of missionaries the book was read by the Indians from house to house. After the removal a Methodist minister, Reverend Ulrich Keener, began to make visits for preaching at irregular intervals, and was followed several years later by Baptist workers. In the fall of 1839 the Commissioner of Indian Affairs reported that the East Cherokee had recently expressed a desire to join their brethren in the West, but had been deterred from so doing by the unsettled condition of affairs in the territory. He states that, they have a right to remain or to go, but that as the interests of others are involved in their decision they should decide without delay. 
1840 about 100 Catawba, nearly all that were left of the tribe, being dissatisfied with their condition in South Carolina, moved up in a body and took up their residence with the Cherokee. Latent tribal jealousies broke out, however, and at their own request negotiations were begun in 1848, through Thomas and others, for their removal to Indian Territory. The effort being without result, they soon after began to drift back to their own homes, until, in 1852, there were only about a dozen remaining among the Cherokee. In 1890 only one was left, an old woman, the widow of a Cherokee husband. She and her daughter, both of whom spoke the language, were expert potters according to the Catawba method, which differs markedly from that of the Cherokee. There are now two Catawba women, both married to Cherokee husbands, living with the tribe, and practicing their native potter's art. While residing among the Cherokee, the Catawba acquired a reputation as doctors and leaders of the dance. On August 6, 1846, a treaty was concluded at Washington with the representatives of the Cherokee Nation West by which the rights of the East Cherokee to a participation in the benefits of the new Ekota Treaty of 1835 were distinctly recognized. And provision was made for a final adjustment of all unpaid and pending claims due under that treaty. The right claimed by the East Cherokee to participate in the benefits of the new Ekota Treaty, although not denied by the government, had been held to be conditional upon their removal to the West. In the spring of 1848 the author, Landman, visited the East Cherokee and has left an interesting account of their condition at the time, together with a description of their ball plays, dances, and customs generally. Having been the guest of Colonel Thomas, of whom he speaks as the guide, counselor, and friend of the Indians, as well as their business agent and chief, so that the connection was like that existing between a father and his children. He puts the number of Indians at about 800 Cherokee and 100 Catawba on the Kuala Town Reservation, the name being in use thus early, with 200 more Indians residing in the more westerly portion of the state. Of their general condition he says, About three-fourths of the entire population can read in their own language, and, though the majority of them understand English, a very few can speak the language. They practice, to a considerable extent, the science of agriculture, and have acquired such a knowledge of the mechanic arts as answers them for all ordinary purposes, for they manufacture their own clothing, their own plows, and other farming utensils, their own axes, and even their own guns. Their women are no longer treated as slaves, but as equals, the men labor in the fields and their wives are devoted entirely to household employments. They keep the same domestic animals that are kept by their white neighbors, and cultivate all the common grains of the country. They are probably as temperate as any other class of people on the face of the earth, honest in their business intercourse, moral in their thoughts, words, and deeds, and distinguished for their faithfulness in performing the duties of religion. They are chiefly Methodists and Baptists, and have regularly ordained ministers, who preach to them on every Sabbath, and they have also abandoned many of their mere senseless superstitions. They have their own court and try their criminals by a regular jury. Their judges and lawyers are chosen from among themselves. They keep in order the public roads leading through their settlement. By a law of the state they have a right to vote, but seldom exercise that right, as they do not like the idea of being identified with any of the political parties. Excepting on festive days, they dress after the manner of the white man, but far more picturesquely. They live in small log houses of their own construction, and have everything they need or desire in the way of food. They are, in fact, the happiest community that I have yet met with in this southern country. Among the other notables Landman speaks thus of Sala Lee, Squirrel, a born mechanic of the band, who died only a few years since. He is quite a young man and has a remarkably thoughtful face. He is the blacksmith of his nation, and with some assistance supplies the whole of Kuala town with all their axes and plows. But what is more, he has manufactured a number of very superior rifles and pistols, including stock, barrel, and lock, and he is also the builder of grist mills, which grind all the corn which his people eat. A specimen of his workmanship in the way of a rifle may be seen at the patent office in Washington, where it was deposited by Mr. Thomas, and I believe Salola is the first Indian who ever manufactured an entire gun. 
But when it is remembered that he never received a particle of education in any of the mechanic arts but is entirely self-taught, his attainments must be considered truly remarkable. On July 29, 1848, Congress approved an act for taking a census of all those Cherokee who had remained in North Carolina after the removal, and who still resided east of the Mississippi. In order that their share of the removal and subsistence fund under the new ECOTA treaty might be set aside for them. A sum equivalent to $53. 33 was at the same time appropriated for each one, or his representative, to be available for defraying the expenses of his removal to the Cherokee Nation West and subsistence there for one year whenever he should elect so to remove. Any surplus over such expense was to be paid to him in cash after his arrival in the West. The whole amount thus expended was to be reimbursed to the government from the general fund to the credit of the Cherokee Nation under the terms of the Treaty of New Dakota. In the meantime it was ordered that to each individual thus entitled should be paid the accrued interest on this per capita sum from the date of the ratification of the New Dakota Treaty, May 23, 1836. Payment of interest at the same rate to continue annually thereafter. In accordance with this act a census of the Cherokee then residing in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, was completed in the fall of 1848 by J. C. Mulley, making the whole number 2,133. On the basis of this enrollment several payments were made to them by special agents within the next ten years. One being a per capita payment by Alfred Chapman in 1851-52 of unpaid claims arising under the Treaty of New Dakota and amounting in the aggregate to $197,534. 50. The others being payments of the annual interest upon the Removal and Subsistence Fund set apart to their credit in 1848. In the accomplishment of these payments two other enrollments were made by D. W. Siler in 1851 and by Chapman in 1852, the last being simply a corrected revision of the Siler role, and neither varying greatly from the Mullay role. Upon the appointment of Chapman to make the per capita payment above mentioned, the Cherokee Nation West had filed a protest against the payment, upon the double ground that the East Cherokee had forfeited their right to participation. And furthermore that their census was believed to be enormously exaggerated. As a matter of fact the number first reported by Mullay was only 1,517, to which so many were subsequently added as to increase the number by more than 600. A census taken by their agent, Colonel Thomas, in 1841, gave the number of East Cherokee, possibly only those in North Carolina intended, as 1,220, while a year later the whole number residing in North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama and Georgia was officially estimated at from 1,000 to 1,200. It is not the only time a per capita payment has resulted in a sudden increase of the census population. In 1852, Captain James W. Terrell was engaged by Thomas, then in the state senate, to take charge of his store at Kuala, and remained associated with him and in close contact with the Indians from then until after the close of the war, assisting. As special United States agent, in the disbursement of the interest payments, and afterward as a Confederate officer in the organization of the Indian companies, holding a commission as captain of Company A. 69th North Carolina Confederate Infantry. Being of an investigating bent, Captain Terrell was led to give attention to the customs and mythology of the Cherokee, and to accumulate a fund of information on the subject seldom possessed by a white man. He still resides at Webster a few miles from the reservation, and is now 71 years of age. In 1855 Congress directed the per capita payment to the East Cherokee of the removal fund established for them in 1848, provided that North Carolina should first give assurance that they would be allowed to remain permanently in that state. This assurance, however, was not given until 1866, and the money was therefore not distributed, but remained in the Treasury until 1875, when it was made applicable to the purchase of lands and the quieting of titles for the benefit of the Indians. From 1855 until after the Civil War we find no official notice of the East Cherokee, and our information must be obtained from other sources. It was, however, a most momentous period in their history. At the outbreak of the war Thomas was serving his seventh consecutive term in the State Senate. 
Being an ardent Confederate sympathizer, he was elected a delegate to the convention which passed the secession ordinance, and immediately after voting in favor of that measure resigned from the Senate in order to work for the Southern cause. As he was already well advanced in years it is doubtful if his effort would have gone beyond the raising of funds and other supplies but for the fact that at this juncture an effort was made by the Confederate General Kirby Smith to enlist the East. Cherokee for Active Service The agent sent for this purpose was Washington Morgan, known to the Indians as a gangsta ta, son of that Colonel Gideon Morgan who had commanded the Cherokee at the Horseshoe Bend. By virtue of his Indian blood and historic ancestry he was deemed the most fitting emissary for the purpose. Early in 1862 he arrived among the Cherokee, and by appealing to old-time memories so aroused the war spirit among them that a large number declared themselves ready to follow wherever he led. Conceiving the question at issue in the war to be one that did not concern the Indians, Thomas had discouraged their participation in it and advised them to remain at home in quiet neutrality. Now, however, knowing Morgan's reputation for reckless daring, he became alarmed at the possible result to them of such leadership. Forced either to see them go from his own protection or to lead them himself, he chose the latter alternative and proposed to them to enlist in the Confederate Legion which he was about to organize. His object, as he himself has stated, was to keep them out of danger so far as possible by utilizing them as scouts and home guards through the mountains, away from the path of the large armies. Nothing of this was said to the Indians, who might not have been satisfied with such an arrangement. Morgan went back alone and the Cherokee enrolled under the command of their white chief. The Thomas Legion, recruited in 1862 by William H. Thomas for the Confederate service and commanded by him as colonel, consisted originally of one infantry regiment of ten companies, 69th North Carolina Infantry, one infantry battalion of six companies. One cavalry battalion of eight companies, 1st North Carolina Cavalry Battalion, one field battery, light battery, of 103 officers and men, and one company of engineers. In all about 2,800 men. The infantry battalion was recruited toward the close of the war to a full regiment of ten companies. Companies A and B of the 69th Regiment and two other companies of the Infantry Regiment recruited later were composed almost entirely of East Cherokee Indians, most of the commissioned officers being white men. The whole number of Cherokee thus enlisted was nearly 400, or about every able-bodied man in the tribe. In accordance with Thomas's plan the Indians were employed chiefly as scouts and home guards in the mountain region along the Tennessee-Carolina border, where, according to the testimony of Colonel Stringfield, they did good work and service for the South. The most important engagement in which they were concerned occurred at Baptist Gap, Tennessee, September 15, 1862, where Lieutenant Asta Gata G.A., a splendid specimen of Indian manhood, was killed in a charge. The Indians were furious at his death, and before they could be restrained they scalped one or two of the Federal dead. For this action ample apologies were afterward given by their superior officers. The war, in fact, brought out all the latent Indian in their nature. Before starting to the front every man consulted an oracle stone to learn whether or not he might hope to return in safety. The start was celebrated with a grand old-time war dance at the townhouse on Soko, and the same dance was repeated at frequent intervals thereafter, the Indians being painted and feathered in good old style. Thomas himself frequently assisting as master of ceremonies. The ball play, too, was not forgotten, and on one occasion a detachment of Cherokee, left to guard a bridge, became so engrossed in the excitement of the game as to narrowly escape capture by a sudden dash of the Federals. Owing to Thomas's care for their welfare, they suffered but slightly in actual battle, although a number died of hardship and disease. When the Confederates evacuated eastern Tennessee, in the winter of 1863-64, some of the white troops of the Legion, with one or two of the Cherokee companies, were shifted to western Virginia. And by assignment to other regiments a few of the Cherokee were present at the final siege and surrender of Richmond. The main body of the Indians, with the rest of the Thomas Legion, crossed over into North Carolina and did service protecting the western border until the close of the war, when they surrendered on parole at Waynesville, North Carolina, in May. 1865, 
all those of the command being allowed to keep their guns. It is claimed by their officers that they were the last of the Confederate forces to surrender. About 50 of the Cherokee veterans still survive, nearly half of whom, under conduct of Colonel Stringfield, attended the Confederate reunion at Louisville, Kentucky, in 1900, where they attracted much attention. In 1863, by resolution of February 12, the Confederate House of Representatives called for information as to the number and condition of the East Cherokee, and their pending relations with the federal government at the beginning of the war. With a view to continuing these relations under Confederate auspices. In response to this inquiry a report was submitted by the Confederate Commissioner of Indian Affairs, S. S. Scott, based on information furnished by Colonel Thomas and Captain James W. Carroll, their former dispersing agent, showing that interest upon the Removal and Subsistence Fund, established in 1848 had been paid annually up to and including the year 1859, at the rate of $3.20 per capita, or an aggregate, exclusive of Dispersing Agents Commission, of $4,838.40 annually, based upon the original Mullay enumeration of 1517 Upon receipt of this report it was enacted by the Confederate Congress that the sum of $19,352.36 be paid the East Cherokee to cover the interest period of four years from May 23, 1860, to May 23, 1864. In this connection the Confederate Commissioner suggested that the payment be made in provisions, of which the Indians were then greatly in need, and which, if the payment were made in cash, they would be unable to purchase. On account of the general scarcity. He adds that, according to his information, almost every Cherokee capable of bearing arms was then in the Confederate service. The role furnished by Captain Terrell is the original Mullay role corrected to May, 1860, no reference being made to the later Mullay enumeration, 2133, already alluded to. There is no record to show that the payment thus authorized was made, and as the Confederate government was then in hard straits it is probable that nothing further was done in the matter. In submitting his statement of previous payments, Colonel Thomas, their former agent, adds. As the North Carolina Cherokees have, like their brethren West, taken up arms against the Lincoln government. It is not probable that any further advances of interest will be made by that government to any portion of the Cherokee tribe. I also enclose a copy of the Act of July 29, 1848, so far as relates to the North Carolina Cherokees, and a printed explanation of their rights, prepared by me in 1851, and submitted to the Attorney General, and his opinion thereon which may not be altogether uninteresting to those who feel an interest in knowing something of the history of the Cherokee tribe of Indians, whose destiny is so closely identified with that of the Southern Confederacy. In a skirmish near Bryson City, then Charleston, Swain County, North Carolina, about a year after enlistment, a small party of Cherokee, perhaps a dozen in number, was captured by a detachment of Union troops and carried to Knoxville, where, Having become dissatisfied with their experience in the Confederate service, they were easily persuaded to go over to the Union side. Through the influence of their principal man, Daigane Ski, several others were induced to desert to the Union Army, making about thirty in all. As a part of the 3rd North Carolina Mounted Volunteer Infantry, they served with the Union forces in the same region until the close of the war. When they returned to their homes to find their tribesmen so bitterly incensed against them that for some time their lives were in danger. Eight of these are still alive in 1900. One of these Union Cherokee had brought back with him the smallpox from an infected camp near Knoxville. Shortly after his return he became sick and soon died. As the characteristic pustules had not appeared, the disease seeming to work inwardly. The nature of his sickness was not at first suspected smallpox having been an unknown disease among the Cherokee for nearly a century, and his funeral was largely attended. A week later a number of those who had been present became sick, and the disease was recognized by Colonel Thomas as smallpox in all its virulence. It spread throughout the tribe, this being in the early spring of 1866, and in spite of all the efforts of Thomas, who brought a doctor from Tennessee to wait upon them, more than 100 of the small community died in consequence. 
The fatal result was largely due to the ignorance of the Indians, who, finding their own remedies of no avail, used the heroic aboriginal treatment of the plunge bath in the river and the cold water douche, which resulted in death in almost every case. Thus did the war bring its harvest of death, misery, and civil feud to the East Cherokee. Shortly after this event Colonel Thomas was compelled by physical and mental infirmity to retire from further active participation in the affairs of the East Cherokee, after more than half a century spent in intimate connection with them. During the greater portion of which time he had been their most trusted friend and adviser. Their affairs at once became the prey of confusion and factional strife, which continued until the United States stepped in as arbiter. In 1868 Congress ordered another census of the East Cherokee, to serve as a guide in future payments, the role to include only those persons whose names had appeared upon the Mullay Roll of 1848 and their legal heirs and representatives. The work was completed in the following year by S. H. Sweatland, and a payment of interest then due under former enactment was made by him on this basis. In accordance with their earnestly expressed desire to be brought under the immediate charge of the government as its wards. The Congress which ordered this last census directed that the Commissioner of Indian Affairs should assume the same charge over the East Cherokee as over other tribes. But as no extra funds were made available for the purpose the matter was held in abeyance. An unratified treaty made this year with the Cherokee Nation West contained a stipulation that any Cherokee east of the Mississippi who should remove to the Cherokee Nation within three years should be entitled to full citizenship and privileges therein. But after that date could be admitted only by act of the Cherokee National Council. After the retirement of Thomas, in the absence of any active governmental supervision, need was felt of some central authority. On December 9, 1868, a general council of the East Cherokee assembled at Chiawa, in Graham County, North Carolina, took preliminary steps toward the adoption of a regular form of tribal government under a constitution. N. J. Smith, afterward principal chief, was clerk of the council. The new government was formally inaugurated on December 1, 1870. It provided for a first and a second chief to serve for a term of two years, minor officers to serve one year, and an annual council representing each Cherokee settlement within the state of North Carolina. Ka Lahu, All Bones, commonly known to the whites as Flying Squirrel or Sanook, Sawana G.I., was elected chief. A new constitution was adopted five years later, by which the chief's term of office was fixed at four years. The status of the lands held by the Indians had now become a matter of serious concern, as has been stated, the deeds had been made out by Thomas in his own name, as the state laws at that time forbade Indian ownership of real estate. In consequence of his losses during the war and his subsequent disability, the Thomas properties, of which the Cherokee lands were technically a part, had become involved, so that the entire estate had passed into the hands of creditors. The most important of whom, William Johnston, had obtained sheriff's deeds in 1869 for all of these Indian lands under three several judgments against Thomas, aggregating $33,887. 11. To adjust the matter so as to secure title and possession to the Indians, Congress in 1870 authorized suit to be brought in their name for the recovery of their interest. This suit was begun in May, 1873, in the United States Circuit Court for Western North Carolina. A year later the matters in dispute were submitted by agreement to a board of arbitrators, whose award was confirmed by the court in November, 1874. The award finds that Thomas had purchased with Indian funds a tract estimated to contain 50,000 acres on Oconolufti River and Soco Creek, and known as the Kuala Boundary, together with a number of individual tracts outside the boundary. That the Indians were still indebted to Thomas toward the purchase of the Kuala boundary lands for the sum of $18,250, from which should be deducted $6,500 paid by them to Johnston to release titles, with interest to date of award. Making an aggregate of $8,486, together with a further sum of $2,478, which had been entrusted to Terrell, the business clerk and assistant of Thomas, and by him turned over to Thomas, as creditor of the Indians, under power of attorney. This latter sum, with interest to date of award, aggregating $2,697.
89, thus leaving a balance due from the Indians to Thomas or his legal creditor, Johnston, of $7,066.11. The award declares that on account of the questionable manner in which the disputed lands had been bought in by Johnston, he should be allowed to hold them only as security for the balance due him until paid. And that on the payment of the said balance of $7,066. 11. With interest at 6% from the date of the award, the Indians should be entitled to a clear conveyance from him of the legal title to all the lands embraced within the Kuala boundary. To enable the Indians to clear off this lien on their lands and for other purposes. Congress in 1875 directed that as much as remained of the removal and subsistence fund set apart for their benefit in 1848 should be used in perfecting the titles to the lands awarded to them, and to pay the costs, expenses, and liabilities attending their recent litigations, also to purchase and extinguish the titles of any white persons to lands within the general boundaries allotted to them by the court, and for the education, improvement, and civilization of their people. In accordance with this authority the unpaid balance and interest due Johnston, amounting to $7,242.76, was paid him in the same year, and shortly afterward there was purchased on behalf of the Indians some 15,000 acres additional, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs being constituted trustee for the Indians. For the better protection of the Indians the lands were made inalienable except by assent of the Council and upon approval of the President of the United States. The deeds for the Kuala boundary and the 15,000-acre purchase were executed respectively on October 9, 1876, and August 14, 1880. As the boundaries of the different purchases were but vaguely defined, a new survey of the whole Kuala boundary and adjoining tracts was authorized. The work was entrusted to M. S. Temple, Deputy United States Surveyor, who completed it in 1876, his survey maps of the reservation being accepted as the official standard. The titles and boundaries having been adjusted, the Indian Office assumed regular supervision of East Cherokee affairs, and in June, 1875, the first agent since the retirement of Thomas was sent out in the person of W. C. McCarthy. He found the Indians, according to his report, destitute and discouraged, almost without stock or farming tools. There were no schools, and very few full-bloods could speak English, although to their credit nearly all could read and write their own language, the parents teaching the children. Under his authority a distribution was made of stock animals, seed wheat, and farming tools, and several schools were started. In the next year, however, the agency was discontinued and the educational interests of the band turned over to the state school superintendent. In the meantime Ka Lahu had been succeeded as chief by Lloyd R. Welch, the Sajia G.I., an educated mixed blood of Chiawa, who served about five years, dying shortly after his re-election to a second term, 48. He made a good record by his work in reconciling the various factions which had sprung up after the withdrawal of the guiding influence of Thomas, and in defeating the intrigues of fraudulent white claimants and mischief-makers. Shortly before his death the government, through special agent John e. Sibold, recognized his authority as principal chief, together with the constitution which had been adopted by the band under his auspices in 1875. N. J. Smith T. S. A. Lodihai, who had previously served as clerk of the council, was elected to his unexpired term and continued to serve until the fall of 1890. We find no further official notice of the East Cherokee until 1881, when Commissioner Price reported that they were still without agent or superintendent. And that so far as the Indian office was concerned their affairs were in an anomalous and unsatisfactory condition, while factional feuds were adding to the difficulties and retarding the progress of the band. In the spring of that year a visiting delegation from the Cherokee Nation West had extended to them an urgent invitation to remove to Indian Territory and the Indian Office had encouraged the project. With the result that 161 persons of the band removed during the year to Indian Territory, the expense being borne by the government. Others were represented as being desirous to remove, and the commissioner recommended an appropriation for the purpose, but as Congress failed to act the matter was dropped. The neglected condition of the East Cherokee having been brought to the attention of those old-time friends of the Indian, 
the Quakers, through an appeal made in their behalf by members of that society residing in North Carolina. The Western Yearly Meeting, of Indiana, volunteered to undertake the work of civilization and education. On May 31, 1881, representatives of the Friends entered into a contract with the Indians, subject to approval by the government, to establish and continue among them for ten years an industrial school and other common schools. To be supported in part from the annual interest of the trust fund held by the government to the credit of the East Cherokee and in part by funds furnished by the Friends themselves. Through the efforts of Barnabas C. Hobbs, of the Western Yearly Meeting, a yearly contract to the same effect was entered into with the Commissioner of Indian Affairs later in the same year, and was renewed by successive commissioners to cover the period of ten years ending June 30. 1892, when the contract system was terminated and the government assumed direct control. Under the joint arrangement, with some aid at the outset from the North Carolina meeting, work was begun in 1881 by Thomas Brown with several teachers sent out by the Indiana Friends, who established a small training school at the agency headquarters at Cherokee, and several day schools in the outlying settlements. He was succeeded three years later by H. W. Spray, an experienced educator, who, with a corps of efficient assistants and greatly enlarged facilities, continued to do good work for the elevation of the Indians until the close of the contract system eight years later. After an interregnum, during which the schools suffered from frequent changes, he was reappointed as government agent and superintendent in 1898, a position which he still holds in 1901. To the work conducted under his auspices the East Cherokee owe much of what they have today of civilization and enlightenment. From some travelers who visited the reservation about this time we have a pleasant account of a trip along Soko and a day with Chief Smith at Yellow Hill. They described the Indians as being so nearly like the whites in their manner of living that a stranger could rarely distinguish an Indian's cabin or little cove farm from that of a white man. Their principal crop was corn, which they ground for themselves, and they had also an abundance of apples, peaches, and plums, and a few small herds of ponies and cattle. Their wants were so few that they had but little use for money. Their primitive costume had long been obsolete, and their dress was like that of the whites, excepting that moccasins took the place of shoes, and they manufactured their own clothing by the aid of spinning wheels and looms. Finely cut pipes and well-made baskets were also produced, and the good influence of the schools recently established was already manifest in the children. In 1882 the agency was re-established and provision was made for taking a new census of all Cherokee east of the Mississippi, Joseph G. Hester being appointed to the work. The census was submitted as complete in June, 1884, and contained the names of 1,881 persons in North Carolina, 758 in Georgia, 213 in Tennessee, 71 in Alabama, and 33 scattering a total of 2,956. Although this census received the approval and certificate of the East Cherokee Council, a large portion of the band still refused to recognize it as authoritative, claiming that a large number of persons therein enrolled have no Cherokee blood. The East Cherokee had never ceased to contend for a participation in the rights and privileges accruing to the Western nation under treaties with the government. In 1882 a special agent had been appointed to investigate their claims, and in the following year, under authority of Congress. The Eastern Band of Cherokee brought suit in the Court of Claims against the United States and the Cherokee Nation West to determine its rights in the Permanent Annuity Fund and other trust funds held by the United States for the Cherokee Indians. The case was decided adversely to the Eastern Band, first by the Court of Claims in 1885, and finally, on appeal, by the Supreme Court on March 1, 1886. That court holding in its decision that the Cherokee in North Carolina had dissolved their connection with the Cherokee Nation and ceased to be a part of it when they refused to accompany the main body at the removal. And that if Indians in North Carolina or in any state east of the Mississippi wished to enjoy the benefits of the common property of the Cherokee Nation in any form whatever they must be readmitted to citizenship in the Cherokee Nation and comply with its constitution and laws. In accordance with this decision the agent in the Indian Territory was instructed to issue no more residence permits to claimants for Cherokee citizenship. 
and it was officially announced that all persons thereafter entering that country without consent of the Cherokee authorities would be treated as intruders. This decision, cutting off the East Cherokee from all hope of sharing in any of the treaty benefits enjoyed by their Western kinsmen, was a sore disappointment to them all, especially to Chief Smith, who had worked unceasingly in their behalf from the institution of the proceedings. In view of the result, Commissioner Atkins strongly recommended, as the best method of settling them in permanent homes, secure from white intrusion and from anxiety on account of their uncertain tenure and legal status in North Carolina. That negotiations be opened through government channels for their readmission to citizenship in the Cherokee Nation, to be followed, if successful, by the sale of their lands in North Carolina and their removal to Indian Territory. In order to acquire a more definite legal status, the Cherokee residing in North Carolina, being practically all those of the Eastern Band having genuine Indian interests, became a corporate body under the laws of the state in 1889. The Act, ratified on March 11, declares in its first section that the North Carolina or Eastern Cherokee Indians, resident or domiciled in the counties of Jackson, Swain, Graham, and Cherokee, be and at the same time are hereby created and constituted a body politic and corporate under the name, style, and title of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, with all the rights, franchises, privileges and powers incident and belonging to corporations under the laws of the state of North Carolina. On August 2, 1893, ex-Chief Smith died at Cherokee, in the 57th year of his life, more than 20 of which had been given to the service of his people. Nimrod Jarrett Smith, known to the Cherokee as T.S.A. Lodihai, was the son of a half-breed father by an Indian mother, and was born near the present Murphy, Cherokee County, North Carolina, on January 3, 1837. His earliest recollections were thus of the miseries that attended the flight of the refugees to the mountains during the removal period. His mother spoke very little English, but his father was a man of considerable intelligence having acted as interpreter and translator for Rev. Evan Jones at the Old Valley Town Mission. As the boy grew to manhood he acquired a fair education, which, aided by a commanding presence, made him a person of influence among his fellows. At twenty-five years of age he enlisted in the Thomas Legion as 1st Sergeant of Company B, 69th North Carolina, Confederate, Infantry, and served in that capacity till the close of the war. He was clerk of the council that drafted the first East Cherokee Constitution in 1868, and on the death of Principal Chief Lloyd Welch in 1880 was elected to fill the unexpired term. Continuing in office by successive re-elections until the close of 1891, a period of about twelve years, the longest term yet filled by an incumbent. As Principal Chief he signed the contract under which the school work was inaugurated in 1881. For several years thereafter his duties, particularly in connection with the suit against the Western Cherokee, required his presence much of the time at Washington. While at home his time was almost as constantly occupied in attending to the wants of a dependent people. Although he was entitled under the constitution of the band to a salary of $500 per year, no part of this salary was ever paid, because of the limited resources of his people, and only partial reimbursement was made to him. Shortly before his death, for expenses incurred in official visits to Washington. With frequent opportunities to enrich himself at the expense of his people, he maintained his honor and died a poor man. In person Chief Smith was a splendid specimen of physical manhood, being six feet four inches in height and built in proportion, erect in figure, with flowing black hair curling down over his shoulders, a deep musical voice and a kindly spirit and natural dignity that never failed to impress the stranger. His widow, a white woman, and several children survive him. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report P.L. X. Photograph, 1886 Chief N. J. Smith, Saladihai in 1894 the long-standing litigation between the East Cherokee and a number of creditors and claimants to Indian lands within and adjoining the Kuala boundary was finally settled by a compromise by which the several white tenants and claimants within the boundary agreed to execute a quit claim and vacate on payment to them by the Indians of sums aggregating $24.552, 
while for another disputed adjoining tract of 33,000 acres the United States agreed to pay, for the Indians, at the rate of $1.25 per acre. The necessary government approval having been obtained, Congress appropriated a sufficient amount for carrying into effect the agreement, thus at last completing a perfect and unencumbered title to all the lands claimed by the Indians. With the exception of a few outlying tracts of comparative unimportance. In 1895 the Cherokee residing in North Carolina upon the reservation and in the outlying settlements were officially reported to number 1,479. A year later an epidemic of grip spread through the band, with the result that the census of 1,897 shows but 1,312, among those who died at this time being Bigwitch, Skilly Gua, the oldest man of the band, who distinctly remembered the Creek War, and Wadi Yahi, the last old woman who preserved the art of making double-walled baskets. In the next year the population had recovered to 1,351. The description of the mode of living then common to most of the Indians will apply nearly as well today. While they are industrious, these people are not progressive farmers and have learned nothing of modern methods. The same crops are raised continuously until the soil will yield no more or is washed away, when new ground is cleared or broken. The value of rotation and fertilizing has not yet been discovered or taught. That these people can live at all upon the products of their small farms is due to the extreme simplicity of their food, dress, and manner of living. The typical house is of logs, is about 14 by 16 feet, of one room, just high enough for the occupants to stand erect, with perhaps a small loft for the storage of extras. The roof is of split shingles or shakes. There is no window, the open door furnishing what light is required. At one end of the house is the fireplace, with outside chimney of stones or sticks chinked with clay. The furniture is simple and cheap. An iron pot, a bake kettle, a coffee pot and mill, small table, and a few cups, knives, and spoons are all that is needed. These, with one or two bedsteads, homemade, a few pillows and quilts, with feather mattresses for winter covering, as well as for the usual purpose, constitute the principal house possessions. For outdoor work there is an axe, hoe, and shovel plow. A wagon or cart may be owned, but is not essential. The outfit is inexpensive and answers every purpose. The usual food is bean bread, with coffee. In the fall chestnut bread is also used. Beef is seldom eaten, but pork is highly esteemed, and a considerable number of hogs are kept, running wild and untended in summer. By the most recent official count, in 1900, the East Cherokee residing in North Carolina under direct charge of the agent and included within the Act of Incorporation No. 1376, of whom about 1,100 are on the reservation. The rest living farther to the west, on Nantahala, Chiawa, and Hiwassee rivers. This does not include mixed bloods in adjoining states and some hundreds of unrecognized claimants. Those enumerated own approximately 100,000 acres of land, of which 83,000 are included within the Kuala Reservation and a contiguous tract in Jackson and Swain counties. They receive no rations or annuities and are entirely self-supporting, the annual interest on their trust fund established in 1848, which has dwindled to about $23,000, being applied to the payment of taxes upon their unoccupied common lands. From time to time they have made leases of timber, gold washing, and grazing privileges, but without any great profit to themselves. By special appropriation the government supports an industrial training school at Cherokee, the agency headquarters, in which 170 pupils are now being boarded, clothed, and educated in the practical duties of life. This school, which in its workings is a model of its kind, owes much of its usefulness and high standing to the efficient management of Professor H. W. Spray, Wilsini, already mentioned, who combines the duties of superintendent and agent for the band. His chief clerk, Mr. James Blythe, Disqua N., Chestnut Bread, a Cherokee by blood, at one time filled the position of agent, being perhaps the only Indian who has ever served in such capacity. The exact legal status of the East Cherokee is still a matter of dispute, they being at once wards of the government, 
citizens of the United States, and, in North Carolina, a corporate body under state laws. They pay real estate taxes and road service, exercise the voting privilege, and are amenable to the local courts, but do not pay poll tax or receive any pauper assistance from the counties. Neither can they make free contracts or alienate their lands. 49. Under their tribal constitution they are governed by a principal and an assistant chief, elected for a term of four years, with an executive council appointed by the chief. And sixteen councillors elected by the various settlements for a term of two years. The annual council is held in October at Cherokee, on the reservation, the proceedings being in the Cherokee language and recorded by their clerk in the Cherokee alphabet, as well as in English. The present chief is Jesse Reed, say Siska TSI, Scotch Jesse, an intelligent mixed blood, who fills the office with dignity and ability. As a people they are peaceable and law-abiding, kind and hospitable, providing for their simple wants by their own industry without asking or expecting outside assistance. Their fields, orchards, and fish traps, with some few domestic animals and occasional hunting, supply them with food, while by the sale of ginseng and other medicinal plants gathered in the mountains, with fruit and honey of their own raising. They procure what additional supplies they need from the traders. The majority are fairly comfortable, far above the condition of most Indian tribes, and but little, if any, behind their white neighbors. In literary ability they may even be said to surpass them, as in addition to the result of nearly twenty years of school work among the younger people, nearly all the men and some of the women can read and write their own language. All wear civilized costumes, though an occasional pair of moccasins is seen, while the women find means to gratify the racial love of color in the wearing of red bandana kerchiefs in place of bonnets. The older people still cling to their ancient rites and sacred traditions, but the dance and the ball play wither and the Indian day is nearly spent. See the notes to the historical sketch. Barton, Ben Jess. New Views on the Origin of the Tribes and Nations of America, P. XLV, Passim, Philadelphia, 1797. Gallatin, Albert, Synopsis of Indian Tribes, Trans-American Antiquarian Society, 2, page 91, Cambridge, 1836, Hewitt, J. N. B. The Cherokee and Iroquoian Language, Washington, 1887, M.S. in the Archives of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Heckwelder, John, Indian Nations of Pennsylvania, pages 47-49, edition 1876. Brinton, D. G., Wallam Olam, page 231, Philadelphia, 1885. Schoolcraft, H. R., Notes on the Iroquois, page 162, Albany, 1847. Heckwelder, Indian Nations, page 47, edition 1876. Haywood, John, Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee, Pages 225 to 226, Nashville, 1823. Jefferson, Thomas, Notes on Virginia, pages 136 to 137, ed. Boston, 1802. Schoolcraft, Notes on the Iroquois, page 163, 1847. Haywood, Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee, pages 233, 236. 269, 1823. Haywood, Nat and Aberig. History Tennessee, pages 226, 234, 1823. Bartram, William, Travels, page 365. Reprint, London, 1792. Haywood, Opsit, pages 234 to 237. Barton, New Views, page 44. 1797. Haywood, Nat and Aberig. History Tennessee, pages 166, 234 to 235, 287 to 289, 1823. See Story, The Great Leech of Clanusi E, page 328. Garcileso de la Vega, La Florida del Inca, pages 129, 133 to 134. Madrid, 1723. Gentlemen of Elvis, Publications of the Hacklet Society, 9, pages 52, 
58, 64, London, 1851. Ibid, page 60. Garcilaso, La Florida del Inca, page 136, edition 1723. Rangel, in Oviedo, Historia General y Natural de las Indias, I, page 562, Madrid, 1851. Garcilaso, La Florida del Inca, page 137, 1723. See note 8, De Soto's Root. Rangel, Op Sit, I, page 562. Elvis, Hacklet Society, 9, page 61, 1851. Garcilaso, Op CIT. Page 139. Rangel, in Oviedo, Historia, I, page 563, 1861. Elvis, Biedma, and Rangel all make special reference to the dogs given them at this place. They seem to have been of the same small breed, Perillos, which Rangel says the Indians used for food. Garcilaso, La Florida del Inca, page 139, 1723. See Note 8, De Soto's Root. See Elvis, Hacklet Society, 9, page 61, 1851, and Rangel, Op CIT. Page 563. See Note 8, De Soto's Root. Elvis, Op Sit, page 64. Elvis, Hacklet Society, 9, page 66, 1851. Garcilaso, La Florida del Inca, page 141, edition 1723. Shea, J. G., in Windsor, Justin, Narrative and Critical History of America, 2, pages 260, 278. Boston, 1886. Narrative of Pardo's Expedition by Martinez, about 1568, Brooks Manuscripts. Vandera Narrative, 1569, in French, B. F., History Calls. Of Law, New Series, pages 289-292, New York, 1875. Shea, J. G., Catholic Missions, page 72. New York, 1855. See Brooks Manuscripts, in the Archives of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Burke, John, History of Virginia, 2, pages 104-107, Petersburg, 1805. Ramsey, J. G. M., Annals of Tennessee, page 37. Charleston, 1853, quoting Martin, North Carolina, I, page 115, 1853. Letterer, John, Discoveries, pages 15, 26, 27, 29, 33, and Map, Reprint, Charleston, 1891, Mooney, Sioux and Tribes of the East, Bulletin of Bureau of Ethnology, pages 53, 54, 1894. Mooney, Opsit, pages 34 to 35. Document of 1699, quoted in South Carolina History Soci Calls, page 209. Charleston, 1857. Haywood, Nat and Aberig. History Tennessee, page 233, 1823. Noted in Cherokee Advocate, Tahlequah, Indian Territory, January 30, 1845. Document of 1691, South Carolina History Soci Calls, I, page 126. Hewitt, South Carolina and Georgia, I, Page 127, 1778. Documents of 1705, in North Carolina Colonial Records, 2, page 904, Raleigh, 1886. Haywood, Nat and Aberig. Tennessee, page 237, 1823. With the usual idea that Indians live to extreme old age, Haywood makes her 110 years old at her death putting back the introduction of firearms to 1677. Letter of 1708, in Rivers, South Carolina, page 238, 1856. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th N. Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 140, 1888, Hewitt, Op Sit, page 216 E.T. Passim. Hewitt, South Carolina and Georgia, by, page 216 E.T. Passim. 1778. 
see Journal of Colonel George Chicken, 1715-16, with notes, in Charleston Yearbook, pages 313-354, 1894. Journal of South Carolina Assembly, in North Carolina Colonial Records, 2, pages 225 to 227, 1886. For notice, see the Hewitt, South Carolina and Georgia, I, pages 297 to 298, 1778, Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, p. 144 and Map, 1888. Royce, Op. Sit, page 142. Document of 1724, Inferno, Berthold, Ohio Valley in Colonial Days, pages 273 to 275, Albany, 1890. Report of Board of Trade, 1721, in North Carolina Colonial Records, 2, page 422, 1886. Adair, James, American Indians, page 227, London, 1775. Board of Trade Report, 1721, North Carolina Colonial Records, 2, page 422, 1886. Pickett, H. A., History of Alabama, pages 234, 280, 288, reprint, Sheffield, 1896. For notice, see the Hewitt, South Carolina and Georgia, 2, pages 3-11, 1779, Treaty Documents of 1730, North Carolina Colonial Records, 3, pages 128-133, 1886, Jenkinson, Collection of Treaties, 2, pages 315-318, Drake, S.G., Early History of Georgia, Cummings Embassy. Boston, 1872, Letter of Governor Johnson, December 27, 1730, Noted in South Carolina History S.O.C. Calls, I., Page 246, 1867. Documents of 1731 and 1732, North Carolina Colonial Records, 3, pages 153, 202, 345, 369, 393, 1886. Adair, American Indians, pages 232 to 234, 1775. Meadows, State of the Province of Georgia, page 7, 1742, in Force Tracts, I, 1836. Jones, C.C., History of Georgia, I, pages 327, 328, Boston, 1883. Adair, American Indians, pages 240 to 243, 1775, Stevens, W. B. History of Georgia, I, Pages 104 to 107, Philadelphia, 1847. Anonymous writer in Carroll, History Calls. Of South Carolina, 2, pages 97 to 98, 517, 1836. Buckle, Journal, 1757, in Rivers, South Carolina, page 57, 1856. Barcia, A.G. Enseo Cronológico para la Historia General de la Florida, pages 335, 336. Madrid, 1723. For more in regard to these intertribal wars see the historical traditions. Walker, Thomas, Journal of an Exploration, etc., pages 8, 35-37, Boston, 1888. Monet, Valley of the Mississippi. I, page 317, New York, 1848, erroneously makes the second date 1758. Letter of Governor Dobbs, 1755, in North Carolina Colonial Records, v, pages 320, 321, 1887. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 50-52, 50 1853. Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Representative Burr of Ethnology, page 145, 1888. Timberlake, Henry, Memoirs, pages 73, 74, London, 1765. Ramsey, Tennessee, page 51, 1853, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 
in fifth and kept. Burr of Ethnology, page 145, 1888. For notice see Ada Gul K.L., in the Ramsey, Op. Sit, page 50. Letters of Major Andrew Lewis and Governor Dinwiddie, 1756, in North Carolina Colonial Records v. pages 585, 612 to 614, 635, 637, 1887, Ramsey, Op. CIT, pages 51, 52. Letter of Governor Dobbs, 1756, in North Carolina Colonial Records, v. page 604, 1887. Dinwiddie Letter, 1757, Ibid, page 765. Adair, American Indians, 245 to 246, 1775, North Carolina Colonial Records, v. page 48, 1887. Hewitt, quoted in Ramsey, Tennessee, page 54, 1853. For notices see the Timberlake, Memoirs, page 65, 1765. Catawba Reference from Milligan, 1763, in Carroll, South Carolina Historical Collections, 2, page 519, 1836. Figures from Adair, American Indians, page 227, 1775. When not otherwise noted this sketch of the Cherokee War of 1760-61 is compiled chiefly from the contemporary dispatches in the Gentleman's Magazine, supplemented from Hewitt's historical account of South Carolina and Georgia, 1778. With additional details from Adair, American Indians, Ramsey, Tennessee, Royce, Cherokee Nation, North Carolina Colonial Records, v. Documents and Introduction, etc. Timberlake, Memoirs, page 9 E.T. Passim, 1765. Stevens, Georgia, 2, pages 26-29, 1859. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 65-70, 1853. Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Representative Burr of Ethnology, pages 146-149, 1888. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 149, Ramsey, Tennessee, page 71, 1853. Ramsey, Op. Sit, pages 93 to 122, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 146 to 149. Ramsey, Op. Sit, pp. 109 to 122, Royce, Op. Sit, page 146, E. Passim. Bartram, Travels, Pages 366 to 372, 1792. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 143 to 150, 1853, Monette, Valley of the Mississippi, I, pages 400, 401, 431, 432, and 2, pages 33, 34, 1846. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 276 to 281, and 2, pages 1 to 6, 1889. Ramsey, Op. Sit, page 143. Quoted from Stedman, in Ramsey, Op. Sit, page 162. Ramsey, Op. Sit, page 162. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 150 to 159, 1853. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pp. 293 to 297, 1889. See number 110, Incidents of Personal Heroism. For Rutherford's Expedition, see more, Rutherford's Expedition, in North Carolina University Magazine, February, 1888, Swain, Sketch of the Indian War in 1776, Ibid. May, 1852, Reprinted in Historical Magazine, November, 1867, Ramsey, Tennessee, page 164, 1853, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 294 to 302, 1889, etc. For Williamson's Expedition, see Ross Journal, with Rockwell's Notes, in Historical Magazine, October, 1876. Swain, Sketch of the Indian War in 1776, in North Carolina University Magazine for May, 
1852, reprinted in Historical Magazine, November, 1867, Jones, Georgia, 2, page 246 E.D. Passim, 1883, Ramsey, Tennessee, 163-164, 1853. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 296-303, 1889. Jones, Op. Sit, page 246, Ramsey, Op. Sit, page 163, Roosevelt, Op. Sit, page 295. For the Virginia-Tennessee Expedition, see Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 303-305, 1889. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 165-170, 1853. Ross Journal, in Historical Magazine, October, 1867. Swain, Sketch of the Indian War of 1776, in Historical Magazine, November, 1867. Moore's Narrative, in North Carolina University Magazine, February, 1888. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 285, 290, 303, 1889. About 500 sought refuge with Stewart, the British Indian superintendent in Florida, where they were fed for some time at the expense of the British government, Jones, Georgia, 2, page 246, 1883. Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, page 150 and Map, 1888, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 172-174, 1853, Stevens, Georgia, 2, page 144, 1859, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, page 306, 1889. Ramsey, Opposite, pages 171 to 177, 185 to 186, 610 E.T. Passim, Royce, Opposite, page 150. Campbell Letter, 1782, and other documents in Virginia State Papers, 3, pages 271, 571, 599, 1883, and 4, pages 118, 286, 1884, Blunt Letter, January 14, 1793, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 431, 1832. Campbell says they abandoned their first location on account of the invasion from Tennessee. Governor Blunt says they left on account of witches. Hawkins, Manuscript Journal, 1796, with Georgia Historical Society. Ramsey, Tennessee, pp. 174-178, 1853. Campbell Letter, 1782, Virginia State Papers, 3, page 271, 1883. Ramsey, Op. CIT, pages 186-188, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, pages 236 to 238, 1889. Ramsey's statements, chiefly on Haywood's authority, of the strength of the expedition, the number of warriors killed, etc., are so evidently overdrawn that they are here omitted. Heckwelder, Indian Nations, page 827, reprint of 1876. Donaldson's Journal, etc., in Ramsey, Tennessee, Pages 197 to 208, 1853, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, pages 324 to 340, 1889. Ibid, 2, page 337. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, pages 241 to 294, 1889, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 208 to 249, 1853. Roosevelt, Op. Sit, page 256. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, pages 298-300, 1889, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 261-264, 1853. There is great discrepancy in the various accounts of this fight, from the attempts of interested historians to magnify the size of the victory. One writer gives the Indians 1,000 warriors. Here, as elsewhere, Roosevelt is a more reliable guide, his statements being usually from official documents. Roosevelt, Op. Sit, 
pages 300 to 304, Ramsey, Opsit, pages 265 to 268, Campbell, Report, January 15, 1781, in Virginia State Papers, I, page 436. Haywood and others after him make the expedition go as far as Chickamauga and Coosa River, but Campbell's report expressly denies this. Ramsey, Op Sit, page 266. Roosevelt, Op CIT, page 302. Campbell, Letter, March 28, 1781, in Virginia State Papers, I, page 602, 1875, Martin, Letter, March 31, 1781, Ibid, page 613, Ramsey, Tennessee, page 268, 1853, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, pages 305 to 307, 1889. Campbell, Letter, March 28, 1781, in Virginia State Papers, I, page 602, 1875. Ramsey, Op Sit, page 269. Ibid, Roosevelt, Op Sit, page 307. Ibid, Ramsey, Op Sit, pages 267, 268. The latter authority seems to make it 1782, which is evidently a mistake. Stevens, Georgia, 2, pages 282 to 285, 1859, Jones, Georgia, 2, page 503, 1883. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, page 811, 1889. Old Tassel's Talk, in Ramsey, Tennessee, p. 271, 1853, and in Roosevelt, Op Sit, page 315. Ramsey, Op Sit, page 272, Roosevelt, Op Sit, page 317 E.T. Passim. Stevens, Op Sit, pages 411 to 415. Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 151, 1888. See Documents in Virginia State Papers, 3, pages 234, 398, 527, 1883. Ramsey, Tennessee, page 280, 1853. Ibid, page 276. See Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op Sit, pages 151, 152, Ramsey, Op Sit, page 299 E.T. Passim. Indian Treaties, page 8 E.T. Passim, 1837. For a full discussion of the Hopewell Treaty, from official documents, see Royce, Cherokee Nation, in 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 152 to 158, 1888, with map, treaty journal, etc., American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 38 to 44, 1832. Also Stevens, Georgia, 2, pages 417 to 429, 1859, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 336, 337, 1853, see also the map accompanying this work. Ramsey, Opsit, pages 459 to 461, Agent Martin and Hopewell Commissioners, Ibid, pages 318 to 336. Bledsoe and Robertson Letter, Ibid, page 465, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, page 368, 1899. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, page 353, 1889. Ibid, page 355, 1889, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 452 to 454, 1853. Ibid, Pages 358 to 366, 1889. Ibid, p. 341, 1853. Martin Letter of May 11, 1786, Ibid, page 342. Reports of Tennessee Commissioners and Replies by Cherokee Chiefs, etc., 1786, in Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 343 to 346, 1853. Martin. Letter of March 25, 1787, Ibid, page 359. Ibid, page 370. Ramsey, Tennessee, 
pages 393 to 399, 1853. Ibid, pages 417 to 423, 1853. Ibid, pages 517 to 519, and Brown's Narrative, Ibid, page 515. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 515, 519. Brown's Narrative, etc., Ibid, pages 508 to 516. Ibid, pages 459, 489. Bledsoe and Robertson Letter of June 12, 1787, in Ramsey, Tennessee, page 465, 1853. Ibid, with Robertson Letter, pages 465 to 476. Ibid, pages 479 to 486. Monette, Valley of the Mississippi, I, page 505, 1846. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 522, 541, 561, 1853. Washington to the Senate, August 11, 1790, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 83, 1832. Secretary Knox to President Washington, July 7, 1789, Ibid, page 53. Ramsey, Opsit, pages 550, 551. Indian Treaties, pages 34 to 38, 1837. Secretary of War, Report, January 5, 1798, in American State Papers, I, pages 628 to 631, 1832, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 554 to 560, 1853, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and, Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 158 to 170, with full discussion and map, 1888. Indian Treaties, pages 37, 38, 1837. Ramsey, Tennessee, page 557, 1853. Abel Deposition, April 16, 1792, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 274, 1832. Henry Knox, Secretary of War, Instructions to Leonard Shaw, Temporary Agent to the Cherokee Nation of Indians, February 17, 1792, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 247, 1832. Also Knox, Letters to Governor Blunt, January 31 and February 16, 1792, Ibid, pages 245, 246. Estenala Conference Report, June 26, 1792, Ibid, page 271, Dirac, Deposition, September 15, 1792, Ibid, page 292. Pickens, Letter, September 12, 1792, Ibid, page 317. See Letters of Shaw, Casey, Pickens, and Blunt, 1792-93, Ibid, pages 277, 278, 317, 436, 437, 440. Knox, Instructions to Shaw, February 17, 1792, Ibid, page 247. Blunt, Letter, March 20, 1792, Ibid, page 263, Knox, Letters, October 9, 1792, Ibid, pages 261, 262. Governor Telfair's Letters of November 14 and December 5, with enclosure, 1792, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 332, 336, 337, 1832. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 562 to 663, 598, 1853. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 562 to 565, 1853. Blunt, Letter, October 2, 1792, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 294, 1832, Blunt, Letter, etc., in Ramsey, Op. Sit, pages 566, 567, 599-601. See also Brown's Narrative, Ibid, 
511, 512, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 170, 1888. Ramsey, Opsit, 569 to 571. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 571 to 573, 1853. Ibid, pages 574 to 578, 1853. Ramsey, Tennessee, page 579. Ibid, pp. 580 to 583, 1853, Smith, Letter, September 27, 1793, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 468, 1832. Ramsey gives the Indian force 1,000 warriors. Smith says that in many places they marched in files of 28 abreast, each file being supposed to number 40 men. Ramsey, Opsit, pages 584 to 588. Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 590, 602 to 605, 1853. Haywood, Civil and Political History of Tennessee, pages 300 to 302. Knoxville, 1823. Ibid, pages 303 to 308, 1823, Ramsey, Opsit, pages 591 to 594. Haywood's history of this period is little more than a continuous record of killings and petty encounters. Haywood, Civil and Political History of Tennessee, page 308, 1823. Ramsey, Tennessee, page 594, 1853, see also Memorial in Putnam, Middle Tennessee, page 502, 1859. Haywood calls the leader Anakala, which should be on G. A. Dihai, White Man Killer. Compare Haywood's statement with that of Washburn, on page 100. Indian Treaties, pages 39, 40, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 171, 172, 1888, Documents of 1797-98, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 628-631. 1832. The treaty is not mentioned by the Tennessee historians. Haywood, Civil and Political History of Tennessee, pages 309 to 311, 1823, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 594, 595, 1853. Haywood, Opsit, pages 314 to 316, Ramsey, Opsit, page 596. Haywood, Political and Civil History of Tennessee, pages 392 to 396, 1823, Ramsey, Tennessee, with Major Orr's Report, pages 608 to 618, 1853, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau Ethnology, page 171, 1888. Orr, Robertson, and Blunt, Reports, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, Pages 632 to 634, 1832. Ramsey, Op Sit, page 618. Teleco Conference, November 7 to 8, 1794, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 536 to 538, 1832, Royce, Op Sit, page 173. Ramsey, Op Sit, page 596. Beaver's Talk, 1784, Virginia State Papers, 3, page 571, 1883, McDowell, Report, 1786, Ibid, 4, page 118, 1884, McDowell, Report, 1787, Ibid, page 286, Todd, Letter, 1787, Ibid, page 277. Teleco Conference, November 7, 1794, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 538, 1832, Greenville Treaty Conference, August, 1795, Ibid, pages 582 to 583. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 173, 1888. Ibid, pp. 
174, 175, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 679 to 685, 1853. Indian Treaties, pages 78 to 82, 1837, Ramsey, Tennessee, pages 692 to 697, 1853, Royce, Cherokee Nation, with map and full discussion, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 174 to 183, 1888. See Table in Royce, Op. Sit, page 378. Adair, American Indians, pages 230, 231, 1775. C. Hawkins, M.S. Journal from South Carolina to the Creeks, 1796, in Library of Georgia Historical Society. Hawkins, Treaty Commission, 1801, Manuscript No. 5, in Library of Georgia Historical Society. Foot, in North Carolina Colonial Records, v. page 1226, 1887. North Carolina Colonial Records, v. p. x. 1887. Reichel, E. H., Historical Sketch of the Church and Missions of the United Brethren, pp. 65-81, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, 1848, Holmes, John, Sketches of the Missions of the United Brethren, pages 124, 125, 209-212, Dublin, 1818, Thompson, C., Moravian Missions, page 341, New York, 1890, De Schweinitz, Edmund, Life of Zeisberger, pp. 394, 663, 696, Philadelphia, 1870. Morse, American Geography, I, page 577, 1819. Indian Treaties, pages 108, 121, 125, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 183, 193, 1888, Map and Full Discussion. McKinney and Hall, Indian Tribes, 2, page 92, 1858. Indian Treaties, pages 132 to 136, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 193 to 197, 1888. Meigs, Letter, September 28, 1807, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, p. 754, 1832, Royce, Op. Sit, page 197. C. Treaty, December 2, 1807, and Jefferson's Message, with Enclosures, March 10, 1808, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 752 to 754, 1832, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 199 to 201. Ibid, pages 201, 202. In American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, page 283, 1834. See Contract Appended to Washington Treaty, 1819, Indian Treaties, pages 269 to 271, 1837, Royce Map, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, 1888. Author's Personal Information Mooney, Ghost Dance Religion, 14th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 670 E.T. Passim, 1896, Contemporary Documents in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, pages 798 to 801, 845 to 850, 1832. C. Mooney, Ghost Dance Religion, 14th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, pages 670 to 677, 1896, McKenney and Hall, Indian Tribes, 2, pages 93 to 95, 1858, see also Contemporary Letters, 1813, etc., by Hawkins, Cornells, and others in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 1832. Letters of Hawkins, Pinckney, and Cusseta King, July, 1813, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 847 to 849, 1832. Meigs, Letter, May 8, 1812, 
and Hawkins, Letter, May 11, 1812, Ibid, page 809. Author's Information from James D. Wofford. McKinney and Hall, Indian Tribes, 2, pages 96-97, 1858. Drake, Indians, pages 395-396, 1880, Pickett, Alabama, page 556, reprint of 1896. Coffee, Report, etc., in Drake, Indians, page 396, 1880, Lossing, Field Book of the War of 1812, pages 762, 763, n.d. 1869, Pickett, Alabama, page 553, reprint of 1896. Ibid, page 556. Drake, Indians, page 396, 1880, Pickett, Op. Sit, pages 554, 555. White's Report, etc., in Fay and Davison, Sketches of the War, pages 240, 241, Rutland, Vermont, 1815. Lowe, John, Impartial History of the War, page 199, New York, 1815, Drake, Op. Sit, page 397, Pickett, Op. Sit, page 557, Lossing, Op. Sit, page 767. Lowe says White had about 1,100 mounted men, including upward of 300 Cherokee Indians. Pickett gives White 400 Cherokee. Drake, Indians, pages 391, 398, 1880, Pickett, Alabama, pages 557 to 559, 572 to 576, reprint of 1896. Ibid, page 579. Lossing, Field Book of the War of 1812, page 773. Pay and Davison, Sketches of the War, pages 247 to 250, 1815. Pickett, Alabama, pages 579 to 584, reprint of 1896, Drake, Indians, pages 398 to 400, 1880. Pickett says Jackson had 767 men with 200 friendly Indians, Drake says he started with 930 men and was joined at Talladega by 200 friendly Indians. Jackson himself, as quoted in Fay and Davison, says that he started with 930 men, excluding Indians, and was joined at Talladega by between 200 and 300 friendly Indians, 65 being Cherokee, the rest Creeks. The inference is that he already had a number of Indians with him at the start, probably the Cherokee who had been doing garrison duty. Pickett, Opposite, pages 584 to 586. Jackson's report to Governor Blunt, March 31, 1814, in Fay and Davison, Sketches of the War, pages 253, 254, 1815. General Coffey's report to General Jackson, April 1, 1814, Ibid, page 257. Colonel Morgan's report to Governor Blunt, in Fay and Davison, Sketches of the War, pages 258, 259, 1815. Coffey's report to Jackson, Ibid, pages 257, 258. Jackson's report to Governor Blunt, Ibid, pages 255, 256. Jackson's report in Colonel Morgan's report, in Fay and Davison, Sketches of the War, pages 255, 256, 259, 1815. Pickett makes the loss of the white troops 32 killed and 99 wounded. The Houston reference is from Lossing. The battle is described also by Pickett, Alabama, pages 588 to 591, reprint of 1896, Drake, Indians, pages 391, 400, 1880, McKenney and Hall, Indian Tribes, 2, pages 98, 99, 1858. McKinney and Hall, Op. Sit, page 98. Drake, Indians, page 401, 1880. Indian Treaties, page 187, 1837, Meigs Letter to Secretary of War, August 19, 1816, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 113, 
1834. Indian Treaties, pages 185 to 187, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pp. 197 to 209, 1888. Indian Treaties, pages 199, 200, 1837, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 209 to 211. Claiborne, Letter to Jefferson, November 5, 1808, American State Papers, I, page 755, 1832, Gatchet, Creek Migration Legend, I, page 88, 1884. Hawkins, 1799, quoted in Gatchet, Op. Sit, page 89. See Treaty of St. Louis, 1825, and of Castor Hill, 1852, in Indian Treaties, pages 388, 539, 1837. See, The Lost Cherokee. See Letter of Governor Estevan Moreau to Robertson, April 20, 1783, in Roosevelt, Winning of the West, 2, page 407, 1889. See pages 76 to 77. Washburn, Reminiscences, pages 76 to 79, 1869. See also Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, p. 204, 1888. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, pages 202, 203, 1888. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 202, 204, 1888. See also Indian Treaties, pages 209, 215, 1837. The preamble to the Treaty of 1817 says that the delegation of 1808 had desired a division of the tribal territory in order that the people of the upper, northern, towns might begin the establishment of fixed laws and a regular government. While those of the lower, southern, towns desired to remove to the west. Nothing is said of severalty allotments or citizenship. Indian Treaties, pages 209 to 215, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 212 to 217, 1888, see also maps in Royce. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, 217 to 218, 1888. Ibid, pages 218 to 219. Ibid, page 219. Morse, Geography, I, page 577, 1819, and page 185, 1822. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 221 to 222, 1888. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, pages 222 to 228, 1888. Indian Treaties, pages 265 to 269, 1837, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 219 to 221 in Table, page 378. Laws of the Cherokee Nation, Several Documents, 1820, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 279 to 283, 1834. Letter quoted by McKenney, 1825, Ibid, pages 651, 652, Drake, Indians, pages 437, 438, edition 1880. List or missions and reports of missionaries, etc., American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 277 to 279, 459, 1834, personal information from James D. Wofford Concerning Valley Towns Mission For notices of Worcester, Jones, and Wofford, see Pilling, Bibliography of the Iroquoian Languages 1888. G. C., in Cherokee Phoenix, reprinted in Christian Advocate in Journal, New York, September 26, 1828. McKinney and Hall, Indian Tribes, I, page 35, E. Passim, 1858. Phillips, Sequoia, in Harper's Magazine, 
pages 542 to 548, September, 1870. Manuscript Letters by John Mason Brown, January 17, 1822, and February 4, 1889, in Archives of the Bureau of American Ethnology. McKinney and Hall, Indian Tribes, I, page 45, 1858. C. Page. C. The Iroquois Wars. McKinney and Hall, Indian Tribes, I, page 46, 1858, Phillips, in Harper's Magazine, page 547, September, 1870. Indian Treaties, page 425, 1837. For details concerning the life and invention of Sequoia, see McKenney and Hall, Indian Tribes, I, 1858. Phillips, Sequoia, in Harper's Magazine, September 1870, Foster, Sequoia, 1885, and Story of the Cherokee Bible, 1899, based largely on Phillips' article, G. C. Invention of the Cherokee Alphabet, in Cherokee Phoenix, republished in Christian Advocate and Journal, New York, September 26, 1828, Pilling, Bibliography of the Iroquoian Languages, 1888. G. C., Invention of the Cherokee Alphabet, Op. C. I. T. Unsigned, Letter of David Brown, September 2, 1825, Quoted in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, page 652, 1834. Foster, Sequoia, pages 120, 121, 1885. Pilling, Iroquoian Bibliography, page 21, 1888. Brown Letter, unsigned, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, page 652, 1834. For extended notice of Cherokee literature and authors see numerous references in Pilling, Bibliography of the Iroquoian Languages, 1888. Also Foster, Sequoia, 1885, and Story of the Cherokee Bible, 1899. The largest body of original Cherokee manuscript material in existence, including hundreds of ancient ritual formulas, was obtained by the writer among the East Cherokee, and is now in possession of the Bureau of American Ethnology. To be translated at some future time. Brown Letter, Unsigned, September 2, 1825, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 651, 652, 1834. C. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 241, 1888. Meredith, In the Five Civilized Tribes, Extra Census Bulletin, page 41, 1894, Morse, American Geography, I, page 577, 1819, for Hicks. Fort Pitt Treaty, September 17, 1778, Indian Treaties, page 3, 1837. Cherokee Agency Treaty, July 8, 1817, Ibid, p. 209, Drake, Indians, page 450, edition 1880, Johnson in Senate Report on Territories, Cherokee Memorial, January 18, 1831, see Laws of 1808, 1810, and later, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 279-283, 1834. The volume of Cherokee Laws, compiled in the Cherokee language by the nation, in 1850, begins with the year 1808. Personal Information from James D. Wofford So far as is known this rebellion of the conservatives has never hitherto been noted in print. See Resolutions of Honor, in Laws of the Cherokee Nation, pages 187-140, 1868, Meredith, in the Five Civilized Tribes, Extra Census Bulletin, page 41, 1894. Appleton, Cyclopedia of American Biography See fourth article of Articles of Agreement in Session, April 24, 1802, in American State Papers, Class 8, Public Lands, quoted also by Greeley, American Conflict, I, page 103, 1864. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 231-233, 1888.
Cherokee Correspondence, 1823 and 1824, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 468 to 473, 1834, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pp. 236 to 237, 1888. Cherokee Memorial, February 11, 1824, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 473, 494, 1834, Royce, Op. Sit, page 237. Letters of Governor Troop of Georgia, February 28, 1824, and of Georgia Delegates, March 10, 1824, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 475, 477, 1834, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 237, 238. Monroe, Message to the Senate, with Calhoun's Report, March 30, 1824, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 460, 462, 1834. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 241, 242, 1888. Personal Information from J.D. Wofford. Nitsa, H. B. C., in 20th Annual Report United States Geological Survey, Part 6, Mineral Resources, page 112, 1899. C. Butler Letter, quoted in Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 297, 1888. See also Everett, Speech in the House of Representatives on May 31, 1838, pages 16-17, 32-33, 1839. For extracts and synopses of these acts see Royce, Op. Sit, pages 259-264, Drake, Indians, pages 438-456, 1880, Greeley, American Conflict, I, pp. 105, 106, 1864, Edward Everett, Speech in the House of Representatives, February 14, 1831, Lottery Law. The Gold Lottery is also noted incidentally by Landman, Charles, Letters from the Allegheny Mountains, page 10. New York, 1849, and by Nitza, in his report on the Georgia Gold Fields, in the 20th Annual Report of the United States Geological Survey, Part 6, Mineral Resources, page 112, 1899. The author has himself seen in a mountain village in Georgia an old book titled The Cherokee Land and Gold Lottery, containing maps and plats covering the whole Cherokee country of Georgia, with each lot numbered. And descriptions of the water courses, soil, and supposed mineral veins. Speech of May 19, 1830, Washington, printed by Gales and Seton, 1830. Speech in the Senate of the United States, April 16, 1830, Washington, Peter Force, Printer, 1830. See Cherokee Memorial to Congress, January 18, 1831. Personal information from Professor Clinton Duncan, of Tahlequah, Cherokee Nation, whose father's house was the one thus burned. Cherokee Memorial to Congress, January 18, 1831. Ibid. See also speech of Edward Everett in House of Representatives February 14, 1831, Report of the Select Committee of the Senate of Massachusetts upon the Georgia Resolutions, Boston, 1831, Greeley, American Conflict, I, page 106, 1864. Abbott, Cherokee Indians in Georgia, Atlanta Constitution, October 27, 1889. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 261, 262, 1888. Ibid, page 262. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pp. 264 to 266, 1888. Drake, Indians, pages 454, 457, 1880. Greeley, American Conflict, I. 106, 1864. Drake, Indians, page 458, 1880. Royce, Opsit, 
pages 262 to 264, 272, 273. Ibid, pages 274, 275. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Report Bureau of Ethnology, p. 276, 1888. Commissioner Albert Herring, November 25, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 240, 1834, Authors' Personal Information from Major R. C. Jackson and J. D. Wofford. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pp. 278 to 280, 1888, Everett Speech in House of Representatives, May 31, 1838, pages 28, 29, 1839, in which the Secretary's reply is given in full. Royce, Opsit, pages 280 to 281. Ibid, page 281. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Opsit, Ross Arrest, page 281. Drake, Indians, Ross, Payne, Phoenix, page 459, 1880, see also Everett speech of May 31, 1838, Opsit. Royce, Opsit, pages 281, 282, see also Everett speech, 1838. See Fort Gibson Treaty, 1833, page 142. See New Dakota Treaty, 1835, and Fort Gibson Treaty, 1833, Indian Treaties, pages 633 to 648 and 561 to 565, 1837. Also, for full discussion of both treaties, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 249 to 298. For a summary of all the measures of pressure brought to bear upon the Cherokee up to the final removal, see also Everett, Speech in the House of Representatives, May 31, 1838, the chapters on Expatriation of the Cherokees, Drake, Indians, 1880. And the chapter on State Rights, Nullification, in Greeley, American Conflict, I, 1864. The Georgia side of the controversy is presented in E. J. Hardin's Life of Governor, George M. Troop, 1849. Royce, Opsit, page 289. The Indian total is also given in the report of the Indian Commissioner, page 369, 1836. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Opsit, pages 283, 284, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 285, 286, 1836. Quoted by Royce, Cherokee Nation, Opsit, pages 284 to 285. Quoted also, with some verbal differences, by Everett, Speech in House of Representatives on May 31, 1838. Quoted in Royce, Opsit, page 286. Letter of General Wool, September 10, 1836, in Everett, Speech in House of Representatives, May 31, 1838. Letter of June 30, 1836, to President Jackson, in Everett, Speech in the House of Representatives, May 31, 1838. Quoted by Everett, Ibid, also by Royce, Cherokee Nation, Opsit, page 286. Letter of J. M. Mason, J.R. To Secretary of War, September 25, 1837, in Everett, Speech in House of Representatives, May 31, 1838, also quoted in extract by Royce, Opsit, pages 286 to 287. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Opsit pages 287, 289. Ibid, pages 289, 290. Ibid, page 291. The statement of the total number of troops employed is from the speech of Everett in the House of Representatives, May 31, 1838, covering the whole question of the treaty. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 291. Ibid, page 291. The notes on the Cherokee Roundup and Removal are almost entirely from author's information as furnished by actors in the events, both Cherokee and white, among whom may be named the late Colonel W. H. Thomas, the late Colonel Z. A. Zile, of Atlanta, 
of the Georgia Volunteers, the late James Bryson, of Dillsboro, North Carolina, also a volunteer, James D. Wofford, of the Western Cherokee Nation, who commanded one of the emigrant detachments. And old Indians, both East and West, who remembered the removal and had heard the story from their parents. Charlie's story is a matter of common note among the East Cherokee, and was heard in full detail from Colonel Thomas and from Wasatuna, Washington, Charlie's youngest son, who alone was spared by General Scott on account of his youth. The incident is also noted, with some slight inaccuracies, in Landman, Letters from the Allegheny Mountains. C.P. Author's personal information, as before cited. As quoted in Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and, Representative Bureau of Ethnology, p. 292, 1888, the dispersing agent makes the number unaccounted for 1,428, the receiving agent, who took charge of them on their arrival, makes it 1,645. Agent Stokes to Secretary of War, June 24, 1839, in Report Indian Commissioner, page 355, 1839. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and, Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 293, 1888, Drake, Indians, pages 459 to 460, 1880, author's personal information. The agent's report incorrectly makes the killings occur on three different days. Royce, Cherokee Nation, op. Sit, pages 294, 295. Council Resolutions, August 23, 1839, in Report Indian Commissioner, page 387, 1839, Royce, Opposite, page 294. See Act of Union and Constitution, in Constitution and Laws of the Cherokee Nation, 1875. General Arbuckle's Letter to the Secretary of War, June 28, 1840, in Report of Indian Commissioner, page 46, 1840, also Royce, Op. Sit, pages 294, 295. See Ante, pages 105 to 106, Nuttall, who was on the ground, gives them only 1,500. Washburn, Cephas, Reminiscences of the Indians, pages 81, 103, Richmond, 1869. Nuttall, Journal of Travels into the Arkansas Territory, etc., page 129, Philadelphia, 1821. Ibid, pages 123 to 136. The battle mentioned seems to be the same noted somewhat differently by Washburn, Reminiscences, page 120, 1869. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 222. Washburn, Op. Sit, page 160, and personal information from J. D. Wofford. Royce, Op. Sit, pp. 242-243, Washburn, Op. Sit, pages 112-122 E.T. Passam, see also sketches of Tachi in Tuantu or Spring Frog, in McKenney and Hall, Indian Tribes, 1 and 2, 1858. Washburn, Reminiscences, page 178, 1869, see also anti-page 206. Ibid, page 138. See Treaty of 1817, Indian Treaties, 1837. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th Report Bureau of Ethnology, pages 243, 244, 1888. Ibid, page 243. Author's Personal Information, C.P. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 245. Ibid, pages 247. 248. Treaty of Washington, May 6, 1828, Indian Treaties, pages 423 to 428, 1837, Treaty of Port Gibson, 1833, Ibid, pages 561 to 565, see also for synopsis, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and, Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 229, 230, 1888. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and, Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 248, 1888. For a sketch of Tachi, with portraits, 
C. McKenney and Hall, pages 251 to 260, 1858, Catlin, North American Indians, 2, pages 121, 122, 1844. Washburn also mentions the emigration to Texas consequent upon the Treaty of 1828, Reminiscences, page 217, 1869. Treaties at Fort Gibson, February 14, 1833, with Creeks and Cherokee, in Indian Treaties, pages 561 to 569, 1837. Treaty of 1833, Indian Treaties, pages 561 to 565, 1837, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 249 to 253, 1888, see also Treaty of New Dakota, 1835, Andy, pages 123 to 125. Author's Personal Information In 1891 the author opened two Uchi graves on the grounds of Cornelius Bodino, at Tahlequah, finding with one body a number of French, Spanish, and American silver coins wrapped in cloth and deposited in two packages on each side of the head. They are now in the National Museum at Washington. Bonnell, Topographic Description of Texas, page 141, Austin, 1840, Thrall, History of Texas, page 58, New York, 1876. Authors' Personal Information from J.D. Wofford and other old Cherokee residents and from recent Cherokee delegates. Bancroft agrees with Bonnell and Thrall that no grant was formally issued, but states that the Cherokee chief established his people in Texas, confiding in promises made to him. And a conditional agreement in 1822 inch with the Spanish governor, History of the North Mexican States and Texas, 2 p. 103, 1889. It is probable that the paper carried by Bull was the later Houston Treaty. See next page. Thrall, Op. Sit, page 58. Thrall, Texas, page 46, 1879. Bonnell, Texas, pages 142, 143, 1840. Ibid, page 143, 1840. Bonnell, Texas, pages 143, 144. Ibid. Pages 144, 146. Thrall, Texas, pages 116 to 168, 1876. Bonnell, Opsit, pages 146 to 150. Thrall, Opsit, pages 118 to 120. Authors' personal information from J. D. Wofford and other Old Western Cherokee and recent Cherokee delegates. By some this is said to have been a Mexican patent, but it is probably the one given by Texas. See Ante, page 143. Thrall, Texas, page 120, 1876. Authors' personal information from Mexican and Cherokee sources. W. A. Phillips, Sequoia, in Harper's Magazine, September, 1870. Foster, Sequoia, 1885, Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 302, 1888, Letter of William P. Ross, former editor of Cherokee Advocate, March 11, 1889, in Archives of Bureau of American Ethnology, Cherokee Advocate, October 19, 1844, November 2, 1844, and March 6, 1845. Author's personal information. San Fernando seems to have been a small village in Chihuahua, but is not shown on the maps. For full discussion, see Royce, Opsit, pages 298 to 312. Pilling, Bibliography of the Iroquoian Languages, Bulletin of the Bureau of Ethnology, page 174, 1888. See Treaties with Cherokee, October 7, 1861 and with other tribes, in Confederate State Statutes at Large, 1864, Royce, Op. Sit, pages 324-328, Greeley, American Conflict, 2, pages 30-34, 1866, Reports of Indian Commissioner for 1860-1862.
In this battle the Confederates were assisted by from 4,000 to 5,000 Indians of the Southern Tribes, including the Cherokee, under command of General Albert Pike. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 329, 330, 1888. Ibid, page 331. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 376. Ibid, page 376. A census of 1807 gives them 13,566, Ibid, page 351. See synopsis and full discussion in Royce, Op. Sit, pages 334 to 340. Act of Citizenship, November 7, 1865, Laws of the Cherokee Nation, page 119, St. Louis, 1868. See Resolutions of Honor, Ibid, pages 137 to 140. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 356 to 358, 1888. Constitution and Laws of the Cherokee Nation, pages 277 to 284, St. Louis, 1875. Royce, Op. Sit, page 367. Foster, Sequoia, pages 147, 148, 1885, Pilling, Iroquoian Bibliography, 1888, Articles, Cherokee Advocate, and John B. Jones. The schoolbook series seems to have ended with the arithmetic, cause, as the Cherokee National Superintendent of Schools explained to the author, too much white man. Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, P. L. X. V., 1881, and P. 70, 1882, see also page 175. Report of Indian Commissioner, P. L. X. V., 1883. Commissioner J. D. C. Atkins, Report of Indian Commissioner, P. X. L. V., 1886, and page 77, 1887. Agent L. E. Bennett, in Report of Indian Commissioner, page 93, 1890. Report of Indian Commissioner, page 22, 1889. See Proclamation by President Harrison and Order from Indian Commissioner in Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 72 to 73, 421 to 422, 1890. The lease figures are from personal information. Commissioner T. J. Morgan, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 79 to 80, 1892. Commissioner D. M. Browning, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 33 to 34, 1893. Quotation from Act, etc., Report of Indian Commissioner for 1894, page 27, 1895. Report of Agent D. M. Wisdom, Ibid, page 141. Ibid, and Statistical Table, page 570. Report of Agent D. M. Wisdom, Ibid, page 145. Agent D. M. Wisdom, in Report Indian Commissioner for 1895, page 155, 1896. Commissioner D. M. Browning, Report of Indian Commissioner, p. 81, 1896. Report of Agent D. M. Wisdom, Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, pages 159, 160, 1896. Letter of A. E. Ivy, Secretary of the Board of Education, in Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, page 161, 1896. The author can add personal testimony as to the completeness of the seminary establishment. Report of Agent Wisdom, Ibid, page 162. Letter of Bird Harris, May 31, 1895, in Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, page 160, 1896. Synopsis of Curtis Act, pages 75 to 79, and Curtis Act in full, page 425 E. Seek in Report of Indian Commissioner for 1898, noted also in Report of Indian Commissioner, page 84 E. Seek, 1899. Commissioner W. A. Jones, Ibid, pages I, 84 E. T. Seek. Curtis Act and Dawes Commission. Report of Agent D. M. Wisdom, Report of Indian Commissioner, 
pages 141 to 144, 1897. Author's Personal Information, see also House Bill No. 1165, for the relief of certain Indians in Indian Territory, etc. 56th Congress, First Session, 1900. Report of Agent D. M. Wisdom, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 159, 1898. See page. Charlie's story as here given is from the author's personal information, derived chiefly from conversations with Colonel Thomas and with Wasatin Na and other old Indians. An ornate but somewhat inaccurate account is given also in Landman's letters from the Allegheny Mountains, written on the ground ten years after the events described. The leading facts are noted in General Scott's official dispatches. See New Dakota Treaty, December 29, 1835, and Supplementary Articles, March 1, 1836, in Indian Treaties, pages 633 to 648, 1837, also full discussion of same treaty in Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, 1888. Royce, Op. Sit, P. 292. Ibid, page 314. In the Cherokee language Tsiskwa High, Bird Place, Ani, Wadai High, Paint Place, Way High, Wolf Place, Ilawa D, Red Earth, now Cherokee Post Office and Agency, and Kalanan E, Raven Place. There was also, for a time, a pretty woman town, Ani, Hila High. The facts concerning Colonel Thomas's career are derived chiefly from the author's conversations with Thomas himself, supplemented by information from his former assistant, Captain James W. Terrell, and others who knew him, together with an admirable sketch in the North Carolina University Magazine for May 1899, by Mrs. C. Avery, his daughter. He is also frequently noticed, in connection with East Cherokee matters, in the annual reports of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, in the North Carolina Confederate roster, in Landman's letters from the Allegheny Mountains, and in Ziegler and Grosscup's Heart of the Alleghenies, etc. Some manuscript contributions to the Library of the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah, now unfortunately mislaid, show his interest in Cherokee linguistics. The facts concerning Yanaguska are based on the author's personal information obtained from Colonel Thomas, supplemented from conversations with old Indians. The date of his death and his approximate age are taken from the Terrell Roll. He is also noticed at length in Landman's Letters from the Allegheny Mountains, 1848, and in Ziegler and Grosscup's Heart of the Alleghenies, 1883. The trance which, according to Thomas and Landman, lasted about one day, is stretched by the last-named authors to fifteen days, with the whole one thousand two hundred Indians marching and countermarching around the sleeping body. The name in the treaties occurs as Yanahequa, 1798, Yohanaqua, 1805, and Yona, 1819. Indian Treaties, pages 82, 123, 268, Washington, 1837. The name refers to something habitually falling from a leaning position. Act quoted in Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, page 636, 1896. The facts concerning Junaluska are from the author's information obtained from Colonel Thomas, Captain James Terrell, and Cherokee informants. Author's information from Colonel Thomas. Commissioner Crawford, November 25, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 333, 1839. Author's information from Colonel Thomas, Captain Terrell, and Indian Sources, Commissioner W. Medill, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 399, 1848, Commissioner Orlando Brown, Report of Indian Commissioner for 1849, page 14, 1850. Synopsis of the Treaty, etc., in Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, Pages 300 to 313, 1888. See also Ante, page 148. Landman, Letters from the Allegheny Mountains, pages 94 to 95, 1849. Landman, Letters from the Allegheny Mountains, page 111. See Act quoted in The United States of America v. William H. Thomas et al. Also Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and 
Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 313, 1888. In the earlier notices the terms North Carolina Cherokee and Eastern Cherokee are used synonymously, as the original fugitives were all in North Carolina. C. Royce, Op. Sit, pages 313 to 314, Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, P. Lee, 1884, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 495, 1898, also references by Commissioner W. Medill, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 399, 1848. And Report of Indian Commissioner for 1855, page 255, 1856. Royce, Cherokee Nation, Op. Sit, page 313 and Note. Report of the Indian Commissioner, pages 459 to 460, 1845. Commissioner Crawford, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 3, 1842. Royce, Op. Sit, p. 314. The history of the events leading to the organization of the Thomas Legion is chiefly from the author's conversations with Colonel Thomas himself, corroborated and supplemented from other sources. In the words of Thomas, if it had not been for the Indians I would not have been in the war. This is believed to be a correct statement of the strength and makeup of the Thomas Legion. Owing to the imperfection of the records and the absence of reliable memoranda among the surviving officers, no two accounts exactly coincide. The role given in the North Carolina Confederate roster, handed in by Captain Terrell, assistant quartermaster, was compiled early in the war and contains no notice of the engineer company or of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, which included two other Indian companies. The information therein contained is supplemented from conversations and personal letters of Captain Terrell, and from letters and newspaper articles by Lt. Col. Stringfield of the 69th. Another statement is given in Mrs. Avery's sketch of Col. Thomas in the North Carolina University Magazine for May, 1899. Personal information from Col. W. H. Thomas, Lt. Col. W. W. Stringfield, Capt. James W. Terrell, Chief N. J. Smith, 1st Sergeant Company B, and others, with other details from Moore's, Confederate, Roster of North Carolina Troops, for, Raleigh, 1882. Also list of survivors in 1890, by Carrington, in Eastern Band of Cherokees, Extra Bulletin of 11th Census, page 21, 1892. Thomas Terrell Manuscript East Cherokee Roll, with accompanying letters, 1864, Burr A.M. F. Archives. Personal information from Colonel W. H. Thomas, Captain J. W. Terrell, Chief N. J. Smith, and others, see also Carrington, Eastern Band of Cherokees, Extra Bulletin of 11th Census, page 21, 1892. Author's information from Colonel Thomas and others. Various informants have magnified the number of deaths to several hundred, but the estimate here given, obtained from Thomas, is probably more reliable. Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Rep. Bureau of Ethnology, page 314, 1888. Commissioner F. Walker, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 26, 1872. Royce, Op. Sit, page 353. Constitution, etc., quoted in Carrington, Eastern Band of Cherokees, Extra Bulletin 11th Census, pages 18-20, 1892. Author's Personal Information See Award of Arbitrators, Rufus Berenger, John H. Dillard, and T. Ruffin, with full statement, in Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians against W. T. Thomas et al. H. R. X. Document 128, 53d Kong, 2d Cess, 1894. Summary in Royce, Cherokee Nation, 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, pages 315 to 318, 1888. C. Royce, Op. Sit, pages 315 to 318, Commissioner T. J. Morgan, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 29, 1890. The final settlement, under the laws of North Carolina, was not completed until 1894. Royce, Op. Sit, pages 315 to 318, 
Carrington, Eastern Band of Cherokees, with Map of Temple Survey, Extra Bulletin of 11th Census, 1892. Report of Agent W. C. McCarthy, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 343 to 344, 1875, and Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 118 to 119, 1876. Author's Personal Information, see also Carrington, Eastern Band of Cherokees, Ziegler and Grosskup, Heart of the Alleghenies, pp. 35 to 36, 1883. Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 64 LXV, 1881, and Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 69 to 70, 1882, see also Andy, page 151. See Commissioner T. J. Morgan, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 141 to 145, 1892. Authors' personal information from B. C. Hobbs, Chief N. J. Smith, and others. For further notice of school growth see also Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 426 to 427, 1897. Ziegler and Grosskup, Heart of the Alleghenies, pages 36 to 42, 1883. Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 69 to 70, 1882. Report of Indian Commissioner, pages Lee Lee, 1884. Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 69 to 71, 1882, also, Indian Legislation, Ibid, page 214. Commissioner H. Price, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages LXV 66, 1883. Commissioner J. D. C. Atkins, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 70, 1885. Same Commissioner, Report of the Indian Commissioner, P. XLV, 1886. Decision quoted by Same Commissioner, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 77, 1887. Same Commissioner, Report of the Indian Commissioner, P. Lee, 1886, reiterated by him in Report for 1887, page 77. See Act in Full, Report of Indian Commissioner, Volume 1, pages 680 to 681, 1891. From Author's Personal Acquaintance, see also Ziegler and Grosskup, Heart of the Alleghenies, pages 38 to 39, 1883. Agent J. L. Holmes, in Report of Indian Commissioner, p. 160, 1885, Commissioner T. J. Morgan, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 142, 1892, Moore, Roster of the North Carolina Troops, for 1882. Commissioner D. M. Browning, Report of Indian Commissioner for 1894, pages 81-82, 1895, also Agent T. W. Potter, Ibid, page 398. Agent T. W. Potter, Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, page 387, 1896. Agent J. C. Hart, Report of Indian Commissioner, page 208, 1897. Agent J. C. Hart, Report of Indian Commissioner, pages 218 to 219, 1898. At the recent election in November, 1900, they were debarred by the local polling officers from either registering or voting, and the matter is now being contested. 3. Notes to the Historical Sketch 1. Tribal Synonymy, page 15 Very few Indian tribes are known to us under the names by which they call themselves. One reason for this is the fact that the whites have usually heard of a tribe from its neighbors, speaking other languages, before coming upon the tribe itself. Many of the popular tribal names were originally nicknames bestowed by neighboring tribes, frequently referring to some peculiar custom, and in a large number of cases would be strongly repudiated by the people designated by them. As a rule each tribe had a different name in every surrounding Indian language, besides those given by Spanish, French, Dutch, or English settlers. Yunwaya, this word is compounded from Yunwi, person, and Ya, real or principal. The assumption of superiority is much in evidence in Indian tribal names. Thus, the Iroquois, Delawares, and Pawnee call themselves, respectively, Anwi Hanwi, Leni Lenape, and Sariksi Tsa Riks, 
all of which may be rendered, men of men, men surpassing other men, or, real men. Kitawagi, this word, which cannot be analyzed, is derived from Kitawa, the name of an ancient Cherokee settlement formerly on Takasagi River, just above the present Bryson City, in Swain County, North Carolina. It is noted in 1730 as one of the seven mother towns of the tribe. Its inhabitants were called Ani, Kitawagi, people of Kituwa, and seem to have exercised a controlling influence over those of all the towns on the waters of Takasagi and the upper part of Little Tennessee. The whole body being frequently classed together as Ani, Kituwagi. The dialect of these towns held a middle place linguistically between those spoken to the east, on the heads of Savannah, and to the west, on Hiwasi, Chiowa, and the lower course of Little Tennessee. In various forms the word was adopted by the Delawares, Shawano, and other northern Algonquian tribes as a synonym for Cherokee, probably from the fact that the Kituwa people guarded the Cherokee northern frontier. In the form Kutawa it appears on the French map of Vogandy in 1755. From a similarity of spelling, Schoolcraft incorrectly makes it a synonym for Catawba, while Brinton incorrectly asserts that it is an Algonquian term, fancifully rendered, inhabitants of the great wilderness. Among the Western Cherokee it is now the name of a powerful secret society, which had its origin shortly before the War of the Rebellion. Cherokee, this name occurs in fully fifty different spellings. In the standard recognized form, which dates back at least to 1708, it has given name to counties in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama, within the ancient territory of the tribe and to as many as twenty other geographic locations within the United States. In the eastern or lower dialect, with which the English settlers first became familiar, the form is T.S.A. Raggy, whence we get Cherokee. In the other dialects the form is T.S.A. Loggy. It is evidently foreign to the tribe, as is frequently the case in tribal names, and in all probability is of Choctaw origin, having come up from the south through the medium of the Mobilian trade jargon. It will be noted that De Soto, whose chroniclers first used the word, in the form Shalak, obtained his interpreters from the Gulf Coast of Florida. Fontanito, writing about the year 1575, mentions other inland tribes known to the natives of Florida under names which seem to be of Choctaw origin. For instance, the Canoga Coal, interpreted, wicked people, the final part being apparently the Choctaw word Oklahoma or Agula, people, which appears also in Pascagoula, Bayou Gola, and Pensacola. Shetamasha, Atacapa, and probably Biloxi, are also Choctaw names, although the tribes themselves are of other origins. As the Choctaw held much of the Gulf Coast and were the principal traders of that region, it was natural that explorers landing among them should adopt their names for the more remote tribes. The name seems to refer to the fact that the tribe occupied a cave country. In the Choctaw Lexicon of Alan Wright, 1880, page 87, we find Choluk, a noun, signifying a hole, cavity, pit, chasm, etc., and as an adjective signifying hollow. In the manuscript Choctaw Dictionary of Cyrus Byington, in the Library of the Bureau of American Ethnology, we find Chiluk, noun, a hole, cavity, hollow, pit, etc with a statement that in its usual application it means a cavity or hollow, and not a hole through anything. As an adjective, the same form is given as signifying hollow, having a hole, as iti chiluk, a hollow tree, a boha chiluk, an empty house. Chiluk chikoa, to enter a hole. Other noun forms given are chuluk and akaluk in the singular and chalukoa in the plural, all signifying hole, pit, or cavity. Verbal forms are chilukikbi, to make a hole, and chilukba, to open and form a fissure. In agreement with the genius of the Cherokee language the root form of the tribal name takes nominal or verbal prefixes according to its connection with the rest of the sentence, and is declined, or rather conjugated. As follows, singular, first person, tsitsa logi, I, am, a Cherokee. Second person, hitsa logi, thou art a Cherokee, Third person, ATSA Logi, he is a Cherokee. Dual, first person, ASTTSA Logi, we too are Cherokee, second person, STTSA Logi, you too are Cherokee. 
third person, ani, tsa logi, they too are Cherokee. Plural, first person, atsitsa logi, we, several, are Cherokee, second person, hitsitsa logi, you, several, are Cherokee, third person, ani, tsa logi, they, several, are Cherokee. It will be noticed that the third person dual and plural are alike. Oyata Girono, etc. The Iroquois, Mohawk, form is given by Hewitt as Oyata Girono, of which the root is Yada, cave, O is the assertive prefix, GE is the locative at, and Ronan is the tribal suffix, equivalent to, English, ites or people. The word, which has several dialectic forms, signifies, inhabitants of the cave country, or, cave country people, rather than, people who dwell in caves, as rendered by schoolcraft. The same radix yada occurs also in the Iroquois name for the opossum, which is a burrowing animal. As is well known, the Allegheny region is peculiarly a cave country, the caves having been used by the Indians for burial and shelter purposes, as is proved by numerous remains found in them. It is probable that the Iroquois simply translated the name, Shalak, current in the south, as we find is the case in the west, where the principal plains tribes are known under translations of the same names in all the different languages. The Wyandot name for the Cherokee, Wateronan, and their Catawba name, Matron, both seem to refer to coming out of the ground, and may have been originally intended to convey the same idea of cave people. Rikahaken, this name is used by the German explorer, Letterer, in 1670, as the name of the people inhabiting the mountains to the southwest of the Virginia settlements. On his map he puts them in the mountains on the southern head streams of Roanoke River, in western North Carolina. He states that, according to his Indian informants, the Rickahawken lived beyond the mountains in a land of great waves, which he interpreted to mean the seashore. But it is more likely that the Indians were trying to convey, by means of the sign language, the idea of a succession of mountain ridges. The name was probably of Powhatan origin, and is evidently identical with Rekahikrian of the Virginia Chronicles of about the same period, the R in the latter form being perhaps a misprint. It may be connected with Rikahawk, indicated on Smith's map of Virginia, in 1607, as the name of a town within the Powhatan territory, and still preserved in Rikahawk, the name of an estate on Lower Pamunkey River. We have too little material of the Powhatan language to hazard an interpretation, but it may possibly contain the root of the word for sand, which appears as Lekua, Nikua, Nigal, Rigua, Requa, etc. In various Eastern Algonquian dialects, whence Rockaway, sand, and Rekuawank, sandy place. The Powhatan form, as given by Strachey, is Raka, sand. He gives also Rokoihuk, otter, Rikahakoikoik, hidden under a cloud, overcast, Rikahon or Riaikoan, a comb, and Riku, to divide in halves. Talajui, as Brinton Well says, no name in the Lenape legends has given rise to more extensive discussion than this. On Colden's map in his History of the Five Nations, 1727, we find that Alleghens indicated upon Allegheny River. Heckwelder, who recorded the Delaware tradition in 1819, says, those people, as I was told, called themselves Talajou or Talajui. Colonel John Gibson, however, a gentleman who has a thorough knowledge of the Indians, and speaks several of their languages, is of the opinion that they were not called Talajui, but Alagewi. And it would seem that he is right from the traces of their name which still remain in the country, the Allegheny River and mountains having indubitably been named after them. The Delawares still called the former Alagewi Sipu, the River of the Allegheny, Indian Nations, page 48, edition 1876. Loskiel, writing on the authority of Zeisberger, says that the Delawares knew the whole country drained by the Ohio under the name of Allegewining, meaning, the land in which they arrived from distant places. Basing his interpretation upon an etymology compounded from Tali or Ali, there, Iku, to that place, and Iwak, they go, with a locative final. Etwine, another Moravian writer, says the Delawares called the western country Elijwinork, meaning a warpath, and called the river Allegheny Sippo. This definition would make the word come from Palatin or Alatin, to fight, to make war, a whack, they go, and a locative, i.e., 
they go there to fight. Trumbull, an authority on Algonquian languages, derives the river name from Woolock, Good, Best, Hana, Rapid Stream, and Sipu, River, of which rendering its Iroquois name, Ohio, is nearly an equivalent. Rafinesque renders Talajui as, they're found, from Tali, there, and some other root, not given, Brinton, Wallam Olam, pages 229 to 230, 1885. It must be noted that the names Ohio and Allegheny, or Allegheny, were not applied by the Indians, as with us, to different parts of the same river, but to the whole stream, or at least the greater portion of it from its head downward. Although Brinton sees no necessary connection between the river name and the traditional tribal name, the statement of Heckwelder, generally a competent authority on Delaware matters, makes them identical. In the traditional tribal name, Talajui or Allegheny, Y is an assertive verbal suffix, so that the form properly means, he is a talage, or, they are talage. This comes very near to T.S.A. Logi, the name by which the Cherokee call themselves, and it may have been an early corruption of that name. In Zeisberger's Delaware Dictionary, however, we find Wallow or Wallach, signifying a cave or hole, while in the Wallam Olam, we have Oligonunk rendered, at the place of caves, the region being further described as a buffalo land on a pleasant plain. Where the Lenape, advancing seaward from a less abundant northern region, at last found food, Wallam Olam, pp. 194 to 195. Unfortunately, like other aboriginal productions of its kind among the northern tribes, the Lenape Chronicle is suggestive rather than complete and connected. With more light it may be that seeming discrepancies would disappear and we should find at last that the Cherokee, in ancient times as in the historic period, were always the southern vanguard of the Iroquoian race. Always primarily a mountain people, but with their flank resting upon the Ohio and its great tributaries. Following the trend of the Blue Ridge and the Cumberland as they slowly gave way before the pressure from the north until they were finally cut off from the parent stock by the wedge of Algonquian invasion, but always. Whether in the north or in the south, keeping their distinctive title among the tribes as the people of the cave country. As the Cherokee have occupied a prominent place in history for so long a period their name appears in many synonyms and diverse spellings. The following are among the principal of these. Synonyms. T.S.A. Logi, plural. Ani, T.S.A. Logi. Proper form in the. Middle and Western Cherokee dialects. T.S.A. Ragi. Proper. Form in the Eastern or Lower Cherokee dialect. Akalik. Schoolcraft, Notes on Iroquois, 1847, incorrectly. Quoting Garcilaso. Chaliki. Nuttall, Travels, 124, 1821. Shalak. Gentlemen of Elvis, 1557, Publications of Hacklot. Society, 9, 60, 1851. Caliquis. Barcia, Enseo, 335, 1723. Cherokees. Holman Ayers Map, about 1730. Cherokees. Document of 1718, Fide Rivers, South. Carolina, 55, 1856. Cherokees. Governor Johnson, 1720, Fide Rivers, Early. History South Carolina, 93, 1874. Chi Lake. Barton, New Views, 44, 1798. Chi Adair, American Indians, 226, 1775. Chiraki. Ibid, 137. Chirakes. Moore, 1704, in Carroll, History Calls. South Carolina, 2, 576, 1836. Chiroki. Ross, 1776, in Historical Magazine, 2D. Series, 2, 218, 1867. Chalaku. Long, Expedition to Rocky Mountains, 2, 70, 1823. Chalakis. Gallatin, Trans A.M. 
Antique S.O.C. 2, 90, 1836. Chelax. Nuttall, Travels, 247, 1821. Chelaki. Keen, in Stanford's Compendium, 506. 1878. Chelokee. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, 2, 204, 1852. Kalakulji. White, Statistics of Georgia, 28, 1849, given. As plural form of Creek name. Chelokees. Gallatin, Trans A.M. Antique, S.O.C., 2, 104, 1836. Chiaquis. Johnson, 1772, in New York Document Colonel History. 8, 314, 1857, misprint 4. Cherokees. Cherokees. Cox, Carolina, 2. 1741. Cherokees. Ibid, Map, 1741. Cherokees. Chauvignery, 1736, Vide Schoolcraft. Indian Tribes, 3, 555, 1853. Cherokees. Cox, Carolina, 13, 1741. Cherokees. Hennicott, 1699, in Margrave, v. 404, 1883. Cherokees. Clark, 1739, in New York Document Colonel History. 6, 148, 1855. Cherokee. Albany Conference, 1742, Ibid, 218. Cherokee. Governor Johnson, 1708, in. Rivers, South Carolina, 238, 1856. Cherokees. Crogan, 1760, in Massachusetts History Soci Calls, 4th. Series, 9, 372, 1871. Cherokees. Campbell, 1761, Ibid, 416. Cherokees. Evans, 1755, in Gregg, Old Chiraz, 15. 1867. Cherokees. Treaty of 1722, Vide Drake, Book of. Indians, Book 4, 32, 1848. Cherokees. Weiser, 1748, Vide Kaufman, Western. Pennsylvania, Appendix, 18, 1851. Chiracs. Randolph, 1699, in Rivers, South Carolina, 449. 1856. Kyrakis. Writer about 1825, Annals de la Prop. De la FOI. 2, 384, 1841. Karakis. Document of 1748, New York Document Colonel History. X, 143, 1858. Kriakis. Pike, Travels, 173, 1811, misprint. Transposed. Shanaki. Gatshet, Caddo MS, Bureau AM. Ethn, 1882, Caddo. Name. Sean Knack. Marcy, Red River, 273, 1854, Wichita name. Shanaki. Gatshet, Fox MS, Bureau AM. Ethn. 1882, Fox. Name, plural form, Shanakiak. Shayich. Gatshet, Ka M.S., Bur A.M. Ethn, 1878, Ka. Name. Salugos. Cox, Carolina, 22, 1741. Tkok. Gatshet, Tonkawa M.S., Bur A.M. Ethn, 1882, Tonkawa. Name, Chalku. Tsurokiek. Gatshet, Wichita M.S., Bur A.M. Ethn, 1882. Wichita name, Cherokeeish. Chatakes. La Salle, 1682, 
in Margrie, 2, 197, 1877, misprint. Salakis. Gallatin, Trans A.M. Antique, S.O.C., 2, 90, 1836. Salaki. Schoolcraft, Notes on Iroquois, 310, 1847. T.S. Eloki. Morgan, Ancient Society, 113. 1878. Skerakizen. Wrangell, Ethn. Nacrichton, 13, 1839, German form. Sulaki. Grayson, Creek M.S., Burr A.M. Ethn, 1885. Creek name, plural form, Salgol G.I. or. Salgol G.I., Mooney. Seraki. Earlsperger, Fide Gatshet, Creek. Migration Legend, I, 26, 1884. Sulukis. Rafinesque, A.M. Nations, I, 123, 1836. Salukans. Rafinesque, in Marshall, Kentucky, I, 23. 1824. Zulokans. Talajou. Heckwelder, 1819, Indian Nations, 48, reprint of 1876, traditional. Delaware name, singular, Talij or Elij. See preceding explanation. Talajui. Alagewi. Aleg. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, v. 133, 1855. Colden, Map, 1727, Fide Schoolcraft, Ibid. 3, 525, 1853. Alajui. Schoolcraft, Ibid, V. 133, 1855. Allegans. Colden, 1727, quoted in Schoolcraft, Notes on. Iroquois, 147, 1847. Aleganus. Rafinesque, in Marshall, Kentucky, I, 34, 1824. Allegans. Colden, Map, 1727, Fide Schoolcraft, Notes. On Iroquois, 305, 1847. Allegui. Squire, in Beach, Indian Miscellany, 26, 1877. Alley. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, v. 133, 1855. Eliowes. Keen, in Stanford's Compendium, 500. 1878. Talagans. Rafinesque, in Marshall, Kentucky, I, 28, 1824. Talaga. Brinton, Wallam Olam, 201, 1885. Talajwi. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, 2, 36, 1852. Talagui. Rafinesque, Fide Mercer, Lenape Stone, 90. 1885. Talagui. Schoolcraft, Notes on Iroquois, 310, 1847. Taulike. Brinton, Wallam Olam, 230, 1885. Kitawagi, plural. Ani Kitawagi. See preceding. Explanation. Kutawa. Vogandi, Map, Parti de. El Amarique, Septentrionale 1755. Gatua. Gatshet, Creek Migration Legend, I, 28. 1884. Gatichwa. Katua, plural. Katawaji. Katawagas. Haywood, Natural and Aboriginal Tennessee, 233. 1823. Kittawa. Brinton, Wallam Olam, 16, 1885, Delaware name. Katuwal. Apalmut, 1791, Fide Brinton, Ibid, 16. Mahican name. Oyata Girono. Hewitt, Oral Information, Iroquois, Mohawk, name. See preceding. Explanation. Ojadagakroin. Livingston, 1720, 
in New York Document Colonel. History, v. 567, 1855. On the Dienwes. Bleeker, 1701, Ibid, 4, 918, 1854. Oyadak Wiser, 1753, Ibid, 6, 795, 1855. Oyadagarines. Letter of 1713, Ibid, v. 386, 1855, incorrectly stated to be the Flatheads, I. E. Either Catawbas or Choctaws. Oyadijono. Gatchet, Seneca M.S., 1882, Bur A.M. Ethn. Seneca Name. Oyeda, Goono. Morgan, League of Iroquois. 337, 1851. Oyuda. Schoolcraft, Notes on Iroquois, 448, 1847, Seneca. Name. Yawada, Yorok No. Gatshet, Creek Migration. Legend, 28, 1884, Wyandot Name. Wyada. Ibid, Seneca Name. Wiyauda. Schoolcraft, Notes on Iroquois. 253, 1847. Watayoronan. Hewitt, Wyandot M.S. 1893, Bur A.M. Ethn. Wyandot Name. Ricka Hawkins. Letterer. 1672, Discoveries, 26, Reprint of 1891, see preceding. Explanation. Ricka Hawkins. Map, Ibid. Rekahikrians. Drake, Book of Indians, Book 4, 22, 1848. From Old Virginia Documents. Rechahekrians. Rafinesque, in Marshall, Kentucky. I, 36, 1824. Mantarin. Gatshet, Catawba M.S., 1881, Bur A.M. Ethn. Catawba Name. See preceding. Explanation. Enterironan. Potier. Racines Hurons et de Grammaire, M.S., 1751, Wyandot Names. The first. According to Hewitt, is equivalent to ridge, or mountain. People. Okia Terraronan. Tquentiuhani. Beecham, in Journal A.M. Folklore, v. 225. 1892, given as the Onondaga name and rendered, people of A. Beautiful red color. Canoga Cole. Fontanito, about 1575. Memoir, translated in French history calls, 2, 257, 1875, rendered. Wicked people. 2, mobile and trade language, page 16 this trade jargon, based upon Choctaw, but borrowing also from all the neighboring dialects and even from the more northern Algonquian languages. Was spoken and understood among all the tribes of the Gulf states, probably as far west as Matagorda Bay and northward along both banks of the Mississippi to the Algonquian frontier about the entrance of the Ohio. It was called Mobilien by the French, from Mobile, the great trading center of the Gulf region. Along the Mississippi it was sometimes known also as the Chickasaw trade language, the Chickasaw being a dialect of the Choctaw language proper. Jeffreys, in 1761, compares this jargon in its uses to the lingua franca of the Levant. And it was evidently by the aid of this intertribal medium that the Soto's interpreter from Tampa Bay could converse with all the tribes they met until they reached the Mississippi. Some of the names used by Fontanito about 1575 for the tribes northward from Apalachee Bay seem to be derived from this source, as in later times were the names of the other tribes of the Gulf region, without regard to linguistic affinities. Including among others the Tensa, Tunica, Atacapa, and Shedamasha, representing as many different linguistic stocks. In his report upon the southwestern tribes in 1805, Sibley says that the Mobilian was spoken in addition to their native languages by all the Indians who had come from the east side of the Mississippi. Among those so using it he names the Alabama, Appalachie, Biloxi, Shaktu, Pecana, Pascagula, Tensa, and Tunica. 
Woodward, writing from Louisiana more than 50 years later, says, There is yet a language the Texas Indians call the Mobilean tongue, that has been the trading language of almost all the tribes that have inhabited the country. I know white men that now speak it. There is a man now living near me that is fifty years of age, raised in Texas, that speaks the language well. It is a mixture of Creek, Choctaw, Chickasay, Neches, Natchez, and Aplash, Appalachie, Reminiscences, 79. For further information see also Gatshet, Creek Migration Legend, and Sibley, Report. The Mobilean trade jargon was not unique of its kind. In America, as in other parts of the world, the common necessities of intercommunication have resulted in the formation of several such mongrel dialects, prevailing, sometimes over wide areas. In some cases, also, the language of a predominant tribe serves as the common medium for all the tribes of a particular region. In South America we find the Lingoa Geral, based upon the Tupi language, understood for everyday purposes by all the tribes of the immense central region from Guiana to Paraguay, including almost the whole Amazon basin. On the northwest coast we find the well-known Chinook jargon, which takes its name from a small tribe formerly residing at the mouth of the Columbia, in common use among all the tribes from California far up into Alaska, and eastward to the Great Divide of the Rocky Mountains. In the southwest the Navajo Apache language is understood by nearly all the Indians of Arizona and New Mexico, while on the plains the Sioux language in the north and the Comanche in the south hold almost the same position. In addition to these we have also the noted sign language, a gesture system used and perfectly understood as a fluent means of communication among all the hunting tribes of the plains from the Saskatchewan to the Rio Grande. 3. Dialects page 17 The linguistic affinity of the Cherokee and Northern Iroquoian dialects, although now well established, is not usually obvious on the surface, but requires a close analysis of words. With a knowledge of the laws of phonetic changes, to make it appear. The superficial agreement is perhaps most apparent between the Mohawk and the Eastern, Lower, Cherokee dialects, as both of these lack the labials entirely and use R instead of L. In the short table given below the Iroquois words are taken, with slight changes in the alphabet used, from Hewitt's manuscripts. The Cherokee from those of the author. Mohawk. Cherokee. Eastern. Person. Ongwi. Yunwi. Fire. Atsiare. Atsira, Atsi La. Water. On. Awa, Ama. Stone. Oninya. Nunyu. Arrow. Kanan. Kuni. Pipe. Kananawan. Canon no. Hand, arm. Oya. Yua e. Milk. Anenta. Anuntii. Five. Whisk. Hiski. Tobacco. Tkaru. Tuscarora. Saru, Salu. Fish. Atkanta. Utsudi. Ghost. Oskena. Asjina. Snake. Enetan. Inadu. Comparison of Cherokee dialects. Eastern, lower. Middle. Western, upper. Fire. ATSIRA. ATSI law. ATSI law. Water. Awa. AMA. AMA. Dog. GIRE. GI Lee. GI Lee. Hair. Gitsu. Gitsu. Gitlu. Hawk. TSA Nuwa. TSA Nuwa. TLA Nuwa. Leech. Tsanuasai. Tsanuasai. Tlainuasai. Bat. TSA Weha. TSA Meha. TLA Meha. Panther. Tsunta TSI. Tsunta TSI. Tlunta TSI. J. Tsaiku. Tsaiku. Tlaiku. Martin, Bird. Satsu.
Tsutsu. Tlutlu. War Club. Atasu. Atasu. Atasi. Heart. Bunahu. Bunahu. Anawi. Where? Ga Tsu. Ga Tsu. Hot Lu. How much? Hungu. Hungu. Hila Gu. Ki. Stugi Sti. Stugi Sti. Stui Sti. I pick it up, long. Tsinaji Yu. Tsinaji Yu. Sign Yu. My father. Ajita Ta. Ajita Ta. Ida Ta. My mother. Agitsi. Agitsi. Etsi. My father's father. Ajinaya Sai. Ajinaya Sai. Enaya Sai. My mother's father. Ajidu 2. Ajidu 2. Edu 2. It will be noted that the eastern and middle dialects are about the same. Excepting for the change of L to R, and the entire absence of the labial M from the eastern dialect, while the western differs considerably from the others, particularly in the greater frequency of the liquid L and the softening of the guttural G. The changes tending to render it the most musical of all the Cherokee dialects. It is also the standard literary dialect. In addition to these three principal dialects there are some peculiar forms and expressions in use by a few individuals which indicate the former existence of one or more other dialects now too far extinct to be reconstructed. As in most other tribes, the ceremonial forms used by the priesthood are so filled with archaic and figurative expressions as to be almost unintelligible to the laity. 4. Iroquoian Tribes and Migrations, p. The Iroquoian stock, taking its name from the celebrated Iroquois Confederacy, consisted formerly of from 15 to 20 tribes, speaking nearly as many different dialects, and including, among others, the following. Wyandot, or Huron. Ontario. Canada. Tianantati, or Tobacco Nation. Adiwan Darren, or Neutral Nation. Tohotenrat. Wenrorono. Mohawk. Iroquois, or Five Nations, New York. Oneida. Onondaga. Cayuga. Seneca. Erie. Northern Ohio, etc. Conestoga, or Susquehanna. Southern Pennsylvania and Maryland. Nottoway. Southern. Virginia. Maharan. Tuscarora. Eastern North Carolina. Cherokee. Western Carolina, etc. Tradition and history alike point to this T. Lawrence region as the early home of this stock. Upon this point all authorities concur. Says Hale, in his paper on Indian migrations, p. 4. The constant tradition of the Iroquois represents their ancestors as emigrants from the region north of the Great Lakes, where they dwelt in early times with their Huron brethren. This tradition is recorded with much particularity by Cadwallader Colden, Surveyor General of New York, who in the early part of the last century composed his well-known History of the Five Nations. It is told in a somewhat different form by David Cusick, the Tuscarora historian, in his Sketches of Ancient History of the Six Nations, and it is repeated by Mr. L. H. Morgan in his now classical work, The League of the Iroquois, for which he procured his information chiefly among the Senecas. Finally, as we learn from the narrative of the Wyandotte Indian, Peter Clark, in his book entitled Origin and Traditional History of the Wyandots, the belief of the Hurons accords in this respect with that of the Iroquois. Both point alike to the country immediately north of the St. Lawrence, and especially to that portion of it lying east of Lake Ontario, as the early home of the Huron-Iroquois nations. Nothing is known of the traditions of the Conestoga or the Nottoway, but the tradition of the Tuscarora, as given by Cusick and other authorities, makes them a direct offshoot from the northern Iroquois, with whom they afterward reunited. The traditions of the Cherokee also, as we have seen, bring them from the north, thus completing the cycle. The striking fact has become evident that the course of migration of the Huron-Cherokee family has been from the northeast to the southwest, that is, from eastern Canada, 
on the lower St. Lawrence, to the mountains of northern Alabama. Hale, Indian Migrations, page 11. The retirement of the northern Iroquoian tribes from the St. Lawrence region was due to the hostility of their Algonquian neighbors, by whom the Hurons and their allies were forced to take refuge about Georgian Bay and the head of Lake Ontario, while the Iroquois proper retreated to central New York. In 1535 Cartier found the shores of the river from Quebec to Montreal occupied by an Iroquoian people, but on the settlement of the country seventy years later the same region was found in possession of Algonquian tribes. The Confederation of the Five Iroquois Nations, probably about the year 1540, enabled them to check the Algonquian invasion and to assume the offensive. Linguistic and other evidence shows that the separation of the Cherokee from the parent stock must have far antedated this period. 5. Wallamolam, p. The name signifies, red score, from the Delaware Wallam, painted, more particularly, painted red, and Olam, a score, tally mark. The Wallam Olam was first published in 1836 in a work entitled, The American Nations, by Constantine Samuel Raffinesque, a versatile and voluminous, but very erratic, French scholar, who spent the latter half of his life in this country. Dying in Philadelphia in 1840. He asserted that it was a translation of a manuscript in the Delaware language, which was an interpretation of an ancient sacred metrical legend of the Delawares, recorded in pictographs cut upon wood. Obtained in 1820 by a medical friend of his among the Delawares then living in central Indiana. He says himself, these actual olam were first obtained in 1820 as a reward for a medical cure, deemed a curiosity, and were unexplicable. In 1822 were obtained from another individual the songs annexed thereto in the original language, but no one could be found by me able to translate them. I had therefore to learn the language since, by the help of Zeisberger, Heckwelder, and a manuscript dictionary, on purpose to translate them, which I only accomplished in 1833. On account of the unique character of the alleged Indian record and Raffinesque's own lack of standing among his scientific contemporaries, but little attention was paid to the discovery until Brinton took up the subject a few years ago. After a critical sifting of the evidence from every point of view he arrived at the conclusion that the work is a genuine native production, although the manuscript rendering is faulty. Partly from the white scribe's ignorance of the language and partly from the Indian narrator's ignorance of the meaning of the archaic forms. Brinton's edition, Q. V., published from Raffinesque's manuscript, gives the legend in triplicate form, pictograph, Delaware, an English translation, with notes and glossary, and a valuable ethnologic introduction by Brinton himself. It is not known that any of the original woodcut pictographs of the Wallamolam are now in existence, although a statement of Raffinesque implies that he had seen them. As evidence of the truth of his statement, however, we have the fact that precisely similar pictographic series cut upon birch bark, each pictograph representing a line or couplet of a sacred metrical recitation, are now known to be common among the Ojibwe, Menomini, and other northern tribes. In 1762 a Delaware prophet recorded his visions in hieroglyphics cut upon a wooden stick, and about the year 1827 a Kickapoo reformer adopted the same method to propagate a new religion among the tribes. One of these, prayer sticks, is now in the National Museum, being all that remains of a large basketful delivered to a missionary in Indiana by a party of Kickapoo Indians in 1830, see plate and description, pages 665, 697 E. B. Seek. In the author's Ghost Dance Religion, 14th Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology. 6. Fish River, P. Namisi Sipu, Heckwelder, Indian Nations, 49, or Namasipi, Wallam Olam, page 198. Deceived by a slight similarity of sound, Heckwelder makes this river identical with the Mississippi, but as Schoolcraft shows, notes on Iroquois, p. 316, the true name of the Mississippi is simply Mississippi, Great River, and Fish River, would be a most inappropriate name for such a turbulent current, where only the coarser species can live. The mere fact that there can be a question of identity among experts familiar with Indian nomenclature would indicate that it was not one of the larger streams. Although Heckwelder makes the Allegheny, as he prefers to call them, 
flee down the Mississippi after their final defeat, the Wallamolam Chronicle says only, all the Talega go south. It was probably a gradual withdrawal, rather than a sudden and concerted flight, see Hale, Indian Migrations, pages 19-22. 7. First Appearance of Whites, p. It is possible that this may refer to one of the earlier adventurers who coasted along the North Atlantic in the first decades after the discovery of America, among whom were Sebastian Cabot, in 1498, Verrazano, in 1524, and Gomez, in 1525. As these voyages were not followed up by permanent occupation of the country it is doubtful if they made any lasting impression upon Indian tradition. The author has chosen to assume, with Brinton and Raffinesque, that the Wallamolam reference is to the settlement of the Dutch at New York and the English in Virginia soon after 1600. 8. De Soto's Route, p. On May 30, 1539, Hernando de Soto, of Spain, with 600 armed men and 213 horses, landed at Tampa Bay, on the west coast of Florida, in search of gold. After more than four years of hardship and disappointed wandering from Florida to the Great Plains of the West and back again to the Mississippi, where De Soto died and his body was consigned to the Great River, 311 men. All that were left of the expedition, arrived finally at Panuco, in Mexico, on September 10, 1543. For the history of this expedition, the most important ever undertaken by Spain within eastern United States, we have four original authorities. First is the very brief, but evidently truthful, Spanish, report of Biedma, an officer of the expedition, presented to the king in 1544, immediately after the return to Spain. Next in order, but of first importance for detail and general appearance of reliability, is the narrative of an anonymous Portuguese cavalier of the expedition, commonly known as the Gentleman of Elvis. Originally published in the Portuguese language in 1557. Next comes the Spanish narrative of Garcilaso, written, but not published, in 1587. Unlike the others, the author was not an eyewitness of what he describes, but made up his account chiefly from the oral recollections of an old soldier of the expedition more than forty years after the event. This information being supplemented from papers written by two other soldiers of De Soto. As might be expected, the Garcilaso narrative, although written in flowery style, abounds in exaggeration and trivial incident, and compares unfavorably with the other accounts, while probably giving more of the minor happenings. The fourth original account is an unfinished, Spanish, report by Rangel, secretary of the expedition, written soon after reaching Mexico, and afterward incorporated with considerable change by Oviedo. In his, Historia Natural y General de las Indias. As this fourth narrative remained unpublished until 1851 and has never been translated, it has hitherto been entirely overlooked by the commentators, excepting Windsor, who notes it incidentally. In general it agrees well with the Elvis narrative and throws valuable light upon the history of the expedition. The principal authorities, while preserving a general unity of narrative, differ greatly in detail, especially in estimates of numbers and distances, frequently to such an extent that it is useless to attempt to reconcile their different statements. In general the gentleman of Elvis is most moderate in his expression, while Biedma takes a middle ground and Garcilaso exaggerates greatly. Thus the first named gives De Soto 600 men, Biedma makes the number 620, while Garcilaso says 1000. At a certain stage of the journey the Portuguese gentleman gives De Soto 700 Indians as escort, Biedma says 800, while Garcilaso makes it 8,000. At the Battle of Mavilla the Elvis account gives 18 Spaniards and 2,500 Indians killed, Biedma says 20 Spaniards killed, without giving an estimate of the Indians, while Garcilaso has 82 Spaniards and over 11,000 Indians killed. In distances there is as great discrepancy. Thus Biedma makes the distance from Guaxul to Chiaja four days, Garcilaso has it six days, and Elvis seven days. As to the length of an average day's march we find it estimated all the way from, four leagues, more or less, Garcilaso, to, every day seven or eight leagues, Elvis. In another place the Elvis chronicler states that they usually made five or six leagues a day through inhabited territories, but that in crossing uninhabited regions, 
as that between Kanasagua and Chiaha. They marched every day as far as possible for fear of running out of provisions. One of the most glaring discrepancies appears in regard to the distance between Chiaha and Kast. Both the Portuguese writer and Garcilaso put Chiaha upon an island, a statement which in itself is at variance with any present conditions. But while the former makes the island a fraction over a league in length the latter says that it was five leagues long. The next town was Kast, which Garcilaso puts immediately at the lower end of the same island while the Portuguese gentleman represents it as seven days distant, although he himself has given the island the shorter length. Notwithstanding a deceptive appearance of exactness, especially in the Elvis and Rangel narratives, which have the form of a daily journal, the conclusion is irresistible that much of the record was made after dates had been forgotten. And the sequence of events had become confused. Considering all the difficulties, dangers, and uncertainties that constantly beset the expedition, it would be too much to expect the regularity of a ledger, and it is more probable that the entries were made, not from day to day. But at irregular intervals as opportunity presented at the several resting places. The story must be interpreted in the light of our later knowledge of the geography and ethnology of the country traversed. Each of the three principal narratives has passed through translations and later editions of more or less doubtful fidelity to the original, the English edition in some cases being itself a translation from an earlier French or Dutch translation. English-speaking historians of the expedition have usually drawn their material from one or the other of these translations, without knowledge of the original language. Of the etymologies of the Indian names or the relations of the various tribes mentioned, or of the general system of Indian geographic nomenclature. One of the greatest errors has been the attempt to give in every case a fixed local habitation to a name which in some instances is not a proper name at all. And in others is merely a descriptive term or a duplicate name occurring at several places in the same tribal territory. Thus Tali is simply the Creek word Taluwa, town, and not a definite place name as represented by a mistake natural in dealing through interpreters with an unknown Indian language. Talis and Talimuches are respectively Old Town and New Town in Creek, and there can be no certainty that the same names were applied to the same places a century later. Kanasagua is a corruption of a Cherokee name which occurs in at least three other places in the old Cherokee country in addition to the one mentioned in the narrative, and almost every old Indian local name was thus repeated several times. As in the case of such common names as Short Creek, Whitewater, Richmond, or Lexington among ourselves. The fact that only one name of the set has been retained on the map does not prove its identity with the town of the Old Chronicle. Again such loose terms as, a large river, a beautiful valley, have been assumed to mean something more definitely localized than the wording warrants. The most common error in translation has been the rendering of the Spanish, despoblado, as, desert. There are no deserts in the Gulf states, and the word means simply an uninhabited region, usually the debatable strip between two tribes. There have been many attempts to trace De Soto's route. As nearly every historian who has written of the southern states has given attention to this subject it is unnecessary to enumerate them all. Of some thirty works consulted by the author, in addition to the original narratives already mentioned, not more than two or three can be considered as speaking with any authority, the rest simply copying from these without investigation. The first attempt to locate the route definitely was made by Meek, Romantic Passages, etc., in 1839, reprinted in 1857, his conclusions being based upon his general knowledge of the geography of the region. In 1851 Pickett tried to locate the route, chiefly, he asserts, from Indian tradition as related by mixed bloods. How much dependence can be placed upon Indian tradition as thus interpreted three centuries after the event it is unnecessary to say. Both these writers have brought De Soto down the Kusa River, in which they have been followed without investigation by Irving, Shea and others, but none of these was aware of the existence of a Suwali tribe. Or correctly acquainted with the Indian nomenclature of the upper country, or of the Creek country as so well summarized by Gatchet in his Creek Migration Legend. They are also mistaken in assuming that only De Soto passed through the country, whereas we now know that several Spanish explorers and numerous French adventurers traversed the same territory. 
the latest expeditions of course being freshest in Indian memory. Jones in his De Soto's March Through Georgia simply dresses up the earlier statements in more literary style, sometimes changing surmises to positive assertions, without mentioning his authorities. Maps of the supposed route, all bringing De Soto down the Coosa instead of the Chattahoochee, have been published in Irving's Conquest of Florida, the Hacklet Society's edition of The Gentleman of Elva's Account. And in Buckingham Smith's translation of the same narrative, as well as in several other works. For the eastern portion, with which we have to deal, all of these are practically duplicates of one another. On several old Spanish and French maps the names mentioned in the narrative seem to have been set down merely to fill space, without much reference to the text of the chronicle. For a list and notices of principal writers who have touched upon this subject see the appendix to Shea's chapter on Ancient Florida, in Windsor's Narrative and Critical History of America, 2, Boston, 1886. We shall speak only of that part of the route which lay near the Cherokee Mountains. The first location which concerns us in the narrative is Cafetachiki, the town from which De Soto set out for the Cherokee country. The name appears variously as Cafetachiki, Rangel, Cafetachik, Biedma, Kofachiki, Garcileso, Cutafachiki, by transposition, Elvis, Kofatak, Bandera, Katafachik, Williams, and Kosatachiki, Miss Brint. Brooks MSS. And the Spaniards first heard of the region as Yupaha from a tribe farther to the south. The correct form appears to be that first given, which Gatshet, from later information than that quoted in his Creek Migration legend, makes a Hitchiti word about equivalent to Dogwood Town, from Kofi, Dogwood, Kofita, Dogwood Thicket. And Chiki, house, or collectively, town. McCulloch puts the town upon the headwaters of the Oak Mulgee, Williams locates it on the Chattahoochee, Gallatin on the Oconee or the Savannah, Meek and Monette, following him, probably in the fork of the Savannah and the Broad. Pickett, with Jones and others following him, at Silver Bluff on the east, north, bank of the Savannah, in Barnwell County, South Carolina, about 25 miles by water below the present Augusta. It will thus be seen that at the very outset of our inquiry the commentators differ by a distance equal to more than half the width of the state of Georgia. It will suffice here to say, without going into the argument, that the author is inclined to believe that the Indian town was on or near Silver Bluff, which was noted for its extensive ancient remains as far back as Bartram's time, Travels, 313. And where the noted George Galfin established a trading post in 1736. The original site has since been almost entirely worn away by the river. According to the Indians of Kafetachiki, the town, which was on the farther, north, bank of the stream, was two days' journey from the sea, probably by canoe. And the sailors with the expedition believed the river to be the same one that entered at Esti. Helena, which was a very close guess. The Spaniards were shown here European articles which they were told had been obtained from white men who had entered the river's mouth many years before. These they conjectured to have been the men with Elon, who had landed on that coast in 1520 and again in 1524. The town was probably the ancient capital of the Uchi Indians, who, before their absorption by the Creeks, held or claimed most of the territory on both banks of Savannah River from the Cherokee border to within about 40 miles of Savannah and westward to the Ogeechee and Kenichi Rivers, see Gatshet, Creek Migration Legend, 17-24. The country was already on the decline in 1540 from a recent fatal epidemic, but was yet populous and wealthy, and was ruled by a woman chief whose authority extended for a considerable distance. The town was visited also by Pardo in 1567 and again by Torres in 1628, when it was still a principal settlement, as rich in pearls as in De Soto's time, Brooks MSS, in the archives of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Somewhere in southern Georgia De Soto had been told of a rich province called Coca, Cusa, the Creek Country, toward the northwest. At Cafetachiki he again heard of it and of one of its principal towns called Chiaha, Chaha, as being twelve days inland. Although on first hearing of it he had kept on in the other direction in order to reach Cafetachiki, he now determined to go there, and made the queen a prisoner to compel her to accompany him a part of the way as guide. Coca province was, though he did not know it, almost due west, 
and he was in haste to reach it in order to obtain corn, as his men and horses were almost worn out from hunger. It is apparent, however, that the unwilling queen, afraid of being carried beyond her own territories, led the Spaniards by a roundabout route in the hope of making her escape, as she finally did. Or perhaps of leaving them to starve and die in the mountains, precisely the trick attempted by the Indians upon another Spanish adventurer, Coronado, entering the Great Plains from the Pacific coast in search of golden treasure in the same year. Instead therefore of recrossing the river to the westward, the Spaniards, guided by the captive queen, took the direction of the north, La Vuelta del Norte, Biedma, and, after passing through several towns subject to the queen, came in seven days to the province of Shalak, Elvis. Elvis, Garcilaso, and Rangel agree upon the spelling, but the last named makes the distance only two days from Cafetachiki. Biedma does not mention the country at all. The trifling difference in statement of five days in seven need not trouble us, as Biedma makes the whole distance from Cafetachiki to Zwala eight days, and from Guaxal to Chiaha four days, where Elvis makes it, respectively. Twelve and seven days. Shalak is, of course, Cherokee, as all writers agree, and De Soto was now probably on the waters of Kiowi River, the eastern head stream of Savannah River, where the lower Cherokee had their towns. Finding the country bare of corn, he made no stay. Proceeding six days farther they came next to Guaquili, where they were kindly received. This name occurs only in the Rangel narrative, the other three being entirely silent in regard to such a halting place. The name has a Cherokee sound, Wakili, but if we allow for a dialectic substitution of L for R it may be connected with such Catawba names as Congari, Watari, and Sujuri. It was probably a village of minor importance. They came next to the province of Zuala, or Zuala, as the Elvis narrative more often has it. In a French edition it appears as Choala. Rangel makes it three days from Guaquili or five from Shalak. Elvis also makes it five days from Shalak, while Biedma makes it eight days from Cafetachiki, a total discrepancy of four days from the last named place. Biedma describes it as a rough mountain country, thinly populated, but with a few Indian houses, and thinks that in these mountains the great river of Espiritu Santo, the Mississippi, had its birth. Rangel describes the town as situated in a plain in the vicinity of rivers and in a country with greater appearance of gold mines than any they had yet seen. The Portuguese gentleman describes it as having very little corn, and says that they reached it from Cafetachiki over a hilly country. In his final chapter he states that the course from Cafetachiki to this place was from south to north, thus agreeing with Biedma. According to Garcilaso, pp. 136 to 137, it was fifty leagues by the road along which the Spaniards had come from Cafetachiki to the first valley of the province of Zuala, with but few mountains on the way. And the town itself was situated close under a mountain, a la falda de una sierra, beside a small but rapid stream which formed the boundary of the territory of Cafetachiki in this direction. From Rangel we learn that on the same day after leaving this place for the next province, the Spaniards crossed a very high mountain ridge, Buna Sierra Muialta. Without mentioning the name, Pickett, 1851, refers to Zwala as a town in the present Habersham County, Georgia, but gives no reason for this opinion. Ryan Irving, of the same date, arguing from a slight similarity of name, think it may have been on the site of a former Cherokee town, Kualachi, on the head of Chattahoochee River in Georgia. The resemblance, however, is rather far-fetched, and moreover this same name is found on Kiowi River in South Carolina. Jones, de Soto in Georgia, 1880, interprets Garcilaso's description to refer to Nacuchi Valley, Habersham County, which should be White County, and the neighboring Mount Yona, overlooking the fact that the same description of mountain, valley, and swift flowing stream might apply equally well to any one of twenty other localities in this southern mountain country. With direct contradiction Garcilaso says that the Spaniards rested here fifteen days because they found provisions plentiful, while the Portuguese gentleman says that they stopped but two days because they found so little corn. Rangel makes them stop four days and says they found abundant provisions and assistance. However that may have been, 
there can be no question of the identity of the name. As the province of Shalak is the country of the Cherokee, so the province of Zwala is the territory of the Suwali or Sara Indians, better known later as Chira, who lived in early times in the Piedmont country about the head of Broad River in North Carolina, adjoining the Cherokee, who still remember them under the name of Ani Sowali. A principal trail to their country from the west led up Swananoa River and across the gap which, for this reason, was known to the Cherokee as Suwalinana, Suwali Trail, corrupted by the whites to Swananoa. Letterer, who found them in the same general region in 1670, calls this gap the Swala Pass and the neighboring mountains the Sara Mountains, which, he says, the Spaniards make Swala. They afterward shifted to the north and finally returned and were incorporated with the Catawba, C. Muni, Suan Tribes of the East, Bulletin of the Bureau of Ethnology, 1894. Up to this point the Spaniards had followed a north course from Cofetachiki, Biedma and Elvis, but they now turned to the west, Elvis, final chapter. On the same day on which they left Swala they crossed a very high mountain ridge, and descended the next day to a wide meadow bottom, savanna, through which flowed a river which they concluded was a part of the Espiritu Santo. The Mississippi, Rangel. Biedma speaks of crossing a mountain country and mentions the river, which he also says they thought to be a tributary of the Mississippi. Garcilaso says that this portion of their route was through a mountain country without inhabitants, Despoblado, and the Portuguese gentleman describes it as being over very rough and high ridges. In five days of such travel, for here, for a wonder, all the narratives agree, they came to Guaxol. This is the form given by Garcilaso and the gentleman of Elvis, Biedma has Guajula, and Rangel Guasali or Guajuli. The translators and commentators have given us such forms as Guachul, Quaxul, Quaxula, and Quexail. According to the Spanish method of writing Indian words the name was pronounced Washul or Wajuli, which has a Cherokee sound, although it cannot be translated. Buckingham Smith, Narratives, p. 222, hints that the Spaniards may have changed Guasali to Guajul, because of the similarity of the latter form to a town name in southern Spain. Such corruptions of Indian names are of frequent occurrence. Garcilaso speaks of it as a province and town, while Biedma and Rangel call it simply a town, Pueblo. Before reaching this place the Indian queen had managed to make her escape. All the chroniclers tell of the kind reception which the Spaniards met here, but the only description of the town itself is from Garcilaso. Who says that it was situated in the midst of many small streams which came down from the mountains roundabout, that it consisted of three hundred houses, which is probably an exaggeration. Though it goes to show that the village was of considerable size, and that the chief's house, in which the principal officers were lodged, was upon a high hill, on Cerro Alto. Around which was a roadway, Pasiadero, wide enough for six men to walk abreast. By the chief's house, we are to understand the townhouse, while from various similar references in other parts of the narrative there can be no doubt that the hill upon which it stood was an artificial mound. In modern Spanish writing such artificial elevations are more often called lomas, but these early adventurers may be excused for not noting the distinction. Issuing from the mountains round about the town were numerous small streams, which united to form the river which the Spaniards henceforth followed from here down to Chiaja, where it was as large as the Guadalquivir at Sevilla, Garcilaso. Deceived by the occurrence, in the Portuguese narrative, of the name Canasagua, which they assumed could belong in but one place, earlier commentators have identified this river with the Cusa. Pickett putting Guaxol somewhere upon its upper waters, while Jones improves upon this by making the site identical, or very nearly so, with Kusawati Old Town, in the southeastern corner of Murray County, Georgia. As we shall show, however, the name in question was duplicated in several states, and a careful study of the narratives, in the light of present knowledge of the country, makes it evident that the river was not the Kusa, but the Chattahoochee. Turning our attention once more to Zwala, the most northern point reached by De Soto, we have seen that this was the territory of the Suwala or Sara Indians, in the eastern foothills of the Alleghenies. About the headwaters of Broad and Catawba rivers, in North Carolina. 
As the Spaniards turned here to the west they probably did not penetrate far beyond the present South Carolina boundary. The very high mountain ridge, which they crossed immediately after leaving the town was in all probability the main chain of the Blue Ridge, while the river which they found after descending to the savannah on the other side, and which they guessed to be a branch of the Mississippi, was almost as certainly the upper part of the French Broad, the first stream flowing in an opposite direction from those which they had previously encountered. They may have struck it in the neighborhood of Hendersonville or Brevard, there being two gaps, passable for vehicles, in the main ridge eastward from the first named town. The uninhabited mountains through which they struggled for several days on their way to Chiaha and Coca, the creek country, in the southwest were the broken ridges in which the Savannah and the Little Tennessee have their sources. And if they followed an Indian trail they may have passed through the Rabin Gap, near the present Clayton, Georgia. Guaxil, and not Zwala, as Jones supposes, was in the Coochie Valley, in the present White County, Georgia, and the small streams which united to form the river down which the Spaniards proceeded to Chiaha were the headwaters of the Chattahoochee. The hill upon which the townhouse was built must have been the Great Nakuchi Mound, the most prominent landmark in the valley, on the east bank of Saudi Creek, in White County, about twelve miles northwest of Clarksville. This is the largest mound in Upper Georgia, with the exception of the noted Etowah Mound near Cartersville, and is the only one which can fill the requirements of the case. There are but two considerable mounds in western North Carolina, that at Franklin and a smaller one on Oconolufti River, on the present East Cherokee Reservation, and as both of these are on streams flowing away from the creek country. This fact alone would bar them from consideration. The only large mounds in Upper Georgia are this one at Nakuchi in the group on the Etowah River, near Cartersville. The largest of the Etowah group is some 50 feet in height and is ascended on one side by means of a roadway about 50 feet wide at the base and narrowing gradually to the top. Had this been the mound of the narrative it is hardly possible that the chronicler would have failed to notice also the two other mounds of the group or the other one on the opposite side of the river. Each of these being from 20 to 25 feet in height, to say nothing of the great ditch a quarter of a mile in length which encircles the group. Moreover, Cartersville is at some distance from the mountains, and the Etowah River at this point does not answer the description of a small rushing mountain stream. There is no considerable mound at Kusawati or in any of the three counties adjoining. The Nakuchi Mound has been cleared and cultivated for many years and does not now show any appearance of a roadway up the side, but from its great height we may be reasonably sure that some such means of easy ascent existed in ancient times. In other respects it is the only mound in the whole upper country which fills the conditions. The valley is one of the most fertile spots in Georgia and numerous ancient remains give evidence that it was a favorite center of settlement in early days. At the beginning of the modern historic period it was held by the Cherokee, who had there a town called Nakuchi, but their claim was disputed by the Creeks. The gentleman of Elvis states that Guaxul was subject to the Queen of Kafatachiki, but this may mean only that the people of the two towns or tribes were in friendly alliance. The modern name is pronounced Nagats by the Cherokee, who say, however, that it is not of their language. The terminal may be the Creek Uchi, small, or it may have a connection with the name of the Uchi Indians. From Guaxo the Spaniards advanced to Canasoga, Rangel, or Canasagua, Elvis, one or two days march from Guaxo, according to one or the other authority. Garcilaso and Biedma do not mention the name. As Garcilaso states that from Guaxul to Chiaha the march was down the bank of the same river, which we identify with the Chattahoochee, the town may have been in the neighborhood of the present Gainesville. As we have seen, however, it is unsafe to trust the estimates of distance. Arguing from the name, Meek infers that the town was about Conasauga River in Murray County, and that the river down which they marched to reach it was, no doubt the Etowah. Although to reach the first named river from the Etowah it would be necessary to make another sharp turn to the north. From the same coincidence Pickett puts it on the Conasauga, in the modern county of Murray, Georgia, while Jones, on the same theory, locates it, at or near the junction of the Conasauga and Kusawati rivers, in originally Cass. Now Gordon County. Here his modern geography as well as his ancient is at fault, 
as the original Cass County is now Bartow, the name having been changed in consequence of a local dislike for General Cass. The whole theory of a march down the Coosa River rests upon this coincidence of the name. The same name however, pronounced Gansa G.I. by the Cherokee, was applied by them to at least three different locations within their old territory, while the one mentioned in the narrative would make the fourth. The others were, one, on Ustanaula River, opposite the mouth of the Conasauga, where afterward was New Dakota, in Gordon County, Georgia, two, on Kanasauga Creek, in McMinn County, Tennessee. Three, on Tecassegee River, about two miles above Webster, in Jackson County, North Carolina. At each of these places are remains of ancient settlement. It is possible that the name of Kennesaw Mountain, near Marietta, in Cobb County, Georgia, may be a corruption of Gansa G.I., and if so, the Kanasagua of the narrative may have been somewhere in this vicinity on the Chattahoochee. The meaning of the name is lost. On leaving Kanasagua they continued down the same river which they had followed from Guaxul, Garcilaso, and after traveling several days through an uninhabited, despoblado, country, Elvis, arrived at Chiaha, which was subject to the great chief of Coca, Elvis. The name is spelled Chiaha by Rangel and the gentleman of Elvis, Chiha by Biedma in the documentos, China by a misprint in an English rendering, and Ikayaha by Garcilaso. It appears as Chiha on an English map of 1762 reproduced in Windsor, Westward Movement, page 31, 1897. Gallatin spells it Akayaha, while Williams and Fairbanks, by misprint, make it Chiapa. According to both Rangel and Elvis the army entered it on the 5th of June, although the former makes it four days from Kanasagua, while the other makes it five. Biedma says it was four days from Guaxul, and, finally, Garcilaso says it was six days and thirty leagues from Guaxul and on the same river, which was, here at Chiaha, as large as the Guadalquivir at Sevilla. As we have seen, there is a great discrepancy in the statements of the distance from Cafetachiki to this point. All four authorities agree that the town was on an island in the river, along which they had been marching for some time, Garcilaso, Rangel. But while the Elvis narrative makes the island two crossbow shot in length above the town and one league in length below it, Garcilaso calls it a great island more than five leagues long. On both sides of the island the stream was very broad and easily waded, Elvis. Finding welcome and food for men and horses the Spaniards rested here nearly a month, June 5th to 28th, Rangel, 26 or 27 days, Biedma, 30 days, Elvis. In spite of the danger from attack De Soto allowed his men to sleep under trees in the open air, because it was very hot and the people should have suffered great extremity if it had not been so, Elvis. This in itself is evidence that the place was pretty far to the south, as it was yet only the first week in June. The town was subject to the chief of the great province of Coca, farther to the west. From here onward they began to meet palisade towns. On the theory that the march was down Kusa River, every commentator hitherto has located Chiaha at some point upon this stream either in Alabama or Georgia. Gallatin, 1836, says that it must have been on the Kusa, probably some distance below the site of New Dakota. He notes a similarity of sound between Akayaha and Ekoe, Itzai, a Cherokee town name. Williams, 1837, says that it was on Mobile, i.e., the Alabama or Lower Coosa River. Meek, 1839, says, There can be little doubt that Chiaha was situated but a short distance above the junction of the Coosa and Chattooga rivers, i.e., not far within the Alabama line. He notes the occurrence of a Chiaha, Chihaha, creek near Talladega, Alabama. In regard to the island upon which the town was said to have been situated he says, there is no such island now in the Coosa. It is probable that the Spaniards either mistook the peninsula formed by the junction of two rivers, the Coosa and Chituga, for an island, or that those two rivers were originally united so as to form an island near their present confluence. We have heard this latter supposition asserted by persons well acquainted with the country. Romantic Passages, page 222, 1857. Monette, 1846, puts it on Etowah branch of the Coosa, probably in Floyd County, Georgia. 
Pickett, 1851, followed in turn by Irving, Jones, and Shea, locates it at the site of the modern Rome. The island is interpreted to mean the space between the two streams above the confluence. Pickett, as has been stated, bases his statements chiefly or entirely upon Indian traditions as obtained from half-breeds or traders. How much information can be gathered from such sources in regard to events that transpired three centuries before may be estimated by considering how much an illiterate mountaineer of the same region might be able to tell concerning the founding of the Georgia colony. Pickett himself seems to have been entirely unaware of the later Spanish expeditions of Pardo and de Luna through the same country, as he makes no mention of them in his history of Alabama, but ascribes everything to de Soto. Concerning Chiaha he says, The most ancient Cherokee Indians, whose tradition has been handed down to us through old Indian traders, disagree as to the precise place, exclamation point. Where de Soto crossed the Ustanaula to get over into the town of Chiaha, some asserting that he passed over that river seven miles above its junction with the Etowah, and that he marched from thence down to Chiaha, which, all contend, lay immediately at the confluence of the two rivers. While other ancient Indians asserted that he crossed, with his army, immediately opposite the town. But this is not very important. Coupling the Indian traditions with the account by Garcilaso and that by the Portuguese eyewitness. We are inclined to believe the latter tradition that the expedition continued to advance down the western side of the Ustanaula until they halted in view of the mouth of the Etowa. De Soto, having arrived immediately opposite the great town of Chiaha, now the site of Rome, crossed the Ustanaula, etc., History of Alabama, page 23, reprint, 1896. He overlooks the fact that Chiaha was not a Cherokee town, but belonged to the province of Coca, i.e., the territory of the Creek Indians. A careful study of the four original narratives makes it plain that the expedition did not descend either the Ustanaula or the Etowa, and that consequently Chiaha could not have been at their junction, the present site of Rome. On the other hand the conclusion is irresistible that the march was down the Chattahoochee from its extreme head springs in the mountains, and that the Chiaha of the narrative was the lower creek town of the same name, more commonly known as Chiaha. Formerly on this river in the neighborhood of the modern city of Columbus, Georgia, while Cost, in the narrative the next adjacent town, was Casita, or Casita, of the same group of villages. The falls at this point mark the geologic break line where the river changes from a clear, swift current to a broad, slow-moving stream of the lower country. Attracted by the fisheries and the fertile bottom lands the lower creeks established here their settlement nucleus, and here, up to the beginning of the present century. They had within easy distance of each other on both sides of the river some fifteen towns, among which were Chiaha, Chaha, Kayahuchi, Little Chaha, and Casita, Casita. Most of these settlements were within what are now Muskogee and Chattahoochee counties, Georgia, and Lee and Russell counties, Alabama, see town list and map in Gatshet, Creek Migration Legend. Large mounds and other earthworks on both sides of the river in the vicinity of Columbus attest the importance of the site in ancient days. While the general appearance indicates that at times the adjacent low grounds were submerged or cut off by overflows from the main stream. A principal trail crossed here from the Okmulgee, passing by Tuskegee to the upper creek towns about the junction of the Coosa and Tallapoosa in Alabama. At the beginning of the present century this trail was known to the traders as De Soto's Trace, Woodward, Reminiscences, page 76. As the Indian towns frequently shift their position within a limited range on account of epidemics, freshets, or impoverishment of the soil, it is not necessary to assume that they occupied exactly the same sites in 1540 as in 1800. But only that as a group they were in the same general vicinity. Thus Casita itself was at one period above the falls and at a later period some eight miles below them. Both Casita and Chiaha were principal towns, with several branch villages. The time given as occupied on the march from Kanasagua to Chiaha would seem too little for the actual distance, but as we have seen, the chroniclers do not agree among themselves. We can easily believe that the Spaniards, buoyed up by the certainty of finding food and rest at their next halting place, 
made better progress along the smooth river trail than while blundering helplessly through the mountains at the direction of a most unwilling guide. If Kanesagwa was anywhere in the neighborhood of Kennesaw, in Cobb County, the time mentioned in the Elvis or Garcilaso narrative would probably have been sufficient for reaching Chiaha at the falls. The uninhabited country between the two towns was the neutral ground between the two hostile tribes, the Cherokee and the Creeks. And it is worth noting that Kennesaw Mountain was made a point on the boundary line afterward established between the two tribes through the mediation of the United States government. There is no large island in either the Coosa or the Chattahoochee, and we are forced to the conclusion that what the Chronicle describes as an island was really a portion of the bottom land temporarily cut off by backwater from a freshet. In a similar way, the slough, east of Flint River in Mitchell County, may have been formed by a shifting of the river channel. Two months later, in Alabama, the Spaniards reached a river so swollen by rains that they were obliged to wait six days before they could cross Elvis. Letterer, while crossing South Carolina in 1670, found his farther progress barred by a great lake, which he puts on his map as Ushery Lake, although there is no such lake in the state. But the mystery is explained by Lawson, who, in going over the same ground thirty years later, found all the bottom lands under water from a great flood, the Santee in particular being thirty-six feet above its normal level. As Lawson was a surveyor his figures may be considered reliable. The Ushery Lake of Letterer was simply an overflow of Catawba River. Flood water in the streams of Upper Georgia and Alabama would quickly be carried off, but would be apt to remain for some time on the more level country below the falls. According to information supplied by Mr. Thomas Robinson, an expert engineering authority familiar with the Lower Chattahoochee, there was formerly a large mound, now almost entirely washed away, on the eastern bank of the river. About nine miles below Columbus, while on the western or Alabama bank, a mile or two farther down, there is still to be seen another of nearly equal size. At extreme freshets both of these mounds were partly submerged. To the east of the former, known as the Indian Mound, the flood plain is a mile or two wide, and along the eastern side of the plain stretches a series of swamps or wooded sloughs, indicating an old river bed. All the plain between the present river and the sloughs is river-made land. The river bluff along by the mound on the Georgia side is from 20 to 30 feet above the present low-water surface of the stream. About a mile above the mound are the remains of what was known as Jenny's Island. At ordinary stages of the river no island is there. The eastern channel was blocked by government work some years ago, and the hole is filled up and now used as a cornfield. The island remains can be traced now, I think, for a length of half a mile, with a possible extreme width of 300 feet. This whole country, on both sides of the river, is full of Indian lore. I have mentioned both mounds simply to indicate that this portion of the river was an Indian locality, and have also stated the facts about the remains of Jenny's Island in order to give a possible clue to a professional who might study the ground. Letter, April 22, 1900 Chiaha was the first town of the province of Coca, the territory of the Coosa or Creek Indians. The next town mentioned, Cost, Elvis and Rangel, Costi, Biedma, or Acost, Garcilaso, was Casita, or Casita, as it was afterward known to the whites. While Garcilaso puts it at the lower end of the same island upon which Chiaha was situated, the Elvis narrative makes it seven days distant. The modern towns of Chaha and Casita were within a few miles of each other on the Chattahoochee, the former being on the western or Alabama side, while Casita, in 1799, was on the east or Georgia side about eight miles below the falls at Columbus, and in Chattahoochee County, which has given its capital the same name, Casita. From the general tone of the narrative it is evident that the two towns were near together in DeSoto's time, and it may be that the Elvis Chronicle confounded Casita with Kosati, a principal Upper Creek town. A short distance below the junction of the Coosa and Tallapoosa. At Cost they crossed the river and continued westward, through many towns subject to the cacique of Coca, Elvis, until they came to the great town of Coca itself. This was Coosa or Coosa, the ancient capital of the Upper Creeks. There were two towns of this name at different periods. 
1. Described by Adair in 1775 as, the great and old beloved town of refuge, Kusa, was on the east bank of Coosa River, a few miles southwest of the present Talladega, Alabama. The other, known as, Bold Coosa, and probably of more ancient origin, was on the west side of Alabama River, near the present site of Montgomery, see Gatchet, Creek Migration Legend. It was probably the latter which was visited by De Soto, and later on by De Luna, in 1559. Beyond Coca they passed through another creek town, apparently lower down on the Alabama, the name of which is variously spelled Atawa, Elvis, Force Translation, Itava, Elvis, Hacklet Society Translation, or Itaba, Ranjo. And which may be connected with Itawa, Etawa, or Hightower, the name of a former Cherokee settlement near the head of Etawa River in Georgia. The Cherokee regard this as a foreign name, and its occurrence in Upper Georgia, as well as in central Alabama, may help to support the tradition that the southern Cherokee border was formerly held by the Creeks. De Soto's route beyond the Cherokee country does not concern us except as it throws light upon his previous progress. In the 17th chapter the Elvis narrative summarizes that portion from the landing at Tampa Bay to a point in southern Alabama as follows, from the port de Spirito Santo to Appalach, which is about an hundred leagues. The governor went from east to west. And from Appalach to Kutafikiki, which are 430 leagues, from the southwest to the northeast, and from Kutafikiki to Zuala, which are about 250 leagues, from the south to the north. And from Zuala to Tascaluca, which are 250 leagues more, and 190 of them he traveled from east to west, to wit, to the province of Coca, and the other 60, from Coca to Tascaluca, from the north to the south. Chiska, Elvis and Rangel, the mountainous northern region in search of which men were sent from Chiaha to look for copper and gold, was somewhere in the Cherokee country of Upper Georgia or Alabama. The precise location is not material, as it is now known that native copper, in such condition as to have been easily workable by the Indians, occurs throughout the whole southern Allegheny region from about Anniston, Alabama, into Virginia. Notable finds of native copper have been made on the Upper Tallapoosa, in Cleburne County, Alabama, about Ducktown, in Polk County, Tennessee, and in southwestern Virginia, one nugget from Virginia weighing several pounds. From the appearance of ancient soapstone vessels which have been found in the same region there is even a possibility that the Indians had some knowledge of smelting, as the Spanish explorer surmised, oral information from Mr. W. H. Weed, U.S. Geological Survey we hear again of this province after De Soto had reached the Mississippi, and in one place Garcilaso seems to confound it with another province called Quizca, Rangel, or Quizquiz, Elvis and Biedma. The name has some resemblance to the Cherokee word Tsisqua, bird. 9. De Luna and Rogel, P. Jones, in his De Soto's March Through Georgia, incorrectly ascribed certain traces of ancient mining operations in the Cherokee country particularly on Valley River in North Carolina, to the followers of De Luna, who, in 1560, came with 300 Spanish soldiers into this region, and spent the summer in eager and laborious search for gold. Don Tristan De Luna, with 1500 men, landed somewhere about Mobile Bay in 1559 with the design of establishing a permanent Spanish settlement in the interior. But owing to a succession of unfortunate happenings the attempt was abandoned the next year. In the course of his wanderings he traversed the country of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Upper Creeks, as is shown by the names and other data in the narrative, but returned without entering the mountains or doing any digging, see Barcia. Enseo Cronologico, pp. 32-41, 1723, Windsor, Narrative and Critical History, 2, pages 257-259. In 1569 the Jesuit Rogel, called Father John Roger by Shea, began mission work among the South Carolina tribes inland from Santa Elena, about Port Royal. The mission, which at first promised well, was abandoned next year, owing to the unwillingness of the Indians to give up their old habits and beliefs. Shea, in his, Catholic Missions, supposes that these Indians were probably a part of the Cherokee, but a study of the Spanish record in Barcia, and Sale, pages 138-141, shows that Rogel penetrated only a short distance from the coast. 
10. Davies' History of the Caribbean Islands, p. The fraudulent character of this work, which is itself an altered translation of a fictitious history by Rockefeller, is noted by Buckingham Smith, Letter of Hernando de Soto, p. 36, 1854, Windsor, Narrative and Critical History, 2, page 289, and Field, Indian Bibliography, page 95. Says Field, this book is an example of the most unblushing effrontery. The pseudo-author assumes the credit of the performance, with but the faintest allusion to its previous existence. It is a nearly faithful translation of Rockefeller's Histoire de Antilles. There is, however, a gratifying retribution in Davies' treatment of Rockefeller, for the work of the latter was fictitious in every part which was not purloined from authors whose knowledge furnished him with all in his treatise which was true. 11. Ancient Spanish Mines, pp. 29. 31 As the existence of the precious metals in the southern Alleghenies was known to the Spaniards from a very early period. It is probable that more thorough exploration of that region will bring to light many evidences of their mining operations. In his, Antiquities of the Southern Indians, Jones describes a sort of subterranean village discovered in 1834 on Dukes Creek, White County, Georgia, consisting of a row of small log cabins extending along the creek but embedded several feet below the surface of the ground, upon which large trees were growing, the inference being that the houses had been thus covered by successive freshets. The logs had been notched and shaped apparently with sharp metallic tools. Shafts had been discovered on Valley River, North Carolina, at the bottom of one of which was found, in 1854, a well-preserved windlass of hewn oak timbers, showing traces of having once been banded with iron. Another shaft, passing through hard rock, showed the marks of sharp tools used in the boring. The casing and other timbers were still sound, Jones, pages 48, 49. Similar ancient shafts have been found in other places in Upper Georgia and Western North Carolina, together with some remarkable stone-built fortifications or corrals, notably at Fort Mountain, in Murray County, Georgia, and on Silver Creek. A few miles from Rome, Georgia. Very recently remains of an early white settlement, traditionally ascribed to the Spaniards, have been reported from Lincolnton, North Carolina, on the edge of the ancient country of the Serra, among whom the Spaniards built a fort in 1566. The works include a dam of cut stone, a series of low pillars of cut stone, arranged in squares as though intended for foundations, a stone-walled well, a quarry from which the stone had been procured, a fire pit, and a series of sinks. Extending along the stream, in which were found remains of timbers suggesting the subterranean cabins on Duke's Creek. All these antedated the first settlement of that region, about the year 1750. Ancient mining indications are also reported from Kings Mountain, about 20 miles distant, Reinhardt M.S., 1900, in Bureau of American Ethnology Archives. The Spanish miners of whom Lederer heard in 1670 and more in 1690 were probably at work in this neighborhood. 12. Sir William Johnson, p. This great soldier, whose history is so inseparably connected with that of the Six Nations, was born in the County Meath, Ireland, in 1715, and died at Johnstown, New York, in 1774. The younger son of an Irish gentleman, he left his native country in 1738 in consequence of a disappointment in love, and emigrated to America, where he undertook the settlement of a large tract of wild land belonging to his uncle, which lay along the south side of the Mohawk River in what was then the wilderness of New York. This brought him into close contact with the Six Nations, particularly the Mohawks, in whom he became so much interested as to learn their language and in some degree to accommodate himself to their customs sometimes even to the wearing of the native costume. This interest, together with his natural kindness and dignity, completely won the hearts of the Six Nations, over whom he acquired a greater influence than has ever been exercised by any other white man before or since. He was formally adopted as a chief by the Mohawk tribe. In 1744, being still a very young man, he was placed in charge of British affairs with the Six Nations, and in 1755 was regularly commissioned at their own urgent request as superintendent for the Six Nations and their dependent and allied tribes. A position which he held for the rest of his life. 
In 1748 he was also placed in command of the New York colonial forces, and two years later was appointed to the Governor's Council. At the beginning of the French and Indian War he was commissioned a Major General. He defeated Daiska at the Battle of Lake George, where he was severely wounded early in the action, but refused to leave the field. For this service he received the thanks of Parliament, a grant of £5,000, and a baronetcy. He also distinguished himself at Ticonderoga and Fort Niagara, taking the latter after routing the French army sent to its relief. At the head of his Indian and colonial forces he took part in other actions and expeditions, and was present at the surrender of Montreal. For his services throughout the war he received a grant of 100,000 acres of land north of the Mohawk River. Here he built Johnson Hall, which still stands, near the village of Johnstown, which was laid out by him with stores, church, and other buildings, at his own expense. At Johnson Hall he lived in the style of an old country baron, dividing his attention between Indian affairs and the raising of blooded stock, and dispensing a princely hospitality to all comers. His influence alone prevented the Six Nations joining Pontiac's great confederacy against the English. In 1768 he concluded the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, which fixed the Ohio as the boundary between the northern colonies and the western tribes, the boundary for which the Indians afterward contended against the Americans until 1795. In 1739 he married a German girl of the Mohawk Valley, who died after bearing him three children. Later in life he formed a connection with the sister of Brandt, the Mohawk chief. He died from overexertion at an Indian council. His son, Sir John Johnson, succeeded to his title and estates, and on the breaking out of the revolution espoused the British side, drawing with him the Mohawks and a great part of the other six nations. Who abandoned their homes and fled with him to Canada, C.W. L. Stone, Life of Sir William Johnson. 13. Captain John Stuart, P. This distinguished officer was contemporaneous with Sir William Johnson, and sprang from the same adventurous Celtic stock which has furnished so many men conspicuous in our early Indian history. Born in Scotland about the year 1700, he came to America in 1733, was appointed to a subordinate command in the British service, and soon became a favorite with the Indians. When Fort Loudoun was taken by the Cherokee in 1760, he was second in command, and his rescue by Atticola Culla is one of the romantic episodes of that period. In 1763 he was appointed superintendent for the Southern Tribes, a position which he continued to hold until his death. In 1768 he negotiated with the Cherokee the Treaty of Hard Labor by which the canal was fixed as the western boundary of Virginia. Sir William Johnson at the same time concluding a treaty with the Northern Tribes by which the boundary was continued northward along the Ohio. At the outbreak of the Revolution he organized the Cherokee and other southern tribes, with the white loyalists, against the Americans, and was largely responsible for the Indian outrages along the southern border. He planned a general invasion by the southern tribes along the whole frontier, in cooperation with a British force to be landed in western Florida. While a British fleet should occupy the attention of the Americans on the coast side and the Tories should rise in the interior. On the discovery of the plot and the subsequent defeat of the Cherokee by the Americans, he fled to Florida and soon afterwards sailed for England, where he died in 1779. 14. Nancy Ward, p. A noted half-breed Cherokee woman, the date and place of whose birth and death are alike unknown. It is said that her father was a British officer named Ward and her mother a sister of Atticola principal chief of the nation at the time of the First Cherokee War. She was probably related to Brian Ward, an old-time trader among the Cherokee, mentioned elsewhere in connection with the Battle of Taliwa. During the Revolutionary period she resided at Akota, the national capital, where she held the office of Beloved Woman, or Pretty Woman, by virtue of which she was entitled to speak in councils and to decide the fate of captives. She distinguished herself by her constant friendship for the Americans, always using her best effort to bring about peace between them and her own people, and frequently giving timely warning of projected Indian raids. Notably on the occasion of the great invasion of the Watauga and Holston settlements in 1776. A Mrs. Bean, captured during this incursion, 
was saved by her interposition after having been condemned to death and already bound to the stake. In 1780, on occasion of another Cherokee outbreak, she assisted a number of traders to escape, and the next year was sent by the chiefs to make peace with Sevier and Campbell, who were advancing against the Cherokee towns. Campbell speaks of her in his report as the famous Indian woman, Nancy Ward. Although peace was not then granted, her relatives, when brought in later with other prisoners, were treated with the consideration due in return for her good offices. She is described by Robertson, who visited her about this time, as queenly and commanding, in appearance and manner, and her house as furnished in accordance with her high dignity. When among the Arkansas Cherokee in 1819, Nuttall was told that she had introduced the first cows into the nation, and that by her own and her children's influence the condition of the Cherokee had been greatly elevated. He was told also that her advice and counsel bordered on supreme, and that her interference was allowed to be decisive even in affairs of life and death. Although he speaks in the present tense, it is hardly probable that she was then still alive, and he does not claim to have met her. Her descendants are still found in the nation. C. Haywood, Natural and Aboriginal Tennessee, Ramsey, Tennessee. Nuttall, Travels, page 130, 1821, Campbell Letter, 1781, and Springstone Deposition, 1781, in Virginia State Papers I, pages 435, 436, 447, 1875, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography. 15, General James Robertson, P. This distinguished pioneer and founder of Nashville was born in Brunswick County, Virginia, in 1742, and died at the Chickasaw Agency in West Tennessee in 1814. Like most of the men prominent in the early history of Tennessee, he was of Scotch-Irish ancestry. His father having removed about 1750 to western North Carolina, the boy grew up without education, but with a strong love for adventure, which he gratified by making exploring expeditions across the mountains. After his marriage his wife taught him to read and write. In 1771 he led a colony to the Watauga River and established the settlement which became the nucleus of the future state of Tennessee. He took a leading part in the organization of the Watauga Association, the earliest organized government within the state, and afterwards served in Dunmore's War, taking part in the Bloody Battle of Point Pleasant in 1774. He participated in the earlier revolutionary campaigns against the Cherokee, and in 1777 was appointed agent to reside at their capital, Dakota, and act as a medium in their correspondence with the state governments of North Carolina, including Tennessee, and Virginia. In this capacity he gave timely warning of a contemplated invasion by the hostile portion of the tribe early in 1779. Soon after in the same year he led a preliminary exploration from Watauga to the Cumberland. He brought out a larger party late in the fall, and in the spring of 1780 built the first stockades on the site which he named Nashboro, now Nashville. Only his force of character was able to hold the infant settlement together in the face of hardships and Indian hostilities, but by his tact and firmness he was finally able to make peace with the surrounding tribes and established the Cumberland Settlement upon a secure basis. The Spanish government at one time unsuccessfully attempted to engage him in a plot to cut off the Western Territory from the United States, but met a patriotic refusal. Having been commissioned a brigadier general in 1790, he continued to organize campaigns, resist invasions, and negotiate treaties until the final close of the Indian Wars in Tennessee. He afterward held the appointment of Indian Commissioner to the Chickasaw and Choctaw. C. Ramsey, Tennessee, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography. 16. General Griffith Rutherford, P. Although this revolutionary officer commanded the greatest expedition ever sent against the Cherokee, with such distinguished success that both North Carolina and Tennessee have named counties in his honor. Little appears to be definitely known of his history. He was born in Ireland about 1731, and, emigrating to America, settled near Salisbury, North Carolina. On the opening of the revolutionary struggle he became a member of the Provincial Congress and Council of Safety. In June, 1776, he was commissioned a brigadier general in the American Army, 
and a few months later led his celebrated expedition against the Cherokee, as elsewhere narrated. He rendered other important service in the Revolution, in one battle being taken prisoner by the British and held by them nearly a year. He afterwards served in the State Senate of North Carolina, and, subsequently removing to Tennessee, was for some time a member of its territorial council. He died in Tennessee about 1800. 17. Rutherford's Route, p. The various North Carolina detachments which combined to form Rutherford's expedition against the Cherokee in the autumn of 1776 organized at different points about the Upper Catawba and probably concentrated at Davidson's Fort, now Old Fort. In McDowell County. Thence, advancing westward closely upon the line of the present Southern Railroad and its western North Carolina branch, the army crossed the Blue Ridge over the Swananoa Gap and went down the Swananoa to its junction with the French Broad. Crossing the latter at the Warrior Ford, below the present Asheville. Thence up Hominy Creek and across the ridge to Pigeon River, crossing it a few miles below the junction of the East and West Forks, thence to Richland Creek, crossing it just above the present Waynesville and over the dividing ridge between the present Haywood and Jackson counties to the head of Scotts Creek. Thence down that creek by, a blind path through a very mountainous bad way, as Moore's old narrative has it, to its junction with the Tecassegee River just below the present Webster. Thence, crossing to the west, south, side of the river, the troops followed a main trail down the stream for a few miles until they came to the first Cherokee town, Stacoa, on the site of the farm formerly owned by Colonel William H. Thomas, just above the present railroad village of Whittier, Swain County, North Carolina. After destroying the town a detachment left the main body and pursued the fugitives northward on the other side of the river to Oconolufty River and Soco Creek. Getting back afterward to the settlements by steering an easterly course across the mountains to Richland Creek, more narrative. The main army, under Rutherford, crossed the dividing ridge to the southward of Whittier and descended Cowie Creek to the waters of Little Tennessee, in the present Macon County. After destroying the towns in this vicinity the army ascended Cartugaja Creek, west from the present Franklin, and crossed the Nantahala Mountains at Waya Gap, where a fight took place, to Nantahala River, probably at the town of the same name. About the present Jarrett Station from here the march was west across the mountain into the present Cherokee County and down Valley River to its junction with the Hiwassee, at the present Murphy. Authorities, Moore Narrative and Wilson Letter in North Carolina University Magazine, February, 1888, Ramsey, Tennessee, page 164, Roosevelt, Winning of the West, I, pages 300-302, Royce, Cherokee Map, Personal Information from Colonel William H. Thomas, Major James Bryson, whose grandfather was with Rutherford, and Cherokee informants. 18. Colonel William Christian, P. Colonel William Christian, sometimes incorrectly called Christie, was born in Berkeley County, Virginia, in 1732. Accustomed to frontier warfare almost from boyhood, he served in the French and Indian War with the rank of captain and was afterward in command of the Tennessee and North Carolina forces which participated in the Great Battle of Point Pleasant in 1774, although he himself arrived too late for the fight. He organized a regiment at the opening of the Revolutionary War, and in 1776 led an expedition from Virginia against the Upper Cherokee and compelled them to sue for peace. In 1782, while upon an expedition against the Ohio tribes, he was captured and burned at the stake. 19. The Great Indian War Path, p. This noted Indian thoroughfare from Virginia through Kentucky and Tennessee to the Creek Country in Alabama and Georgia is frequently mentioned in the early narrative of that section. And is indicated on the maps accompanying Ramsey's Annals of Tennessee and Royce's Cherokee Nation, in the fifth annual report of the Bureau of Ethnology. Royce's map shows it in more correct detail. It was the great trading and war path between the northern and southern tribes, and along the same path Christian, Severe, and others of the old Indian fighters led their men to the destruction of the towns on Little Tennessee, Hiwassee, and southward. According to Ramsey, p. One branch of it ran nearly on the line of the later stage road from Harper's Ferry to Knoxville, passing the Big Lick in Bodetort County, Virginia. 
crossing New River near Old Fort Chiswell, which stood on the south bank of Reed Creek of New River, about nine miles east from Wytheville, Virginia, crossing Holston at the Seven Mile Ford. Thence to the left of the stage road near the river to the north fork of Holston, crossing as at present. Thence to Big Creek, and, crossing the Holston at Dodson's Ford, to the grassy springs near the former residence of Mikajalia. Thence down the Nalachucky to Long Creek, up it to its head, and down Dumplin' Creek nearly to its mouth, where the path bent to the left and crossed French Broad near Buckingham's Island. Here a branch left it and went up the west fork of Little Pigeon and across the mountains to the middle towns on Tecassegee and the upper Little Tennessee. The main trail continued up Boyd's Creek to its head, and down Ellijoy Creek to Little River, crossing near Henry's Place. Thence by the present Maryville to the mouth of Teleco, and, passing through the Cherokee towns of Teleco, Ekota, and Hiwassee, down the Coosa, connecting with the Great War Path of the Creeks. Near the Wolf Hills, now Abingdon, Virginia, another path came in from Kentucky, passing through the Cumberland Gap. It was along this latter road that the early explorers entered Kentucky, and along it also the Shawano and other Ohio tribes often penetrated to raid upon the Holston and New River settlements. On Royce's map the trail is indicated from Virginia southward. Starting from the junction of Moccasin Creek with the North Fork of Holston, just above the Tennessee state line, it crosses the latter river from the east side at its mouth or junction with the South Fork, just below Kingsport or the Long Island. Then follows down along the west side of the Holston, crossing Big Creek at its mouth, and crossing to the south, east, side of Holston at Dodson's Creek. Thence up along the east side of Dodson's Creek and across Big Gap Creek, following it for a short distance and continuing southwest, just touching Nalachucky. Passing up the west side of Long Creek of that stream and down the same side of Dumplin' Creek, and crossing French Broad just below the mouth of the creek. Thence up along the west side of Boyd's Creek to its head and down the west side of Ellijoy Creek to and across Little River. Thence through the present Maryville to cross Little Tennessee at the entrance of Teleco River, where Old Fort Loudoun was built. Thence turning up along the south side of Little Tennessee River to Ekota, the ancient capital, and then southwest across Teleco River along the ridge between Chestua and Canasauga Creeks. And crossing the latter near its mouth to strike Hiwassee River at the town of the same name. Then southwest, crossing Okoe River near its mouth, passing south of Cleveland, through the present Ultawa and across Chickamauga Creek into Georgia and Alabama. According to Timberlake, Memoirs, with map, 1765, the trail crossed Little Tennessee from Dakota, northward, in two places, just above and below Four Mile Creek, the first camping place being at the junction of Ellijoy Creek and Little River. At the old town site. It crossed Holston within a mile of Fort Robinson. According to Hutching, Topographical Description of America, p. 24, 1778, the road which went through Cumberland Gap was the one taken by the northern Indians in their incursions into the Kutawa country, and went from Sandusky, on Lake Erie. By a direct path to the mouth of Scioto, where Portsmouth now is, and thence across Kentucky to the Gap. 20. Peace Towns and Towns of Refuge, p. Towns of Refuge existed among the Cherokee, the Creeks, and probably other Indian tribes, as well as among the ancient Hebrews, the institution being a merciful provision for softening the harshness of the primitive law, which required a life for a life. We learn from Deuteronomy that Moses appointed three cities on the east side of Jordan, that the slayer might flee thither which should kill his neighbor unawares and hated him not in times past, and that fleeing into one of these cities he might live. It was also ordained that as more territory was conquered from the heathen three additional cities should be thus set aside as havens of refuge for those who should accidentally take human life. And where they should be safe until the matter could be adjusted. The willful murderer, however, was not to be sheltered, but delivered up to punishment without pity, Deuteronomy 4, 41-43, and 19, 1-11. Ekota, the ancient Cherokee capital near the mouth of Little Tennessee, was the Cherokee town of refuge, commonly designated as the White Town or Peace Town. According to Adair, the Cherokee in his time, 
although extremely degenerate in other things. Still observed the law so strictly in this regard that even a willful murderer who might succeed in making his escape to that town was safe so long as he remained there, although, unless the matter was compounded in the meantime. The friends of the slain person would seldom allow him to reach home alive after leaving it. He tells how a trader who had killed an Indian to protect his own property took refuge in Ikota, and after having been there for some months prepared to return to his trading store, which was but a short distance away. But was assured by the chiefs that he would be killed if he ventured outside the town. He was accordingly obliged to stay a longer time until the tears of the bereaved relatives had been wiped away with presents. In another place the same author tells how a Cherokee, having killed a trader, was pursued and attempted to take refuge in the town, but was driven off into the river as soon as he came in sight by the inhabitants. Who feared either to have their town polluted by the shedding of blood or to provoke the English by giving him sanctuary, Adair, American Indians, p. 158, 1775. In 1768 Okanestota, speaking on behalf of the Cherokee delegates who had come to Johnson Hall to make peace with the Iroquois, said, we come from Shot, where the wise, white house, the house of peace is erected, treaty record, 1768, New York Colonial Documents, 8, page 42, 1857. In 1786 the friendly Cherokee made Choda, the watchword by which the Americans might be able to distinguish them from the hostile Creeks, Ramsey, Tennessee, page 343. From conversation with old Cherokee it seems probable that in cases where no satisfaction was made by the relatives of the manslayer he continued to reside close within the limits of the town until the next recurrence of the annual green corn dance. When a general amnesty was proclaimed. Among the creeks the ancient town of Coosa or Coosa, on Coosa River in Alabama, was a town of refuge. In Adair's time, although then almost deserted and in ruins, it was still a place of safety for one who had taken human life without design. Certain towns were also known as peace towns, from their prominence in peace ceremonials and treaty making. Upon this Adair says, in almost every Indian nation there are several peaceable towns, which are called Old Beloved, Ancient, Holy, or White Towns. They seem to have been formerly towns of refuge, for it is not in the memory of their oldest people that ever human blood was shed in them, although they often force persons from thence and put them to death elsewhere. Adair, American Indians, 159. A closely parallel institution seems to have existed among the Seneca. The Seneca nation, ever the largest, and guarding the western door of the Vlong House, which was threatened alike from the north, west, and south, had traditions peculiarly their own, besides those common to the other members of the Confederacy. The stronghold or fort, Gaustraya, on the mountain ridge, for miles east of Lewiston, had a peculiar character as the residence of a virgin queen known as the Peacemaker. When the Iroquois Confederacy was first formed the prime factors were mutual protection and domestic peace, and this fort was designed to afford comfort and relieve the distress incident to war. It was a true, city of refuge, to which fugitives from battle, whatever their nationality, might flee for safety and find generous entertainment. Curtains of deerskin separated pursuer and pursued while they were being lodged and fed. At parting, the curtains were withdrawn, and the hostile parties, having shared the hospitality of the queen, could neither renew hostility or pursuit without the queen's consent. According to tradition, no virgin had for many generations been counted worthy to fill the place or possessed the genius and gifts to honor the position. In 1878 the Tonawanda Band proposed to revive the office and conferred upon Caroline Parker the title. Carrington, in Six Nations of New York, Extra Bulletin 11th Census, page 73, 1892. 21, Scalping by Whites, p. To the student, aware how easily the civilized man reverts to his original savagery when brought in close contact with its conditions. It will be no surprise to learn that every barbarous practice of Indian warfare was quickly adopted by the white pioneer and soldier and frequently legalized and encouraged by local authority. Scalping, while the most common, was probably the least savage and cruel of them all, being usually performed after the victim was already dead, with the primary purpose of securing a trophy of the victory. 
The tortures, mutilations, and nameless deviltries inflicted upon Indians by their white conquerors in the early days could hardly be paralleled even in civilized Europe. When burning at the stake was the punishment for holding original opinions and sawing into two pieces the penalty for desertion. Actual torture of Indians by legal sanction was rare within the English colonies, but mutilation was common and scalping was the rule down to the end of the War of 1812. And has been practiced more or less in almost every Indian war down to the latest. Captain Church, who commanded in King Philip's War in 1676, states that his men received thirty shillings a head for every Indian killed or taken, and Philip's head, after it was cut off, went at the same price. When the chief was killed one of his hands was cut off and given to his Indian slayer, to show to such gentlemen as would bestow gratuities upon him, and accordingly he got many a penny by it. His other hand was chopped off and sent to Boston for exhibition, his head was sent to Plymouth and exposed upon a scaffold there for twenty years, while the rest of his body was quartered and the pieces left hanging upon four trees. Fifty years later Massachusetts offered a bounty of one hundred pounds for every Indian scalp, and scalp hunting thus became a regular and usually a profitable business. On one occasion a certain Lovewell, having recruited a company of forty men for this purpose, discovered ten Indians lying asleep by their fire and killed the whole party. After scalping them they stretched the scalps upon hoops and marched thus into Boston, where the scalps were paraded and the bounty of one thousand pounds paid for them. By a few other scalps sold from time to time at the regular market rate, Lovewell was gradually acquiring a competency when in May, 1725, his company met disaster. He discovered and shot a solitary hunter, who was afterwards scalped by the chaplain of the party, but the Indian managed to kill Lovewell before being overpowered, on which the whites withdrew, but were pursued by the tribesmen of the slain hunter. With the result that but sixteen of them got home alive. A famous old ballad of the time tells how. Our worthy Captain Lovewell among them there did die. They killed Lieutenant Robbins and wounded good young Fry. Who was our English chaplain? He many Indians slew. And some of them he scalped when bullets round him flew. When the mission village of Norwichwak was attacked by the New England men about the same time, women and children were made to suffer the fate of the warriors. The scholarly missionary, Rassels, author of the Abnaki Dictionary, was shot down at the foot of the cross, where he was afterward found with his body riddled with balls, his skull crushed and scalped, his mouth and eyes filled with earth. His limbs broken, and all his members mutilated, and this by white men. The border men of the revolutionary period and later invariably scalped slain Indians as often as opportunity permitted, and, as has already been shown, both British and American officials encouraged the practice by offers of bounties and rewards. Even, in the case of the former, when the scalps were those of white people. Our difficulties with the Apache date from a treacherous massacre of them in 1836 by a party of American scalp hunters in the pay of the governor of Sonora. The bounty offered was one ounce of gold per scalp. In 1864 the Colorado militia under Colonel Chivington attacked a party of Cheyennes camped under the protection of the United States flag, and killed, mutilated, and scalped 170 men, women, and children, bringing the scalps into Denver. Where they were paraded in a public hall. One Lieutenant Richmond killed and scalped three women and five children. Scalps were taken by American troops in the Modoc War of 1873, and there is now living in the Comanche tribe a woman who was scalped, though not mortally wounded, by white soldiers in one of the later Indian encounters in Texas. Authorities, Drake, Indians, for New England Wars, Roosevelt, Virginia State Papers, etc., Revolution, etc. Bancroft, Pacific States, Apache, Official Report on the Condition of the Indian Tribes, 1867, for Chivington Episode. Author's Personal Information. 22, Lower Cherokee Refugees, p. In every hut I have visited I find the children exceedingly alarmed at the sight of white men, and here, at Willstown, a little boy of eight years old was excessively alarmed and could not be kept from screaming out until he got out of the door. And then he ran and hid himself. But as soon as I can converse with them and they are informed who I am they execute any order I give them with eagerness. 
I inquired particularly of the mothers what could be the reason for this. They said, this town was the remains of several towns who, sick, formerly resided on Tugalo and Kiowi, and had been much harassed by the whites, that the old people remembered their former situation and suffering, and frequently spoke of them. That these tales were listened to by the children, and made an impression which showed itself in the manner I had observed. The women told me, who I saw gathering nuts, that they had sensations upon my coming to the camp, in the highest degree alarming to them, and when I lit from my horse, took them by the hand, and spoke to them, they at first could not reply. Although one of them understood and spoke English very well. Hawkins, Manuscript Journal, 1796, in Library of Georgia Historical Society. 23, General Alexander McGillivray, p. This famous Creek chieftain, like so many distinguished men of the southern tribes, was of mixed blood, being the son of a Scotch trader, Lachlan McGillivray, by a half-breed woman of influential family, whose father was a French officer of Fort Toulouse. The future chief was born in the Creek Nation about 1740, and died at Pensacola, Florida, in 1793. He was educated at Charleston, studying Latin in addition to the ordinary branches, and after leaving school was placed by his father with a mercantile firm in Savannah. He remained but a short time, when he returned to the Creek country, where he soon began to attract attention, becoming a partner in the firm of Panton, Forbes, and Leslie, of Pensacola, which had almost a monopoly of the Creek trade. He succeeded to the chieftainship on the death of his mother, who came of ruling stock, but refused to accept the position until called to it by a formal council, when he assumed the title of Emperor of the Creek Nation. His paternal estates having been confiscated by Georgia at the outbreak of the Revolution, he joined the British side with all his warriors, and continued to be a leading instigator in the border hostilities until 1790. When he visited New York with a large retinue and made a treaty of peace with the United States on behalf of his people. President Washington's instructions to the treaty commissioners, in anticipation of this visit, state that he was said to possess great abilities and an unlimited influence over the Creeks and part of the Cherokee. And that it was an object worthy of considerable effort to attach him warmly to the United States. In pursuance of this policy the Creek chiefs were entertained by the Tammany Society, all the members being in full Indian dress, at which the visitors were much delighted and responded with an Indian dance. While McGillivray was induced to resign his commission as colonel in the Spanish service for a commission of higher grade in the service of the United States. Soon afterward, on account of some opposition, excited by Bowles, a renegade white man, he absented himself from his tribe for a time, but was soon recalled, and continued to rule over the nation until his death. McGillivray appears to have had a curious mixture of Scotch shrewdness, French love of display, and Indian secretiveness. He fixed his residence at Little Tallahassee, on the Coosa, a few miles above the present Wetumpka, Alabama, where he lived in a handsome house with extensive quarters for his Negro slaves, so that his place had the appearance of a small town. He entertained with magnificence and traveled always in state, as became one who styled himself emperor. Throughout the Indian wars he strove, so far as possible, to prevent unnecessary cruelties, being noted for his kindness to captives and his last years were spent in an effort to bring teachers among his people. On the other hand, he conformed much to the Indian customs. And he managed his negotiations with England, Spain, and the United States with such adroitness that he was able to play off one against the other, holding commissions by turn in the service of all three. Woodward, who knew of him by later reputation, asserts positively that McGillivray's mother was of pure Indian blood and that he himself was without education, his letters having been written for him by Leslie. Of the trading firm with which he was connected. The balance of testimony, however, seems to leave no doubt that he was an educated as well as an able man, whatever may have been his origin. Authorities, Drake, American Indians, Documents in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 1832. Pickett, Alabama, 1896. Appleton's Cyclopedia of American Biography, Woodward, Reminiscences, page 59 E.T. Passim, 1859. 24. Governor John Sevier, p. 
This noted leader and statesman in the pioneer history of Tennessee was born in Rockingham County, Virginia, in 1745, and died at the creek town of Tucabachi, in Alabama, in 1815. His father was a French immigrant of good birth and education, the original name of the family being Xavier. The son received a good education, and being naturally remarkably handsome and of polished manner, fine courage, and generous temperament. Soon acquired a remarkable influence over the rough border men with whom his lot was cast and among whom he was afterward affectionately known as Chucky Jack. To the Cherokee he was known as Tsanusti, Little John. After some service against the Indians on the Virginia frontier he removed to the new Watauga settlement in Tennessee, in 1772, and at once became prominently identified with its affairs. He took part in Dunmore's War in 1774 and, afterward. From the opening of the Revolution in 1775 until the close of the Indian Wars in Tennessee, a period extending over nearly twenty years, was the acknowledged leader or organizer in every important Indian campaign along the Tennessee border. His services in this connection have been already noted. He also commanded one wing of the American forces at the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1780, and in 1783 led a body of mountain men to the assistance of the Patriots under Marion. At one time during the revolution a Tory plot to assassinate him was revealed by the wife of the principal conspirator. In 1779 he had been commissioned as commander of the militia of Washington County, North Carolina, the nucleus of the present state of Tennessee, a position which he had already held by common consent. Shortly after the close of the revolution he held for a short time the office of governor of the seceding state of Franklin, for which he was arrested and brought to trial by the government of North Carolina, but made his escape. When the matter was allowed to drop. The question of jurisdiction was finally settled in 1790, when North Carolina ceded the disputed territory to the general government. Before this Sevier had been commissioned as Brigadier General. When Tennessee was admitted as a state in 1796 he was elected its first, state, governor, serving three terms, or six years. In 1803 he was again re-elected, serving three more terms. In 1811 he was elected to Congress, where he served two terms and was re-elected to a third, but died before he could take his seat, having contracted a fever while on duty as a boundary commissioner among the Creeks. Being then in his seventy-first year. For more than forty years he had been continuously in the service of his country, and no man of his state was ever more loved and respected. In the prime of his manhood he was reputed the handsomest man and the best Indian fighter in Tennessee. 25, Hopewell, South Carolina, p. This place, designated in early treaties and also in Hawkins's manuscript journal as Hopewell on the Kiowee, was the plantation seat of General Andrew Pickens, who resided there from the close of the Revolution until his death in 1817. It was situated on the northern edge of the present Anderson County, on the east side of Kiowee River, opposite and a short distance below the entrance of Little River, and about three miles from the present Pendleton. In sight of it, on the opposite side of Kiowee, was the old Cherokee town of Seneca, destroyed by the Americans in 1776. Important treaties were made here with the Cherokee in 1785, and with the Chickasaw in 1786. 26. Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, p. This distinguished soldier, statesman, and author, was born in Warren County, North Carolina, in 1754, and died at Hawkinsville, Georgia, in 1816. His father, Colonel Philemon Hawkins, organized and commanded a regiment in the Revolutionary War, and was a member of the convention that ratified the National Constitution. At the outbreak of the Revolution young Hawkins was a student at Princeton, but offered his services to the American cause. And on account of his knowledge of French and other modern languages was appointed by Washington his staff interpreter for communicating with the French officers cooperating with the American army. He took part in several engagements and was afterward appointed commissioner for procuring war supplies abroad. After the close of the war he was elected to Congress, and in 1785 was appointed on the commission which negotiated at Hopewell the first federal treaty with the Cherokee. He served a second term in the House and another in the Senate, 
and in 1796 was appointed superintendent for all the Indians south of the Ohio. He thereupon removed to the Creek country and established himself in the wilderness at what is now Hawkinsville, Georgia, where he remained in the continuance of his office until his death. As senator he signed the deed by which North Carolina ceded Tennessee to the United States in 1790, and as Indian superintendent helped to negotiate seven different treaties with the southern tribes. He had an extensive knowledge of the customs and language of the Creeks, and his Sketch of the Creek Country, written in 1799 and published by the Historical Society of Georgia in 1848, remains a standard. His journal and other manuscripts are in possession of the same society, while a manuscript Cherokee vocabulary is in possession of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Authorities, Hawkins's Manuscripts, with Georgia Historical Society, Indian Treaties, 1837, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 1832, 2, 1834, Gatchet, Creek Migration Legend, Appleton, Cyclopedia of American Biography. 27, Governor William Blunt, P. William Blunt, Territorial Governor of Tennessee, was born in North Carolina in 1744 and died at Knoxville, Tennessee, in 1800. He held several important offices in his native state, including two terms in the Assembly and two others as delegate to the Old Congress, in which latter capacity he was one of the signers of the Federal Constitution in 1787. On the organization of a territorial government for Tennessee in 1790, he was appointed territorial governor and also superintendent for the Southern Tribes, fixing his headquarters at Knoxville. In 1791 he negotiated an important treaty with the Cherokee, and had much to do with directing the operations against the Indians until the close of the Indian War. He was president of the convention which organized the state of Tennessee in 1796, and was elected to the National Senate but was expelled on the charge of having entered into a treasonable conspiracy to assist the British in conquering Louisiana from Spain. A United States officer was sent to arrest him, but returned without executing his mission on being warned by Blunt's friends that they would not allow him to be taken from the state. The impeachment proceedings against him were afterward dismissed on technical grounds. In the meantime the people of his own state had shown their confidence in him by electing him to the state senate, of which he was chosen president. He died at the early age of 53, the most popular man in the state next to Severe. His younger brother, Willie Blunt, who had been his secretary, was afterward governor of Tennessee, 1809-1815. 28, St. Clair's Defeat, 1791, p. Early in 1791 Major General Arthur St. Clair, a veteran officer in two wars and governor of the Northwestern Territory, was appointed to the chief command of the army operating against the Ohio tribes. On November 4 of that year, while advancing upon the Miami villages with an army of 1,400 men, he was surprised by an Indian force of about the same number under Little Turtle, the Miami chief, in what is now southwestern Mercer County, Ohio. Adjoining the Indiana Line because of the cowardly conduct of the militia he was totally defeated, with the loss of 632 officers and men killed and missing, and 263 wounded, many of whom afterward died. The artillery was abandoned, not a horse being left alive to draw it off, and so great was the panic that the men threw away their arms and fled for miles, even after the pursuit had ceased. It was afterward learned that the Indians lost 150 killed, besides many wounded. Two years later General Wayne built Fort Recovery upon the same spot. The detachment sent to do the work found within a space of 350 yards 500 skulls, while for several miles along the line of pursuit the woods were strewn with skeletons and muskets. The two cannon lost were found in the adjacent stream. Authorities, St. Clair's Report and Related Documents, 1791, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 1832, Drake, Indians 570, 571, 1880, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography. 29. Cherokee Clans, p. The Cherokee have seven clans, viz., Ani, Waya, Wolf, Ani, Kawi, Deer, Ani, Tsi Squaw, Bird, Ani, Wa Di, Paint, Ani, Saha Ani, Ani, Gatage Y, 
Ani, Hila Hai. The names of the last three cannot be translated with certainty. The Wolf Clan is the largest and most important in the tribe. It is probable that, in accordance with the general system in other tribes, each clan had formerly certain hereditary duties and privileges, but no trace of these now remains. Children belong to the clan of the mother, and the law forbidding marriage between persons of the same clan is still enforced among the conservative fullbloods. The seven clans are frequently mentioned in the sacred formulas, and even in some of the tribal laws promulgated within the century. There is evidence that originally there were fourteen, which by extinction or absorption have been reduced to seven, thus, the ancient turtle dove and raven clans now constitute a single bird clan. The subject will be discussed more fully in a future Cherokee paper. 30. Wayne's Victory, 1794, p. After the successive failures of Harmar and St. Clair in their efforts against the Ohio tribes the chief command was assigned, in 1793, to Major General Anthony Wayne, who had already distinguished himself by his fighting qualities during the Revolution. Having built Fort Recovery on the site of St. Clair's defeat, he made that post his headquarters through the winter of 1793-94. In the summer of 1794 he advanced down the Maumee with an army of 3,000 men, two-thirds of whom were regulars. On August 20 he encountered the Confederated Indian forces near the head of the Maumee Rapids at a point known as the Fallen Timbers and defeated them with great slaughter. The pursuit being followed up by the cavalry until the Indians took refuge under the guns of the British garrison at Fort Miami, just below the rapids. His own loss was only 33 killed and 100 wounded, of whom 11 afterward died of their wounds. The loss of the Indians and their white auxiliaries was believed to be more than double this. The Indian force was supposed to number 2,000, while, on account of the impetuosity of Wayne's charge, the number of his troops actually engaged did not exceed 900. On account of this defeat and the subsequent devastation of their towns and fields by the victorious army the Indians were compelled to sue for peace, which was granted by the treaty concluded at Greenville, Ohio, August 3, 1795 by which the tribes represented ceded away nearly their whole territory in Ohio. Authorities, Wayne's Report and Related Documents, 1794, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, 1832, Drake, Indians, 571-577, 1880, Greenville Treaty, in Indian Treaties, 1837, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography. 31. First Things of Civilization, p. We usually find that the first things adopted by the Indian from his white neighbor are improved weapons and cutting tools, with trinkets and articles of personal adornment. After a regular trade has been established certain traders marry Indian wives, and, taking up their permanent residence in the Indian country, engage in farming and stock raising according to civilized methods, thus, even without intention constituting themselves industrial teachers for the tribe. From data furnished by Haywood, guns appear to have been first introduced among the Cherokee about the year 1700 or 1710, although he himself puts the date much earlier. Horses were probably not owned in any great number before the marking out of the horse path for traders from Augusta about 1740. The Cherokee, however, took kindly to the animal, and before the beginning of the War of 1760 had a prodigious number. In spite of their great losses at that time they had so far recovered in 1775 that almost every man then had from two to a dozen, a dare, page 231. In the border wars following the revolution companies of hundreds of mounted Cherokee and Creeks sometimes invaded the settlements. The cow is called Waka by the Cherokee and Waga by the Creeks, indicating that their first knowledge of it came through the Spaniards. Nuttall states that it was first introduced among the Cherokee by the celebrated Nancy Ward, Travels, page 130. It was not in such favor as the horse, being valuable chiefly for food, of which at that time there was an abundant supply from the wild game. A potent reason for its avoidance was the Indian belief that the eating of the flesh of a slow-moving animal breeds a corresponding sluggishness in the eater. The same argument applied even more strongly to the hog, and to this day a few of the old conservatives among the East Cherokee will have nothing to do with beef, pork, milk, or butter. 
Nevertheless, Bartram tells of a trader in the Cherokee country as early as 1775 who had a stock of cattle, and whose Indian wife had learned to make butter and cheese, travels, page 347. In 1796 Hawkins mentions meeting two Cherokee women driving ten very fat cattle to market in the White Settlements, Manuscript Journal, 1796. Bees, if not native, as the Indians claim, were introduced at so early a period that the Indians have forgotten their foreign origin. The De Soto narrative mentions the finding of a pot of honey in an Indian village in Georgia in 1540. The peach was cultivated in orchards a century before the Revolution, and one variety, known as early as 1700 as the Indian peach, the Indians claimed as their own, asserting that they had had it before the whites came to America, Lawson, Carolina. P. 182, edition 1860. Potatoes were introduced early and were so much esteemed that, according to one old informant, the Indians in Georgia, before the removal, lived on them. Coffee came later, and the same informant remembered and the full bloods still considered it poison, in spite of the efforts of the chief, Charles Hicks, to introduce it among them. Spinning wheels and looms were introduced shortly before the revolution. According to the Wananahi manuscript the first among the Cherokee were brought over from England by an Englishman named Edward Graves, who taught his Cherokee wife to spin and weave. The anonymous writer may have confounded this early civilizer with a young Englishman who was employed by Agent Hawkins in 1801 to make wheels and looms for the Creeks, Hawkins, 1801, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 647. Wofford, in his boyhood, say about 1815, knew an old man named T.S.I. Nawi on Young Cane Creek of Nottily River, in Upper Georgia who was known as a wheelwright and was reputed to have made the first spinning wheel and loom ever made among the mountain Cherokee, or perhaps in the nation, long before Wofford's time. Or, about the time the Cherokee began to drop their silver ornaments and go to work. In 1785 the commissioners for the Hopewell Treaty reported that some of the Cherokee women had lately learned to spin, and many were very desirous of instruction in the raising, spinning, and weaving of flax, cotton, and wool, Hopewell Commissioner's Report, 1785, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, p. 39, in accordance with their recommendation the next treaty made with the tribe, in 1791, contained a provision for supplying the Cherokee with farming tools, Holston Treaty, 1791, Indian Treaties, p. 36, 1837, and this civilizing policy was continued and broadened until, in 1801, their agent reported that at the Cherokee Agency the wheel, the loom, and the plow were in pretty general use, and farming, manufacturing. And stock raising were the principal topics of conversation among men and women, Hawkins Manuscripts, Treaty Commission of 1801. 32. Colonel Return J. Meigs, P. Return Jonathan Meigs was born in Middletown, Connecticut, December 17, 1734, and died at the Cherokee Agency in Tennessee, January 28, 1823. He was the firstborn son of his parents, who gave him the somewhat peculiar name of Return Jonathan to commemorate a romantic incident in their own courtship, when his mother, a young Quakeress, called back her lover as he was mounting his horse to leave the house forever after what he had supposed was a final refusal. The name has been handed down through five generations, every one of which has produced some man distinguished in the public service. The subject of this sketch volunteered immediately after the opening engagement of the Revolution at Lexington, and was assigned to duty under Arnold, with rank of major. He accompanied Arnold in the disastrous march through the wilderness against Quebec, and was captured in the assault upon the citadel and held until exchanged the next year. In 1777 he raised a regiment and was promoted to the rank of colonel. For a gallant and successful attack upon the enemy at Sag Harbor, Long Island, he received a sword and a vote of thanks from Congress, and by his conduct at the head of his regiment at Stony Point won the favorable notice of Washington. After the close of the Revolution he removed to Ohio, where, as a member of the territorial legislature, he drew up the earliest code of regulations for the pioneer settlers. 
In 1801 he was appointed agent for the Cherokee and took up his residence at the agency at Teleco Blockhouse, opposite the mouth of Teleco River, in Tennessee, continuing to serve in that capacity until his death. He was succeeded as agent by Governor McMinn, of Tennessee. In the course of 22 years he negotiated several treaties with the Cherokee and did much to further the work of civilization among them and to defend them against unjust aggression. He also wrote a journal of the expedition to Quebec. His grandson of the same name was special agent for the Cherokee and Creeks in 1834, afterward achieving a reputation in the legal profession both in Tennessee and in the District of Columbia. Authorities, Appleton, Cyclopedia of American Biography, 1894, Royce, Cherokee Nation, in Fifth Annual Report Bureau of Ethnology, 1888, Documents in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 1 and 2. 33, Tecumtha, P. This great chief of the Shawano and commander of the Allied Northern Tribes in the British service was born near the present Chillicothe, in western Ohio, about 1770, and fell in the Battle of the Thames, in Ontario, October 5, 1813. His name signifies a flying panther, i.e., a meteor. He came of fighting stock good even in a tribe distinguished for its warlike qualities, his father and elder brother having been killed in battle with the whites. His mother is said to have died among the Cherokee. Tecumtha is first heard of as taking part in an engagement with the Kentuckians when about twenty years old, and in a few years he had secured recognition as the ablest leader among the Allied tribes. It is said that he took part in every important engagement with the Americans from the time of Harmar's defeat in 1790 until the battle in which he lost his life. When about thirty years of age he conceived the idea of uniting the tribes northwest of the Ohio, as Pontiac had united them before, in a great confederacy to resist the further advance of the Americans. Taking the stand that the whole territory between the Ohio and the Mississippi belonged to all these tribes in common and that no one tribe had the right to sell any portion of it without the consent of the others. The refusal of the government to admit this principle led him to take active steps to unite the tribes upon that basis, in which he was seconded by his brother, the Prophet, who supplemented Tecumtha's eloquence with his own claims to supernatural revelation. In the summer of 1810 Tecumtha held a conference with Governor Harrison at Vincennes to protest against a recent treaty session, and finding after exhausting his arguments that the effort was fruitless. He closed the debate with the words, The President is far off and may sit in his town and drink his wine, but you and I will have to fight it out. Both sides at once prepared for war, Tecumtha going south to enlist the aid of the Creek, Choctaw, and other southern tribes. While Harrison took advantage of his absence to force the issue by marching against the Prophet's town on the Tippecanoe River, where the hostile warriors from a dozen tribes had gathered. A battle fought before daybreak of November 6, 1811, resulted in the defeat of the Indians and the scattering of their forces. Tecumtha returned to find his plans brought to naught for the time. But the opening of the war between the United States and England a few months later enabled him to rally the Confederated tribes once more to the support of the British against the Americans. As a commissioned brigadier general in the British service he commanded 2,000 warriors in the War of 1812, distinguishing himself no less by his bravery than by his humanity in preventing outrages and protecting prisoners from massacre. At one time saving the lives of 400 American prisoners who had been taken in ambush near Fort Meigs and were unable to make longer resistance. He was wounded at Maguagua, where nearly 400 were killed and wounded on both sides. He covered the British retreat after the Battle of Lake Erie, and, refusing to retreat farther, compelled the British General Proctor to make a stand at the Thames River. Almost the whole force of the American attack fell on Tecumtha's division. Early in the engagement he was shot through the arm, but continued to fight desperately until he received a bullet in the head and fell dead, surrounded by the bodies of 120 of his slain warriors. The services of Tecumtha and his Indians to the British cause have been recognized by an English historian, who says, but for them it is probable we should not now have a Canada. Authorities, Drake, Indians, edition 1880. Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography, 1894, Eggleston, Tecumseh and the Shawnee Prophet. 34, Fort Mims Massacre, 1813, p. 
Fort Mims, so called from an old Indian trader on whose lands it was built, was a stockade fort erected in the summer of 1813 for the protection of the settlers in what was known as the Tensaw District, and was situated on Tensaw Lake, Alabama. One mile east of Alabama River and about 40 miles above Mobile. It was garrisoned by about 200 volunteer troops under Major Daniel Beasley, with refugees from the neighboring settlement, making a total at the time of its destruction of 553 men, women, and children. Being carelessly guarded, it was surprised on the morning of August 30th by about 1,000 Creek warriors led by the mixed-blood chief, William Weatherford, who rushed in at the open gate, and, after a stout but hopeless resistance by the garrison, massacred all within, with the exception of the few Negroes and half-breeds, whom they spared, and about a dozen whites who made their escape. The Indian loss is unknown, but was very heavy, as the fight continued at close quarters until the buildings were fired over the heads of the defenders. The unfortunate tragedy was due entirely to the carelessness of the commanding officer, who had been repeatedly warned that the Indians were about. And at the very moment of the attack a Negro was tied up waiting to be flogged for reporting that he had the day before seen a number of painted warriors lurking a short distance outside the stockade. Authorities, Pickett, Alabama, edition 1896, Hamilton and Owen, note, page 170, in Transactions Alabama Historical Society, 2, 1898, Agent Hawkins's Report, 1813, American State Papers, Indian Affairs, I, page 853, Drake, Indians, edition 1880. The figures given are those of Pickett, which in this instance seem most correct, while Drake's are evidently exaggerated. 35, General William McIntosh, p. This noted half-breed chief of the Lower Creeks was the son of a Scotch officer in the British Army by an Indian mother, and was born at the creek town of Coweta in Alabama, on the Lower Chattahoochee, nearly opposite the present city of Columbus, Georgia, and killed at the same place by order of the Creek National Council on April 30, 1825. Having sufficient education to keep up an official correspondence, he brought himself to public notice and came to be regarded as the principal chief of the Lower Creeks. In the Creek War of 1813-14 he led his warriors to the support of the Americans against his brethren of the Upper Towns, and acted a leading part in the terrible slaughters at Otto Sea and the Horseshoe Bend. In 1817 he again headed his warriors on the government side against the Seminole and was commissioned as major. His common title of general belonged to him only by courtesy. In 1821 he was the principal supporter of the Treaty of Indian Springs, by which a large tract between the Flint and Chattahoochee rivers was ceded. The treaty was repudiated by the Creek Nation as being the act of a small faction. Two other attempts were made to carry through the treaty, in which the interested motives of Mackintosh became so apparent that he was branded as a traitor to his nation and condemned to death, together with his principal underlings. In accordance with a Creek law making death the penalty for undertaking to sell lands without the consent of the National Council. About the same time he was publicly exposed and denounced in the Cherokee Council for an attempt to bribe John Ross and other chiefs of the Cherokee in the same fashion. At daylight of April 30, 1825, a hundred or more warriors sent by the Creek National Council surrounded his house and, after allowing the women and children to come out, set fire to it and shot Mackintosh and another chief as they tried to escape. He left three wives, one of whom was a Cherokee. Authorities, Drake, Indians, edition 1880, Letters from Mackintosh's Son and Widows, 1825, in American State Papers, Indian Affairs, 2, pages 764 and 768. 36, William Weatherford, P. This leader of the hostels in the Creek War was the son of a white father and a half-breed woman of Tuskegee Town whose father had been a Scotchman. Weatherford was born in the Creek Nation about 1780 and died on Little River, in Monroe County, Alabama, in 1826. He came first into prominence by leading the attack upon Fort Mims, August 30, 1813, which resulted in the destruction of the fort and the massacre of over 500 inmates. It is maintained, with apparent truth, that he did his best to prevent the excesses which followed the victory, and left the scene rather than witness the atrocities when he found that he could not restrain his followers. 
The fact that Jackson allowed him to go home unmolested after the final surrender is evidence that he believed Weatherford guiltless. At the Battle of the Holy Ground, in the following December, he was defeated and narrowly escaped capture by the troops under General Claiborne. When the last hope of the Creeks had been destroyed and their power of resistance broken by the bloody Battle of the Horseshoe Bend, March 27, 1814, Weatherford voluntarily walked into General Jackson's headquarters and surrendered. Creating such an impression by his straightforward and fearless manner that the general, after a friendly interview, allowed him to go back alone to gather up his people preliminary to arranging terms of peace. After the treaty he retired to a plantation in Monroe County, where he lived in comfort and was greatly respected by his white neighbors until his death. As an illustration of his courage it is told how he once, single-handed, arrested two murderers immediately after the crime, when the local justice and a large crowd of bystanders were afraid to approach them. Jackson declared him to be as high-toned and fearless as any man he had ever met. In person he was tall, straight, and well-proportioned, with features indicating intelligence, bravery, and enterprise. Authorities, Pickett, Alabama, edition 1896. Drake, Indians, edition 1880, Woodward, Reminiscences, 1859. 37. Reverend David Brainerd, P. The pioneer American missionary from whom the noted Cherokee mission took its name was born at Haddam, Connecticut, April 20, 1718, and died at Northampton, Massachusetts, October 9, 1747. He entered Yale College in 1739, but was expelled on account of his religious opinions. In 1742 he was licensed as a preacher and the next year began work as missionary to the Mahican Indians of the village of Conomique, 20 miles from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He persuaded them to remove to Stockbridge, where he put them in charge of a resident minister, after which he took up work with good result among the Delaware and other tribes on the Delaware and Susquehanna rivers. In 1747 his health failed and he was forced to retire to Northampton, where he died a few months later. He wrote a journal and an account of his missionary labors at Conomique. His later mission work was taken up and continued by his brother. Authority, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography, 1894. 38. Rev. Samuel Austin Worcester, P. This noted missionary and philologist, the son of a congregational minister who was also a printer, was born at Worcester, Massachusetts, January 19, 1798, and died at Park Hill, in the Cherokee Nation West, April 20, 1859. Having removed to Vermont with his father while still a child, he graduated with the honors of his class at the State University at Burlington in 1819. And after finishing a course at the Theological Seminary at Andover was ordained to the ministry in 1825. A week later, with his newly wedded bride, he left Boston to begin mission work among the Cherokee, and arrived in October at the Mission of the American Board, at Brainerd, Tennessee, where he remained until the end of 1827. He then, with his wife, removed to New Dakota, in Georgia, the capital of the Cherokee Nation, where he was the principal worker in the establishment of the Cherokee Phoenix, the first newspaper printed in the Cherokee language and alphabet. In this labor his inherited printer's instinct came into play, for he himself supervised the casting of the new types and the systematic arrangement of them in the case. In March, 1831, he was arrested by the Georgia authorities for refusing to take a special oath of allegiance to the state. He was released, but was rearrested soon afterward, confined in the state penitentiary, and forced to wear prison garb, until January, 1833, notwithstanding a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States, nearly a year before. That his imprisonment was a violation of the law of the land. The Cherokee Phoenix having been suspended and the Cherokee Nation brought into disorder by the extension over it of the state laws, he then returned to Brainerd, which was beyond the limits of Georgia. In 1835 he removed to the Indian Territory, whither the Arkansas Cherokee had already gone, and after short sojourns at Dwight and Union Missions took up his final residence at Park Hill in December, 1836. He had already set up his mission press at Union, printing both in the Cherokee and the Creek languages, and on establishing himself at Park Hill he began a regular series of publications in the Cherokee language. 
1843 he states that, at Park Hill, besides the preaching of the gospel, a leading object of attention is the preparation and publication of books in the Cherokee language, letter and report of Indian Commissioner, page 356, 1843. The list of his Cherokee publications, first editions, under his own name in Pilling's bibliography comprises about twenty titles, including the Bible, hymn books, tracts, and almanacs in addition to the Phoenix and large number of anonymous works. Says Pilling, it is very probable that he was the translator of a number of books for which he is not given credit here, especially those portions of the scripture which are herein not assigned to any name. Indeed it is safe to say that during the thirty-four years of his connection with the Cherokee but little was done in the way of translating in which he had not a share. He also began a Cherokee geography and had both a grammar and a dictionary of the language underway when his work was interrupted by his arrest. The manuscripts, with all his personal effects, afterward went down with a sinking steamer on the Arkansas. His daughter, Mrs. E. W. Robertson, became a missionary among the Creeks and has published a number of works in their language. Authorities, Pilling, Bibliography of the Iroquoian Languages, Articles Worcester, Cherokee Phoenix, etc., 1888, Drake, Indians, Edition 1880, Report of Indian Commissioner, 1843, Worcester Letter. 39. Death Penalty for Selling Lands, p. In 1820 the Cherokee Nation enacted a law making it treason punishable with death to enter into any negotiation for the sale of tribal lands without the consent of the National Council. A similar law was enacted by the Creeks at about the same time. It was for violating these laws that Macintosh and Ridge suffered death in their respective tribes. The principal parts of the Cherokee law, as re-enacted by the United Nation in the West in 1842, appear as follows in the compilation authorized in 1866. An act against sale of land, etc. Whereas, the peace and prosperity of Indian nations are frequently sacrificed or placed in jeopardy by the unrestrained cupidity of their own individual citizens. And whereas, we ourselves are liable to suffer from the same cause, and be subjected to future removal and disturbances, therefore. Be it further enacted, that any person or persons who shall, contrary to the will and consent of the legislative council of this nation, in general council convened, enter into a treaty with any commissioner or commissioners of the United States, or any officer or officers instructed for the purpose, and agree to cede, exchange, or dispose in any way any part or portion of the lands belonging to or claimed by the Cherokees, west of the Mississippi, he or they so offending. Upon conviction before any judge of the circuit or supreme courts, shall suffer death, and any of the aforesaid judges are authorized to call a court for the trial of any person or persons so transgressing. Be it further enacted, that any person or persons who shall violate the provisions of the second section of this act, and shall resist or refuse to appear at the place designated for trial, or abscond, are hereby declared to be outlaws. And any person or persons, citizens of this nation, may kill him or them so offending at any time and in any manner most convenient, within the limits of this nation, and shall not be held accountable to the laws for the same. Be it further enacted, that no treaty shall be binding upon this nation which shall not be ratified by the General Council, and approved by the Principal Chief of the Nation. December 2, 1842 Laws of the Cherokee Nation, 1868 40. The Cherokee Syllabary, p. In the various schemes of symbolic thought representation, from the simple pictograph of the primitive man to the finished alphabet of the civilized nations, our own system, although not yet perfect, stands at the head of the list. The result of three thousand years of development by Egyptian, Phoenician, and Greek. Sequoia's syllabary, the unaided work of an uneducated Indian reared amid semi-savage surroundings, stands second. Twelve years of his life are said to have been given to his great work. Being entirely without instruction and having no knowledge of the philosophy of language, being not even acquainted with English, his first attempts were naturally enough in the direction of the crude Indian pictograph. He set out to devise a symbol for each word of the language, and after several years of experiment, finding this an utterly hopeless task, he threw aside the thousands of characters which he had carved or scratched upon pieces of bark. 
and started in anew to study the construction of the language itself. By attentive observation for another long period he finally discovered that the sounds and the words used by the Cherokee in their daily conversation and their public speeches could be analyzed and classified. And that the thousands of possible words were all formed from varying combinations of hardly more than a hundred distinct syllables. Having thoroughly tested his discovery until satisfied of its correctness, he next proceeded to formulate a symbol for each syllable. For this purpose he made use of a number of characters which he found in an old English spelling book, picking out capitals, lowercase, italics, and figures, and placing them right side up or upside down. Without any idea of their sound or significance as used in English, see plate V. Having thus utilized some thirty-five ready-made characters, to which must be added a dozen or more produced by modification of the same originals, he designed from his own imagination as many more as were necessary to his purpose. Making eighty-five in all. The complete syllabary, as first elaborated, would have required some one hundred and fifteen characters, but after much hard study over the hissing sound in its various combinations. He hit upon the expedient of representing the sound by means of a distinct character, the exact equivalent of our letter S, whenever it formed the initial of a syllable. Says Gallatin, it wanted but one step more, and to have also given a distinct character to each consonant, to reduce the whole number to sixteen, and to have had an alphabet similar to ours. In practice, however, and as applied to his own language, the superiority of Gessa's alphabet is manifest, and has been fully proved by experience. You must indeed learn and remember eighty-five characters instead of twenty-five, sick. But this once accomplished, the education of the pupil is completed, he can read and he is perfect in his orthography without making it the subject of a distinct study. The boy learns in a few weeks that which occupies two years of the time of ours. Says Phillips, in my own observation Indian children will take one or two, at times several, years to master the English printed and written language, but in a few days can read and write in Cherokee. They do the latter, in fact, as soon as they learn to shape letters. As soon as they master the alphabet they have got rid of all the perplexing questions in orthography that puzzle the brains of our children. It is not too much to say that a child will learn in a month, by the same effort, as thoroughly in the language of Sequoia, that which in ours consumes the time of our children for at least two years. Although in theory the written Cherokee word has one letter for each syllable, the rule does not always hold good in practice, owing to the frequent elision of vowel sounds. Thus the word for, soul, is written with four letters as adananta, but pronounced in three syllables, adanta. In the same way tsaluanayusti, like tobacco, the cardinal flower, is pronounced saliusti. There are also, as in other languages, a number of minute sound variations not indicated in the written word, so that it is necessary to have heard the language spoken in order to read with correct pronunciation. The old upper dialect is the standard to which the alphabet has been adapted. There is no provision for the R of the lower or the SH of the middle dialect, each speaker usually making his own dialectic change in the reading. The letters of a word are not connected, and there is no difference between the written and the printed character. Authorities, Gallatin, Synopsis of the Indian Tribes, in Trans A.M. Antique, S.O.C., 2, 1836. Phillips, Sequoia, in Harper's Magazine, September, 1870, Pilling, Bibliography of Iroquoian Languages, Article on Guess and Plate of Syllabary, 1888, Author's Personal Information. 41, Southern Gold Fields, p. Almost every valuable mineral and crystal known to the manufacturer or the lapidary is found in the southern Alleghenies, although, so far as present knowledge goes, but few of these occur in paying quantities. It is probable, however, that this estimate may change with improved methods and enlarged railroad facilities. Leaving out of account the earlier operations by the Spanish, French, and English adventurers, of which mention has already been made. The first authentic account of gold finding in any of the states south of Mason and Dixon's line within what may be called the American period appears to be that given by Jefferson, writing in 1781, of a lump of ore found in Virginia, which yielded seventeen pennyweights of gold. This was probably not the earliest, however, 
as we find doubtful references to gold discoveries in both Carolinas before the Revolution. The first mint returns of gold were made from North Carolina in 1793, and from South Carolina in 1829, although gold is certainly known to have been found in the latter state some years earlier. The earliest gold records for the other southern states are, approximately, Georgia, near Dallanaga, 1815-1820, Alabama, 1830, Tennessee, Cocoa Creek, Monroe County, 1831, Maryland, Montgomery County, 1849. Systematic tracing of gold belts southward from North Carolina began in 1829 and speedily resulted in the forcible eviction of the Cherokee from the gold-bearing region. Most of the precious metal was procured from placers or alluvial deposits by a simple process of digging and washing. Very little quartz mining has yet been attempted, and that usually by the crudest methods. In fact, for a long period gold working was followed as a sort of side issue to farming between crop seasons. In North Carolina prospectors obtained permission from the owners of the land to wash or dig on shares, varying from one-fourth to one-half. And the proprietor was accustomed to put his slaves to work in the same way along the creek bottoms after the crops had been safely gathered. The dust became a considerable medium of circulation, and miners were accustomed to carry about with them quills filled with gold, and a pair of small hand scales, on which they weighed out gold at regular rates. For instance, three and a half grains of gold was the customary equivalent of a pint of whiskey. For a number of years, about 1830 and later, a man named Beckler coined gold on his own account in North Carolina, and these coins, with Mexican silver, are said to have constituted the chief currency over a large region. A regular mint was established at Dallanaga in 1838 and maintained for some years. From 1804 to 1827 all the gold produced in the United States came from North Carolina, although the total amounted to but $110,000. The discovery of the rich deposits in California checked mining operations in the South, and the Civil War brought about an almost complete suspension, from which there is hardly yet a revival. According to the best official estimates the gold production of the Southern Allegheny region for the century from 1799 to 1898, inclusive, has been something over $46 million, distributed as follows. North Carolina 21,926,376 dollars. Georgia. 16,658. 630. South Carolina. 3,961,863. Virginia, slightly in excess of. 3,216,343. Alabama, slightly in excess of. 437,927. Tennessee, slightly in excess of. 167,405. Maryland. 47,068. Total, slightly in excess of. 46,415,612. Authorities, Becker. Gold Fields of the Southern Appalachians, in the 16th Annual Report United States Geological Survey, 1895. Day, Mineral Resources of the United States, 17th Annual Report United States Geological Survey, Part 3, 1896. Nitsa, Gold Mining and Metallurgy in the Southern States, in North Carolina Geological Survey Report, Republished in Mineral Resources of the United States, 20th Annual Report United States Geological Survey, Part 6, 1899. Landman, Letters from the Allegheny Mountains, 1849. 42, Extension of Georgia Laws, 1830, p. It is hereby ordained that all the laws of Georgia are extended over the Cherokee country. That after the first day of June, 1830, all Indians then and at that time residing in said territory, shall be liable and subject to such laws and regulations as the legislature may hereafter prescribe. That all laws, usages, and customs made and established and enforced in the said territory, by the said Cherokee Indians, be, and the same are hereby, on and after the first day of June, 1830, declared null and void. And no Indian, or descendant of an Indian, 
residing within the Creek or Cherokee nations of Indians, shall be deemed a competent witness or party to any suit in any court where a white man is a defendant. Extract from the Act passed by the Georgia Legislature on December 20, 1828, to add the territory within this state and occupied by the Cherokee Indians to the counties of DeKalb et al., and to extend the laws of this state over the same. Authorities, Drake, Indians, page 439, edition 1880, Royce, Cherokee Nation of Indians, in 5th and Representative Bureau of Ethnology, page 260, 1888. 43, Removal Forts, 1838, p. For collecting the Cherokee preparatory to the removal, the following stockade forts were built, in North Carolina, Fort Lindsay, on the south side of the Tennessee River at the junction of Nantahala, in Swain County. Fort Scott, at Aquone, farther up Nantahala River, in Macon County, Fort Montgomery, at Robbinsville, in Graham County, Fort Hembree, at Hayesville, in Clay County, Fort Delaney, at Valleytown, in Cherokee County. Fort Butler, at Murphy, in the same county. In Georgia, Fort Scudder, on Frogtown Creek, north of Dallanaga, in Lumpkin County, Fort Gilmer, near Elijay, in Gilmer County, Fort Kusawati, in Murray County. Fort Talking Rock, near Jasper, in Pickens County, Fort Buffington, near Canton, in Cherokee County. In Tennessee, Fort Cass, at Calhoun, on Hiwassee River, in McMinn County. In Alabama, Fort Tickytown, on Coosa River, at Center, in Cherokee County. Authority, Author's Personal Information. 44, McNair's Grave, P. Just inside the Tennessee line, where the Conasauga River bends again into Georgia, is a stonewalled grave, with a slab, on which is an epitaph which tells its own story of the removal heartbreak. McNair was a white man, prominent in the Cherokee Nation, whose wife was a daughter of the chief, Van, who welcomed the Moravian missionaries and gave his own house for their use. The date shows that she died while the removal was in progress, possibly while waiting in the stockade camp. The inscription, with details, is given from information kindly furnished by Mr. D. K. Dunn of Conasauga, Tennessee, in a letter dated August 16, 1890. Sacred to the memory of David and Delilah A. McNair, who departed this life, the former on the 15th of August, 1836, and the latter on the 30th of November, 1838. Their children, being members of the Cherokee Nation and having to go with their people to the West, do leave this monument, not only to show their regard for their parents, but to guard their sacred ashes against the unhallowed intrusion of the white man. 45. President Samuel Houston, P. This remarkable man was born in Rockbridge County, Virginia, March 2, 1793, and died at Huntsville, Texas, July 25, 1863. Of strangely versatile, but forceful, character, he occupies a unique position in American history, combining in a wonderful degree the rough manhood of the pioneer, the eccentric vanity of the Indian, the stern dignity of the soldier. The genius of the statesman, and with all the high chivalry of a knight of the olden time. His erratic career has been the subject of much cheap romancing, but the simple facts are of sufficient interest in themselves without the aid of fictitious embellishment. To the Cherokee, whom he loved so well, he was known as Kalenu, the Raven, an old war title in the tribe. His father having died when the boy was nine years old, his widowed mother removed with him to Tennessee, opposite the territory of the Cherokee, whose boundary was then the Tennessee River. Here he worked on the farm, attending school at intervals. But, being of adventurous disposition, he left home when sixteen years old, and, crossing over the river, joined the Cherokee, among whom he soon became a great favorite, being adopted into the family of Chief Jolly, from whom the island at the mouth of Hiwassee takes its name. After three years of this life, during which time he wore the Indian dress and learned the Indian language, he returned to civilization and enlisted as a private soldier under Jackson in the Creek War. He soon attracted favorable notice and was promoted to the rank of ensign. By striking bravery at the bloody Battle of Horseshoe Bend, where he scaled the breastworks with an arrow in his thigh and led his men into the thick of the enemy, he won the lasting friendship of Jackson, who made him a lieutenant. 
although he was then barely 21. He continued in the army after the war, serving for a time as subagent for the Cherokee at Jackson's request, until the summer of 1818, when he resigned on account of some criticism by Calhoun, then Secretary of War. An official investigation, held at his demand, resulted in his exoneration. Removing to Nashville, he began the study of law, and, being shortly afterward admitted to the bar, set up in practice at Lebanon. Within five years he was successively district attorney and adjutant general and major general of state troops. In 1823 he was elected to Congress, serving two terms, at the end of which, in 1827, he was elected governor of Tennessee by an overwhelming majority, being then 34 years of age. Shortly before this time he had fought and wounded General White in a duel. In January, 1829, he married a young lady residing near Nashville, but two months later, without a word of explanation to any outsider, he left her, resigned his governorship and other official dignities, and left the state forever. To rejoin his old friends, the Cherokee, in the West. For years the reason for this strange conduct was a secret, and Houston himself always refused to talk of it. But it is now understood to have been due to the fact that his wife admitted to him that she loved another and had only been induced to marry him by the over-persuasions of her parents. From Tennessee he went to Indian Territory, whither a large part of the Cherokee had already removed, and once more took up his residence near Chief Jolly, who was now the principal chief of the Western Cherokee. The great disappointment which seemed to have blighted his life at its brightest was heavy at his heart, and he sought forgetfulness in drink to such an extent that for a time his manhood seemed to have departed, notwithstanding which. Such was his force of character and his past reputation, he retained his hold upon the affections of the Cherokee in his standing with the officers and their families at the neighboring posts of Fort Smith, Fort Gibson, and Fort Coffey. In the meantime his former wife in Tennessee had obtained a divorce, and Houston being thus free once more soon after married Tallahena, the youngest daughter of a prominent mixed-blood Cherokee named Rogers, who resided near Fort Gibson. She was the niece of Houston's adopted father, Chief Jolly, and he had known her when a boy in the old nation. Being a beautiful girl, and educated above her surroundings, she became a welcome guest wherever her husband was received. He started a trading store near Weber's Falls, but continued in his dissipated habits until recalled to his senses by the outcome of a drunken affray in which he assaulted his adopted father, the old chief, and was himself fell to the ground unconscious. Upon recovery from his injuries he made a public apology for his conduct and thenceforward led a sober life. In 1832 he visited Washington in the interest of the Western Cherokee, calling an Indian costume upon President Jackson, who received him with old-time friendship. Being accused while there of connection with a fraudulent Indian contract, he administered a severe beating to his accuser, a member of Congress. For this he was fined $500 and reprimanded by the bar of the House, but Jackson remitted the fine. Soon after his return to the West he removed to Texas to take part in the agitation just started against Mexican rule. He was a member of the convention which adopted a separate constitution for Texas in 1833, and two years later aided in forming a provisional government, and was elected commander-in-chief to organize the new militia. In 1836 he was a member of the convention which declared the independence of Texas. At the Battle of San Jacinto in April of that year he defeated with 750 men Santa Ana's army of 1,800, inflicting upon the Mexicans the terrible loss of 630 killed and 730 prisoners, among whom was Santa Ana himself. Houston received a severe wound in the engagement. In the autumn of the same year he was elected first president of the Republic of Texas, receiving more than four-fifths of the votes cast. He served two years and retired at the end of his term, leaving the country on good terms with both Mexico and the Indian tribes, and with its notes at par. He was immediately elected to the Texas Congress and served in that capacity until 1841, when he was re-elected president. It was during these years that he made his steadfast fight in behalf of the Texas Cherokee, as is narrated elsewhere, supporting their cause without wavering, at the risk of his own popularity and position. He frequently declared that no treaty made and carried out in good faith had ever been violated by Indians. 
His Cherokee wife having died some time before, he was again married in 1840, this time to a lady from Alabama, who exercised over him a restraining and ennobling influence through the stormy vicissitudes of his eventful life. In June, 1842, he vetoed a bill making him dictator for the purpose of resisting a threatened invasion from Mexico. On December 29, 1845, Texas was admitted to the Union, and in the following March Houston was elected to the Senate, where he served continuously until 1859, when he resigned to take his seat as governor, to which position he had just been elected. From 1852 to 1860 his name was three times presented before national presidential nominating conventions, the last time receiving 57 votes. He had taken issue with the Democratic majority throughout his term in the Senate, and when Texas passed the Secession Ordinance in February, 1861, being an uncompromising Union man. He refused to take the oath of allegiance to the Confederacy and was accordingly deposed from the office of governor, declining the proffered aid of federal troops to keep him in his seat. Unwilling either to fight against the Union or to take sides against his friends, he held aloof from the great struggle and remained in silent retirement until his death, two years later. No other man in American history has left such a record of continuous election to high office while steadily holding to his own convictions in the face of strong popular opposition. Authorities, Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography, 1894. Bonnell, Texas, 1840, Thrall, Texas, 1876, Lossing, Field Book of the War of 1812, 1869, Authors' Personal Information, Various Periodical and Newspaper Articles. 46. Chief John Ross, P. This great chief of the Cherokee, whose name is inseparable from their history, was himself but one-eighth of Indian blood and showed little of the Indian features, his father, Daniel Ross. Having emigrated from Scotland before the Revolution and married a quarter-blood Cherokee woman whose father, John MacDonald, was also from Scotland. He was born at or near the family residence at Rossville, Georgia, just across the line from Chattanooga, Tennessee. As a boy, he was known among the Cherokee as Tsanusti, Little John, but after arriving at manhood was called Gui Skui, the name of a rare migratory bird, of large size and white or grayish plumage. Said to have appeared formerly at long intervals in the old Cherokee country. It may have been the egret or the swan. He was educated at Kingston, Tennessee, and began his public career when barely 19 years of age. His first wife, a full-blood Cherokee woman, died in consequence of the hardships of the removal while on the Western March and was buried at Little Rock, Arkansas. Some years later he married again, this time to a Miss Stapler of Wilmington, Delaware, the marriage taking place in Philadelphia, author's personal information from Mr. Alan Ross, son of John Ross. See also Meredith, the Cherokees, in the Five Civilized Tribes, Extra Bulletin 11th Census, 1894. Kuiskui District of the Cherokee Nation West has been named in his honor. The following biographic facts are taken from the panegyric in his honor, passed by the National Council of the Cherokee, on hearing of his death, as feebly expressive of the loss they have sustained. John Ross was born October 3, 1790, and died in the city of Washington, August 1, 1866, in the 76th year of his age. His official career began in 1809, when he was entrusted by Agent Return Meigs with an important mission to the Arkansas Cherokee. From that time until the close of his life, with the exception of two or three years in the earlier part, he was in the constant service of his people. Furnishing an instance of confidence on their part and fidelity on his which has never been surpassed in the annals of history. In the War of 1813-14 against the Creeks he was adjutant of the Cherokee Regiment which cooperated with General Jackson, and was present at the Battle of the Horseshoe, where the Cherokee, under Colonel Morgan, of Tennessee, rendered distinguished service. In 1817 he was elected a member of the National Committee of the Cherokee Council. The first duty assigned him was to prepare a reply to the United States commissioners who were present for the purpose of negotiating with the Cherokee for their lands east of the Mississippi, in firm resistance to which he was destined. A few years later, to test the power of truth and to attain a reputation of no ordinary character. 
1819, October 26, his name first appears on the statute book of the Cherokee Nation as president of the National Committee, and is attached to an ordinance which looked to the improvement of the Cherokee people. Providing for the introduction into the nation of schoolmasters, blacksmiths, mechanics, and others. He continued to occupy that position till 1826. In 1827 he was associate chief with William Hicks, and president of the convention which adopted the constitution of that year. That constitution, it is believed, is the first effort at a regular government, with distinct branches and powers defined, ever made and carried into effect by any of the Indians of North America. From 1828 until the removal west, he was principal chief of the Eastern Cherokee, and from 1839 to the time of his death, principal chief of the United Cherokee Nation. In regard to the long contest which culminated in the removal, the resolutions declare that, the Cherokees, with John Ross at their head, alone with their treaties, achieved a recognition of their rights, but they were powerless to enforce them. They were compelled to yield, but not until the struggle had developed the highest qualities of patience, fortitude, and tenacity of right and purpose on their part, as well as that of their chief. The same may be said of their course after their removal to this country, and which resulted in the reunion of the Eastern and Western Cherokees as one people and in the adoption of the present Constitution. Concerning the events of the Civil War and the official attempt to depose Ross from his authority, they state that these occurrences, with many others in their trying history as a people, are confidently committed to the future page of the historian. It is enough to know that the treaty negotiated at Washington in 1866 bore the full and just recognition of John Ross' name as principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. The summing up of the panegyric is a splendid tribute to a splendid manhood. Blessed with a fine constitution and a vigorous mind, John Ross had the physical ability to follow the path of duty wherever it led. No danger appalled him. He never faltered in supporting what he believed to be right, but clung to it with a steadiness of purpose which alone could have sprung from the clearest convictions of rectitude. He never sacrificed the interests of his nation to expediency. He never lost sight of the welfare of the people. For them he labored daily for a long life, and upon them he bestowed his last expressed thoughts. A friend of law, he obeyed it. A friend of education, he faithfully encouraged schools throughout the country, and spent liberally his means in conferring it upon others. Given to hospitality, none ever hungered around his door. A professor of the Christian religion, he practiced its precepts. His works are inseparable from the history of the Cherokee people for nearly half a century, while his example in the daily walks of life will linger in the future and whisper words of hope, temperance, and charity in the years of posterity. Resolutions were also passed for bringing his body from Washington at the expense of the Cherokee Nation and providing for suitable obsequies, in order that his remains should rest among those he so long served, resolutions in honor of John Ross. In Laws of the Cherokee Nation, 1869. 47. The Ketua Society, p. This Cherokee secret society, which has recently achieved some newspaper prominence by its championship of Cherokee autonomy, derives its name, properly Kitawa. But commonly spelled Ketua in English print, from the ancient town in the old nation which formed the nucleus of the most conservative element of the tribe and sometimes gave a name to the nation itself, see Kitawagi, under tribal synonyms. A strong band of comradeship, if not a regular society organization, appears to have existed among the warriors and leading men of the various settlements of the Ketua district from a remote period. So that the name is even now used in councils as indicative of genuine Cherokee feeling in its highest patriotic form. When, some years ago, delegates from the Western Nation visited the East Cherokee to invite them to join their more prosperous brethren beyond the Mississippi. The speaker for the delegates expressed their fraternal feeling for their separated kinsmen by saying in his opening speech, We are all Ketua people, Ani, Ketuwagi. The Ketua Society in the Cherokee Nation West was organized shortly before the Civil War by John B. Jones, son of the missionary, Evan Jones, and an adopted citizen of the nation, as a secret society for the ostensible purpose of cultivating a national feeling among the full bloods. In opposition to the innovating tendencies of the mixed blood element. 
The real purpose was to counteract the influence of the Blue Lodge and other secret secessionist organizations among the wealthier slaveholding classes, made up chiefly of mixed bloods and whites. It extended to the Creeks, and its members in both tribes rendered good service to the Union cause throughout the war. They were frequently known as Pin Indians, for a reason explained below. Since the close of the Great Struggle the society has distinguished itself by its determined opposition to every scheme looking to the curtailment or destruction of Cherokee national self-government. The following account of the society was written shortly after the close of the Civil War. Those Cherokees who were loyal to the Union combined in a secret organization for self-protection, assuming the designation of the Ketuha Society. Which name was soon merged in that of Pins. The pins were so styled because of a peculiar manner they adopted of wearing a pin. The symbol was discovered by their enemies, who applied the term in derision. But it was accepted by this loyal league, and has almost superseded the designation which its members first assumed. The pin organization originated among the members of the Baptist congregation at Peavine, Going Snake District, in the Cherokee Nation. In a short time the society counted nearly 3,000 members, and had commenced proselytizing the Creeks, when the rebellion, against which it was arming, preventing its further extension. The poor Creeks having been driven into Kansas by the rebels of the Golden Circle. During the war the Pins rendered services to the Union cause in many bloody encounters, as has been acknowledged by our generals. It was distinctly an anti-slavery organization. The slaveholding Cherokees, who constituted the wealthy and more intelligent class, naturally allied themselves with the South, while loyal Cherokees became more and more opposed to slavery. This was shown very clearly when the Loyalists first met in convention, in February, 1863. They not only abolished slavery unconditionally and forever, before any slave state made a movement toward emancipation, but made any attempts at enslaving a grave misdemeanor. The secret signs of the pins were a peculiar way of touching the hat as a salutation, particularly when they were too far apart for recognition in other ways. They had a peculiar mode of taking hold of the lapel of the coat, first drawing it away from the body, and then giving it a motion as though wrapping it around the heart. During the war a portion of them were forced into the rebellion, but quickly rebelled against General Cooper, who was placed over them, and when they fought against that general, at Bird Creek, they wore a bit of corn husk, split into strips. Tied in their hair. In the night when two pins met, and one asked the other, Who are you? The reply or pass was, Tahlequah, who are you? The response was, I am Ketuha's son. Dr. D. J. McGowan, Indian Secret Societies, in Historical Magazine, X, 1866. 48. Farewell Address of Lloyd Welch, P. In the sad and eventful history of the Cherokee their gifted leaders, frequently of white ancestry, have oftentimes spoken to the world with eloquent words of appeal, of protest, or of acknowledgement. But never more eloquently than in the last farewell of Chief Lloyd Welch to the Eastern Band, as he felt the end draw near, Leaflet, McGowan, Chattanooga, N. D. 1880. To the Chairman and Council of the Eastern Band of Cherokees. My brothers, it becomes my imperative duty to bid you an affectionate farewell, and resign into your hands the trust you so generously confided to my keeping. Principal Chief of the Eastern Band It is with great solicitude and anxiety for your welfare that I am constrained to take this course. But the inexorable laws of nature, and the rapid decline of my health, admonish me that soon, very soon, I will have passed from earth, my body consigned to the tomb, my spirit to God who gave it, in that happy home in the beyond. Where there is no sickness, no sorrow, no pain, no death, but one eternal joy and happiness forevermore. The only regret that I feel for thus being so soon called from among you, at the meridian of manhood, when hope is sweet, is the great anxiety I have to serve and benefit my race. For this I have studied and labored for the past ten years of my life, to secure to my brothers equal justice from their brothers of the West and the United States, and that you would no longer be hewers of wood and drawers of water. But assume that proud position among the civilized nations of the earth intended by the Creator that we should occupy, and which in the near future you will take or be exterminated. 
When you become educated, as a natural consequence you will become more intelligent, sober, industrious, and prosperous. It has been the aim of my life, the chief object, to serve my race faithfully, honestly, and to the best of my ability. How well I have succeeded I will leave to history and your magnanimity to decide, trusting an all-wise and just God to guide and protect you in the future, as He will do all things well. We may fail when on earth to see the goodness and wisdom of God in removing from us our best and most useful men. But when we have crossed over on the other shore to our happy and eternal home in the far beyond then our eyes will be opened and we will be enabled to see and realize the goodness and mercy of God in thus afflicting us while here on earth. And will be enabled more fully to praise God, from whom all blessings come. I hope that when you come to select one from among you to take the responsible position of principal chief of your band you will lay aside all personal considerations and select one in every respect competent, without stain on his fair fame. A pure, noble, honest, man, one who loves God and all that is pure, with intellect sufficient to know your rights, independence and nerve to defend them. Should you be thus fortunate in making your choice, all will be well. It has been truthfully said that when the righteous rule the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule the people mourn. I am satisfied that you have among you many who are fully competent of the task. If I was satisfied it was your wish and for the good of my brothers I might mention some of them, but think it best to leave you in the hands of an all-wise God, who does all things right, to guide and direct you aright. And now, my brothers. In taking perhaps my last farewell on earth I do pray God that you may so conduct yourselves while here on earth that when the last sad rite is performed by loved friends we may compose one unbroken family above in that celestial city from whose born no traveller has ever returned to describe the beauty, grandeur, and happiness of the heaven prepared for the faithful by God Himself beyond the sky. And again, my brothers, permit me to bid you a fond, but perhaps a last, farewell on earth until we meet again where parting is never known and friends meet to part no more forever. L. R. Welch Principal Chief Eastern Band Cherokee Indians Witness Samuel W. Davidson B. B. Maroney 49. Status of Eastern Band, P. For some reason all authorities who have hitherto discussed the status of the Eastern Band of Cherokee seem to have been entirely unaware of the enactment of the supplementary articles to the Treaty of New Dakota, by which all preemption and reservation rights granted under the Twelfth Article were cancelled. Thus, in the Cherokee case of the United States at all against D.T. Boyd et al., we find the United States Circuit Judge quoting the Twelfth Article in its original form as a basis for argument. While his associate judge says, their forefathers availed themselves of a provision in the Treaty of New Dakota and remained in the state of North Carolina, etc. Report of Indian Commissioner for 1895, pages 633 to 635, 1896. The truth is that the treaty as ratified with its supplementary articles cancelled the residence right of every Cherokee east of the Mississippi. And it was not until thirty years afterwards that North Carolina finally gave assurance that the Eastern Band would be permitted to remain within her borders. The Twelfth Article of the New Dakota Treaty of December 29, 1835, provides for a pro rata apportionment to such Cherokee as desire to remain in the East. And continues, such heads of Cherokee families as are desirous to reside within the states of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Alabama, subject to the laws of the same, and who are qualified or calculated to become useful citizens, shall be entitled, on the certificate of the commissioners, to a preemption right to 160 acres of land, or one quarter section, at the minimum Congress price, so as to include the present buildings or improvements of those who now reside there. And such as do not live there at present shall be permitted to locate within two years any lands not already occupied by persons entitled to preemption privilege under this treaty, etc. Article 13 defines terms with reference to individual reservations granted under former treaties. The preamble to the supplementary articles agreed upon on March 1, 1836, recites that, whereas the President of the United States has expressed his determination not to allow any preemptions or reservations. 
his desire being that the whole Cherokee people should remove together and establish themselves in the country provided for them west of the Mississippi River. Article 1 It is therefore agreed that all preemption rights and reservations provided for in Articles 12 and 13 shall be and are hereby relinquished and declared void. The treaty, in this shape, was ratified on May 23, 1836, see Indian Treaties, pages 633 to 648, 1837. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual. Report PL. 11. Swimmer, I. I. N. I. 4. Stories and Storytellers. Cherokee myths may be roughly classified as sacred myths, animal stories, local legends, and historical traditions. To the first class belong the Genesis stories, dealing with the creation of the world, the nature of the heavenly bodies and elemental forces, the origin of life and death, the spirit world and the invisible beings, the ancient monsters, and the hero gods. It is almost certain that most of the myths of this class are but disjointed fragments of an original complete genesis and migration legend, which is now lost. With nearly every tribe that has been studied we find such a sacred legend, preserved by the priests of the tradition, who alone are privileged to recite and explain it. And dealing with the origin and wanderings of the people from the beginning of the world to the final settlement of the tribe in its home territory. Among the best examples of such Genesis traditions are those recorded in the Wallamolum of the Delawares and Matthew's Navajo origin legend. Others may be found in Cusick's History of the Six Nations, Gatshet's Creek Migration Legend, and the author's Gkarilla Genesis. The Cheyenne, Arapaho, and other Plains tribes are known to have similar Genesis myths. The former existence of such a national legend among the Cherokee is confirmed by Haywood, writing in 1823, who states on information obtained from a principal man in the tribe that they had once a long oration, then nearly forgotten, which recounted the history of their wanderings from the time when they had been first placed upon the earth by some superior power from above. Up to about the middle of the last century this tradition was still recited at the annual Greencorn Dance. Unlike most Indians the Cherokee are not conservative, and even before the revolution had so far lost their primitive customs from contact with the whites that Adair, in 1775, calls them a nest of apostate hornets who for more than thirty years have been fast degenerating. Whatever it may have been, their national legend is now lost forever. The secret organizations that must have existed formerly among the priesthood have also disappeared, and each man now works independently according to his individual gifts and knowledge. The sacred myths were not for every one, but only those might hear who observed the proper form and ceremony. When John Axe and other old men were boys, now some eighty years ago, the myth keepers and priests were accustomed to meet together at night in the ACI, or low built log sleeping house, to recite the traditions and discuss their secret knowledge. At times, those who desired instruction from an adept in the sacred lore of the tribe met him by appointment in the ACI, where they sat up all night talking with only the light of a small fire burning in the middle of the floor. At daybreak the whole party went down to the running stream, where the pupils or hearers of the myth stripped themselves, and were scratched upon their naked skin with a bone-tooth comb in the hands of the priest, after which they waded out, facing the rising sun, and dipped seven times under the water, while the priest recited prayers upon the bank. This purificatory rite, observed more than a century ago by Adair, is also a part of the ceremonial of the ball play, the green corn dance, and, in fact, every important ritual performance. Before beginning one of the stories of the sacred class the informant would sometimes suggest jokingly that the author first submit to being scratched and, go to water. As a special privilege a boy was sometimes admitted to the ACI on such occasions, to tend the fire, and thus had the opportunity to listen to the stories and learn something of the secret rites. In this way John Axe gained much of his knowledge, although he does not claim to be an adept. As he describes it, the fire intended to heat the room, for the nights are cold in the Cherokee Mountains, was built upon the ground in the center of the small house, which was not high enough to permit a standing position. While the occupants sat in a circle around it. In front of the fire was placed a large flat rock, and near it a pile of pine knots or splints. 
When the fire had burned down to a bed of coals, the boy lighted one or two of the pine knots and laid them upon the rock, where they blazed with a bright light until nearly consumed, when others were laid upon them, and so on until daybreak. Sometimes the pine splints were set up crosswise, thus, times 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 times, in a circle around the fire, with a break at the eastern side. They were then lighted from one end and burned gradually around the circle, fresh splints being set up behind as those in front were consumed. Lawson describes this identical custom as witnessed at a dance among the Waxhaw, on Catawba River, in 1701. Now, to return to our state house, whither we were invited by the grandees. As soon as we came into it, they placed our Englishman near the king, it being my fortune to sit next him, having his great general or war captain on my other hand. The house is as dark as a dungeon, and as hot as one of the Dutch stoves in Holland. They had made a circular fire of split canes in the middle of the house, it was one man's employment to add more split reeds to the one end as it consumed at the other, there being a small vacancy left to supply it with fuel. To the second class belong the shorter animal myths, which have lost whatever sacred character they may once have had, and are told now merely as humorous explanations of certain animal peculiarities. While the sacred myths have a constant bearing upon formulistic prayers and observances, it is only in rare instances that any rite or custom is based upon an animal myth. Moreover, the sacred myths are known as a rule only to the professional priests or conjurers, while the shorter animal stories are more or less familiar to nearly everyone and are found in almost identical form among Cherokee, Creeks, and other southern tribes. The animals of the Cherokee myths, like the traditional hero gods, were larger and of more perfect type than their present representatives. They had chiefs, councils, and townhouses, mingled with humankind upon terms of perfect equality and spoke the same language. In some unexplained manner they finally left this lower world and ascended to Galuan Lati, the world above, where they still exist. The removal was not simultaneous, but each animal chose his own time. The animals that we know, small in size and poor in intellect, came upon the earth later, and are not the descendants of the mythic animals, but only weak imitations. In one or two special cases, however, the present creature is the descendant of a former monster. Trees and plants also were alive and could talk in the old days, and had their place in council, but do not figure prominently in the myths. Each animal had his appointed station and duty. Thus, the Wallaasai frog was the marshal and leader in the council, while the rabbit was the messenger to carry all public announcements, and usually led the dance besides. He was also the great trickster and mischief-maker, a character which he bears in eastern and southern Indian myth generally, as well as in the southern negro stories. The bear figures as having been originally a man, with human form and nature. As with other tribes and countries, almost every prominent rock and mountain, every deep bend in the river, in the old Cherokee country has its accompanying legend. It may be a little story that can be told in a paragraph, to account for some natural feature, or it may be one chapter of a myth that has its sequel in a mountain a hundred miles away. As is usual when a people has lived for a long time in the same country, nearly every important myth is localized, thus assuming more definite character. There is the usual number of anecdotes and stories of personal adventure, some of them irredeemably vulgar, but historical traditions are strangely wanting. The authentic records of unlettered peoples are short at best, seldom going back much farther than the memories of their oldest men. And although the Cherokee have been the most important of the southern tribes, making wars and treaties for three centuries with Spanish, English, French, and Americans, Iroquois, Shawano, Catawba, and Creeks, there is little evidence of the fact in their traditions. This condition may be due in part to the temper of the Cherokee mind, which, as has been already stated, is accustomed to look forward to new things rather than to dwell upon the past. The First Cherokee War, with its stories of Agansta, Ta and Atagul Kalu, is absolutely forgotten. Of the long revolutionary struggle they have hardly a recollection, although they were constantly fighting throughout the whole period and for several years after, and at one time were brought to the verge of ruin by four concerted expeditions, which ravaged their country simultaneously from different directions and destroyed almost every one of their towns. 
Even the Creek War, in which many of their warriors took a prominent part, was already nearly forgotten some years ago. Beyond a few stories of encounters with the Shawano and Iroquois there is hardly anything that can be called history until well within the present century. With some tribes the winter season and the night are the time for telling stories, but to the Cherokee all times are alike. As our grandmothers begin, once upon a time, so the Cherokee storyteller introduces his narrative by saying, this is what the old men told me when I was a boy. Not all tell the same stories, for in tribal lore, as in all other sorts of knowledge, we find specialists. Some common minds take note only of common things, little stories of the rabbit, the terrapin, and the others, told to point a joke or amuse a child. Others dwell upon the wonderful and supernatural, Sulkal, Sunahi, and the thunderers, and those sacred things to be told only with prayer and purification. Then, again, there are still a few old warriors who live in the memory of heroic days when there were wars with the Seneca and the Shawano, and these men are the historians of the tribe and the conservators of its antiquities. The question of the origin of myths is one which affords abundant opportunity for ingenious theories in the absence of any possibility of proof. Those of the Cherokee are too far broken down ever to be woven together again into any long-connected origin legend, such as we find with some tribes. Although a few still exhibit a certain sequence which indicates that they once formed component parts of a cycle. From the prominence of the rabbit in the animal stories, as well as in those found among the southern Negroes, an effort has been made to establish for them a Negro origin. Regardless of the fact that the rabbit, the great white rabbit, is the hero god, trickster, and wonder worker of all the tribes east of the Mississippi from Hudson Bay to the Gulf. In European folklore also the rabbit is regarded as something uncanny and half-supernatural, and even in far-off Korea he is the central figure in the animal myths. Just why this should be so is a question that may be left to the theorist to decide. Among the Algonquian tribes the name, Weibos, seems to have been confounded with that of the dawn, Waban. So that the great white rabbit is really the incarnation of the eastern dawn that brings light and life and drives away the dark shadows which have held the world in chains. The animal itself seems to be regarded by the Indians as the fitting type of defenseless weakness protected and made safe by constantly alert vigilance, and with a disposition, moreover, for turning up at unexpected moments. The same characteristics would appeal as strongly to the primitive mind of the Negro. The very expression which Harris puts into the mouth of Uncle Remus, in dem days Burr Rabbit and his family was at the head er de gang wn any racket was in hand, was paraphrased in the Cherokee language by Suyeda in introducing his first rabbit story, T.S.I. Stu Wooligan Atutin on Gutsada G's I, the rabbit was the leader of them all in mischief. The expression struck the author so forcibly that the words were recorded as spoken. In regard to the contact between the two races, by which such stories could be borrowed from one by the other. It is not commonly known that in all the southern colonies Indian slaves were bought and sold and kept in servitude and worked in the field side by side with Negroes up to the time of the Revolution. Not to go back to the Spanish period, when such things were the order of the day, we find the Cherokee as early as 1693 complaining that their people were being kidnapped by slave hunters. Hundreds of captured Tuscarora and nearly the whole tribe of the Apalachee were distributed as slaves among the Carolina colonists in the early part of the 18th century, while the Natchez and others shared a similar fate in Louisiana. And as late at least as 1776 Cherokee prisoners of war were still sold to the highest bidder for the same purpose. At one time it was charged against the governor of South Carolina that he was provoking a general Indian war by his encouragement of slave hunts. Furthermore, as the coast tribes dwindled they were compelled to associate and intermarry with the Negroes until they finally lost their identity and were classed with that race. So that a considerable proportion of the blood of the southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. The Negro, with his genius for imitation and his love for stories, especially of the comic variety, must undoubtedly have absorbed much from the Indian in this way, while on the other hand the Indian with his pride of conservatism and his contempt for a subject race, would have taken but little from the Negro, and that little could not easily have found its way back to the free tribes. 
Some of these animal stories are common to widely separated tribes among whom there can be no suspicion of Negro influences. Thus the famous, Tar Baby, story has variants, not only among the Cherokee, but also in New Mexico, Washington, and southern Alaska, wherever, in fact. The pinion or the pine supplies enough gum to be molded into a ball for Indian uses, while the incident of the rabbit dining the bear is found with nearly every tribe from Nova Scotia to the Pacific. The idea that such stories are necessarily of Negro origin is due largely to the common but mistaken notion that the Indian has no sense of humor. In many cases it is not necessary to assume borrowing from either side, the myths being such as would naturally spring up in any part of the world among primitive people accustomed to observe the characteristics of animals which their religious system regarded as differing in no essential from humankind, save only in outward form. Thus in Europe and America the terrapin has been accepted as the type of plodding slowness, while the rabbit, with his sudden dash, or the deer with his bounding stride, is the type of speed. What more natural than that the storyteller should set one to race against the other, with the victory in favor of the patient striver against the self-confident boaster? The idea of a hungry wolf or other beast of prey luring his victims by the promise of a new song or dance, during which they must close their eyes, is also one that would easily occur among any primitive people whose chief pastime is dancing. On the other hand, such a conception as that of Flint and the Rabbit could only be the outgrowth of a special cosmogonic theology, though now indeed broken and degraded. And it is probable that many myths told now only for amusement are really worn down fragments of ancient sacred traditions. Thus the story just noted appears in a different dress among the Iroquois as a part of their great creation myth. The Cherokee being a detached tribe of the Iroquois, we may expect to find among the latter, if it be not already too late, the explanation and more perfect statement of some things which are obscure in the Cherokee myths. It must not be forgotten, however, that the Indian, like other men, does some things for simple amusement, and it is useless to look for occult meanings where none exist. Except as to the local traditions and a few others which are obviously the direct outgrowth of Cherokee conditions, it is impossible to fix a definite starting point for the myths. It would be unwise to assert that even the majority of them originated within the tribe. The Cherokee have strains of Creek, Catawba, Achi, Natchez, Iroquois, Osage, and Shawano blood, and such admixture implies contact more or less intimate and continued. Indians are great wanderers, and a myth can travel as far as a redstone pipe or a string of wampum. It was customary, as it still is to a limited extent in the West, for large parties, sometimes even a whole band or village, to make long visits to other tribes, dancing, feasting, trading and exchanging stories with their friends for weeks or months at a time, with the expectation that their hosts would return the visit within the next summer. Regular trade routes crossed the continent from east to west and from north to south. And when the subject has been fully investigated it will be found that this intertribal commerce was as constant and well recognized a part of Indian life as is our own railroad traffic today. The very existence of a trade jargon or a sign language is proof of intertribal relations over wide areas. Their political alliances also were often far-reaching, for Pontiac welded into a warlike confederacy all the tribes from the Atlantic border to the head of the Mississippi. While the emissaries of the Shawano Prophet carried the story of his revelations throughout the whole region from the Florida coast to the Saskatchewan. In view of these facts it is as useless to attempt to trace the origin of every myth as to claim a Cherokee authorship for them all. From what we know of the character of the Shawano, their tendency toward the ceremonial and the mystic, and their close relations with the Cherokee, it may be inferred that some of the myths originated with that tribe. We should naturally expect also to find close correspondence with the myths of the Creeks and other southern tribes within the former area of the Mobilian trade language. The localization at home of all the more important myths indicates a long residence in the country. As the majority of those here given belong to the half-dozen counties still familiar to the East Cherokee, we may guess how many attached to the ancient territory of the tribe are now irrecoverably lost. Contact with the white race seems to have produced very little impression on the tribal mythology, and not more than three or four stories current among the Cherokee can be assigned to a Caucasian source. 
These have not been reproduced here, for the reason that they are plainly European, and the author has chosen not to follow the example of some collectors who have assumed that every tale told in an Indian language is necessarily an Indian story. Scores recorded in collections from the North and West are nothing more than variants from the celebrated Hosmarken, as told by French trappers and voyagers to their Indian campmates and half-breed children. It might perhaps be thought that missionary influence would be evident in the Genesis tradition, but such is not the case. The Bible story kills the Indian tradition, and there is no amalgamation. It is hardly necessary to say that stories of a great fish which swallows a man and of a great flood which destroys a people are found the world over. The supposed Cherokee hero god, Wasi, described by one writer as so remarkably resembling the great Hebrew lawgiver is in fact that great teacher himself, Wasi being the Cherokee approximate for Moses. And the good missionary who first recorded the story was simply listening to a chapter taken by his convert from the Cherokee Testament. The whole primitive pantheon of the Cherokee is still preserved in their sacred formulas. As compared with those from some other tribes the Cherokee myths are clean. For picturesque imagination and wealth of detail they rank high, and some of the wonder stories may challenge those of Europe and India. The numerous parallels furnished will serve to indicate their relation to the general Indian system. Unless otherwise noted, every myth here given has been obtained directly from the Indians, and in nearly every case has been verified from several sources. I know not how the truth may be. I tell the tale as, t'was told to me. First and chief in the list of storytellers comes I. Aini, swimmer, from whom nearly three-fourths of the whole number were originally obtained. Together with nearly as large a proportion of the whole body of Cherokee material now in possession of the author. The collection could not have been made without his help, and now that he is gone it can never be duplicated. Born about 1835, shortly before the removal, he grew up under the instruction of masters to be a priest, doctor, and keeper of tradition. So that he was recognized as an authority throughout the band and by such a competent outside judge as Colonel Thomas. He served through the war as second sergeant of the Cherokee Company A, 69th North Carolina Confederate Infantry, Thomas Legion. He was prominent in the local affairs of the band, and no green corn dance, ball play, or other tribal function was ever considered complete without his presence and active assistance. A genuine aboriginal antiquarian and patriot, proud of his people and their ancient system. He took delight in recording in his native alphabet the songs and sacred formulas of priests and dancers and the names of medicinal plants and the prescriptions with which they were compounded, while his mind was a storehouse of Indian tradition. To a happy descriptive style he added a musical voice for the songs and a peculiar faculty for imitating the characteristic cry of bird or beast, so that to listen to one of his recitals was often a pleasure in itself. Even to one who understood not a word of the language. He spoke no English, and to the day of his death clung to the moccasin and turban, together with the rattle, his badge of authority. He died in March, 1899, aged about sixty-five, and was buried like a true Cherokee on the slope of a forest-clad mountain. Peace to his ashes and sorrow for his going, for with him perished half the tradition of a people. Next in order comes the name of Ataganahi, better known as John Axe, born about 1800 and now consequently just touching the century mark, being the oldest man of the band. He has a distinct recollection of the Creek War, at which time he was about twelve years of age, and was already married and a father when the lands east of Nantahala were sold by the Treaty of 1819. Although not a professional priest or doctor, he was recognized, before age had dulled his faculties, as an authority upon all relating to tribal custom, and was an expert in the making of rattles, wands, and other ceremonial paraphernalia. Of a poetic and imaginative temperament, he cared most for the wonder stories, of the giant sulkal, of the great Actina or of the invisible spirit people, but he had also a keen appreciation of the humorous animal stories. He speaks no English, and with his erect spare figure and piercing eye is a fine specimen of the old-time Indian. Notwithstanding his great age he walked without other assistance than his stick to the last ball game, where he watched every run with the closest interest, and would have attended the dance the night before but for the interposition of friends. Suyeda, the chosen one, 
who preaches regularly as a Baptist minister to an Indian congregation, does not deal much with the Indian supernatural, perhaps through deference to his clerical obligations. But has a good memory and liking for rabbit stories and others of the same class. He served in the Confederate Army during the war as 4th Sergeant in Company A, of the 69th North Carolina, and is now a well-preserved man of about 62. He speaks no English, but by an ingenious system of his own has learned to use a concordance for verifying references in his Cherokee Bible. He is also a first-class carpenter and mason. Another principal informant was Ta Gwadihai, Kataba Killer, of Chiawa, who died a few years ago, aged about 70. He was a doctor and made no claim to special knowledge of myths or ceremonials, but was able to furnish several valuable stories, besides confirmatory evidence for a large number obtained from other sources. Besides these may be named, among the East Cherokee, the late Chief N. J. Smith, Sala Lee, mentioned elsewhere, who died about 1895, Cessa N. I. or Jessen, who also served in the war, I.S.T.A., one of the principal conservatives among the women. And James and David Blythe, younger men of mixed blood, with an English education, but inheritors of a large share of Indian lore from their father, who was a recognized leader of ceremony. Among informants in the Western Cherokee Nation the principal was James D. Wofford, known to the Indians as Tsuskwanan Nawata, worn-out blanket, a mixed-blood speaking and writing both languages, born in the old Cherokee Nation near the site of the present Clarksville, Georgia, in 1806 and dying when about ninety years of age at his home in the eastern part of the Cherokee Nation, adjoining the Seneca Reservation. The name figures prominently in the early history of North Carolina and Georgia. His grandfather, Colonel Wofford, was an officer in the American Revolutionary Army, and shortly after the Treaty of Hopewell, in 1785, established a colony known as Wofford Settlement, in Upper Georgia on territory which was afterward found to be within the Indian boundary and was acquired by special treaty purchase in 1804. His name is appended, as witness for the state of Georgia, to the Treaty of Holston, in 1794. On his mother's side Mr. Wofford was of mixed Cherokee, Natchez, and white blood, she being a cousin of Sequoia. He was also remotely connected with Cornelius Doherty, the first trader established among the Cherokee. In the course of his long life he filled many positions of trust and honor among his people. In his youth he attended the mission school at Valleytown under Rev. Evan Jones. And just before the adoption of the Cherokee alphabet he finished the translation into phonetic Cherokee spelling of a Sunday school speller noted in Pilling's Iroquoian bibliography. In 1824 he was the census enumerator for that district of the Cherokee Nation embracing Upper Hiwassee River, in North Carolina, with Natalie and Tekoa in the adjoining portion of Georgia. His fund of Cherokee geographic information thus acquired was found to be invaluable. He was one of the two commanders of the largest detachment of emigrants at the time of the removal, and his name appears as a counselor for the Western nation in the Cherokee Almanac for 1846. When employed by the author at Tahlequah in 1891 his mind was still clear and his memory keen. Being of practical bent, he was concerned chiefly with tribal history, geography, linguistics, and everyday life and custom, on all of which subjects his knowledge was exact and detailed. But there were few myths for which he was not able to furnish confirmatory testimony. Despite his education he was a firm believer in the Nun High, and several of the best legends connected with them were obtained from him. His death takes from the Cherokee one of the last connecting links between the present and the past. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL, 12 Photograph by Author, 1888 John Axe, Itaganuhi Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL, 13 Photograph by Author, 1888 Tagudi American Anthropologist, Volume 11, July, 1898 See page. Adair, American Indians, page 81, 1775. Lawson, Carolina, 67-68, reprint 1860. Harris, 
J. C., Uncle Remus, His Songs and His Sayings, page 29. New York, 1886. For a presentation of the African and European argument C. Harris, Nights with Uncle Remus, Introduction, 1883, and Uncle Remus, His Songs and His Sayings, Introduction, 1886. Gerber, Uncle Remus Traced to the Old World, in Journal of American Folklore, 6, page 23, October, 1893. In regard to tribal dissemination of myth see Boas, Dissemination of Tales Among the Natives of North America, in Journal of American Folklore, for, page 12, January, 1891, The Growth of Indian Mythologies, in the same journal, 9, p. 32, January 1896, Northern Elements in the Mythology of the Navajo, in American Anthropologist, X, page 11, November, 1897, Introduction to Tights Traditions of the Thompson River Indians, 1898. Dr. Boas has probably devoted more study to the subject than any other anthropologist, and his personal observations include tribes from the Arctic regions to the Columbia. See Contemporary Notice in the Historical Sketch. V. The Myths. Cosmogonic Myths. 1. How the World Was Made. The Earth is a great island floating in a sea of water, and suspended at each of the four cardinal points by a cord hanging down from the sky vault, which is of solid rock. When the world grows old and worn out, the people will die and the cords will break and let the earth sink down into the ocean, and all will be water again. The Indians are afraid of this. When all was water, the animals were above in Galu and Lati, beyond the arch, but it was very much crowded, and they were wanting more room. They wondered what was below the water, and at last a uni si, beaver's grandchild, the little water beetle, offered to go and see if it could learn. It darted in every direction over the surface of the water, but could find no firm place to rest. Then it dived to the bottom and came up with some soft mud, which began to grow and spread on every side until it became the island which we call the earth. It was afterward fastened to the sky with four cords, but no one remembers who did this. At first the earth was flat and very soft and wet. The animals were anxious to get down, and sent out different birds to see if it was yet dry, but they found no place to alight and came back again to Galu and Lati. At last it seemed to be time, and they sent out the buzzard and told him to go and make ready for them. This was the great buzzard, the father of all the buzzards we see now. He flew all over the earth, low down near the ground, and it was still soft. When he reached the Cherokee country, he was very tired, and his wings began to flap and strike the ground, and wherever they struck the earth there was a valley, and where they turned up again there was a mountain. When the animals above saw this, they were afraid that the whole world would be mountains, so they called him back, but the Cherokee country remains full of mountains to this day. When the earth was dry and the animals came down, it was still dark, so they got the sun and set it in a track to go every day across the island from east to west, just overhead. It was too hot this way, and Tsiska Gilly, the red crawfish, had his shell scorched a bright red, so that his meat was spoiled, and the Cherokee do not eat it. The conjurers put the sun another handbreadth higher in the air, but it was still too hot. They raised it another time, and another, until it was seven handbreadths high and just under the sky arch. Then it was right, and they left it so. This is why the conjurers called the highest place Gulkwa Jain di Galu and Latian, the seventh height, because it is seven handbreadths above the earth. Every day the sun goes along under this arch, and returns at night on the upper side to the starting place. There is another world under this, and it is like ours in everything, animals, plants, and people, save that the seasons are different. The streams that come down from the mountains are the trails by which we reach this underworld, and the springs at their heads are the doorways by which we enter it. But to do this one must fast and go to water and have one of the underground people for a guide. We know that the seasons in the underworld are different from ours, because the water in the springs is always warmer in winter and cooler in summer than the outer air. When the animals and plants were first made, we do not know by whom, they were told to watch and keep awake for seven nights, just as young men now fast and keep awake when they pray to their medicine. 
They tried to do this, and nearly all were awake through the first night, but the next night several dropped off to sleep, and the third night others were asleep, and then others, until, on the seventh night, of all the animals only the owl, the panther, and one or two more were still awake. To these were given the power to see and to go about in the dark, and to make prey of the birds and animals which must sleep at night. Of the trees only the cedar, the pine, the spruce, the holly, and the laurel were awake to the end, and to them it was given to be always green and to be greatest for medicine. But to the others it was said, because you have not endured to the end you shall lose your hair every winter. Men came after the animals and plants. At first there were only a brother and sister until he struck her with a fish and told her to multiply, and so it was. In seven days a child was born to her, and thereafter every seven days another, and they increased very fast until there was danger that the world could not keep them. Then it was made that a woman should have only one child in a year, and it has been so ever since. 2. The First Fire In the beginning there was no fire, and the world was cold, until the thunders, Ani, Hyun Tequala Ski, who lived up in Galuan Lati, sent their lightning and put fire into the bottom of a hollow sycamore tree which grew on an island. The animals knew it was there, because they could see the smoke coming out at the top, but they could not get to it on account of the water, so they held a council to decide what to do. This was a long time ago. Every animal that could fly or swim was anxious to go after the fire. The raven offered, and because he was so large and strong they thought he could surely do the work, so he was sent first. He flew high and far across the water and alighted on the sycamore tree, but while he was wondering what to do next, the heat had scorched all his feathers black, and he was frightened and came back without the fire. The little screech owl, Wahoohoo, volunteered to go, and reached the place safely, but while he was looking down into the hollow tree a blast of hot air came up and nearly burned out his eyes. He managed to fly home as best he could, but it was a long time before he could see well, and his eyes are red to this day. Then the hooting owl, Yuguku, and the horned owl, Skili, went, but by the time they got to the hollow tree the fire was burning so fiercely that the smoke nearly blinded them. And the ashes carried up by the wind made white rings about their eyes. They had to come home again without the fire, but with all their rubbing they were never able to get rid of the white rings. Now no more of the birds would venture, and so the little Uxu High Snake, the black racer, said he would go through the water and bring back some fire. He swam across to the island and crawled through the grass to the tree, and went in by a small hole at the bottom. The heat and smoke were too much for him, too, and after dodging about blindly over the hot ashes until he was almost on fire himself he managed by good luck to get out again at the same hole, but his body had been scorched black. And he has ever since had the habit of darting and doubling on his track as if trying to escape from close quarters. He came back, and the great black snake, Gyul Gi, the climber, offered to go for fire. He swam over to the island and climbed up the tree on the outside, as the black snake always does, but when he put his head down into the hole the smoke choked him so that he fell into the burning stump. And before he could climb out again he was as black as the Uxu High. Now they held another council, for still there was no fire, and the world was cold, but birds, snakes, and four-footed animals, all had some excuse for not going, because they were all afraid to venture near the burning sycamore. Until at last Kanan Skiyamai Yehi, the water spider, said she would go. This is not the water spider that looks like a mosquito, but the other one, with black downy hair and red stripes on her body. She can run on top of the water or dive to the bottom, so there would be no trouble to get over to the island, but the question was, how could she bring back the fire? I'll manage that, said the water spider. So she spun a thread from her body and wove it into a tusty bowl, which she fastened on her back. Then she crossed over to the island and through the grass to where the fire was still burning. She put one little coal of fire into her bowl, and came back with it, and ever since we have had fire, and the water spider still keeps her tusty bowl. 3. Kana Ti and Selu, The Origin of Game and Corn When I was a boy this is what the old men told me they had heard when they were boys. Long years ago, 
Soon after the world was made, a hunter and his wife lived at Pilot Knob with their only child, a little boy. The father's name was Kana Ti, the lucky hunter, and his wife was called Selu, Corn. No matter when Kana Ti went into the wood, he never failed to bring back a load of game, which his wife would cut up and prepare, washing off the blood from the meat in the river near the house. The little boy used to play down by the river every day, and one morning the old people thought they heard laughing and talking in the bushes as though there were two children there. When the boy came home at night his parents asked him who had been playing with him all day. He comes out of the water, said the boy, and he calls himself my elder brother. He says his mother was cruel to him and threw him into the river. Then they knew that the strange boy had sprung from the blood of the game which Selu had washed off at the river's edge. Every day when the little boy went out to play the other would join him, but as he always went back again into the water the old people never had a chance to see him. At last one evening Kana Ti said to his son, Tomorrow, when the other boy comes to play, get him to wrestle with you, and when you have your arms around him hold on to him and call for us. The boy promised to do as he was told, so the next day as soon as his playmate appeared he challenged him to a wrestling match. The other agreed at once, but as soon as they had their arms around each other, Kana Ti's boy began to scream for his father. The old folks at once came running down, and as soon as the wild boy saw them he struggled to free himself and cried out, Let me go, you threw me away. But his brother held on until the parents reached the spot, when they seized the wild boy and took him home with them. They kept him in the house until they had tamed him, but he was always wild and artful in his disposition, and was the leader of his brother in every mischief. It was not long until the old people discovered that he had magic powers, and they called him Ine Judison High, he who grew up wild. Whenever Kana Ti went into the mountains he always brought back a fat buck or doe, or maybe a couple of turkeys. One day the wild boy said to his brother, I wonder where our father gets all that game, let's follow him next time and find out. A few days afterward Kana Ti took a bow and some feathers in his hand and started off toward the west. The boys waited a little while and then went after him, keeping out of sight until they saw him go into a swamp where there were a great many of the small reeds that hunters used to make arrow shafts. Then the wild boy changed himself into a puff of bird's down, which the wind took up and carried until it alighted upon Kana Ti's shoulder just as he entered the swamp, but Kana Ti knew nothing about it. The old man cut reeds, fitted the feathers to them and made some arrows, and the wild boy, in his other shape, thought, I wonder what those things are for. When Kana Ti had his arrows finished he came out of the swamp and went on again. The wind blew the down from his shoulder, and it fell in the woods, when the wild boy took his right shape again and went back and told his brother what he had seen. Keeping out of sight of their father, they followed him up the mountain until he stopped at a certain place and lifted a large rock. At once there ran out a buck, which Kana Ti shot, and then lifting it upon his back he started for home again. Oh ho, exclaimed the boys, he keeps all the deer shut up in that hole, and whenever he wants meat he just lets one out and kills it with those things he made in the swamp. They hurried and reached home before their father, who had the heavy deer to carry, and he never knew that they had followed. A few days later the boys went back to the swamp, cut some reeds, and made seven arrows, and then started up the mountain to where their father kept the game. When they got to the place, they raised the rock and a deer came running out. Just as they drew back to shoot it, another came out, and then another and another, until the boys got confused and forgot what they were about. In those days all the deer had their tails hanging down like other animals, but as a buck was running past the wild boy struck its tail with his arrow so that it pointed upward. The boys thought this good sport, and when the next one ran past the wild boy struck its tail so that it stood straight up, and his brother struck the next one so hard with his arrow that the deer's tail was almost curled over his back. The deer carries his tail this way ever since. The deer came running past until the last one had come out of the hole and escaped into the forest. Then came droves of raccoons, rabbits, and all the other four-footed animals, all but the bear, because there was no bear then. Last came great flocks of turkeys, pigeons, and partridges that darkened the air like a cloud and made such a noise with their wings that Kana Ti, sitting at home, 
heard the sound like distant thunder on the mountains and said to himself. My bad boys have got into trouble. I must go and see what they are doing. So he went up the mountain, and when he came to the place where he kept the game he found the two boys standing by the rock, and all the birds and animals were gone. Kana Ti was furious, but without saying a word he went down into the cave and kicked the covers off four jars in one corner, when out swarmed bedbugs, fleas, lice, and gnats, and got all over the boys. They screamed with pain and fright and tried to beat off the insects, but the thousands of vermin crawled over them and bit and stung them until both dropped down nearly dead. Kana Ti stood looking on until he thought they had been punished enough, when he knocked off the vermin and made the boys a talk. Now, you rascals, said he, you have always had plenty to eat and never had to work for it. Whenever you were hungry all I had to do was to come up here and get a deer or a turkey and bring it home for your mother to cook. But now you have let out all the animals, and after this when you want a deer to eat you will have to hunt all over the woods for it, and then maybe not find one. Go home now to your mother, while I see if I can find something to eat for supper. When the boys got home again they were very tired and hungry and asked their mother for something to eat. There is no meat, said Selu, but wait a little while and I'll get you something. So she took a basket and started out to the storehouse. This storehouse was built upon poles high up from the ground, to keep it out of the reach of animals, and there was a ladder to climb up by, and one door, but no other opening. Every day when Selu got ready to cook the dinner she would go out to the storehouse with a basket and bring it back full of corn and beans. The boys had never been inside the storehouse, so wondered where all the corn and beans could come from, as the house was not a very large one. So as soon as Selu went out of the door the wild boy said to his brother, let's go and see what she does. They ran around and climbed up at the back of the storehouse and pulled out a piece of clay from between the logs, so that they could look in. There they saw Selu standing in the middle of the room with the basket in front of her on the floor. Leaning over the basket, she rubbed her stomach, so, and the basket was half full of corn. Then she rubbed under her armpits, so, and the basket was full to the top with beans. The boys looked at each other and said, This will never do. Our mother is a witch. If we eat any of that it will poison us. We must kill her. When the boys came back into the house, she knew their thoughts before they spoke. So you are going to kill me, said Selu. Yes, said the boys, you are a witch. Well, said their mother, when you have killed me, clear a large piece of ground in front of the house and drag my body seven times around the circle. Then drag me seven times over the ground inside the circle, and stay up all night and watch, and in the morning you will have plenty of corn. The boys killed her with their clubs, and cut off her head and put it up on the roof of the house with her face turned to the west, and told her to look for her husband. Then they set to work to clear the ground in front of the house, but instead of clearing the whole piece they cleared only seven little spots. This is why corn now grows only in a few places instead of over the whole world. They dragged the body of Selu around the circle, and wherever her blood fell on the ground the corn sprang up. But instead of dragging her body seven times across the ground they dragged it over only twice, which is the reason the Indians still work their crop but twice. The two brothers sat up and watched their corn all night, and in the morning it was full grown and ripe. When Kana Ti came home at last, he looked around, but could not see Selu anywhere, and asked the boys where was their mother. She was a witch, and we killed her, said the boys, there is her head up there on top of the house. When he saw his wife's head on the roof, he was very angry, and said, I won't stay with you any longer, I am going to the wolf people. So he started off, but before he had gone far the wild boy changed himself again to a tuft of down, which fell on Kana Ti's shoulder. When Kana Ti reached the settlement of the wolf people, they were holding a council in the townhouse. He went in and sat down with the tuft of birds down on his shoulder, but he never noticed it. When the wolf chief asked him his business, he said, I have two bad boys at home, and I want you to go in seven days from now and play ball against them. Although Kana Ti spoke as though he wanted them to play a game of ball, the wolves knew that he meant for them to go and kill the two boys. They promised to go. 
Then the bird's down blew off from Kana Tia's shoulder, and the smoke carried it up through the hole in the roof of the townhouse. When it came down on the ground outside, the wild boy took his right shape again and went home and told his brother all that he had heard in the townhouse. But when Kana Ti left the wolf people he did not return home, but went on farther. The boys then began to get ready for the wolves, and the wild boy, the magician, told his brother what to do. They ran around the house in a wide circle until they had made a trail all around it excepting on the side from which the wolves would come, where they left a small open space. Then they made four large bundles of arrows and placed them at four different points on the outside of the circle, after which they hid themselves in the woods and waited for the wolves. In a day or two a whole party of wolves came and surrounded the house to kill the boys. The wolves did not notice the trail around the house, because they came in where the boys had left the opening, but the moment they went inside the circle the trail changed to a high brush fence and shut them in. Then the boys on the outside took their arrows and began shooting them down, and as the wolves could not jump over the fence they were all killed, excepting a few that escaped through the opening into a great swamp close by. The boys ran around the swamp, and a circle of fire sprang up in their tracks and set fire to the grass and bushes and burned up nearly all the other wolves. Only two or three got away, and from these have come all the wolves that are now in the world. Soon afterward some strangers from a distance, who had heard that the brothers had a wonderful grain from which they made bread, came to ask for some, for none but Selu and her family had ever known corn before. The boys gave them seven grains of corn, which they told them to plant the next night on their way home, sitting up all night to watch the corn, which would have seven ripe ears in the morning. These they were to plant the next night and watch in the same way, and so on every night until they reached home, when they would have corn enough to supply the whole people. The strangers lived seven days' journey away. They took the seven grains and watched all through the darkness until morning, when they saw seven tall stalks, each stalk bearing a ripened ear. They gathered the ears and went on their way. The next night they planted all their corn, and guarded it as before until daybreak, when they found an abundant increase. But the way was long and the sun was hot, and the people grew tired. On the last night before reaching home they fell asleep, and in the morning the corn they had planted had not even sprouted. They brought with them to their settlement what corn they had left and planted it, and with care and attention were able to raise a crop. But ever since the corn must be watched and tended through half the year, which before would grow and ripen in a night. As Kana Ti did not return, the boys at last concluded to go and find him. The wild boy took a gaming wheel and rolled it toward the darkening land. In a little while the wheel came rolling back, and the boys knew their father was not there. He rolled it to the south and to the north, and each time the wheel came back to him, and they knew their father was not there. Then he rolled it toward the sunland, and it did not return. Our father is there, said the wild boy, let us go and find him. So the two brothers set off toward the east, and after traveling a long time they came upon Kana Ti walking along with a little dog by his side. You bad boys, said their father, have you come here? Yes, they answered, we always accomplish what we start out to do, we are men. This dog overtook me four days ago, then said Kana Ti, but the boys knew that the dog was the wheel which they had sent after him to find him. Well, said Kana Ti, as you have found me, we may as well travel together, but I shall take the lead. Soon they came to a swamp, and Kana Ti told them there was something dangerous there and they must keep away from it. He went on ahead, but as soon as he was out of sight the wild boy said to his brother, Come and let us see what is in the swamp. They went in together, and in the middle of the swamp they found a large panther asleep. The wild boy got out an arrow and shot the panther in the side of the head. The panther turned his head and the other boy shot him on that side. He turned his head away again and the two brothers shot together, tust, tust, tust. But the panther was not hurt by the arrows and paid no more attention to the boys. They came out of the swamp and soon overtook Kana Ti, waiting for them. Did you find it? asked Kana Ti. Yes, said the boys, we found it, but it never hurt us. We are men. Kana Ti was surprised, but said nothing, and they went on again. 
After a while he turned to them and said, Now you must be careful. We are coming to a tribe called the Anata Duntaski, roasters, i.e., cannibals, and if they get you they will put you into a pot and feast on you. Then he went on ahead. Soon the boys came to a tree which had been struck by lightning, and the wild boy directed his brother to gather some of the splinters from the tree and told him what to do with them. In a little while they came to the settlement of the cannibals, who, as soon as they saw the boys, came running out, crying, Good, here are two nice fat strangers. Now we'll have a grand feast. They caught the boys and dragged them into the townhouse, and sent word to all the people of the settlement to come to the feast. They made up a great fire, put water into a large pot and set it to boiling, and then seized the wild boy and put him down into it. His brother was not in the least frightened and made no attempt to escape, but quietly knelt down and began putting the splinters into the fire, as if to make it burn better. When the cannibals thought the meat was about ready they lifted the pot from the fire, and that instant a blinding light filled the townhouse, and the lightning began to dart from one side to the other. Striking down the cannibals until not one of them was left alive. Then the lightning went up through the smoke hole, and the next moment there were the two boys standing outside the townhouse as though nothing had happened. They went on and soon met Kana Ti, who seemed much surprised to see them, and said, What? Are you here again? Oh, yes, we never give up. We are great men. What did the cannibals do to you? We met them and they brought us to their townhouse, but they never hurt us. Kana Ti said nothing more, and they went on. He soon got out of sight of the boys, but they kept on until they came to the end of the world, where the sun comes out. The sky was just coming down when they got there, but they waited until it went up again, and then they went through and climbed up on the other side. There they found Kana Ti and Selu sitting together. The old folk received them kindly and were glad to see them, telling them they might stay there a while, but then they must go to live where the sun goes down. The boys stayed with their parents seven days and then went on toward the darkening land, where they are now. We call them Aniska Yatsunsti, the little men, and when they talk to each other we hear low rolling thunder in the west. After Kana Ts boys had let the deer out from the cave where their father used to keep them, the hunters tramped about in the woods for a long time without finding any game, so that the people were very hungry. At last they heard that the Thunder Boys were now living in the far west, beyond the sun door, and that if they were sent for they could bring back the game. So they sent messengers for them, and the boys came and sat down in the middle of the townhouse and began to sing. At the first song there was a roaring sound like a strong wind in the northwest, and it grew louder and nearer as the boys sang on, until at the seventh song a whole herd of deer, led by a large buck, came out from the woods. The boys had told the people to be ready with their bows and arrows, and when the song was ended and all the deer were close around the townhouse, the hunters shot into them and killed as many as they needed before the herd could get back into the timber. Then the thunder boys went back to the darkening land, but before they left they taught the people the seven songs with which to call up the deer. It all happened so long ago that the songs are now forgotten, all but two, which the hunters still sing whenever they go after deer. Wananahi Version After the world had been brought up from under the water, they then made a man and a woman and led them around the edge of the island. On arriving at the starting place they planted some corn, and then told the man and woman to go around the way they had been led. This they did, and on returning they found the corn up and growing nicely. They were then told to continue the circuit. Each trip consumed more time. At last the corn was ripe and ready for use. Another story is told of how sin came into the world. A man and a woman reared a large family of children in comfort and plenty, with very little trouble about providing food for them. Every morning the father went forth and very soon returned bringing with him a deer, or a turkey, or some other animal or fowl. At the same time the mother went out and soon returned with a large basket filled with ears of corn which she shelled and pounded in a mortar, thus making meal for bread. When the children grew up, seeing with what apparent ease food was provided for them, they talked to each other about it, wondering that they never saw such things as their parents brought in. At last one proposed to watch when their parents went out and to follow them. 
Accordingly next morning the plan was carried out. Those who followed the father saw him stop at a short distance from the cabin and turn over a large stone that appeared to be carelessly leaned against another. On looking closely they saw an entrance to a large cave, and in it were many different kinds of animals and birds, such as their father had sometimes brought in for food. The man standing at the entrance called a deer, which was lying at some distance and back of some other animals. It rose immediately as it heard the call and came close up to him. He picked it up, closed the mouth of the cave, and returned, not once seeming to suspect what his sons had done. When the old man was fairly out of sight, his sons, rejoicing how they had outwitted him, left their hiding place and went to the cave, saying they would show the old folks that they, too, could bring in something. They moved the stone away, though it was very heavy and they were obliged to use all their united strength. When the cave was opened, the animals, instead of waiting to be picked up, all made a rush for the entrance, and leaping past the frightened and bewildered boys, scattered in all directions and disappeared in the wilderness. While the guilty offenders could do nothing but gaze in stupefied amazement as they saw them escape. There were animals of all kinds, large and small, buffalo, deer, elk, antelope, raccoons, and squirrels, even catamounts and panthers, wolves and foxes, and many others, all fleeing together. At the same time birds of every kind were seen emerging from the opening, all in the same wild confusion as the quadrupeds, turkeys, geese, swans, ducks, quails, eagles, hawks, and owls. Those who followed the mother saw her enter a small cabin, which they had never seen before, and close the door. The culprits found a small crack through which they could peer. They saw the woman place a basket on the ground and standing over it shake herself vigorously, jumping up and down, when lo and behold! Large ears of corn began to fall into the basket. When it was well filled she took it up and, placing it on her head, came out, fastened the door, and prepared their breakfast as usual. When the meal had been finished in silence the man spoke to his children, telling them that he was aware of what they had done, that now he must die and they would be obliged to provide for themselves. He made bows and arrows for them, then sent them to hunt for the animals which they had turned loose. Then the mother told them that as they had found out her secret she could do nothing more for them. That she would die, and they must drag her body around over the ground, that wherever her body was dragged corn would come up. Of this they were to make their bread. She told them that they must always save some for seed and plant every year. 4. Origin of Disease and Medicine In the old days the beasts, birds, fishes, insects, and plants could all talk, and they and the people lived together in peace and friendship. But as time went on the people increased so rapidly that their settlements spread over the whole earth, and the poor animals found themselves beginning to be cramped for room. This was bad enough, but to make it worse man invented bows, knives, blowguns, spears, and hooks, and began to slaughter the larger animals, birds, and fishes for their flesh or their skins, while the smaller creatures, such as the frogs and worms, were crushed and trodden upon without thought, out of pure carelessness or contempt. So the animals resolved to consult upon measures for their common safety. The bears were the first to meet in council in their townhouse under Kua High Mountain, the Mulberry Place, and the old white bear chief presided. After each in turn had complained of the way in which man killed their friends, ate their flesh, and used their skins for his own purposes, it was decided to begin war at once against him. Someone asked what weapons man used to destroy them. Bows and arrows, of course, cried all the bears in chorus. And what are they made of, was the next question. The bow of wood, and the string of our entrails, replied one of the bears. It was then proposed that they make a bow and some arrows and see if they could not use the same weapons against man himself. So one bear got a nice piece of locust wood and another sacrificed himself for the good of the rest in order to furnish a piece of his entrails for the string. But when everything was ready and the first bear stepped up to make the trial, it was found that in letting the arrow fly after drawing back the bow, his long claws caught the string and spoiled the shot. This was annoying, but someone suggested that they might trim his claws, which was accordingly done, and on a second trial it was found that the arrow went straight to the mark. 
But here the chief, the old white bear, objected, saying it was necessary that they should have long claws in order to be able to climb trees. One of us has already died to furnish the bowstring, and if we now cut off our claws we must all starve together. It is better to trust to the teeth and claws that nature gave us, for it is plain that man's weapons were not intended for us. No one could think of any better plan, so the old chief dismissed the council and the bears dispersed to the woods and thickets without having concerted any way to prevent the increase of the human race. Had the result of the council been otherwise, we should now be at war with the bears, but as it is, the hunter does not even ask the bears pardon when he kills one. The deer next held a council under their chief, the little deer, and after some talk decided to send rheumatism to every hunter who should kill one of them unless he took care to ask their pardon for the offense. They sent notice of their decision to the nearest settlement of Indians and told them at the same time what to do when necessity forced them to kill one of the deer tribe. Now, whenever the hunter shoots a deer, the little deer, who is swift as the wind and cannot be wounded, runs quickly up to the spot and, bending over the blood stains, asks the spirit of the deer if it has heard the prayer of the hunter for pardon. If the reply be, yes, all is well, and the little deer goes on his way. But if the reply be, no, he follows on the trail of the hunter, guided by the drops of blood on the ground, until he arrives at his cabin in the settlement, when the little deer enters invisibly and strikes the hunter with rheumatism. So that he becomes at once a helpless cripple. No hunter who has regard for his health ever fails to ask pardon of the deer for killing it, although some hunters who have not learned the prayer may try to turn aside the little deer from his pursuit by building a fire behind them in the trail. Next came the fishes and reptiles, who had their own complaints against man. They held their counsel together and determined to make their victims dream of snakes twining about them in slimy folds and blowing foul breath in their faces, or to make them dream of eating raw or decaying fish, so that they would lose appetite. Sicken, and die. This is why people dream about snakes and fish. Finally the birds, insects, and smaller animals came together for the same purpose, and the grubworm was chief of the council. It was decided that each in turn should give an opinion, and then they would vote on the question as to whether or not man was guilty. Seven votes should be enough to condemn him. One after another denounced man's cruelty and injustice toward the other animals and voted in favor of his death. The frog spoke first, saying, We must do something to check the increase of the race, or people will become so numerous that we shall be crowded from off the earth. See how they have kicked me about because I'm ugly, as they say, until my back is covered with sores, and here he showed the spots on his skin. Next came the bird, no one remembers now which one it was, who condemned man, because he burns my feet off, meaning the way in which the hunter barbecues birds by impaling them on a stick set over the fire. So that their feathers and tender feet are singed off. Others followed in the same strain. The ground squirrel alone ventured to say a good word for man, who seldom hurt him because he was so small, but this made the others so angry that they fell upon the ground squirrel and tore him with their claws. And the stripes are on his back to this day. They began then to devise and name so many new diseases, one after another, that had not their invention at last failed them, no one of the human race would have been able to survive. The grubworm grew constantly more pleased as the name of each disease was called off, until at last they reached the end of the list, when someone proposed to make menstruation sometimes fatal to women. On this he rose up in his place and cried, Wadden. Thanks. I'm glad some more of them will die, for they are getting so thick that they tread on me. The thought fairly made him shake with joy, so that he fell over backward and could not get on his feet again, but had to wriggle off on his back, as the grubworm has done ever since. When the plants, who were friendly to man, heard what had been done by the animals, they determined to defeat the latter's evil designs. Each tree, shrub, and herb, down even to the grasses and mosses, agreed to furnish a cure for some one of the diseases named, and each said, I shall appear to help man when he calls upon me in his need. Thus came medicine. And the plants, every one of which has its use if we only knew it, furnish the remedy to counteract the evil wrought by the revengeful animals. Even weeds were made for some good purpose, which we must find out for ourselves. 
When the doctor does not know what medicine to use for a sick man the spirit of the plant tells him. 5. The Daughter of the Sun The sun lived on the other side of the sky vault, but her daughter lived in the middle of the sky, directly above the earth. And every day as the sun was climbing along the sky arch to the west she used to stop at her daughter's house for dinner. Now, the sun hated the people on the earth, because they could never look straight at her without screwing up their faces. She said to her brother, The moon, my grandchildren are ugly, they grin all over their faces when they look at me. But the moon said, I like my younger brothers, I think they are very handsome, because they always smiled pleasantly when they saw him in the sky at night, for his rays were milder. The sun was jealous and planned to kill all the people, so every day when she got near her daughter's house she sent down such sultry rays that there was a great fever and the people died by hundreds. Until everyone had lost some friend and there was fear that no one would be left. They went for help to the little men, who said the only way to save themselves was to kill the sun. The little men made medicine and changed two men to snakes, the spreading adder and the copperhead, and sent them to watch near the door of the daughter of the sun to bite the old sun when she came next day. They went together and hid near the house until the sun came, but when the spreading adder was about to spring, the bright light blinded him and he could only spit out yellow slime, as he does to this day when he tries to bite. She called him a nasty thing and went by into the house, and the copperhead crawled off without trying to do anything. So the people still died from the heat, and they went to the little men a second time for help. The little men made medicine again and changed one man into the great Actina and another into the rattlesnake and sent them to watch near the house and kill the old son when she came for dinner. They made the Actina very large, with horns on his head, and everyone thought he would be sure to do the work, but the rattlesnake was so quick and eager that he got ahead and coiled up just outside the house. And when the son's daughter opened the door to look out for her mother, he sprang up and bit her and she fell dead in the doorway. He forgot to wait for the old son, but went back to the people, and the Actina was so very angry that he went back, too. Since then we pray to the rattlesnake and do not kill him, because he is kind and never tries to bite if we do not disturb him. The Actina grew angrier all the time and very dangerous, so that if he even looked at a man, that man's family would die. After a long time the people held a council and decided that he was too dangerous to be with them, so they sent him up to Galu and Lati, and he is there now. The spreading adder, the copperhead, the rattlesnake, and the Actina were all men. When the son found her daughter dead, she went into the house and grieved, and the people did not die any more, but now the world was dark all the time, because the sun would not come out. They went again to the little men, and these told them that if they wanted the sun to come out again they must bring back her daughter from Tsushina I, the ghost country, in Yusunhi, the darkening land in the west. They chose seven men to go, and gave each a sourwood rod a handbreadth long. The little men told them they must take a box with them, and when they got to Tsushina I they would find all the ghosts at a dance. They must stand outside the circle, and when the young woman passed in the dance they must strike her with the rods and she would fall to the ground. Then they must put her into the box and bring her back to her mother, but they must be very sure not to open the box, even a little way, until they were home again. They took the rods and a box and traveled seven days to the west until they came to the darkening land. There were a great many people there, and they were having a dance just as if they were at home in the settlements. The young woman was in the outside circle, and as she swung around to where the seven men were standing, one struck her with his rod and she turned her head and saw him. As she came around the second time another touched her with his rod, and then another and another, until at the seventh round she fell out of the ring, and they put her into the box and closed the lid fast. The other ghosts seemed never to notice what had happened. They took up the box and started home toward the east. In a little while the girl came to life again and begged to be let out of the box, but they made no answer and went on. Soon she called again and said she was hungry, but still they made no answer and went on. After another while she spoke again and called for a drink and pleaded so that it was very hard to listen to her, but the men who carried the box said nothing and still went on. When at last they were very near home, she called again and begged them to raise the lid just a little, because she was smothering. 
They were afraid she was really dying now, so they lifted the lid a little to give her air, but as they did so there was a fluttering sound inside and something flew past them into the thicket and they heard a redbird cry, Quish! 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 In the bushes. They shut down the lid and went on again to the settlements, but when they got there and opened the box it was empty. So we know the redbird is the daughter of the sun, and if the men had kept the box closed, as the little men told them to do, they would have brought her home safely, and we could bring back our other friends also from the ghost country. But now when they die we can never bring them back. The son had been glad when they started to the ghost country, but when they came back without her daughter she grieved and cried, My daughter, my daughter, and wept until her tears made a flood upon the earth. And the people were afraid the world would be drowned. They held another council, and sent their handsomest young men and women to amuse her so that she would stop crying. They danced before the sun and sang their best songs, but for a long time she kept her face covered and paid no attention, until at last the drummer suddenly changed the song, when she lifted up her face. And was so pleased at the sight that she forgot her grief and smiled. 6. How they brought back the tobacco. In the beginning of the world, when people and animals were all the same, there was only one tobacco plant. To which they all came for their tobacco until the daggled geese stole it and carried it far away to the south. The people were suffering without it, and there was one old woman who grew so thin and weak that everybody said she would soon die unless she could get tobacco to keep her alive. Different animals offered to go for it, one after another, the larger ones first and then the smaller ones, but the Dagok saw and killed every one before he could get to the plant. After the others the little mole tried to reach it by going under the ground, but the Dagok saw his track and killed him as he came out. At last the hummingbird offered, but the others said he was entirely too small and might as well stay at home. He begged them to let him try, so they showed him a plant in a field and told him to let them see how he would go about it. The next moment he was gone and they saw him sitting on the plant, and then in a moment he was back again, but no one had seen him going or coming, because he was so swift. This is the way I'll do, said the hummingbird, so they let him try. He flew off to the east, and when he came in sight of the tobacco the dagok were watching all about it, but they could not see him because he was so small and flew so swiftly. He darted down on the plant, TSA, and snatched off the top with the leaves and seeds, and was off again before the dagok knew what had happened. Before he got home with the tobacco the old woman had fainted and they thought she was dead, but he blew the smoke into her nostrils, and with a cry of, TSA Lu. Tobacco, she opened her eyes and was alive again. Second version. The people had tobacco in the beginning, but they had used it all, and there was great suffering for want of it. There was one old man so old that he had to be kept alive by smoking, and as his son did not want to see him die he decided to go himself to try and get some more. The tobacco country was far in the south, with high mountains all around it, and the passes were guarded, so that it was very hard to get into it, but the young man was a conjurer and was not afraid. He traveled southward until he came to the mountains on the border of the tobacco country. Then he opened his medicine bag and took out a hummingbird skin and put it over himself like a dress. Now he was a hummingbird and flew over the mountains to the tobacco field and pulled some of the leaves and seed and put them into his medicine bag. He was so small and swift that the guards, whoever they were, did not see him, and when he had taken as much as he could carry he flew back over the mountains in the same way. Then he took off the hummingbird skin and put it into his medicine bag, and was a man again. He started home, and on his way came to a tree that had a hole in the trunk, like a door, near the first branches, and a very pretty woman was looking out from it. He stopped and tried to climb the tree, but although he was a good climber he found that he always slipped back. He put on a pair of medicine moccasins from his pouch, and then he could climb the tree, but when he reached the first branches he looked up and the hole was still as far away as before. He climbed higher and higher, but every time he looked up the hole seemed to be farther than before, until at last he was tired and came down again. When he reached home he found his father very weak, but still alive, and one draw at the pipe made him strong again. The people planted the seed and have had tobacco ever since. 
7. The Journey to the Sunrise a long time ago several young men made up their minds to find the place where the sun lives and see what the sun is like. They got ready their bows and arrows, their parched corn and extra moccasins, and started out toward the east. At first they met tribes they knew, then they came to tribes they had only heard about, and at last to others of which they had never heard. There was a tribe of root eaters and another of acorn eaters, with great piles of acorn shells near their houses. In one tribe they found a sick man dying, and were told it was the custom there when a man died to bury his wife in the same grave with him. They waited until he was dead, when they saw his friends lower the body into a great pit, so deep and dark that from the top they could not see the bottom. Then a rope was tied around the woman's body, together with a bundle of pine knots, a lighted pine knot was put into her hand, and she was lowered into the pit to die there in the darkness after the last pine knot was burned. The young men traveled on until they came at last to the sunrise place where the sky reaches down to the ground. They found that the sky was an arch or vault of solid rock hung above the earth and was always swinging up and down, so that when it went up there was an open place like a door between the sky and ground, and when it swung back the door was shut. The sun came out of this door from the east and climbed along on the inside of the arch. It had a human figure, but was too bright for them to see clearly and too hot to come very near. They waited until the sun had come out and then tried to get through while the door was still open, but just as the first one was in the doorway the rock came down and crushed him. The other six were afraid to try it, and as they were now at the end of the world they turned around and started back again, but they had traveled so far that they were old men when they reached home. 8. The Moon and the Thunders the sun was a young woman and lived in the east, while her brother, the moon, lived in the west. The girl had a lover who used to come every month in the dark of the moon to court her. He would come at night, and leave before daylight, and although she talked with him she could not see his face in the dark, and he would not tell her his name, until she was wondering all the time who it could be. At last she hit upon a plan to find out, so the next time he came, as they were sitting together in the dark of the ACI, she slyly dipped her hand into the cinders and ashes of the fireplace and rubbed it over his face, saying, Your face is cold. You must have suffered from the wind, and pretending to be very sorry for him, but he did not know that she had ashes on her hand. After a while he left her and went away again. The next night when the moon came up in the sky his face was covered with spots, and then his sister knew he was the one who had been coming to see her. He was so much ashamed to have her know it that he kept as far away as he could at the other end of the sky all the night. Ever since he tries to keep a long way behind the sun, and when he does sometimes have to come near her in the west he makes himself as thin as a ribbon so that he can hardly be seen. Some old people say that the moon is a ball which was thrown up against the sky in a game a long time ago. They say that two towns were playing against each other, but one of them had the best runners and had almost won the game. When the leader of the other side picked up the ball with his hand, a thing that is not allowed in the game, and tried to throw it to the goal, but it struck against the solid sky vault and was fastened there, to remind players never to cheat. When the moon looks small and pale it is because someone has handled the ball unfairly, and for this reason they formerly played only at the time of a full moon. When the sun or moon is eclipsed it is because a great frog up in the sky is trying to swallow it. Everybody knows this, even the Creeks and the other tribes, and in the olden times, eighty or a hundred years ago, before the great medicine men were all dead. Whenever they saw the sun grow dark the people would come together and fire guns and beat the drum, and in a little while this would frighten off the great frog and the sun would be all right again. The common people call both sun and moon Nanda, one being, Nanda that dwells in the day, and the other, Nanda that dwells in the night but the priests call the sun Su Talitahai, Six Killer, and the moon Gu Gu Gia. Though nobody knows now what this word means, or why they use these names. Sometimes people ask the moon not to let it rain or snow. The great thunder and his sons, the two thunder boys, live far in the west above the sky vault. The lightning and the rainbow are their beautiful dress. The priests pray to the thunder and call him the red man, because that is the brightest color of his dress. There are other thunders that live lower down, in the cliffs and mountains, and under waterfalls, 
and travel on invisible bridges from one high peak to another where they have their town houses. The great thunders above the sky are kind and helpful when we pray to them, but these others are always plotting mischief. One must not point at the rainbow, or one's finger will swell at the lower joint. 9. What the stars are like. There are different opinions about the stars. Some say they are balls of light, others say they are human, but most people say they are living creatures covered with luminous fur or feathers. One night a hunting party camping in the mountains noticed two lights like large stars moving along the top of a distant ridge. They wondered and watched until the light disappeared on the other side. The next night, and the next, they saw the lights again moving along the ridge, and after talking over the matter decided to go on the morrow and try to learn the cause. In the morning they started out and went until they came to the ridge, where, after searching some time, they found two strange creatures about so large, making a circle with outstretched arms. With round bodies covered with fine fur or downy feathers, from which small heads stuck out like the heads of terrapins. As the breeze played upon these feathers showers of sparks flew out. The hunters carried the strange creatures back to the camp, intending to take them home to the settlements on their return. They kept them several days and noticed that every night they would grow bright and shine like great stars, although by day they were only balls of grey fur, except when the wind stirred and made the sparks fly out. They kept very quiet, and no one thought of their trying to escape, when, on the seventh night, they suddenly rose from the ground like balls of fire and were soon above the tops of the trees. Higher and higher they went, while the wandering hunters watched, until at last they were only two bright points of light in the dark sky, and then the hunters knew that they were stars. 10. Origin of the Pleiades and the Pine Long ago, when the world was new, there were seven boys who used to spend all their time down by the townhouse playing the Gatayu Sti game. Rolling a stone wheel along the ground and sliding a curved stick after it to strike it. Their mothers scolded, but it did no good, so one day they collected some Gatayu Sti stones and boiled them in the pot with the corn for dinner. When the boys came home hungry their mothers dipped out the stones and said, Since you like the Gatayu Sti better than the cornfield, take the stones now for your dinner. The boys were very angry, and went down to the townhouse, saying, As our mothers treat us this way, let us go where we shall never trouble them any more. They began a dance, some say it was the feather dance, and went round and round the townhouse, praying to the spirits to help them. At last their mothers were afraid something was wrong and went out to look for them. They saw the boys still dancing around the townhouse, and as they watched they noticed that their feet were off the earth, and that with every round they rose higher and higher in the air. They ran to get their children, but it was too late, for they were already above the roof of the townhouse, all but one, whose mother managed to pull him down with the Gatayu Sti pole. But he struck the ground with such force that he sank into it and the earth closed over him. The other six circled higher and higher until they went up to the sky, where we see them now as the Pleiades, which the Cherokee still call Anitsutsa, the boys. The people grieved long after them, but the mother whose boy had gone into the ground came every morning and every evening to cry over the spot until the earth was damp with her tears. At last a little green shoot sprouted up and grew day by day until it became the tall tree that we call now the pine, and the pine is of the same nature as the stars and holds in itself the same bright light. 11. The Milky Way Some people in the south had a corn mill, in which they pounded the corn into meal, and several mornings when they came to fill it they noticed that some of the meal had been stolen during the night. They examined the ground and found the tracks of a dog, so the next night they watched, and when the dog came from the north and began to eat the meal out of the bowl they sprang out and whipped him. He ran off howling to his home in the north, with the meal dropping from his mouth as he ran, and leaving behind a white trail where now we see the Milky Way, which the Cherokee call to this day Gil Utsin Stan and E, where the dog ran. 12. Origin of Strawberries When the first man was created and a mate was given to him, they lived together very happily for a time, but then began to quarrel, until at last the woman left her husband and started off toward Nundagun E, the sun land. In the east. The man followed alone and grieving, 
but the woman kept on steadily ahead and never looked behind, until on Ellen High, the great apportioner, the son, took pity on him and asked him if he was still angry with his wife. He said he was not, and on Ellen High then asked him if he would like to have her back again, to which he eagerly answered yes. So An Ellen High caused a patch of the finest ripe huckleberries to spring up along the path in front of the woman, but she passed by without paying any attention to them. Farther on he put a clump of blackberries, but these also she refused to notice. Other fruits, one, two, and three, and then some trees covered with beautiful red service berries, were placed beside the path to tempt her, but she still went on until suddenly she saw in front a patch of large ripe strawberries. The first ever known. She stooped to gather a few to eat, and as she picked them she chanced to turn her face to the west, and at once the memory of her husband came back to her and she found herself unable to go on. She sat down, but the longer she waited the stronger became her desire for her husband, and at last she gathered a bunch of the finest berries and started back along the path to give them to him. He met her kindly and they went home together. 13. The Great Yellow Jacket, Origin of Fish and Frogs A long time ago the people of the old town of Kanu Gali, Briar Place, or Briartown, on Nantahala River, in the present Macon County, North Carolina, were much annoyed by a great insect called Ulag, as large as a house, which used to come from some secret hiding place, and darting swiftly through the air, would snap up children from their play and carry them away. It was unlike any other insect ever known, and the people tried many times to track it to its home, but it was too swift to be followed. They killed a squirrel and tied a white string to it, so that its course could be followed with the eye, as bee hunters follow the flight of a bee to its tree. The ulag came and carried off the squirrel with the string hanging to it, but darted away so swiftly through the air that it was out of sight in a moment. They killed a turkey and put a longer white string to it, and the ulag came and took the turkey, but was gone again before they could see in what direction it flew. They took a deer ham and tied a white string to it, and again the ulag swooped down and bore it off so swiftly that it could not be followed. At last they killed a yearling deer and tied a very long white string to it. The ulag came again and seized the deer, but this time the load was so heavy that it had to fly slowly and so low down that the string could be plainly seen. The hunters got together for the pursuit. They followed it along a ridge to the east until they came near where Franklin now is, when, on looking across the valley to the other side, they saw the nest of a ewe lag in a large cave in the rocks. On this they raised a great shout and made their way rapidly down the mountain and across to the cave. The nest had the entrance below with tiers of cells built up one above another to the roof of the cave. The great ulag was there, with thousands of smaller ones, that we now call yellow jackets. The hunters built fires around the hole, so that the smoke filled the cave and smothered the great insect and multitudes of the smaller ones, but others which were outside the cave were not killed. And these escaped and increased until now the yellow jackets, which before were unknown, are all over the world. The people called the cave Tskagen E, where the yellow jacket was, and the place from which they first saw the nest they called Adahita, where they shouted, and these are their names today. They say also that all the fish and frogs came from a great monster fish and frog which did much damage until at last they were killed by the people. Who cut them up into little pieces which were thrown into the water and afterward took shape as the smaller fishes and frogs. 14. The Deluge A long time ago a man had a dog, which began to go down to the river every day and look at the water and howl. At last the man was angry and scolded the dog, which then spoke to him and said, Very soon there is going to be a great freshet and the water will come so high that everybody will be drowned. But if you will make a raft to get upon when the rain comes you can be saved, but you must first throw me into the water. The man did not believe it, and the dog said, If you want a sign that I speak the truth, look at the back of my neck. He looked and saw that the dog's neck had the skin worn off so that the bones stuck out. Then he believed the dog, and began to build a raft. Soon the rain came and he took his family, with plenty of provisions, and they all got upon it. It rained for a long time, 
and the water rose until the mountains were covered and all the people in the world were drowned. Then the rain stopped and the waters went down again, until at last it was safe to come off the raft. Now there was no one alive but the man and his family, but one day they heard a sound of dancing and shouting on the other side of the ridge. The man climbed to the top and looked over. Everything was still, but all along the valley he saw great piles of bones of the people who had been drowned, and then he knew that the ghosts had been dancing. Quadruped Myths 15. The Fourfoot Tribes In Cherokee mythology, as in that of Indian tribes generally, there is no essential difference between men and animals. In the primal Genesis period they seem to be completely undifferentiated, and we find all creatures alike living and working together in harmony and mutual helpfulness until man, by his aggressiveness and disregard for the rights of the others, provokes their hostility when insects, birds, fishes, reptiles, and four-foot beasts join forces against him, see story, origin of disease and medicine. Henceforth their lives are apart, but the difference is always one of degree only. The animals, like the people, are organized into tribes and have like them their chiefs and townhouses, their councils and ballplays, and the same hereafter in the darkening land of Yusunhi'i. Man is still the paramount power, and hunts and slaughters the others as his own necessities compel, but is obliged to satisfy the animal tribes in every instance, very much as a murder is compounded for, according to the Indian system. By, covering the bones of the dead, with presents for the bereaved relatives. This pardon to the hunter is made the easier through a peculiar doctrine of reincarnation, according to which, as explained by the shamans, there is assigned to every animal a definite life term which cannot be curtailed by violent means. If it is killed before the expiration of the allotted time the death is only temporary and the body is immediately resurrected in its proper shape from the blood drops, and the animal continues its existence until the end of the predestined period. When the body is finally dissolved and the liberated spirit goes to join its kindred shades in the darkening land. This idea appears in the story of the bear man and in the belief concerning the little deer. Death is thus but a temporary accident and the killing a mere minor crime. By some priests it is held that there are seven successive reanimations before the final end. Certain supernatural personages, Kana Ti and Tsulkal, see the myths, have dominion over the animals, and are therefore regarded as the distinctive gods of the hunter. Kana Ti at one time kept the game animals, as well as the pestiferous insects, shut up in a cave underground, from which they were released by his undutiful sons. The primeval animals, the actors in the animal myths and the predecessors of the existing species, are believed to have been much larger, stronger, and cleverer than their successors of the present day. In these myths we find the Indian explanation of certain peculiarities of form, color, or habit, and the various animals are always consistently represented as acting in accordance with their well-known characteristics. First and most prominent in the animal myths is the rabbit, Tsistu, who figures always as a trickster and deceiver, generally malicious, but often beaten at his own game by those whom he had intended to victimize. The connection of the rabbit with the dawn god and the relation of the Indian myths to the stories current among the southern Negroes are discussed in another place. Ball players while in training are forbidden to eat the flesh of the rabbit, because this animal so easily becomes confused in running. On the other hand, their spies seek opportunity to strew along the path which must be taken by their rivals a soup made of rabbit hamstrings, with the purpose of rendering them timorous in action. In a ball game between the birds and the four-foot animals, see story, the bat, which took sides with the birds, is said to have won the victory for his party by his superior dodging abilities. For this reason the wings or sometimes the stuffed skin of the bat are tied to the implements used in the game to ensure success for the players. According to the same myth the flying squirrel, Tewa, also aided in securing the victory, and hence both these animals are still invoked by the ball player. The meat of the common grey squirrel, Sala Lee, is forbidden to rheumatic patients, on account of the squirrel's habit of assuming a cramped position when eating. The stripes upon the back of the ground squirrel, Kiyuga, 
are the mark of scratches made by the angry animals at a memorable council in which he took it upon himself to say a good word for the archenemy, man, see, origin of disease and medicine. The peculiarities of the mink, Sunji, are accounted for by another story. The buffalo, the largest game animal of America, was hunted in the southern Allegheny region until almost the close of the last century, the particular species being probably that known in the west as the wood or mountain buffalo. The name in use among the principal Gulf tribes was practically the same, and cannot be analyzed, viz, Cherokee, Yunsu, Hichiti, Yanasi, Creek, Yenasa, Choctaw, Yanash. Although the flesh of the buffalo was eaten, its skin dressed for blankets and bed coverings, its long hair woven into belts, and its horns carved into spoons, it is yet strangely absent from Cherokee folklore. So far as is known it is mentioned in but a single one of the sacred formulas, in which a person under treatment for rheumatism is forbidden to eat the meat, touch the skin, or use a spoon made from the horn of the buffalo. Upon the ground of an occult connection between the habitual cramped attitude of a rheumatic and the natural hump of that animal. The elk is known, probably by report, under the name of Aigua, great deer, but there is no myth or folklore in connection with it. The deer, Aw, which is still common in the mountains, was the principal dependence of the Cherokee hunter, and is consequently prominent in myth, folklore, and ceremonial. One of the seven gentes of the tribe is named from it, Ani, Kawi, deer people. According to a myth given elsewhere, the deer won his horns in a successful race with the rabbit. Rheumatism is usually ascribed to the work of revengeful deer ghosts, which the hunter has neglected to placate, while on the other hand the aid of the deer is invoked against frostbite, as its feet are believed to be immune from injury by frost. The wolf, the fox, and the opossum are also invoked for this purpose, and for the same reason. When the redroot, Ceanothus americanus, puts forth its leaves the people say the young fawns are then in the mountains. On killing a deer the hunter always cuts out the hamstring from the hind quarter and throws it away, for fear that if he ate it he would thereafter tire easily in traveling. The powerful chief of the deer tribe is the A. Y. Usti, or Little Deer, who is invisible to all except the greatest masters of the hunting secrets. And can be wounded only by the hunter who has supplemented years of occult study with frequent fasts and lonely vigils. The little deer keeps constant protecting watch over his subjects, and sees well to it that not one is ever killed in wantonness. When a deer is shot by the hunter the little deer knows it at once and is instantly at the spot. Bending low his head he asks of the blood stains upon the ground if they have heard, i.e., if the hunter has asked pardon for the life that he has taken. If the formulistic prayer has been made, all is well, because the necessary sacrifice has been atoned for. But if otherwise, the little deer tracks the hunter to his house by the blood drops along the trail, and, unseen and unsuspected, puts into his body the spirit of rheumatism that shall rack him with aches and pains from that time henceforth. As seen at rare intervals, perhaps once in a long lifetime, the little deer is pure white and about the size of a small dog, has branching antlers, and is always in company with a large herd of deer. Even though shot by the master hunter, he comes to life again, being immortal, but the fortunate huntsman who can thus make prize of his antlers has in them an unfailing talisman that brings him success in the chase forever after. The smallest portion of one of those horns of the little deer, when properly consecrated, attracts the deer to the hunter, and when exposed from the wrapping dazes them so that they forget to run and thus become an easy prey. Like the Yulunsu Ti stone, see, it is a dangerous prize when not treated with proper respect, and is, or was, kept always in a secret place away from the house to guard against sacrilegious handling. Somewhat similar talismanic power attached to the down from the young antler of the deer when properly consecrated. So firm was the belief that it had influence over anything about a deer, that eighty and a hundred years ago even white traders used to bargain with the Indians for such charms in order to increase their store of deerskins by drawing the trade to themselves. The faith in the existence of the miraculous little deer is almost as strong and universal today among the older Cherokee as is the belief in a future life. The bears, Yanu, are transformed Cherokee of the old clan of the Ani, Tsa Gui, Sea Story, Origin of the Bear. 
Their chief is the White Bear, who lives at Koa High, Mulberry Place, one of the high peaks of the Great Smoky Mountains, near to the enchanted lake of Ataga High, sea, to which the wounded bears go to be cured of their hurts. Under Koa High and each of three other peaks in the same mountain region the bears have townhouses, where they congregate and hold dances every fall before retiring to their dens for the winter. Being really human, they can talk if they only would, and once a mother bear was heard singing to her cub in words which the hunter understood. There is one variety known as Kulus Ganahita, long hams, described as a large black bear with long legs and small feet, which is always lean, and which the hunter does not care to shoot, possibly on account of its leanness. It is believed that newborn cubs are hairless, like mice. The wolf, Waya, is revered as the hunter and watchdog of Kana Ti, and the largest gens in the tribe bears the name of Ani, Waya, wolf people. The ordinary Cherokee will never kill one if he can possibly avoid it, but will let the animal go by unharmed, believing that the kindred of a slain wolf will surely revenge his death. And that the weapon with which the deed is done will be rendered worthless for further shooting until cleaned and exorcised by a medicine man. Certain persons, however, having knowledge of the proper atonement rites, may kill wolves with impunity, and are hired for this purpose by others who have suffered from raids upon their fish traps or their stock. Like the eagle killer, see, the bird tribes, the professional wolf killer, after killing one of these animals. Addresses to it a prayer in which he seeks to turn aside the vengeance of the tribe by laying the burden of blame upon the people of some other settlement. He then unscrews the barrel of his gun and inserts into it seven small sourwood rods heated over the fire, and allows it to remain thus overnight in the running stream. In the morning the rods are taken out and the barrel is thoroughly dried and cleaned. The dog, Gil, although as much a part of Indian life among the Cherokee as in other tribes, hardly appears in folklore. One myth makes him responsible for the Milky Way, another represents him as driving the wolf from the comfortable house fire and taking the place for himself. He figures also in connection with the deluge. There is no tradition of the introduction of the horse, Esegwali, Esegwalihu, a pack or burden, or of the cow, Waka, from the Spanish, Vaca. The hog is called Sikwa, this being originally the name of the opossum, which somewhat resembles it in expression, and which is now distinguished as Sikwa Utsti, grinning Sikwa. In the same way the sheep, another introduced animal, is called A Unaid Na, woolly deer, the goat, A Hanulahi, bearded deer, and the mule, Sa Gua Li Digulanahi Ta, long-eared horse. The cat, also obtained from the whites, is called Wisa, an attempt at the English, pussy. When it purrs by the fireside, the children say it is counting in Cherokee, Taladu, Nun Gi, Taladu, Nun Gi, 16, 4, 16, 4. The elephant, which a few of the Cherokee have seen in shows, is called by them Kama Ma Yutanu, Great Butterfly, from the supposed resemblance of its long trunk and flapping ears to the proboscis and wings of that insect. The anatomical peculiarities of the opossum, of both sexes, are the subject of much curious speculation among the Indians, many of whom believe that its young are produced without any help from the male. It occurs in one or two of the minor myths. The fox, Tsuel, is mentioned in one of the formulas, but does not appear in the tribal folklore. The black fox is known by a different name, Ina Lee. The odor of the skunk, Dila, is believed to keep off contagious diseases, and the scent bag is therefore taken out and hung over the doorway, a small hole being pierced in it in order that the contents may ooze out upon the timbers. At times, as in the smallpox epidemic of 1866, the entire body of the animal was thus hung up, and in some cases, as an additional safeguard, the meat was cooked and eaten and the oil rubbed over the skin of the person. The underlying idea is that the fetid smell repels the diseased spirit, and upon the same principle the buzzard, which is so evidently superior to carrion smells, is held to be powerful against the same diseases. The beaver, de e, by reason of its well-known gnawing ability, against which even the hardest wood is not proof, is invoked on behalf of young children just getting their permanent teeth. According to the little formula which is familiar to nearly every mother in the tribe, when the loosened milk tooth is pulled out or drops out of itself, 
the child runs with it around the house, repeating four times, the e, skinta, beaver. Put a new tooth into my jaw, after which he throws the tooth upon the roof of the house. In a characteristic song formula to prevent frostbite the traveler, before starting out on a cold winter morning, rubs his feet in the ashes of the fire and sings a song of four verses, by means of which, according to the Indian idea, he acquires in turn the cold-defying powers of the wolf, deer, fox, and opossum, for animals whose feet, it is held, are never frostbitten. After each verse he imitates the cry and the action of the animal. The words used are archaic in form and may be rendered, I become a real wolf, etc. The song runs. Sun Wayaya, repeated four times, Wa plus A. Prolonged howl. Imitates a wolf pawing the ground with his feet. Sun Ka Wai, repeated four times, Saw. 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 Imitates call and jumping of a deer. Sun Tsu Laya, repeated four times, Gay. 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 Imitates barking and scratching of a fox. Sun si quaya, repeated four times, key plus. Imitates the cry of an opossum when cornered, and throws his head back as that animal does when feigning death. 16. The rabbit goes duck hunting. The rabbit was so boastful that he would claim to do whatever he saw anyone else do, and so tricky that he could usually make the other animals believe it all. Once he pretended that he could swim in the water and eat fish just as the otter did, and when the others told him to prove it he fixed up a plan so that the otter himself was deceived. Soon afterward they met again and the otter said, I eat ducks sometimes. Said the rabbit, well, I eat ducks too. The otter challenged him to try it. So they went up along the river until they saw several ducks in the water and managed to get near without being seen. The rabbit told the otter to go first. The otter never hesitated, but dived from the bank and swam under water until he reached the ducks, when he pulled one down without being noticed by the others, and came back in the same way. While the otter had been under the water the rabbit had peeled some bark from a sapling and made himself a noose. Now, he said, just watch me. And he dived in and swam a little way under the water until he was nearly choking and had to come up to the top to breathe. He went under again and came up again a little nearer to the ducks. He took another breath and dived under, and this time he came up among the ducks and threw the noose over the head of one and caught it. The duck struggled hard and finally spread its wings and flew up from the water with the rabbit hanging on to the noose. It flew on and on until at last the rabbit could not hold on any longer, but had to let go and drop. As it happened, he fell into a tall, hollow sycamore stump without any hole at the bottom to get out from, and there he stayed until he was so hungry that he had to eat his own fur, as the rabbit does ever since when he is starving. After several days, when he was very weak with hunger, he heard children playing outside around the trees. He began to sing. Cut a door and look at me. I'm the prettiest thing you ever did see. The children ran home and told their father, who came and began to cut a hole in the tree. As he chopped away the rabbit inside kept singing, cut it larger, so you can see me better, I'm so pretty. They made the hole larger, and then the rabbit told them to stand back so that they could take a good look as he came out. They stood away back, and the rabbit watched his chance and jumped out and got away. 17. How the rabbit stole the otter's coat. The animals were of different sizes and wore coats of various colors and patterns. Some wore long fur and others wore short. Some had rings on their tails, and some had no tails at all. Some had coats of brown, others of black or yellow. They were always disputing about their good looks, so at last they agreed to hold a council to decide who had the finest coat. They had heard a great deal about the otter, who lived so far up the creek that he seldom came down to visit the other animals. It was said that he had the finest coat of all but no one knew just what it was like, because it was a long time since anyone had seen him. They did not even know exactly where he lived, only the general direction. But they knew he would come to the council when the word got out. Now the rabbit wanted the verdict for himself, 
so when it began to look as if it might go to the otter he studied up a plan to cheat him out of it. He asked a few sly questions until he learned what trail the otter would take to get to the council place. Then, without saying anything, he went on ahead and after four days' travel he met the otter and knew him at once by his beautiful coat of soft dark brown fur. The otter was glad to see him and asked him where he was going. Oh, said the rabbit, the animals sent me to bring you to the council, because you live so far away they were afraid you mightn't know the road. The otter thanked him, and they went on together. They traveled all day toward the council ground, and at night the rabbit selected the camping place, because the otter was a stranger in that part of the country, and cut down bushes for beds and fixed everything in good shape. The next morning they started on again. In the afternoon the rabbit began to pick up wood and bark as they went along and to load it on his back. When the otter asked what this was for the rabbit said it was that they might be warm and comfortable at night. After a while, when it was near sunset, they stopped and made their camp. When supper was over the rabbit got a stick and shaved it down to a paddle. The otter wondered and asked again what that was for. I have good dreams when I sleep with a paddle under my head, said the rabbit. When the paddle was finished the rabbit began to cut away the bushes so as to make a clean trail down to the river. The otter wondered more and more and wanted to know what this meant. Said the rabbit, this place is called D. Totlaski E, the place where it rains fire. Sometimes it rains fire here, and the sky looks a little that way tonight. You go to sleep and I'll sit up and watch, and if the fire does come, as soon as you hear me shout, you run and jump into the river. Better hang your coat on a limb over there, so it won't get burnt. The otter did as he was told, and they both doubled up to go to sleep, but the rabbit kept awake. After a while the fire burned down to red coals. The rabbit called, but the otter was fast asleep and made no answer. In a little while he called again, but the otter never stirred. Then the rabbit filled the paddle with hot coals and threw them up into the air and shouted, It's raining fire. It's raining fire. The hot coals fell all around the otter and he jumped up. To the water, cried the rabbit, and the otter ran and jumped into the river, and he has lived in the water ever since. The rabbit took the otter's coat and put it on, leaving his own instead, and went on to the council. All the animals were there, every one looking out for the otter. At last they saw him in the distance, and they said one to the other, The otter is coming and sent one of the small animals to show him the best seat. They were all glad to see him and went up in turn to welcome him, but the otter kept his head down, with one paw over his face. They wondered that he was so bashful, until the bear came up and pulled the paw away, and there was the rabbit with his split nose. He sprang up and started to run, when the bear struck at him and pulled his tail off, but the rabbit was too quick for them and got away. 18. Why the possum's tail is bare. The possum used to have a long, bushy tail, and was so proud of it that he combed it out every morning and sang about it at the dance, until the rabbit, who had had no tail since the bear pulled it out, became very jealous and made up his mind to play the possum a trick. There was to be a great council and a dance at which all the animals were to be present. It was the rabbit's business to send out the news, so as he was passing the possum's place he stopped to ask him if he intended to be there. The possum said he would come if he could have a special seat, because I have such a handsome tail that I ought to sit where everybody can see me. The rabbit promised to attend to it and to send someone besides to comb and dress the possum's tail for the dance, so the possum was very much pleased and agreed to come. Then the rabbit went over to the cricket, who is such an expert hair cutter that the Indians call him the barber, and told him to go next morning and dress the possum's tail for the dance that night. He told the cricket just what to do and then went on about some other mischief. In the morning the cricket went to the possum's house and said he had come to get him ready for the dance. So the possum stretched himself out and shut his eyes while the cricket combed out his tail and wrapped a red string around it to keep it smooth until night. But all this time, as he wound the string around, he was clipping off the hair close to the roots, and the possum never knew it. When it was night the possum went to the townhouse where the dance was to be and found the best seat ready for him, just as the rabbit had promised. When his turn came in the dance he loosened the string from his tail and stepped into the middle of the floor. 
The drummers began to drum and the possum began to sing, See my beautiful tail. Everybody shouted and he danced around the circle and sang again, See what a fine color it has. They shouted again and he danced around another time, singing, See how it sweeps the ground. The animals shouted more loudly than ever, and the possum was delighted. He danced around again and sang, See how fine the fur is. Then everybody laughed so long that the possum wondered what they meant. He looked around the circle of animals and they were all laughing at him. Then he looked down at his beautiful tail and saw that there was not a hair left upon it, but that it was as bare as the tail of a lizard. He was so much astonished and ashamed that he could not say a word, but rolled over helpless on the ground and grinned, as the possum does to this day when taken by surprise. 19. How the Wildcat Caught the Gobbler The wildcat once caught the rabbit and was about to kill him, when the rabbit begged for his life, saying, I'm so small I would make only a mouthful for you. But if you let me go I'll show you where you can get a whole drove of turkeys. So the wildcat let him up and went with him to where the turkeys were. When they came near the place the rabbit said to the wildcat, Now, you must do just as I say. Lie down as if you were dead and don't move, even if I kick you, but when I give the word jump up and catch the largest one there. The wildcat agreed and stretched out as if dead, while the rabbit gathered some rotten wood and crumbled it over his eyes and nose to make them look flyblown, so that the turkeys would think he had been dead some time. Then the rabbit went over to the turkeys and said, in a sociable way, Here, I've found our old enemy, the wildcat, lying dead in the trail. Let's have a dance over him. The turkeys were very doubtful, but finally went with him to where the wildcat was lying in the road as if dead. Now, the rabbit had a good voice and was a great dance leader, so he said, I'll lead the song and you dance around him. The turkeys thought that fine, so the rabbit took a stick to beat time and began to sing, Galaji na hasuyak, Galaji na hasuyak, pick out the gobbler, pick out the gobbler. Why do you say that, said the old turkey. Oh, that's all right, said the rabbit, that's just the way he does, and we sing about it. He started the song again and the turkeys began to dance around the wildcat. When they had gone around several times the rabbit said, Now go up and hit him, as we do in the war dance. So the turkeys, thinking the wildcat surely dead, crowded in close around him and the old gobbler kicked him. Then the rabbit drummed hard and sang his loudest, Pick out the gobbler, pick out the gobbler, and the wildcat jumped up and caught the gobbler. 20. How the Terrapin Beat the Rabbit The rabbit was a great runner, and everybody knew it. No one thought the terrapin anything but a slow traveler, but he was a great warrior and very boastful, and the two were always disputing about their speed. At last they agreed to decide the matter by a race. They fixed the day and the starting place and arranged to run across four mountain ridges, and the one who came in first at the end was to be the winner. The rabbit felt so sure of it that he said to the terrapin, You know you can't run. You can never win the race, so I'll give you the first ridge and then you'll have only three to cross while I go over four. The terrapin said that would be all right, but that night when he went home to his family he sent for his terrapin friends and told them he wanted their help. He said he knew he could not outrun the rabbit, but he wanted to stop the rabbit's boasting. He explained his plan to his friends and they agreed to help him. When the day came all the animals were there to see the race. The rabbit was with them, but the terrapin was gone ahead toward the first ridge, as they had arranged, and they could hardly see him on account of the long grass. The word was given and the rabbit started off with long jumps up the mountain, expecting to win the race before the terrapin could get down the other side. But before he got up the mountain he saw the terrapin go over the ridge ahead of him. He ran on, and when he reached the top he looked all around, but could not see the terrapin on account of the long grass. He kept on down the mountain and began to climb the second ridge, but when he looked up again there was the terrapin just going over the top. Now he was surprised and made his longest jumps to catch up, but when he got to the top there was the terrapin away in front going over the third ridge. The rabbit was getting tired now and nearly out of breath but he kept on down the mountain and up the other ridge until he got to the top just in time to see the terrapin cross the fourth ridge and thus win the race. The rabbit could not make another jump, but fell over on the ground, 
crying me, 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 as the rabbit does ever since when he is too tired to run any more. The race was given to the terrapin and all the animals wondered how he could win against the rabbit, but he kept still and never told. It was easy enough, however, because all the terrapin's friends looked just alike, and he had simply posted one near the top of each ridge to wait until the rabbit came in sight and then climb over and hide in the long grass. When the rabbit came on he could not find the terrapin and so thought the terrapin was ahead, and if he had met one of the other terrapins he would have thought it the same one because they looked so much alike. The real terrapin had posted himself on the fourth ridge, so as to come in at the end of the race and be ready to answer questions if the animals suspected anything. Because the rabbit had to lie down and lose the race the conjurer now, when preparing his young men for the ball play, boils a lot of rabbit hamstrings into a soup. And sends someone at night to pour it across the path along which the other players are to come in the morning, so that they may become tired in the same way and lose the game. It is not always easy to do this, because the other party is expecting it and has watchers ahead to prevent it. 21. The Rabbit and the Tar Wolf once there was such a long spell of dry weather that there was no more water in the creeks and springs, and the animals held a council to see what to do about it. They decided to dig a well, and all agreed to help except the rabbit, who was a lazy fellow, and said, I don't need to dig for water. The dew on the grass is enough for me. The others did not like this, but they went to work together and dug their well. They noticed that the rabbit kept sleek and lively, although it was still dry weather and the water was getting low in the well. They said, that tricky rabbit steals our water at night, so they made a wolf of pine gum and tar and set it up by the well to scare the thief. That night the rabbit came, as he had been coming every night, to drink enough to last him all next day. He saw the queer black thing by the well and said, who's there, but the tar wolf said nothing. He came nearer, but the wolf never moved, so he grew braver and said, get out of my way or I'll strike you. Still the wolf never moved and the rabbit came up and struck it with his paw, but the gum held his foot and it stuck fast. Now he was angry and said, let me go or I'll kick you. Still the wolf said nothing. Then the rabbit struck again with his hind foot, so hard that it was caught in the gum and he could not move, and there he stuck until the animals came for water in the morning. When they found who the thief was they had great sport over him for a while and then got ready to kill him, but as soon as he was unfastened from the tar wolf he managed to get away. Wafford. Second Version Once upon a time there was such a severe drought that all streams of water and all lakes were dried up. In this emergency the beasts assembled together to devise means to procure water. It was proposed by one to dig a well. All agreed to do so except the hare. She refused because it would soil her tiny paws. The rest, however, dug their well and were fortunate enough to find water. The hare beginning to suffer and thirst, and having no right to the well, was thrown upon her wits to procure water. She determined, as the easiest way, to steal from the public well. The rest of the animals, surprised to find that the hare was so well supplied with water, asked her where she got it. She replied that she arose betimes in the morning and gathered the dewdrops. However the wolf and the fox suspected her of theft and hit on the following plan to detect her. They made a wolf of tar and placed it near the well. On the following night the hare came as usual after her supply of water. On seeing the tar wolf she demanded who was there. Receiving no answer she repeated the demand, threatening to kick the wolf if he did not reply. She receiving no reply kicked the wolf, and by this means adhered to the tar and was caught. When the fox and wolf got hold of her they consulted what it was best to do with her. One proposed cutting her head off. This the hare protested would be useless, as it had often been tried without hurting her. Other methods were proposed for dispatching her, all of which she said would be useless. At last it was proposed to let her loose to perish in a thicket. Upon this the hare affected great uneasiness and pleaded hard for life. Her enemies, however, refused to listen and she was accordingly let loose. As soon, however, as she was out of reach of her enemies she gave a whoop, and bounding away she exclaimed, This is where I live. Cherokee Advocate, December 18, 1845
Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL, 14 Photograph by Author, 1888 Ista 22, The Rabbit and the Possum After a Wife The rabbit and the possum each wanted a wife, but no one would marry either of them. They talked over the matter and the rabbit said, We can't get wives here, let's go to the next settlement. I'm the messenger for the council, and I'll tell the people that I bring an order that everybody must take a mate at once, and then we'll be sure to get our wives. The possum thought this a fine plan, so they started off together to the next town. As the rabbit traveled faster he got there first and waited outside until the people noticed him and took him into the townhouse. When the chief came to ask his business the rabbit said he brought an important order from the council that everybody must get married without delay. So the chief called the people together and told them the message from the council. Every animal took a mate at once, and the rabbit got a wife. The possum traveled so slowly that he got there after all the animals had mated, leaving him still without a wife. The rabbit pretended to feel sorry for him and said, Never mind, I'll carry the message to the people in the next settlement, and you hurry on as fast as you can, and this time you will get your wife. So he went on to the next town, and the possum followed close after him. But when the rabbit got to the townhouse he sent out the word that, as there had been peace so long that everybody was getting lazy the council had ordered that there must be war at once and they must begin right in the townhouse. So they all began fighting, but the rabbit made four great leaps and got away just as the possum came in. Everybody jumped on the possum, who had not thought of bringing his weapons on a wedding trip, and so could not defend himself. They had nearly beaten the life out of him when he fell over and pretended to be dead until he saw a good chance to jump up and get away. The possum never got a wife, but he remembers the lesson, and ever since he shuts his eyes and pretends to be dead when the hunter has him in a close corner. 23. The rabbit dines the bear. The bear invited the rabbit to dine with him. They had beans in the pot, but there was no grease for them, so the bear cut a slit in his side and let the oil run out until they had enough to cook the dinner. The rabbit looked surprised, and thought to himself, that's a handy way. I think I'll try that. When he started home he invited the bear to come and take dinner with him four days later. When the bear came the rabbit said, I have beans for dinner, too. Now I'll get the grease for them. So he took a knife and drove it into his side, but instead of oil, a stream of blood gushed out and he fell over nearly dead. The bear picked him up and had hard work to tie up the wound and stop the bleeding. Then he scolded him, you little fool, I'm large and strong and lined with fat all over, the knife don't hurt me, but you're small and lean, and you can't do such things. 24. The rabbit escapes from the wolves. Some wolves once caught the rabbit and were going to eat him when he asked leave to show them a new dance he was practicing. They knew that the rabbit was a great song leader, and they wanted to learn the latest dance, so they agreed and made a ring about him while he got ready. He patted his feet and began to dance around in a circle, singing. Plaj Situan Gali Sgi Sida Ha. Ha Nia Lil. Lil. Ha Nia Lil. Lil. On the edge of the field I dance about. Ha Nia Lil. Lil. Ha Nia Lil. Lil. Now, said the rabbit, when I sing, on the edge of the field, I dance that way, and he danced over in that direction, and when I sing, Lil. Lil, you must all stamp your feet hard. The wolves thought it fine. He began another round singing the same song, and danced a little nearer to the field, while the wolves all stamped their feet. He sang louder and louder and danced nearer and nearer to the field until at the fourth song, when the wolves were stamping as hard as they could and thinking only of the song, he made one jump and was off through the long grass. They were after him at once, but he ran for a hollow stump and climbed up on the inside. When the the wolves got there one of them put his head inside to look up, but the rabbit spit into his eye, so that he had to pull his head out again. The others were afraid to try, and they went away, with the rabbit still in the stump. 25. Flint visits the rabbit. In the old days Toy Scala, Flint, lived up in the mountains, and all the animals hated him because he had helped to kill so many of them. 
They used to get together to talk over means to put him out of the way, but everybody was afraid to venture near his house until the rabbit, who was the boldest leader among them, offered to go after Flint and try to kill him. They told him where to find him, and the rabbit set out and at last came to Flint's house. Flint was standing at his door when the rabbit came up and said, sneeringly, See you. Hello. Are you the fellow they call Flint? Yes. That's what they call me, answered Flint. Is this where you live? Yes, this is where I live. All this time the rabbit was looking about the place trying to study out some plan to take Flint off his guard. He had expected Flint to invite him into the house, so he waited a little while, but when Flint made no move, he said, Well, my name is Rabbit, I've heard a good deal about you, so I came to invite you to come and see me. Flint wanted to know where the rabbit's house was, and he told him it was down in the broomgrass field near the river. So Flint promised to make him a visit in a few days. Why not come now and have supper with me? Said the rabbit, and after a little coaxing Flint agreed and the two started down the mountain together. When they came near the rabbit's hole the rabbit said, There is my house, but in summer I generally stay outside here where it is cooler. So he made a fire, and they had their supper on the grass. When it was over, Flint stretched out to rest and the rabbit got some heavy sticks and his knife and cut out a mallet and wedge. Flint looked up and asked what that was for. Oh, said the rabbit, I like to be doing something, and they may come handy. So Flint lay down again, and pretty soon he was sound asleep. The rabbit spoke to him once or twice to make sure, but there was no answer. Then he came over to Flint and with one good blow of the mallet he drove the sharp stake into his body and ran with all his might for his own hole, but before he reached it there was a loud explosion, and pieces of Flint flew all about. That is why we find Flint in so many places now. One piece struck the rabbit from behind and cut him just as he dived into his hole. He sat listening until everything seemed quiet again. Then he put his head out to look around, but just at that moment another piece fell and struck him on the lip and split it, as we still see it. 26. How the deer got his horns. In the beginning the deer had no horns, but his head was smooth just like a doe's. He was a great runner and the rabbit was a great jumper, and the animals were all curious to know which could go farther in the same time. They talked about it a good deal, and at last arranged a match between the two, and made a nice large pair of antlers for a prize to the winner. They were to start together from one side of a thicket and go through it, then turn and come back, and the one who came out first was to get the horns. On the day fixed all the animals were there, with the antlers put down on the ground at the edge of the thicket to mark the starting point. While everybody was admiring the horns the rabbit said, I don't know this part of the country. I want to take a look through the bushes where I am to run. They thought that all right, so the rabbit went into the thicket, but he was gone so long that at last the animal suspected he must be up to one of his tricks. They sent a messenger to look for him, and away in the middle of the thicket he found the rabbit gnawing down the bushes and pulling them away until he had a road cleared nearly to the other side. The messenger turned around quietly and came back and told the other animals. When the rabbit came out at last they accused him of cheating, but he denied it until they went into the thicket and found the cleared road. They agreed that such a trickster had no right to enter the race at all, so they gave the horns to the deer, who was admitted to be the best runner, and he has worn them ever since. They told the rabbit that as he was so fond of cutting down bushes he might do that for a living hereafter, and so he does to this day. 27. Why the deer's teeth are blunt. The rabbit felt sore because the deer had won the horns, see the last story, and resolved to get even. One day soon after the race he stretched a large grapevine across the trail and nodded nearly in two in the middle. Then he went back a piece, took a good run, and jumped up at the vine. He kept on running and jumping up at the vine until the deer came along and asked him what he was doing. Don't you see, says the rabbit. I'm so strong that I can bite through that grapevine at one jump. The deer could hardly believe this, and wanted to see it done. So the rabbit ran back, made a tremendous spring, and bit through the vine where he had gnawed it before. The deer, when he saw that, 
said, well, I can do it if you can. So the rabbit stretched a larger grapevine across the trail, but without gnawing it in the middle. The deer ran back as he had seen the rabbit do, made a spring, and struck the grapevine right in the center, but it only flew back and threw him over on his head. He tried again and again, until he was all bruised and bleeding. Let me see your teeth, at last said the rabbit. So the deer showed him his teeth, which were long like a wolf's teeth, but not very sharp. No wonder you can't do it, says the rabbit, your teeth are too blunt to bite anything. Let me sharpen them for you like mine. My teeth are so sharp that I can cut through a stick just like a knife. And he showed him a black locust twig, of which rabbits gnaw the young shoots, which he had shaved off as well as a knife could do it, in regular rabbit fashion. The deer thought that just the thing. So the rabbit got a hard stone with rough edges and filed and filed away at the deer's teeth until they were worn down almost to the gums. It hurts, said the deer, but the rabbit said it always hurt a little when they began to get sharp. So the deer kept quiet. Now try it, at last said the rabbit. So the deer tried again, but this time he could not bite at all. Now you've paid for your horns, said the rabbit, as he jumped away through the bushes. Ever since then the deer's teeth are so blunt that he cannot chew anything but grass and leaves. 28. What became of the rabbit? The deer was very angry at the rabbit for filing his teeth and determined to be revenged, but he kept still and pretended to be friendly until the rabbit was off his guard. Then one day, as they were going along together talking, he challenged the rabbit to jump against him. Now the rabbit is a great jumper, as everyone knows, so he agreed at once. There was a small stream beside the path, as there generally is in that country, and the deer said. Let's see if you can jump across this branch. We'll go back a piece, and then when I say cool. Then both run and jump. All right, said the rabbit. So they went back to get a good start, and when the deer gave the word coo. They ran for the stream, and the rabbit made one jump and landed on the other side. But the deer had stopped on the bank, and when the rabbit looked back the deer had conjured the stream so that it was a large river. The rabbit was never able to get back again and is still on the other side. The rabbit that we know is only a little thing that came afterwards. 29. Why the mink smells. The mink was such a great thief that at last the animals held a council about the matter. It was decided to burn him, so they caught the mink, built a great fire, and threw him into it. As the blaze went up and they smelt the roasted flesh, they began to think he was punished enough and would probably do better in the future, so they took him out of the fire. But the mink was already burned black and is black ever since, and whenever he is attacked or excited he smells again like roasted meat. The lesson did no good, however, and he is still as great a thief as ever. 30. Why the Mole Lives Underground A man was in love with a woman who disliked him and would have nothing to do with him. He tried every way to win her favor, but to no purpose, until at last he grew discouraged and made himself sick thinking over it. The mole came along, and finding him in such low condition asked what was the trouble. The man told him the whole story and when he had finished the mole said, I can help you, so that she will not only like you, but will come to you of her own will. So that night the mole burrowed his way underground to where the girl was in bed asleep and took out her heart. He came back by the same way and gave the heart to the man, who could not see it even when it was put into his hand. There, said the mole, swallow it, and she will be drawn to come to you and cannot keep away. The man swallowed the heart, and when the girl woke up she somehow thought at once of him, and felt a strange desire to be with him, as though she must go to him at once. She wondered and could not understand it, because she had always disliked him before, but at last the feeling grew so strong that she was compelled to go herself to the man and tell him she loved him and wanted to be his wife. And so they were married, but all the magicians who had known them both were surprised and wondered how it had come about. When they found that it was the work of the mole, whom they had always before thought too insignificant for their notice, they were very jealous and threatened to kill him. So that he hid himself under the ground and has never since dared to come up to the surface. 31. The Terrapins Escape from the Wolves 
The possum and the terrapin went out together to hunt persimmons, and found a tree full of ripe fruit. The possum climbed it and was throwing down the persimmons to the terrapin when a wolf came up and began to snap at the persimmons as they fell, before the terrapin could reach them. The possum waited his chance, and at last managed to throw down a large one, some say a bone which he carried with him, so that it lodged in the wolf's throat as he jumped up at it and choked him to death. I'll take his ears for hominy spoons, said the terrapin, and cut off the wolf's ears and started home with them, leaving the possum still eating persimmons up in the tree. After a while he came to a house and was invited to have some kanahi na gruel from the jar that is set always outside the door. He sat down beside the jar and dipped up the gruel with one of the wolf's ears for a spoon. The people noticed and wondered. When he was satisfied he went on, but soon came to another house and was asked to have some more kanahi na. He dipped it up again with the wolf's ear and went on when he had enough. Soon the news went around that the terrapin had killed the wolf and was using his ears for spoons. All the wolves got together and followed the terrapin's trail until they came up with him and made him prisoner. Then they held a council to decide what to do with him, and agreed to boil him in a clay pot. They brought in a pot, but the terrapin only laughed at it and said that if they put him into that thing he would kick it all to pieces. They said they would burn him in the fire, but the terrapin laughed again and said he would put it out. Then they decided to throw him into the deepest hole in the river and drown him. The terrapin begged and prayed them not to do that, but they paid no attention, and dragged him over to the river and threw him in. That was just what the terrapin had been waiting for all the time, and he dived under the water and came up on the other side and got away. Some say that when he was thrown into the river he struck against a rock, which broke his back in a dozen places. He sang a medicine song. Gu de Wu, Gu de Wu. I have sewed myself together. I have sewed myself together. And the pieces came together, but the scars remain on his shell to this day. 32. Origin of the Groundhog Dance, the Groundhog's Head Seven wolves once caught a groundhog and said, Now we'll kill you and have something good to eat. But the groundhog said, When we find good food we must rejoice over it, as people do in the green corn dance. I know you mean to kill me and I can't help myself, but if you want to dance I'll sing for you. This is a new dance entirely. I'll lean up against seven trees in turn and you will dance out and then turn and come back, as I give the signal, and at the last turn you may kill me. The wolves were very hungry, but they wanted to learn the new dance, so they told him to go ahead. The groundhog leaned up against a tree and began the song, Hawaii Ahai, and all the wolves danced out in front, until he gave the signal, you. And began with Hai Yagui, when they turned and danced back in line. That's fine, said the groundhog, and went over to the next tree and started the second song. The wolves danced out and then turned at the signal and danced back again. That's very fine, said the groundhog, and went over to another tree and started the third song. The wolves danced their best and the groundhog encouraged them but at each song he took another tree, and each tree was a little nearer to his hole under a stump. At the seventh song he said, Now, this is the last dance, and when I say you, you will all turn and come after me, and the one who gets me may have me. So he began the seventh song and kept it up until the wolves were away out in front. Then he gave the signal, you, and made a jump for his hole. The wolves turned and were after him, but he reached the hole first and dived in. Just as he got inside, the foremost wolf caught him by the tail and gave it such a pull that it broke off, and the groundhog's tail has been short ever since. The unpleasant smell of the groundhog's head was given it by the other animals to punish an insulting remark made by him in council. The story is a vulgar one, without wit enough to make it worth recording. 33. The Migration of the Animals in the old times when the animals used to talk and hold councils, and the grubworm and woodchuck used to marry people, there was once a great famine of mast in the mountains. And all the animals and birds which lived upon it met together and sent the pigeon out to the low country to see if any food could be found there. After a time she came back and reported that she had found a country where the mast was, up to our ankles, on the ground. 
So they got together and moved down into the low country in a great army. 34. The Wolf's Revenge, The Wolf and the Dog Kana Ti had wolves to hunt for him, because they are good hunters and never fail. He once sent out two wolves at once. One went to the east and did not return. The other went to the north, and when he returned at night and did not find his fellow he knew he must be in trouble and started after him. After traveling on some time he found his brother lying nearly dead beside a great green snake, Saliqua E, which had attacked him. The snake itself was too badly wounded to crawl away, and the angry wolf, who had magic powers, taking out several hairs from his own whiskers, shot them into the body of the snake and killed it. He then hurried back to Kana Ti, who sent the terrapin after a great doctor who lived in the west to save the wounded wolf. The wolf went back to help his brother and by his magic powers he had him cured long before the doctor came from the west, because the terrapin was such a slow traveler and the doctor had to prepare his roots before he started. In the beginning, the people say, the dog was put on the mountain and the wolf beside the fire. When the winter came the dog could not stand the cold, so he came down to the settlement and drove the wolf from the fire. The wolf ran to the mountains, where it suited him so well that he prospered and increased, until after a while he ventured down again and killed some animals in the settlements. The people got together and followed and killed him, but his brothers came from the mountains and took such revenge that ever since the people have been afraid to hurt a wolf. Bird Myths 35. The Bird Tribes Winged creatures of all kinds are classed under the generic term of Anina Hilida High, flyers. Birds are called, alike in the singular and plural, TSI Squaw, the term being generally held to exclude the domestic fowls introduced by the whites. When it is necessary to make the distinction they are mentioned, respectively, as in Ajehi, living in the woods, and Alani Ta, tame. The robin is called Sisquagua, a name which cannot be analyzed, while the little sparrow is called Sisquaya, the real or principal bird, perhaps, in accord with a principle in Indian nomenclature, on account of its wide distribution. As in other languages, many of the bird names are onomatopes, as Wahuhu, the screech owl, Yuguku, the hooting owl, Waguli, the whippoorwill, Kagu, the crow, Gugwi, the quail, Huhu, the yellow mockingbird, Tsi Kalili, the chickadee. Sasa, the goose. The turtle dove is called Gyul, Diskani, it cries for acorns, on account of the resemblance of its cry to the sound of the word for acorn, Gyul. The meadow lark is called Nkwizi, star, on account of the appearance of its tail when spread out as it soars. The nuthatch, Sita carolinensis, is called Suli Na, deaf, and is supposed to be without hearing, possibly on account of its fearless disregard for man's presence. Certain diseases are diagnosed by the doctors as due to birds, either revengeful bird ghosts, bird feathers about the house, or bird shadows falling upon the patient from overhead. The eagle, Awahili, is the great sacred bird of the Cherokee, as of nearly all our native tribes, and figures prominently in their ceremonial ritual, especially in all things relating to war. The particular species prized was the golden or war eagle, Aquila crescidus, called by the Cherokee the pretty feathered eagle, on account of its beautiful tail feathers, white, tipped with black, which were in such great demand for decorative and ceremonial purposes that among the western tribes a single tail was often rated as equal in value to a horse. Among the Cherokee in the old times the killing of an eagle was an event which concerned the whole settlement, and could be undertaken only by the professional eagle killer. Regularly chosen for the purpose on account of his knowledge of the prescribed forms and the prayers to be said afterwards in order to obtain pardon for the necessary sacrilege, and thus ward off vengeance from the tribe. It is told of one man upon the reservation that having deliberately killed an eagle in defiance of the ordinances he was constantly haunted by dreams of fierce eagles swooping down upon him. Until the nightmare was finally exorcised after a long course of priestly treatment. In 1890 there was but one eagle killer remaining among the East Cherokee. It does not appear that the eagle was ever captured alive as among the Plains tribes. The eagle must be killed only in the winter or late fall after the crops were gathered and the snakes had retired to their dens. 
If killed in the summertime a frost would come to destroy the corn, while the songs of the eagle dance, when the feathers were brought home, would so anger the snakes that they would become doubly dangerous. Consequently the eagle songs were never sung until after the snakes had gone to sleep for the winter. When the people of a town had decided upon an eagle dance the eagle killer was called in, frequently from a distant settlement, to procure the feathers for the occasion. He was paid for his services from offerings made later at the dance, and as the few professionals guarded their secrets carefully from outsiders their business was a quite profitable one. After some preliminary preparation the eagle killer sets out alone for the mountains, taking with him his gun or bow and arrows. Having reached the mountains, he goes through a vigil of prayer and fasting, possibly lasting four days, after which he hunts until he succeeds in killing a deer. Then, placing the body in a convenient exposed situation upon one of the highest cliffs, he conceals himself nearby and begins to sing in a low undertone the songs to call down the eagles from the sky. When the eagle alights upon the carcass, which will be almost immediately if the singer understands his business, he shoots it, and then standing over the dead bird. He addresses to it a prayer in which he begs it not to seek vengeance upon his tribe, because it is not a Cherokee, but a Spaniard, Asqua and I, that has done the deed. The selection of such a vicarious victim of revenge is evidence at once of the antiquity of the prayer in its present form and of the enduring impression which the cruelties of the early Spanish adventurers made upon the natives. Fig. 1. Feather Wand of Eagle Dance made by John Axe. The prayer ended, he leaves the dead eagle where it fell and makes all haste to the settlement, where the people are anxiously expecting his return. On meeting the first warriors he says simply, a snowbird has died, and passes on at once to his own quarters, his work being now finished. The announcement is made in this form in order to ensure against the vengeance of any eagles that might overhear, the little snowbird being considered too insignificant a creature to be dreaded. Having waited four days to allow time for the insect parasites to leave the body, the hunters delegated for the purpose go out to bring in the feathers. On arriving at the place they strip the body of the large tail and wing feathers, which they wrap in a fresh deerskin brought with them, and then return to the settlement, leaving the body of the dead eagle upon the ground. Together with that of the slain deer, the latter being intended as a sacrifice to the eagle spirits. On reaching the settlement, the feathers, still wrapped in the deerskin, are hung up in a small, round hut built for this special purpose near the edge of the dance ground, Detson and Lee, and known as the place where the feathers are kept. Or Feather House Some settlements had two such feather houses, one at each end of the dance ground. The eagle dance was held on the night of the same day on which the feathers were brought in, all the necessary arrangements having been made beforehand. In the meantime, as the feathers were supposed to be hungry after their journey, a dish of venison and corn was set upon the ground below them and they were invited to eat. The body of a flax bird or scarlet tanager, Paranga rubra, was also hung up with the feathers for the same purpose. The food thus given to the feathers was disposed of after the dance, as described in another place. The eagle being regarded as a great Ada Wehi, only the greatest warriors and those versed in the sacred ordinances would dare to wear the feathers or to carry them in the dance. Should any person in the settlement dream of eagles or eagle feathers he must arrange for an eagle dance, with the usual vigil and fasting, at the first opportunity, otherwise some one of his family will die. Should the insect parasites which infest the feathers of the bird in life get upon a man they will breed a skin disease which is sure to develop, even though it may be latent for years. It is for this reason that the body of the eagle is allowed to remain four days upon the ground before being brought into the settlement. The raven, Kalenu, is occasionally seen in the mountains, but is not prominent in folk belief, excepting in connection with the gruesome tales of the raven mocker, Q. V. In former times its name was sometimes assumed as a war title. The crow, so prominent in other tribal mythologies, does not seem to appear in that of the Cherokee. Three varieties of owls are recognized, each under a different name, viz., Skeely, the dusky horned owl, Bubo virginianus saturatus. Uguku, the barred or hooting owl, Cernium nebulosum, and Wahuhu, the screech owl, Megascops asio. The first of these names signifies a witch, the others being onomatopes. 
Owls and other night-crying birds are believed to be embodied ghosts or disguised witches, and their cry is dreaded as a sound of evil omen. If the eyes of a child be bathed with water in which one of the long wing or tail feathers of an owl has been soaked, the child will be able to keep awake all night. The feather must be found by chance, and not procured intentionally for the purpose. On the other hand, an application of water in which the feather of a blue jay, procured in the same way, has been soaked will make the child an early riser. The buzzard, Suli, is said to have had a part in shaping the earth, as was narrated in the Genesis myth. It is reputed to be a doctor among birds, and is respected accordingly, although its feathers are never worn by ball players, for fear of becoming bald. Its own baldness is accounted for by a vulgar story. As it thrives upon carrion and decay, it is held to be immune from sickness, especially of a contagious character, and a small quantity of its flesh eaten, or of the soup used as a wash, is believed to be a sure preventive of smallpox. And was used for this purpose during the smallpox epidemic among the East Cherokee in 1866. According to the Wananahi manuscript, it is said also that a buzzard feather placed over the cabin door will keep out witches. In treating gunshot wounds, the medicine is blown into the wound through a tube cut from a buzzard quill and some of the buzzard's down is afterwards laid over the spot. There is very little concerning hawks, excepting as regards the great mythic hawk, the TLA Nuwa. The TLA Nuwa Usti, or Little TLA Nuwa, is described as a bird about as large as a turkey and of a grayish-blue color, which used to follow the flocks of wild pigeons, flying overhead and darting down occasionally upon a victim. Which it struck and killed with its sharp breast and ate upon the wing, without alighting. It is probably the goshawk, Aster atricapillus. The common swamp gallinule, locally known as mudhen or didapper, the linula gaelata, is called digaguani, lame or crippled, on account of its habit of flying only for a very short distance at a time. In the Digaguani dance the performers sing the name of the bird and endeavor to imitate its halting movements. The Dagal Ku, or white-fronted goose, Anser albifrons, appears in connection with the myth of the origin of tobacco. The feathers of the Tsque, the great white heron or American egret, Herodias agretta, are worn by ball players, and this bird probably the swan whose white wing was used as a peace emblem in ancient times. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL 15 Photograph by Author, 1888 Sawanu G.I., a Cherokee ballplayer A rare bird said to have been seen occasionally upon the reservation many years ago was called by the curious name of Nundadikani, it looks at the sun, sungazer. It is described as resembling a blue crane, and may possibly have been the Florida cerulea, or little blue heron. Another infrequent visitor, which sometimes passed over the mountain country in company with flocks of wild geese, was the goo whiskowy, so called from its cry. It is described as resembling a large snipe, with yellow legs and feet unwebbed, and is thought to visit Indian territory at intervals. It is chiefly notable from the fact that the celebrated chief John Ross derives his Indian name, goo whiskowy, from this bird, the name being perpetuated in Kuiskui district of the Cherokee Nation in the West. Another chance visitant, concerning which there is much curious speculation among the older men of the East Cherokee, was called Tsun Digwansuji or Tsun Digwanski, forked, referring to the tail. It appeared but once, for a short season, about forty years ago, and has not been seen since. It is said to have been pale blue, with red in places, and nearly the size of a crow, and to have had a long forked tail like that of a fish. It preyed upon hornets, which it took upon the wing, and also feasted upon the larvae in the nests. Appearing unexpectedly and as suddenly disappearing, it was believed to be not a bird but a transformed red horse fish, Moxistoma, Cherokee alliga, a theory borne out by the red spots and the long, forked tail. It is even maintained that about the time those birds first appeared some hunters on Oconolufti saw seven of them sitting on the limb of a tree and they were still shaped like a red horse, although they already had wings and feathers. It was undoubtedly the scissor-tail or swallow-tailed flycatcher, Milvulus forficatus, which belongs properly in Texas and the adjacent region, but strays occasionally into the eastern states. 
On account of the red throat appendage of the turkey, somewhat resembling the goitrous growth known in the south as kernels, Cherokee, Dula TSI, the feathers of this bird are not worn by ball players. Neither is the neck allowed to be eaten by children or sick persons, under the fear that a growth of kernels would be the result. The meat of the ruffed grouse, locally known as the pheasant, Bonesa umbilis, is tabooed to a pregnant woman, because this bird hatches a large brood, but loses most of them before maturity. Under a stricter construction of the theory this meat is forbidden to a woman until she is past childbearing. The redbird, Tatsu Wa, is believed to have been originally the daughter of the sun, see the story. The huhu, or yellow mockingbird, occurs in several stories. It is regarded as something supernatural, possibly on account of its imitative powers, and its heart is given to children to make them quick to learn. The chickadee, Paris carolinensis, Cicillulae, and the tufted titmouse, Paris bicolor, Utsuji, or Eustidae, are both regarded as news bringers, but the one is venerated as a truth teller while the other is scoffed at as a lying messenger. For reasons which appear in the story of Ninyunu Y, Q. V, when the Tsikilalai perches on a branch near the house and chirps its song it is taken as an omen that an absent friend will soon be heard from or that a secret enemy is plotting mischief. Many stories are told in confirmation of this belief, among which may be instanced that of Tom Starr, a former noted outlaw of the Cherokee Nation of the West, who, on one occasion, was about to walk unwittingly into an ambush prepared for him along a narrow trail, when he heard the warning note of the Tsikilalai, and, turning abruptly, ran up the side of the ridge and succeeded in escaping with his life. Although hotly pursued by his enemies. 36. The Ball Game of the Birds and Animals Once the animals challenged the birds to a great ball play, and the birds accepted. The leaders made the arrangements and fixed the day, and when the time came both parties met at the place for the ball dance, the animals on a smooth grassy bottom near the river and the birds in the treetops over by the ridge. The captain of the animals was the bear, who was so strong and heavy that he could pull down anyone who got in his way. All along the road to the ball ground he was tossing up great logs to show his strength and boasting of what he would do to the birds when the game began. The terrapin, too, not the little one we have now, but the great original terrapin, was with the animals. His shell was so hard that the heaviest blows could not hurt him, and he kept rising up on his hind legs and dropping heavily again to the ground, bragging that this was the way he would crush any bird that tried to take the ball from him. Then there was the deer, who could outrun every other animal. Altogether it was a fine company. The birds had the eagle for their captain, with the hawk and the great TLA Nuwa, all swift and strong of flight, but still they were a little afraid of the animals. The dance was over and they were all pruning their feathers up in the trees and waiting for the captain to give the word when here came two little things hardly larger than field mice climbing up the tree in which sat perched the bird captain. At last they reached the top, and creeping along the limb to where the eagle captain sat they asked to be allowed to join in the game. The captain looked at them, and seeing that they were four-footed, he asked why they did not go to the animals, where they belonged. The little thing said that they had, but the animals had made fun of them and driven them off because they were so small. Then the bird captain pitted them and wanted to take them. But how could they join the birds when they had no wings? The eagle, the hawk, and the others consulted, and at last it was decided to make some wings for the little fellows. They tried for a long time to think of something that might do, until someone happened to remember the drum they had used in the dance. The head was of groundhog skin and maybe they could cut off a corner and make wings of it. So they took two pieces of leather from the drum head and cut them into shape for wings, and stretched them with cane splints and fastened them on to the forelegs of one of the small animals, and in this way came Tla Meha, the bat. They threw the ball to him and told him to catch it, and by the way he dodged and circled about, keeping the ball always in the air and never letting it fall to the ground, the birds soon saw that he would be one of their best men. Now they wanted to fix the other little animal, but they had used up all their leather to make wings for the bat, and there was no time to send for more. Somebody said that they might do it by stretching his skin, so two large birds took hold from opposite sides with their strong bills. 
and by pulling at his fur for several minutes they managed to stretch the skin on each side between the fore and hind feet, until they had Tewa, the flying squirrel. To try him the bird captain threw up the ball, when the flying squirrel sprang off the limb after it, caught it in his teeth and carried it through the air to another tree nearly across the bottom. When they were all ready the signal was given and the game began, but almost at the first toss the flying squirrel caught the ball and carried it up a tree, from which he threw it to the birds, who kept it in the air for some time until it dropped. The bear rushed to get it, but the marten darted after it and threw it to the bat, who was flying near the ground, and by his dodging and doubling kept it out of the way of even the deer. Until he finally threw it in between the posts and won the game for the birds. The bear and the terrapin, who had boasted so of what they would do, never got a chance even to touch the ball. For saving the ball when it dropped, the birds afterwards gave the marten a gourd in which to build his nest, and he still has it. 37. How the turkey got his beard. When the terrapin won the race from the rabbit, see the story, all the animals wondered and talked about it a great deal, because they had always thought the terrapin slow. Although they knew that he was a warrior and had many conjuring secrets beside. But the turkey was not satisfied and told the others there must be some trick about it. Said he, I know the terrapin can't run, he can hardly crawl, and I'm going to try him. So one day the turkey met the terrapin coming home from war with a fresh scalp hanging from his neck and dragging on the ground as he traveled. The turkey laughed at the sight and said, that scalp don't look right on you. Your neck is too short and low down to wear it that way. Let me show you. The terrapin agreed and gave the scalp to the turkey, who fastened it around his neck. Now, said the turkey, I'll walk a little way and you can see how it looks. So he walked ahead a short distance and then turned and asked the terrapin how he liked it. Said the terrapin, it looks very nice, it becomes you. Now I'll fix it in a different way and let you see how it looks, said the turkey. So he gave the string another pull and walked ahead again. Oh, that looks very nice, said the terrapin. But the turkey kept on walking, and when the terrapin called to him to bring back the scalp he only walked faster and broke into a run. Then the terrapin got out his bow and by his conjuring art shot a number of cane splints into the turkey's leg to cripple him so that he could not run, which accounts for all the many small bones in the turkey's leg, that are of no use whatever. But the terrapin never caught the turkey, who still wears the scalp from his neck. 38. Why the turkey gobbles? The grouse used to have a fine voice and a good halloo in the ballplay. All the animals and birds used to play ball in those days and were just as proud of a loud halloo as the ball players of today. The turkey had not a good voice, so he asked the grouse to give him lessons. The grouse agreed to teach him, but wanted pay for his trouble, and the turkey promised to give him some feathers to make himself a collar. That is how the grouse got his collar of turkey feathers. They began the lessons and the turkey learned very fast until the grouse thought it was time to try his voice. Now, said the grouse, I'll stand on this hollow log, and when I give the signal by tapping on it, you must halloo as loudly as you can. So he got upon the log ready to tap on it, as a grouse does, but when he gave the signal the turkey was so eager and excited that he could not raise his voice for a shout, but only gobbled, and ever since then he gobbles whenever he hears a noise. 39. How the Kingfisher Got His Bill Some old men say that the kingfisher was meant in the beginning to be a water bird, but as he had not been given either web feet or a good bill he could not make a living. The animals held a council over it and decided to make him a bill like a long sharp awl for a fish gig, fish spear. So they made him a fish gig and fastened it on in front of his mouth. He flew to the top of a tree, sailed out and darted down into the water, and came up with a fish on his gig. And he has been the best gigger ever since. Some others say it was this way, a black snake found a yellowhammer's nest in a hollow tree, and after swallowing the young birds, coiled up to sleep in the nest, where the mother bird found him when she came home. She went for help to the little people, who sent her to the kingfisher. He came, and after flying back and forth past the hole a few times, made one dart at the snake and pulled him out dead. When they looked they found a hole in the snake's head where the kingfisher had pierced it with a slender Tugaluna fish, 
which he carried in his bill like a lance. From this the little people concluded that he would make a first-class gigger if he only had the right spear, so they gave him his long bill as a reward. 40. How the Partridge Got His Whistle In the old days the terrapin had a fine whistle, but the partridge had none. The terrapin was constantly going about whistling and showing his whistle to the other animals until the partridge became jealous, so one day when they met the partridge asked leave to try it. The terrapin was afraid to risk it at first, suspecting some trick, but the partridge said, I'll give it back right away, and if you are afraid you can stay with me while I practice. So the terrapin let him have the whistle and the partridge walked around blowing on it in fine fashion. How does it sound with me? asked the partridge. Oh, you do very well, said the terrapin, walking alongside. Now, how do you like it? said the partridge, running ahead and whistling a little faster. That's fine, answered the terrapin, hurrying to keep up, but don't run so fast. And now, how do you like this? Called the partridge, and with that he spread his wings, gave one long whistle, and flew to the top of a tree, leaving the poor terrapin to look after him from the ground. The terrapin never recovered his whistle, and from that, and the loss of his scalp, which the turkey stole from him, he grew ashamed to be seen, and ever since he shuts himself up in his box when anyone comes near him. 41. How the Redbird Got His Color A raccoon passing a wolf one day made several insulting remarks, until at last the wolf became angry and turned and chased him. The raccoon ran his best and managed to reach a tree by the riverside before the wolf came up. He climbed the tree and stretched out on a limb overhanging the water. When the wolf arrived he saw the reflection in the water, and thinking it was the raccoon he jumped at it and was nearly drowned before he could scramble out again, all wet and dripping. He lay down on the bank to dry and fell asleep, and while he was sleeping the raccoon came down the tree and plastered his eyes with dung. When the wolf awoke he found he could not open his eyes, and began to whine. Along came a little brown bird through the bushes and heard the wolf crying and asked what was the matter. The wolf told his story and said, If you will get my eyes open, I will show you where to find some nice red paint to paint yourself. All right, said the brown bird, so he pecked at the wolf's eyes until he got off all the plaster. Then the wolf took him to a rock that had streaks of bright red paint running through it, and the little bird painted himself with it, and has ever since been a red bird. 42. The Pheasant Beating Corn Origin of the Pheasant Dance the pheasant once saw a woman beating corn in a wooden mortar in front of the house. I can do that, too, said he, but the woman would not believe it, so the pheasant went into the woods and got upon a hollow log and drummed with his wings as a pheasant does. Until the people in the house heard him and thought he was really beating corn. In the pheasant dance, a part of the green corn dance, the instrument used is the drum, and the dancers beat the ground with their feet in imitation of the drumming sound made by the pheasant. They form two concentric circles, the men being on the inside, facing the women in the outer circle, each in turn advancing and retreating at the signal of the drummer, who sits at one side and sings the pheasant songs. According to the story, there was once a winter famine among the birds and animals. No mast, fallen nuts, could be found in the woods, and they were near starvation when a pheasant discovered a holly tree, loaded with red berries, of which the pheasant is said to be particularly fond. He called his companion birds, and they formed a circle about the tree, singing, dancing, and drumming with their wings in token of their joy, and thus originated the pheasant dance. 43. The Race Between the Crane and the Hummingbird The hummingbird and the crane were both in love with a pretty woman. She preferred the hummingbird, who was as handsome as the crane was awkward, but the crane was so persistent that in order to get rid of him she finally told him he must challenge the other to a race and she would marry the winner. The hummingbird was so swift, almost like a flash of lightning, and the crane so slow and heavy, that she felt sure the hummingbird would win. She did not know the crane could fly all night. They agreed to start from her house and fly around the circle of the world to the beginning, and the one who came in first would marry the woman. At the word the hummingbird darted off like an arrow and was out of sight in a moment, leaving his rival to follow heavily behind. He flew all day, 
and when evening came and he stopped to roost for the night he was far ahead. But the crane flew steadily all night long, passing the hummingbird soon after midnight and going on until he came to a creek and stopped to rest about daylight. The hummingbird woke up in the morning and flew on again, thinking how easily he would win the race, until he reached the creek and there found the crane spearing tadpoles, with his long bill, for breakfast. He was very much surprised and wondered how this could have happened, but he flew swiftly by and soon left the crane out of sight again. The crane finished his breakfast and started on, and when evening came he kept on as before. This time it was hardly midnight when he passed the hummingbird asleep on a limb, and in the morning he had finished his breakfast before the other came up. The next day he gained a little more, and on the fourth day he was spearing tadpoles for dinner when the hummingbird passed him. On the fifth and sixth days it was late in the afternoon before the hummingbird came up, and on the morning of the seventh day the crane was a whole night's travel ahead. He took his time at breakfast and then fixed himself up as nicely as he could at the creek and came in at the starting place where the woman lived, early in the morning. When the hummingbird arrived in the afternoon he found he had lost the race, but the woman declared she would never have such an ugly fellow as the crane for a husband, so she stayed single. 44. The Owl Gets Married A widow with one daughter was always warning the girl that she must be sure to get a good hunter for a husband when she married. The young woman listened and promised to do as her mother advised. At last a suitor came to ask the mother for the girl, but the widow told him that only a good hunter could have her daughter. I'm just that kind, said the lover, and again asked her to speak for him to the young woman. So the mother went to the girl and told her a young man had come a courting, and as he said he was a good hunter she advised her daughter to take him. Just as you say, said the girl. So when he came again the matter was all arranged, and he went to live with the girl. The next morning he got ready and said he would go out hunting, but before starting he changed his mind and said he would go fishing. He was gone all day and came home late at night, bringing only three small fish, saying that he had had no luck, but would have better success tomorrow. The next morning he started off again to fish and was gone all day, but came home at night with only two worthless spring lizards, do ga, and the same excuse. Next day he said he would go hunting this time. He was gone again until night, and returned at last with only a handful of scraps that he had found where some hunters had cut up a deer. By this time the old woman was suspicious. So next morning when he started off again, as he said, to fish, she told her daughter to follow him secretly and see how he set to work. The girl followed through the woods and kept him in sight until he came down to the river, where she saw her husband change to a hooting owl, Uguku, and fly over to a pile of driftwood in the water and cry, Uguku. Who? Who? You? You? She was surprised and very angry and said to herself, I thought I had married a man, but my husband is only an owl. She watched and saw the owl look into the water for a long time and at last swoop down and bring up in his claws a handful of sand, from which he picked out a crawfish. Then he flew across to the bank, took the form of a man again, and started home with the crawfish. His wife hurried on ahead through the woods and got there before him. When he came in with the crawfish in his hand, she asked him where were all the fish he had caught. He said he had none, because an owl had frightened them all away. I think you are the owl, said his wife, and drove him out of the house. The owl went into the woods and there he pined away with grief and love until there was no flesh left on any part of his body except his head. 45. The Who Who Gets Married A widow who had an only a daughter, but no son, found it very hard to make a living and was constantly urging upon the young woman that they ought to have a man in the family. Who would be a good hunter and able to help in the field? One evening a stranger lover came courting to the house, and when the girl told him that she could marry only one who was a good worker, he declared that he was exactly that sort of man. So the girl talked to her mother, and on her advice they were married. The next morning the widow gave her new son-in-law a hoe and sent him out to the cornfield. When breakfast was ready she went to call him, following a sound as of someone hoeing on stony soil, but when she came to the spot she found only a small circle of hoed ground and no sign of her son-in-law. Away over in the thicket she heard a hoo-hoo calling. 
He did not come in for dinner, either, and when he returned home in the evening the old woman asked him where he had been all day. Hard at work, said he. But I didn't see you when I came to call you to breakfast. I was down in the thicket cutting sticks to mark off the field, said he. But why didn't you come in to dinner? I was too busy working, said he. So the old woman was satisfied, and they had their supper together. Early next morning he started off with his hoe over his shoulder. When breakfast was ready the old woman went again to call him, but found no sign of him, only the hoe lying there and no work done. And away over in the thicket a hoo-hoo was calling, Sow H. Sow H. Sow H. Who? 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 Chi. Chi. Chi, few. She went back to the house, and when at last he came home in the evening she asked him again what he had been doing all day. Working hard, said he. But you were not there when I came after you. Oh, I just went over in the thicket a while to see some of my kinsfolk, said he. Then the old woman said, I have lived here a long time and there is nothing living in the swamp but hoo-hoos. My daughter wants a husband that can work and not a lazy hoo-hoo, so you may go. And she drove him from the house. 46. Why the buzzard's head is bare. The buzzard used to have a fine topknot, of which he was so proud that he refused to eat carrion. And while the other birds were pecking at the body of a deer or other animal which they had found he would strut around and say, you may have it all, it is not good enough for me. They resolved to punish him, and with the help of the buffalo carried out a plot by which the buzzard lost not his top knot alone, but nearly all the other feathers on his head. He lost his pride at the same time, so that he is willing enough now to eat carrion for a living. 47. The Eagle's Revenge Once a hunter in the mountains heard a noise at night like a rushing wind outside the cabin, and on going out he found that an eagle had just alighted on the drying pole and was tearing at the body of a deer hanging there. Without thinking of the danger, he shot the eagle. In the morning he took the deer and started back to the settlement, where he told what he had done, and the chief sent out some men to bring in the eagle and arrange for an eagle dance. They brought back the dead eagle, everything was made ready, and that night they started the dance in the townhouse. About midnight there was a whoop outside and a strange warrior came into the circle and began to recite his exploits. No one knew him, but they thought he had come from one of the farther Cherokee towns. He told how he had killed a man, and at the end of the story he gave a hoarse yell, Hi! That startled the whole company, and one of the seven men with the rattles fell over dead. He sang of another deed, and at the end straightened up with another loud yell. A second rattler fell dead, and the people were so full of fear that they could not stir from their places. Still he kept on, and at every pause there came again that terrible scream, until the last of the seven rattlers fell dead, and then the stranger went out into the darkness. Long afterward they learned from the eagle killer that it was the brother of the eagle shot by the hunter. 48. The Hunter and the Buzzard a hunter had been all day looking for deer in the mountains without success until he was completely tired out and sat down on a log to rest and wonder what he should do. When a buzzard, a bird which always has magic powers, came flying overhead and spoke to him, asking him what was his trouble. When the hunter had told his story the buzzard said there were plenty of deer on the ridges beyond if only the hunter were high up in the air where he could see them, and proposed that they exchange forms for a while. When the buzzard would go home to the hunter's wife while the hunter would go to look for deer. The hunter agreed, and the buzzard became a man and went home to the hunter's wife, who received him as her husband, while the hunter became a buzzard and flew off over the mountain to locate the deer. After staying some time with the woman, who thought always it was her real husband, the buzzard excused himself, saying he must go again to look for game or they would have nothing to eat. He came to the place where he had first met the hunter, and found him already there, still in buzzard form, awaiting him. He asked the hunter what success he had had, and the hunter replied that he had found several deer over the ridge, as the buzzard had said. Then the buzzard restored the hunter to human shape, and became himself a buzzard again and flew away. The hunter went where he had seen the deer and killed several, 
and from that time he never returned empty-handed from the woods. Snake, Fish, and Insect Myths 49. The Snake Tribe The generic name for snakes is Anadu. They are all regarded as Anada Wehi, supernaturals, having an intimate connection with the rain and thunder gods, and possessing a certain influence over the other animal and plant tribes. It is said that the snakes, the deer, and the ginseng act as allies, so that an injury to one is avenged by all. The feeling towards snakes is one of mingled fear and reverence, and every precaution is taken to avoid killing or offending one, especially the rattlesnake. He who kills a snake will soon see others. And should he kill a second one, so many will come around him whichever way he may turn that he will become dazed at the sight of their glistening eyes and darting tongues and will go wandering about like a crazy man. Unable to find his way out of the woods. To guard against this misfortune there are certain prayers which the initiated say in order that a snake may not cross their path, and on meeting the first one of the season the hunter humbly begs of him, let us not see each other this summer. Certain smells, as that of the wild parsnip, and certain songs, as those of a Unica Y or townhouse dance, are offensive to the snakes and make them angry. For this reason the Unica Y dance is held only late in the fall, after they have retired to their dens for the winter. When one dreams of being bitten by a snake he must be treated the same as for an actual bite, because it is a snake ghost that has bitten him, otherwise the place will swell and ulcerate in the same way, even though it be years afterwards. For fear of offending them, even in speaking, it is never said that a man has been bitten by a snake, but only that he has been scratched by a briar. Most of the beliefs and customs in this connection have more special reference to the rattlesnake. The rattlesnake is called Yutsa Nadi, which may be rendered, he has a bell, alluding to the rattle. According to a myth given elsewhere, he was once a man, and was transformed to his present shape that he might save the human race from extermination by the sun, a mission which he accomplished successfully after others had failed. By the old man he is also spoken of as, the thunder's necklace, see the story of Ansei, and to kill one is to destroy one of the most prized ornaments of the thunder god. In one of the formulas addressed to the little men, the sons of the thunder, they are implored to take the diseased snake to themselves, because, it is just what you adorn yourselves with. For obvious reasons the rattlesnake is regarded as the chief of the snake tribe and is feared and respected accordingly. Few Cherokee will venture to kill one except under absolute necessity, and even then the crime must be atoned for by asking pardon of the snake ghost, either in person or through the mediation of a priest, according to a set formula. Otherwise the relatives of the dead snake will send one of their number to track up the offender and bite him so that he will die, see story, the rattlesnake's vengeance. The only thing of which the rattlesnake is afraid is said to be the plant known as Campion, or, rattlesnake's master, Silene Stellata, which is used by the doctors to counteract the effect of the bite. And it is believed that a snake will flee in terror from the hunter who carries a small piece of the root about his person. Chewed lin bark is also applied to the bite, perhaps from the supposed occult connection between the snake and the thunder, as this tree is said to be immune from the lightning stroke. Notwithstanding the fear of the rattlesnake, his rattles, teeth, flesh, and oil are greatly prized for occult or medical uses. The snakes being killed for this purpose by certain priests who know the necessary rites and formulas for obtaining pardon. This device for whipping the devil around the stump, and incidentally increasing their own revenues, is a common trick of Indian medicine men. Outsiders desiring to acquire this secret knowledge are discouraged by being told that it is a dangerous thing to learn, for the reason that the new initiate is almost certain to be bitten. In order that the snakes may try him to know if he has correctly learned the formula. When a rattlesnake is killed the head must be cut off and buried an arm's length deep in the ground and the body carefully hidden away in a hollow log. If it is left exposed to the weather, the angry snakes will send such torrents of rain that all the streams will overflow their banks. Moreover, they will tell their friends, the deer, and the ginseng in the mountains, so that these will hide themselves and the hunters will seek them in vain. The tooth of a rattlesnake which has been killed by the priest with the proper ceremonies while the snake was lying stretched out from east to west is used to scarify patients preliminary to applying the medicine in certain ailments. 
Before using it the doctor holds it between the thumb and finger of his right hand and addresses it in a prayer, at the end of which the tooth becomes alive, when it is ready for the operation. The explanation is that the tense, nervous grasp of the doctor causes his hand to twitch and the tooth to move slightly between his fingers. The rattles are worn on the head, and sometimes a portion of the flesh is eaten by ball players to make them more terrible to their opponents, but it is said to have the bad effect of making them cross to their wives. From the lower half of the body, thought to be the fattest portion, the oil is extracted and is in as great repute among the Indians for rheumatism and sore joints as among the white mountaineers. The doctor who prepares the oil must also eat the flesh of the snake. In certain seasons of epidemic a roasted, barbecued, rattlesnake was kept hanging up in the house, and every morning the father of the family bit off a small piece and chewed it, mixing it then with water. Which he spit upon the bodies of the others to preserve them from the contagion. It was said to be a sure cure, but apt to make the patients hot-tempered. The copperhead, Wadijaska Lee, brown head, although feared on account of its poisonous bite, is hated, instead of being regarded with veneration, as is the rattlesnake. It is believed to be a descendant of a great mythic serpent, C, and is said to have eyes of fire, on account of their intense brightness. The black snake is called Gyul Gi, the climber. Biting its body is said to be a preventive of toothache, and there is also a belief, perhaps derived from the whites, that if the body of one be hung upon a tree it will bring rain within three, four, days. The small green snake is called Siliqua E, the same name being also applied to a certain plant, the Eryngium virginianum, or bear grass, whose long, slender leaves bear some resemblance to a green snake. As with the black snake, it is believed that toothache may be prevented and sound teeth ensured as long as life lasts by biting the green snake along its body. It must be held by the head and tail, and all the teeth at once pressed down four times along the middle of its body, but without biting into the flesh or injuring the snake. Some informants say that the operation must be repeated four times upon as many snakes and that a certain food taboo must also be observed. The water moccasin, Kanegwa ti, is not specially regarded, but a very rare wood snake, said to resemble it except that it has blue eyes, is considered to have great supernatural powers, in what way is not specified. The repulsive but harmless spreading adder, heterodon, is called delixta, vomiter, on account of its habit of spitting, and sometimes quandaya who, a word of uncertain etymology. It was formerly a man, but was transformed into a snake in order to accomplish the destruction of the daughter of the sun, see the story. For its failure on this occasion it is generally despised. The Wananahi manuscript mentions a legend of a great serpent called on account of its color the ground snake. To see it was an omen of death to the one who saw it, and if it was seen by several persons some great tribal calamity was expected. For traditions and beliefs in regard to the Uptina, the Uxuhi, and other mythic serpents, see under those headings. 50. The Uptina and the Yulunsu Ti. Long ago, Halahiyu, when the sun became angry at the people on earth and sent a sickness to destroy them, the little men changed a man into a monster snake, which they called Uptina, the keen eyed, and sent him to kill her. He failed to do the work, and the rattlesnake had to be sent instead, which made the Uktina so jealous and angry that the people were afraid of him and had him taken up to Galu and Lati, to stay with the other dangerous things. He left others behind him, though, nearly as large and dangerous as himself, and they hide now in deep pools in the river and about lonely passes in the high mountains, the places which the Cherokee call where the Uktina stays. Those who know say that the Uktina is a great snake, as large around as a tree trunk, with horns on its head, and a bright, blazing crest like a diamond upon its forehead, and scales glittering like sparks of fire. It has rings or spots of color along its whole length, and cannot be wounded except by shooting in the seventh spot from the head, because under this spot are its heart and its life. The blazing diamond is called Yulunsu Ti, transparent, and he who can win it may become the greatest wonder worker of the tribe, but it is worth a man's life to attempt it. For whoever is seen by the Uptina is so dazed by the bright light that he runs toward the snake instead of trying to escape. Even to see the Uptina asleep is death, not to the hunter himself, 
but to his family. Of all the daring warriors who have started out in search of the Yulunsu Ti only Agan Uni Tsi ever came back successful. The East Cherokee still keep the one which he brought. It is like a large transparent crystal, nearly the shape of a cartridge bullet, with a blood-red streak running through the center from top to bottom. The owner keeps it wrapped in a whole deerskin, inside an earthen jar hidden away in a secret cave in the mountains. Every seven days he feeds it with the blood of small game, rubbing the blood all over the crystal as soon as the animal has been killed. Twice a year it must have the blood of a deer or some other large animal. Should he forget to feed it at the proper time it would come out from its cave at night in a shape of fire and fly through the air to slake its thirst with the lifeblood of the conjurer or some one of his people. He may save himself from this danger by telling it, when he puts it away, that he will not need it again for a long time. It will then go quietly to sleep and feel no hunger until it is again brought out to be consulted. Then it must be fed again with blood before it is used. No white man must ever see it and no person but the owner will venture near it for fear of sudden death. Even the conjurer who keeps it is afraid of it, and changes its hiding place every once in a while so that it cannot learn the way out. When he dies it will be buried with him. Otherwise it will come out of its cave, like a blazing star, to search for his grave, night after night for seven years, when, if still not able to find him, it will go back to sleep forever where he has placed it. Whoever owns the Yulunsu Ti is sure of success in hunting, love, rainmaking, and every other business, but its great use is in life prophecy. When it is consulted for this purpose the future is seen mirrored in the clear crystal as a tree is reflected in the quiet stream below, and the conjurer knows whether the sick man will recover, whether the warrior will return from battle, or whether the youth will live to be old. 51. Ajin Uni Tsas Search for the Uktina. In one of their battles with the Shawano, who are all magicians, the Cherokee captured a great medicine man whose name was Agan Uni Tsi, the groundhog's mother. They had tied him ready for the torture when he begged for his life and engaged, if spared, to find for them the great wonder worker, the Yulunsu Ti. Now, the Yulunsu Ti is like a blazing star set in the forehead of the great Uktina serpent, and the medicine man who could possess it might do marvelous things but everyone knew this could not be, because it was certain death to meet the Uktina. They warned him of all this, but he only answered that his medicine was strong and he was not afraid. So they gave him his life on that condition and he began the search. The Uktina used to lie in wait in lonely places to surprise its victims, and especially haunted the dark passes of the Great Smoky Mountains. Knowing this, the magician went first to a gap in the range on the far northern border of the Cherokee country. He searched and found there a monster black snake, larger than had ever been known before, but it was not what he was looking for, and he laughed at it as something too small for notice. Coming southward to the next gap he found there a great moccasin snake, the largest ever seen, but when the people wondered he said it was nothing. In the next gap he found a green snake and called the people to see, the pretty Saliquae, but when they found an immense green snake coiled up in the path they ran away in fear. Coming on to Utawagenta, the bald mountain, he found there a great diahali, lizard, basking, but, although it was large and terrible to look at, it was not what he wanted and he paid no attention to it. Going still south to Walasi E, the frog place, he found a great frog squatting in the gap. But when the people who came to see it were frightened like the others and ran away from the monster he mocked at them for being afraid of a frog and went on to the next gap. He went on to Dunasqualgi, the gap of the forked antler, and to the enchanted lake of Ataga High, and at each he found monstrous reptiles, but he said they were nothing. He thought the Uktina might be hiding in the deep water at Tlanusi E, the leech place, on Hiwasi, where other strange things had been seen before, and going there he dived far down under the surface. He saw turtles and water snakes, and two immense sun perches rushed at him and retreated again, but that was all. Other places he tried, going always southward, and at last on Gahu Ti mountain he found the Uktina asleep. Turning without noise, he ran swiftly down the mountainside as far as he could go with one long breath, nearly to the bottom of the slope. There he stopped and piled up a great circle of pine cones, and inside of it he dug a deep trench. 
Then he set fire to the cones and came back again up the mountain. The Uptina was still asleep, and, putting an arrow to his bow, Aganyuni TSI shot and sent the arrow through its heart, which was under the seventh spot from the serpent's head. The great snake raised his head, with the diamond in front flashing fire, and came straight at his enemy, but the magician, turning quickly, ran at full speed down the mountain, cleared the circle of fire and the trench at one bound and lay down on the ground inside. The Uptina tried to follow, but the arrow was through his heart, and in another moment he rolled over in his death struggle, spitting poison over all the mountainside. But the poison drops could not pass the circle of fire, but only hissed and sputtered in the blaze, and the magician on the inside was untouched except by one small drop which struck upon his head as he lay close to the ground. But he did not know it. The blood, too, as poisonous as the froth, poured from the Uptina's wound and down the slope in a dark stream, but it ran into the trench and left him unharmed. The dying monster rolled over and over down the mountain, breaking down large trees in its path until it reached the bottom. Then Aganyuni TSI called every bird in all the woods to come to the feast, and so many came that when they were done not even the bones were left. After seven days he went by night to the spot. The body and the bones of the snake were gone, all eaten by the birds, but he saw a bright light shining in the darkness, and going over to it he found, resting on a low-hanging branch, where a raven had dropped it. The diamond from the head of the Uptina. He wrapped it up carefully and took it with him, and from that time he became the greatest medicine man in the whole tribe. When Aganyuni TSI came down again to the settlement the people noticed a small snake hanging from his head where the single drop of poison from the Uptina had struck, but so long as he lived he himself never knew that it was there. Where the blood of the Uptina had filled the trench a lake formed afterwards, and the water was black and in this water the women used to dye the cane splits for their baskets. 52. The Red Man and the Uptina. Two brothers went hunting together, and when they came to a good camping place in the mountains they made a fire, and while one gathered bark to put up a shelter the other started up the creek to look for a deer. Soon he heard a noise on the top of the ridge as if two animals were fighting. He hurried through the bushes to see what it might be, and when he came to the spot he found a great actina coiled around a man and choking him to death. The man was fighting for his life, and called out to the hunter, Help me, nephew, he is your enemy as well as mine. The hunter took good aim, and, drawing the arrow to the head, sent it through the body of the Uctina, so that the blood spouted from the hole. The snake loosed its coils with a snapping noise, and went tumbling down the ridge into the valley, tearing up the earth like a water spout as it rolled. The stranger stood up, and it was the Aska Yit Gi Gagei, the red man of the lightning. He said to the hunter, You have helped me, and now I will reward you, and give you a medicine so that you can always find game. They waited until it was dark, and then went down the ridge to where the dead Uctina had rolled, but by this time the birds and insects had eaten the body and only the bones were left. In one place were flashes of light coming up from the ground, and on digging here, just under the surface, the red man found a scale of the Uctina. Next he went over to a tree that had been struck by lightning, and gathering a handful of splinters he made a fire and burned the Uctina scale to a coal. He wrapped this in a piece of deerskin and gave it to the hunter, saying, As long as you keep this you can always kill game. Then he told the hunter that when he went back to camp he must hang up the medicine on a tree outside, because it was very strong and dangerous. He told him also that when he went into the cabin he would find his brother lying inside nearly dead on account of the presence of the Uctina scale, but he must take a small piece of cane, which the red man gave him, and scrape a little of it into water and give it to his brother to drink and he would be well again. Then the red man was gone, and the hunter could not see where he went. He returned to camp alone, and found his brother very sick, but soon cured him with the medicine from the cane, and that day and the next, and every day after, he found game whenever he went for it. 53. The Hunter and the UKSUHI A man living down in Georgia came to visit some relatives at Hickory Log. He was a great hunter, and after resting in the house a day or two got ready to go into the mountains. His friends warned him not to go toward the north, as in that direction, near a certain large uprooted tree, 
there lived a dangerous monster Uxu High Snake. It kept constant watch, and whenever it could spring upon an unwary hunter it would coil about him and crush out his life in its folds and then drag the dead body down the mountainside into a deep hole in Hiwasi. He listened quietly to the warning, but all they said only made him the more anxious to see such a monster, so, without saying anything of his intention, he left the settlement and took his way directly up the mountain toward the north. Soon he came to the fallen tree and climbed upon the trunk, and there, sure enough, on the other side was the great Uxu Hai stretched out in the grass, with its head raised, but looking the other way. It was about so large, making a circle of a foot in diameter with his hands. The frightened hunter got down again at once and started to run, but the snake had heard the noise and turned quickly and was after him. Up the ridge the hunter ran, the snake close behind him, then down the other side toward the river. With all his running the Uxu Hai gained rapidly, and just as he reached the low ground it caught up with him and wrapped around him, pinning one arm down by his side, but leaving the other free. Now it gave him a terrible squeeze that almost broke his ribs, and then began to drag him along toward the water. With his free hand the hunter clutched at the bushes as they passed, but the snake turned its head and blew its sickening breath into his face until he had to let go his hold. Again and again this happened, and all the time they were getting nearer to a deep hole in the river, when, almost at the last moment, a lucky thought came into the hunter's mind. He was sweating all over from his hard run across the mountain, and suddenly remembered to have heard that snakes cannot bear the smell of perspiration. Putting his free hand into his bosom he worked it around under his armpit until it was covered with perspiration. Then withdrawing it he grasped at a bush until the snake turned its head, when he quickly slapped his sweaty hand on its nose. The Uxu Hai gave one gasp almost as if it had been wounded, loosened its coil, and glided swiftly away through the bushes, leaving the hunter, bruised but not disabled, to make his way home to Hickory Log. 54. The Usta Tli There was once a great serpent called the Usta Tli that made its haunt upon Cahuta Mountain. It was called the Usta Tli or Foot Snake, because it did not glide like other snakes, but had feet at each end of its body, and moved by strides or jerks, like a great measuring worm. These feet were three-cornered and flat and could hold on to the ground like suckers. It had no legs, but would raise itself up on its hind feet, with its snaky head waving high in the air until it found a good place to take a fresh hold. Then it would bend down and grip its front feet to the ground while it drew its body up from behind. It could cross rivers and deep ravines by throwing its head across and getting a grip with its front feet and then swinging its body over. Wherever its footprints were found there was danger. It used to bleat like a young fawn, and when the hunter heard a fawn bleat in the woods he never looked for it, but hurried away in the other direction. Up the mountain or down, nothing could escape the Ustatlias pursuit, but along the side of the ridge it could not go, because the great weight of its swinging head broke its hold on the ground when it moved sideways. It came to pass after a while that not a hunter about Cahuta would venture near the mountain for dread of the Ustatlai. At last a man from one of the northern settlements came down to visit some relatives in that neighborhood. When he arrived they made a feast for him, but had only corn and beans, and excused themselves for having no meat because the hunters were afraid to go into the mountains. He asked the reason, and when they told him he said he would go himself tomorrow and either bring in a deer or find the ust at lie. They tried to dissuade him from it, but as he insisted upon going they warned him that if he heard a fawn bleat in the thicket he must run at once and if the snake came after him he must not try to run down the mountain. But along the side of the ridge. In the morning he started out and went directly toward the mountain. Working his way through the bushes at the base, he suddenly heard a fawn bleat in front. He guessed at once that it was the Ustat Lai, but he had made up his mind to see it, so he did not turn back, but went straight forward, and there, sure enough, was the monster, with its great head in the air, as high as the pine branches. Looking in every direction to discover a deer, or maybe a man, for breakfast. It saw him and came at him at once, moving in jerky strides, every one the length of a tree trunk, holding its scaly head high above the bushes and bleeding as it came. The hunter was so badly frightened that he lost his wits entirely and started to run directly up the mountain. 
The great snake came after him, gaining half its length on him every time it took a fresh grip with its four feet, and would have caught the hunter before he reached the top of the ridge. But that he suddenly remembered the warning and changed his course to run along the sides of the mountain. At once the snake began to lose ground, for every time it raised itself up the weight of its body threw it out of a straight line and made it fall a little lower down the side of the ridge. It tried to recover itself, but now the hunter gained and kept on until he turned the end of the ridge and left the snake out of sight. Then he cautiously climbed to the top and looked over and saw the Ustatlai still slowly working its way toward the summit. He went down to the base of the mountain, opened his fire pouch, and set fire to the grass and leaves. Soon the fire ran all around the mountain and began to climb upward. When the great snake smelled the smoke and saw the flames coming it forgot all about the hunter and turned to make all speed for a high cliff near the summit. It reached the rock and got upon it, but the fire followed and caught the dead pines about the base of the cliff until the heat made the Ustatlia scales crack. Taking a close grip of the rock with its hind feet it raised its body and put forth all its strength in an effort to spring across the wall of fire that surrounded it. But the smoke choked it and its hold loosened and it fell among the blazing pine trunks and lay there until it was burned to ashes. 55. The UW Tsun Ta. At Nundayel, the wildest spot on Nantahala River, in what is now Macon County, North Carolina, where the overhanging cliff is highest and the river far below. There lived in the old time a great snake called the UW Tsun Ta or Bouncer, because it moved by jerks like a measuring worm with only one part of its body on the ground at a time. It stayed generally on the east side, where the sun came first in the morning, and used to cross by reaching over from the highest point of the cliff until it could get a grip on the other side, when it would pull over the rest of its body. It was so immense that when it was thus stretched across its shadow darkened the whole valley below. For a long time the people did not know it was there, but when at last they found out about it they were afraid to live in the valley, so that it was deserted even while still Indian country. 56. The Snake Boy There was a boy who used to go bird hunting every day, and all the birds he brought home he gave to his grandmother, who was very fond of him. This made the rest of the family jealous, and they treated him in such fashion that at last one day he told his grandmother he would leave them all, but that she must not grieve for him. Next morning he refused to eat any breakfast, but went off hungry to the woods and was gone all day. In the evening he returned, bringing with him a pair of deer horns, and went directly to the hothouse, ACI, where his grandmother was waiting for him. He told the old woman he must be alone that night, so she got up and went into the house where the others were. At early daybreak she came again to the hothouse and looked in, and there she saw an immense actina that filled the ACI, with horns on its head, but still with two human legs instead of a snake tail. It was all that was left of her boy. He spoke to her and told her to leave him, and she went away again from the door. When the sun was well up, the Uctina began slowly to crawl out, but it was full noon before it was all out of the ACI. It made a terrible hissing noise as it came out, and all the people ran from it. It crawled on through the settlement, leaving a broad trail in the ground behind it, until it came to a deep bend in the river, where it plunged in and went under the water. The grandmother grieved much for her boy, until the others of the family got angry and told her that as she thought, so much of him she ought to go and stay with him. So she left them and went along the trail made by the Uctina to the river and walked directly into the water and disappeared. Once after that a man fishing near the place saw her sitting on a large rock in the river, looking just as she had always looked, but as soon as she caught sight of him she jumped into the water and was gone. 57. The Snake Man Two hunters, both for some reason under a taboo against the meat of a squirrel or turkey, had gone into the woods together. When evening came they found a good camping place and lighted a fire to prepare their supper. One of them had killed several squirrels during the day, and now got ready to broil them over the fire. His companion warned him that if he broke the taboo and ate squirrel meat he would become a snake, but the other laughed and said that was only a conjurer story. He went on with his preparation, and when the squirrels were roasted made his supper of them and then lay down beside the fire to sleep. Late that night his companion was aroused by groaning, 
and on looking around he found the other lying on the ground rolling and twisting in agony, and with the lower part of his body already changed to the body and tail of a large water snake. The man was still able to speak and called loudly for help, but his companion could do nothing. But only sit by and try to comfort him while he watched the arms sink into the body and the skin take on a scaly change that mounted gradually toward the neck. Until at last even the head was a serpent's head and the great snake crawled away from the fire and down the bank into the river. 58. The Rattlesnake's Vengeance One day in the old times when we could still talk with other creatures, while some children were playing about the house, their mother inside heard them scream. Running out she found that a rattlesnake had crawled from the grass, and taking up a stick she killed it. The father was out hunting in the mountains, and that evening when coming home after dark through the gap he heard a strange wailing sound. Looking about he found that he had come into the midst of a whole company of rattlesnakes, which all had their mouths open and seemed to be crying. He asked them the reason of their trouble, and they told him that his own wife had that day killed their chief, the yellow rattlesnake, and they were just now about to send the black rattlesnake to take revenge. The hunter said he was very sorry, but they told him that if he spoke the truth he must be ready to make satisfaction and give his wife as a sacrifice for the life of their chief. Not knowing what might happen otherwise, he consented. They then told him that the black rattlesnake would go home with him and coil up just outside the door in the dark. He must go inside, where he would find his wife awaiting him, and ask her to get him a drink of fresh water from the spring. That was all. He went home and knew that the black rattlesnake was following. It was night when he arrived and very dark, but he found his wife waiting with his supper ready. He sat down and asked for a drink of water. She handed him a gourd full from the jar, but he said he wanted it fresh from the spring, so she took a bowl and went out of the door. The next moment he heard a cry, and going out he found that the black rattlesnake had bitten her and that she was already dying. He stayed with her until she was dead, when the black rattlesnake came out from the grass again and said his tribe was now satisfied. He then taught the hunter a prayer song, and said, When you meet any of us hereafter sing this song and we will not hurt you, but if by accident one of us should bite one of your people then sing this song over him and he will recover. And the Cherokee have kept the song to this day. 59. The Smaller Reptiles, Fishes and Insects There are several varieties of frogs and toads, each with a different name, but there is very little folklore in connection with them. The common green frog is called Wallace and among the Cherokee, as among uneducated whites, the handling of it is thought to cause warts, which for this reason are called by the same name, Wallace I. A solar eclipse is believed to be caused by the attempt of a great frog to swallow the sun, and in former times it was customary on such occasions to fire guns and make other loud noises to frighten away the frog. The smaller varieties are sometimes eaten, and on rare occasions the bullfrog also, but the meat is tabooed to ball players while in training, for fear that the brittleness of the frog's bones would be imparted to those of the player. The land tortoise, Tuxi, is prominent in the animal myths, and is reputed to have been a great warrior in the old times. On account of the stoutness of its legs ball players rub their limbs with them before going into the contest. The common water turtle, Saligu Gi, which occupies so important a place in the mythology of the northern tribes, is not mentioned in Cherokee myth or folklore, and the same is true of the soft-shelled turtle, Al Nwa. Perhaps for the reason that both are rare in the cold mountain streams of the Cherokee country. There are perhaps half a dozen varieties of lizard, each with a different name. The gray road lizard, or Dia Halley, alligator lizard, Siloparus undulatus, is the most common. On account of its habit of alternately puffing out and drawing in its throat as though sucking, when basking in the sun, it is invoked in the formulas for drawing out the poison from snake bites. If one catches the first Dia Halley seen in the spring, and, holding it between his fingers, scratches his legs downward with its claws, he will see no dangerous snakes all summer. Also, if one be caught alive at any time and rubbed over the head and throat of an infant, scratching the skin very slightly at the same time with the claws, the child will never be fretful, but will sleep quietly without complaining. Even when sick or exposed to the rain. This is a somewhat risky experiment, however, 
as the child is liable thereafter to go to sleep wherever it may be laid down for a moment, so that the mother is in constant danger of losing it. According to some authorities this sleep lizard is not the Dia Halley, but a larger variety akin to the next described. The Gigazuha L, Bloody Mouth, Pleistodon, is described as a very large lizard, nearly as large as a water dog, with the throat and corners of the mouth red, as though from drinking blood. It is believed to be not a true lizard but a transformed Ugunst Lee fish, described below, on account of the similarity of coloring and the fact that the fish disappears about the time the Gigazuha L begins to come out. It is ferocious and a hard biter, and pursues other lizards. In dry weather it cries or makes a noise like a cicada, raising itself up as it cries. It has a habit of approaching near to where some person is sitting or standing, then halting and looking fixedly at him, and constantly puffing out its throat until its head assumes a bright red color. It is thought then to be sucking the blood of its victim, and is dreaded and shunned accordingly. The small scorpion lizard, Sane and I, is sometimes called also Gigadanaji Ski, Blood Taker. It is a striped lizard which frequents sandy beaches and resemble the Dia Halley, but is of a brown color. It is believed also to be sucking blood in some mysterious way whenever it nods its head, and if its heart be eaten by a dog that animal will be able to extract all the nutrient properties from food by simply looking at these who are eating. The small spring lizard, Duji, which lives in springs, is supposed to cause rain whenever it crawls out of the spring. It is frequently invoked in the formulas. Another spring. Lizard, red, with black spots, is called Dagon T or Anaganti Ski, the rainmaker, because its cry is said to bring rain. The water dog, Soa, mud puppy, Menopoma or Protonopsis, is a very large lizard, or rather salamander, frequenting muddy water. It is rarely eaten, from an unexplained belief that if one who has eaten its meat goes into the field immediately afterward the crop will be ruined. There are names for one or two other varieties of lizard as well as for the alligator, Solaski, but no folklore in connection with them. Although the Cherokee country abounds in swift-flowing streams well stocked with fish, of which the Indians make free use, there is but little fish lore. A number of dream diseases, really due to indigestion, are ascribed to revengeful fish ghosts, and the doctor usually tries to effect the cure by invoking some larger fish or fish-eating bird to drive out the ghost. Toco Creek, in Monroe County, Tennessee, derives its name from a mythic monster fish, the Daqua, considered the father of all the fish tribe, which is said to have lived formerly in Little Tennessee River at that point, sea story. The Hunter and the Daqua A fish called Ugunst Lee, having horns, which appears only in spring, is believed to be transformed later into the Gigazuha Lee lizard, already mentioned. The fish is described as having horns or projections upon its nose and beautiful red spots upon its head, and as being attended or accompanied by many smaller red fish, all of which, including the Ugunst Lee, are accustomed to pile up small stones in the water. As the season advances it disappears and is believed then to have turned into a Gigazuha Lee lizard, the change beginning at the head and finishing with the tail. It is probably the Campostoma or Stone Roller, which is conspicuous for its bright coloring in early spring, but loses its tints after spawning. The meat of the sluggish hog sucker is tabooed to the ball player, who must necessarily be active in movement. The freshwater mussel is called Daguna, and the same name is applied to certain pimples upon the face, on account of a fancied resemblance. The ball player rubs himself with an eel skin to make himself slippery and hard to hold, and, according to the Wananahi manuscript, women formerly tied up their hair with the dried skin of an eel to make it grow long. A large red crawfish called Siska gilly, much resembling a lobster, is used to scratch young children in order to give them a strong grip, each hand of the child being lightly scratched once with the pincer of the living animal. A mother whose grown son had been thus treated when an infant claimed that he could hold anything with his thumb and finger. It is said, however, to render the child quarrelsome and disposed to bite. Of insects there is more to be said. The generic name for all sorts of small insects and worms is Tskaya, and according to the doctors, who had anticipated the microbe theory by several centuries. 
These tskaya are to blame for nearly every human ailment not directly traceable to the asgina of the larger animals or to witchcraft. The reason is plain. There are such myriads of them everywhere on the earth and in the air that mankind is constantly destroying them by wholesale, without mercy and almost without knowledge, and this is their method of taking revenge. Beetles are classed together under a name which signifies, insects with shells. The little water beetle or mellow bug, Dinutes de Sculler, is called Deuni S.I., Beaver's grandmother, and according to the Genesis tradition it brought up the first earth from under the water. A certain green-headed beetle with horns, Phineas Carnifex, is spoken of as the dog of the Thunder Boys, and the metallic green luster upon its forehead is said to have been caused by striking at the celebrated mythic gambler, Unsei. Brass, see the story. The June bug, Alarina nitida, another green beetle, is Tagu, but is frequently called by the curious name of Tu Yidi Skolostiski, one who keeps fire under the beams. Its larva is the grub worm which presided at the meeting held by the insects to compass the destruction of the human race, see the story, Origin of Disease and Medicine. The large horned beetle, Dynasts Titius, is called Cista Na, Crawfish, Aw, Deer, or Galaji Na, Buck, on account of its branching horns. The snapping beetle, allows Oculatus, is called Tulska Wa, one that snaps with his head. When the Lalu or jarfly, Cicada Alites, begins to sing in midsummer they say, the jarfly has brought the beans, his song being taken as the signal that beans are ripe and that green corn is not far behind. When the Katydid, Tsikiki, is heard a little later they say, Katydid has brought the roasting ear bread. The cricket, Tala too, is often called, the barber, Didaste Ski, on account of its habit of gnawing hair from furs, and when the Cherokee meet a man with his hair clipped unevenly they sometimes ask playfully, did the cricket cut your hair? See story, why the possum's tail is bare. Certain persons are said to drink tea made of crickets in order to become good singers. The mole cricket, Grilatalpa, so called because it tunnels in the earth and has hand-like claws fitted for digging, is known to the Cherokee as GLKWA with circumflex G, a word which literally means seven, but is probably an onomatope. It is reputed among them to be alert, hard to catch, and an excellent singer, who never makes mistakes. Like the crawfish and the cricket, it plays an important part in preparing people for the duties of life. Infants slow in learning to speak have their tongues scratched with the claw of a GLKWA with circumflex G, the living insect being held in the hand during the operation, in order that they may soon learn to speak distinctly and be eloquent, wise, and shrewd of speech as they grow older, and of such quick intelligence as to remember without effort anything once heard. The same desirable result may be accomplished with a grown person, but with much more difficulty, as in that case it is necessary to scratch the inside of the throat for four successive mornings. The insect being pushed down with the fingers and again withdrawn, while the regular taboos must be strictly observed for the same period, or the operation will be without effect. In some cases the insect is put into a small bowl of water overnight, and if still alive in the morning it is taken out and the water given to the patient to drink, after which the GLKWA with circumflex G is set at liberty. Bees are kept by many of the Cherokee, in addition to the wild bees which are hunted in the woods. Although they are said to have come originally from the whites, the Cherokee have no tradition of a time when they did not know them. There seems, however, to be no folklore connected with them. The cow ant, Myrmica. A large, red, stinging ant, is called properly Dacentalia Tatsinski, stinging ant, but, on account of its hard body case, is frequently called Nun Yunuwai, stone dress, after a celebrated mythic monster. Strange as it may seem, there appears to be no folklore connected with either the firefly or the glowworm, while the spider, so prominent in other tribal mythologies, appears in but a single Cherokee myth. Where it brings back the fire from across the water. In the formulas it is frequently invoked to entangle in its threads the soul of a victim whom the conjurer desires to bring under his evil spells. From a fancied resemblance in appearance the name for spider, Kanane Ski, is applied also to a watch or clock. A small yellowish moth which flies about the fire at night is called Tun Tau, 
a name implying that it goes into and out of the fire, and when at last it flits too near and falls into the blaze the Cherokee say, Tun Tol is going to bed. On account of its affinity for the fire it is invoked by the doctor in all fire diseases, including sore eyes and frostbite. 60. Why the bullfrog's head is striped. According to one version the bullfrog was always ridiculing the great gambler on Sai E, Brass. See the story, until the latter at last got angry and dared the bullfrog to play the Gatayu Sti, wheel and stick, game with him, whichever lost to be scratched on his forehead. Brass won, as he always did, and the yellow stripes on the bullfrog's head show where the gambler's fingers scratched him. Another story is that the bullfrog had a conjurer to paint his head with yellow stripes, brass, to make him appear more handsome to a pretty woman he was courting. 61. The Bullfrog Lover A young man courted a girl, who liked him well enough, but her mother was so much opposed to him that she would not let him come near the house. At last he made a trumpet from the handle of a gourd and hid himself after night near the spring until the old woman came down for water. While she was dipping up the water he put the trumpet to his lips and grumbled out in a deep voice like a bullfrog's. Yandaska G.A. Hanyahuska. Yandaska G.A. Hanyahuska. The fault finder will die. The fault finder will die. The woman thought it a witch bullfrog, and was so frightened that she dropped her dipper and ran back to the house to tell the people they all agreed that it was a warning to her to stop interfering with her daughter's affairs. So she gave her consent, and thus the young man won his wife. There is another story of a girl who, every day when she went down to the spring for water, heard a voice singing, Kuna nu tu tsahayasai, Kuna nu tu tsahayasai, a bullfrog will marry you, a bullfrog will marry you. She wondered much until one day when she came down she saw sitting on a stone by the spring a bullfrog, which suddenly took the form of a young man and asked her to marry him. She consented and took him back with her to the house. But although he had the shape of a man there was a queer bullfrog look about his face, so that the girl's family hated him and at last persuaded her to send him away. She told him and he went away, but when they next went down to the spring they heard a voice, STETSI to Yahusi, STETSI to Yahusi, your daughter will die, your daughter will die, and so it happened soon after. As some tell it, the lover was a tadpole, who took on human shape, retaining only his tadpole mouth. To conceal it he constantly refused to eat with the family, but stood with his back to the fire and his face screwed up, pretending that he had a toothache. At last his wife grew suspicious and turning him suddenly around to the firelight, exposed the tadpole mouth, at which they all ridiculed him so much that he left the house forever. 62. The Katydid's Warning Two hunters camping in the woods were preparing supper one night when a katydid began singing near them. One of them said sneeringly, Coo! It sings and don't know that it will die before the season ends. The katydid answered, Coo! Niwi, onomatope, oh, so you say, but you need not boast. You will die before tomorrow night. The next day they were surprised by the enemy and the hunter who had sneered at the katydid was killed. Wonder Stories 63, UNTSAYI, The Gambler Thunder lives in the west, or a little to the south of west, near the place where the sun goes down behind the water. In the old times he sometimes made a journey to the east, and once after he had come back from one of these journeys a child was born in the east who, the people said, was his son. As the boy grew up it was found that he had scrofula sores all over his body, so one day his mother said to him, Your father, Thunder, is a great doctor. He lives far in the west, but if you can find him he can cure you. So the boy set out to find his father and be cured. He traveled long toward the west, asking of everyone he met where Thunder lived, until at last they began to tell him that it was only a little way ahead. He went on and came to Antiguhi, on Tennessee, where lived Unsei, Brass. Now Unsei was a great gambler, and made his living that way. It was he who invented the Gatayusti game that we play with a stone wheel and a stick. He lived on the south side of the river, and everybody who came that way he challenged to play against him. The large flat rock, with the lines and grooves where they used to roll the wheel, 
is still there, with the wheels themselves and the stick turned to stone. He won almost every time, because he was so tricky, so that he had his house filled with all kinds of fine things. Sometimes he would lose, and then he would bet all that he had, even to his own life, but the winner got nothing for his trouble, for Anse I knew how to take on different shapes, so that he always got away. As soon as Anse I saw him he asked him to stop and play a while, but the boy said he was looking for his father, Thunder, and had no time to wait. Well, said Anse I, he lives in the next house. You can hear him grumbling over there all the time, he meant the Thunder, so we may as well have a game or two before you go on. The boy said he had nothing to bet. That's all right, said the gambler, we'll play for your pretty spots. He said this to make the boy angry so that he would play, but still the boy said he must go first and find his father, and would come back afterwards. He went on, and soon the news came to Thunder that a boy was looking for him who claimed to be his son. Said Thunder, I have traveled in many lands and have many children. Bring him here and we shall soon know. So they brought in the boy, and Thunder showed him a seat and told him to sit down. Under the blanket on the seat were long, sharp thorns of the honey locust, with the points all sticking up, but when the boy sat down they did not hurt him, and then Thunder knew that it was his son. He asked the boy why he had come. I have sores all over my body, and my mother told me you were my father and a great doctor, and if I came here you would cure me. Yes, said his father, I am a great doctor, and I'll soon fix you. There was a large pot in the corner and he told his wife to fill it with water and put it over the fire. When it was boiling, he put in some roots, then took the boy and put him in with them. He let it boil a long time until one would have thought that the flesh was boiled from the poor boy's bones, and then told his wife to take the pot and throw it into the river, boy and all. She did as she was told, and threw it into the water, and ever since there is an eddy there that we call unto Guhi, pot in the water. A service tree and a calico bush grew on the bank above. A great cloud of steam came up and made streaks and blotches on their bark, and it has been so to this day. When the steam cleared away she looked over and saw the boy clinging to the roots of the service tree where they hung down into the water, but now his skin was all clean. She helped him up the bank, and they went back to the house. On the way she told him, when we go in, your father will put a new dress on you, but when he opens his box and tells you to pick out your ornaments be sure to take them from the bottom. Then he will send for his other sons to play ball against you. There is a honey locust tree in front of the house, and as soon as you begin to get tired strike at that and your father will stop the play, because he does not want to lose the tree. When they went into the house, the old man was pleased to see the boy looking so clean, and said, I knew I could soon cure those spots. Now we must dress you. He brought out a fine suit of buckskin, with belt and headdress, and had the boy put them on. Then he opened a box and said, Now pick out your necklace and bracelets. The boy looked, and the box was full of all kinds of snakes gliding over each other with their heads up. He was not afraid, but remembered what the woman had told him, and plunged his hand to the bottom and drew out a great rattlesnake and put it around his neck for a necklace. He put down his hand again four times and drew up four copperheads and twisted them around his wrists and ankles. Then his father gave him a war club and said, Now you must play a ball game with your two elder brothers. They live beyond here in the darkening land, and I have sent for them. He said a ball game, but he meant that the boy must fight for his life. The young men came, and they were both older and stronger than the boy, but he was not afraid and fought against them. The thunder rolled and the lightning flashed at every stroke, for they were the young thunders, and the boy himself was lightning. At last he was tired from defending himself alone against two, and pretended to aim a blow at the honey locust tree. Then his father stopped the fight, because he was afraid the lightning would split the tree, and he saw that the boy was brave and strong. The boy told his father how once I had dared him to play, and had even offered to play for the spots on his skin. Yes, said Thunder, he is a great gambler and makes his living that way, but I will see that you win. He brought a small simling gourd with a whole board through the neck, and tied it on the boy's wrist. Inside the gourd there was a string of beads, and one end hung out from a hole in the top, 
but there was no end to the string inside. Now, said his father, go back the way you came, and as soon as he sees you he will want to play for the beads. He is very hard to beat, but this time he will lose every game. When he cries out for a drink, you will know he is getting discouraged, and then strike the rock with your war club and water will come, so that you can play on without stopping. At last he will bet his life, and lose. Then send at once for your brothers to kill him, or he will get away, he is so tricky. The boy took the gourd and his war club and started east along the road by which he had come. As soon as Ansei saw him he called to him, and when he saw the gourd with the bead string hanging out he wanted to play for it. The boy drew out the string, but there seemed to be no end to it, and he kept on pulling until enough had come out to make a circle all around the playground. I will play one game for this much against your stake, said the boy, and when that is over we can have another game. They began the game with the wheel and stick and the boy won. Unsei did not know what to think of it, but he put up another stake and called for a second game. The boy won again, and so they played on until noon, when Unsei had lost nearly everything he had and was about discouraged. It was very hot, and he said, I am thirsty, and wanted to stop long enough to get a drink. No, said the boy, and struck the rock with his club so that water came out, and they had a drink. They played on until Unsei had lost all his buckskins and beaded work, his eagle feathers and ornaments, and at last offered to bet his wife. They played and the boy won her. Then Unsei was desperate and offered to stake his life. If I win I kill you, but if you win you may kill me. They played and the boy won. Let me go and tell my wife, said Unsei, so that she will receive her new husband, and then you may kill me. He went into the house, but it had two doors, and although the boy waited long Unsei did not come back. When at last he went to look for him he found that the gambler had gone out the back way and was nearly out of sight going east. The boy ran to his father's house and got his brothers to help him. They brought their dog, the horned green beetle, and hurried after the gambler. He ran fast and was soon out of sight, and they followed as fast as they could. After a while they met an old woman making pottery and asked her if she had seen Unsei and she said she had not. He came this way, said the brothers. Then he must have passed in the night, said the old woman, for I have been here all day. They were about to take another road when the beetle, which had been circling about in the air above the old woman, made a dart at her and struck her on the forehead, and it rang like brass, on Sei. Then they knew it was brass and sprang at him, but he jumped up in his right shape and was off, running so fast that he was soon out of sight again. The beetle had struck so hard that some of the brass rubbed off, and we can see it on the beetle's forehead yet. They followed and came to an old man sitting by the trail, carving a stone pipe. They asked him if he had seen brass pass that way and he said no, but again the beetle, which could know brass under any shape, struck him on the forehead so that it rang like metal. And the gambler jumped up in his right form and was off again before they could hold him. He ran east until he came to the great water, then he ran north until he came to the edge of the world, and had to turn again to the west. He took every shape to throw them off the track, but the green beetle always knew him, and the brothers pressed him so hard that at last he could go no more and they caught him just as he reached the edge of the great water where the sun goes down. They tied his hands and feet with a grapevine and drove a long stake through his breast, and planted it far out in the deep water. They set two crows on the end of the pole to guard it and called the place Kagan E, Crow Place. But Brass never died, and cannot die until the end of the world, but lies there always with his face up. Sometimes he struggles under the water to get free, and sometimes the beavers, who are his friends, come and gnaw at the grapevine to release him. Then the pole shakes and the crows at the top cry ka. 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 And scare the beavers away. 64. The Nest of the TLA Nuwa. On the north bank of Little Tennessee River, in a bend below the mouth of Sitico Creek, in Blunt County, Tennessee, is a high cliff hanging over the water. And about halfway up the face of the rock is a cave with two openings. The rock projects outward above the cave, so that the mouth cannot be seen from above, 
and it seems impossible to reach the cave either from above or below. There are white streaks in the rock from the cave down to the water. The Cherokee call it Tla Nuwa I, the place of the Tla Nuwa, or Great Mythic Hawk. In the old time, away back soon after the creation, a pair of Tla Nuwas had their nest in this cave. The streaks in the rock were made by the droppings from the nest. They were immense birds, larger than any that live now, and very strong and savage. They were forever flying up and down the river, and used to come into the settlements and carry off dogs and even young children playing near the houses. No one could reach the nest to kill them, and when the people tried to shoot them the arrows only glanced off and were seized and carried away in the talons of the Tla Nuwas. At last the people went to a great medicine man, who promised to help them. Some were afraid that if he failed to kill the Tla Nuwas they would take revenge on the people, but the medicine man said he could fix that. He made a long rope of lin bark, just as the Cherokee still do, with loops in it for his feet, and had the people let him down from the top of the cliff at a time when he knew that the old birds were away. When he came opposite the mouth of the cave he still could not reach it, because the rock above hung over. So he swung himself backward and forward several times until the rope swung near enough for him to pull himself into the cave with a hooked stick that he carried, which he managed to fasten in some bushes growing at the entrance. In the nest he found four young ones, and on the floor of the cave were the bones of all sorts of animals that had been carried there by the hawks. He pulled the young ones out of the nest and threw them over the cliff into the deep water below, where a great Actina serpent that lived there finished them. Just then he saw the two old ones coming, and had hardly time to climb up again to the top of the rock before they reached the nest. When they found the nest empty they were furious, and circled round and round in the air until they saw the snake put up its head from the water. Then they darted straight downward, and while one seized the snake in his talons and flew far up in the sky with it, his mate struck at it and bit off piece after piece until nothing was left. They were so high up that when the pieces fell they made holes in the rock, which are still to be seen there, at the place which we call, where the Tla Nuwa cut it up, opposite the mouth of Sidico. Then the two Tla Nuwas circled up and up until they went out of sight, and they have never been seen since. 65. The Hunter and the Tla Nuwa A hunter out in the woods one day saw a Tla Nuwa overhead and tried to hide from it, but the great bird had already seen him, and sweeping down struck its claws into his hunting pack and carried him far up into the air. As it flew, the Tla Nuwa, which was a mother bird, spoke and told the hunter that he need not be afraid, as she would not hurt him. But only wanted him to stay for a while with her young ones to guard them until they were old enough to leave the nest. At last they alighted at the mouth of a cave in the face of a steep cliff. Inside the water was dripping from the roof, and at the farther end was a nest of sticks in which were two young birds. The old Tla Nuwa set the hunter down and then flew away, returning soon with a fresh killed deer, which it tore in pieces, giving the first piece to the hunter and then feeding the two young hawks. The hunter stayed in the cave many days until the young birds were nearly grown, and every day the old mother hawk would fly away from the nest and return in the evening with a deer or a bear, of which she always gave the first piece to the hunter. He grew very anxious to see his home again, but the Tla Nuwa kept telling him not to be uneasy, but to wait a little while longer. At last he made up his mind to escape from the cave and finally studied out a plan. The next morning, after the old bird had gone, he dragged one of the young birds to the mouth of the cave and tied himself to one of its legs with a strap from his hunting pack. Then with the flat side of his tomahawk he struck it several times in the head until it was dazed and helpless, and pushed the bird and himself together off the shelf of rock into the air. They fell far, far down toward the earth but the air from below held up the bird's wings, so that it was almost as if they were flying. As the Tla Nuwa revived it tried to fly upward toward the nest, but the hunter struck it again with his hatchet until it was dazed and dropped again. At last they came down in the top of a poplar tree, when the hunter untied the strap from the leg of the young bird and let it fly away, first pulling out a feather from its wing. He climbed down from the tree and went to his home in the settlement but when he looked in his pack for the feather he found a stone instead. 66. 
Adel T.A., the Spear Finger. Long, long ago, Halahiyu, there dwelt in the mountains a terrible ogress, a woman monster, whose food was human livers. She could take on any shape or appearance to suit her purpose, but in her right form she looked very much like an old woman, excepting that her whole body was covered with a skin as hard as a rock that no weapon could wound or penetrate. And that on her right hand she had a long, stony forefinger of bone, like an awl or spearhead, with which she stabbed everyone to whom she could get near enough. On account of this fact she was called Adulta, Spearfinger, and on account of her stony skin she was sometimes called Nun Yunawai, Stone Dress. There was another stone clothed monster that killed people, but that is a different story. Spearfinger had such powers over stone that she could easily lift and carry immense rocks, and could cement them together by merely striking one against another. To get over the rough country more easily she undertook to build a great rock bridge through the air from Nunyu, Plagi, the Tree Rock, on Hiwasi, over to Sinigula G.I., Whiteside Mountain, on the Blue Ridge. And had it well started from the top of the Tree Rock, when the lightning struck it and scattered the fragments along the whole ridge, where the pieces can still be seen by those who go there. She used to range all over the mountains about the heads of the streams and in the dark passes of Nantahala, always hungry and looking for victims. Her favorite haunt on the Tennessee side was about the gap on the trail where Chilhoe Mountain comes down to the river. Sometimes an old woman would approach along the trail where the children were picking strawberries or playing near the village, and would say to them coaxingly, Come, my grandchildren, come to your granny and let granny dress your hair. When some little girl ran up and laid her head in the old woman's lap to be petted and combed the old witch would gently run her fingers through the child's hair until it went to sleep. When she would stab the little one through the heart or back of the neck with the long all finger, which she had kept hidden under her robe. Then she would take out the liver and eat it. She would enter a house by taking the appearance of one of the family who happened to have gone out for a short time, and would watch her chance to stab someone with her long finger and take out his liver. She could stab him without being noticed, and often the victim did not even know it himself at the time, for it left no wound and caused no pain, but went on about his own affairs, until all at once he felt weak and began gradually to pine away. And was always sure to die, because Spearfinger had taken his liver. When the Cherokee went out in the fall, according to their custom, to burn the leaves off from the mountains in order to get the chestnuts on the ground, they were never safe, for the old witch was always on the lookout. And as soon as she saw the smoke rise she knew there were Indians there and sneaked up to try to surprise one alone. So as well as they could they tried to keep together, and were very cautious of allowing any stranger to approach the camp. But if one went down to the spring for a drink they never knew but it might be the liver eater that came back and sat with them. Sometimes she took her proper form, and once or twice, when far out from the settlements, a solitary hunter had seen an old woman, with a queer-looking hand, going through the woods singing low to herself. Uva la Natsuku. Su sa sai. Liver, I eat it. Su sa sai. It was rather a pretty song, but it chilled his blood, for he knew it was the liver eater, and he hurried away, silently, before she might see him. At last a great council was held to devise some means to get rid of Utlan Ta before she should destroy everybody. The people came from all around, and after much talk it was decided that the best way would be to trap her in a pitfall where all the warriors could attack her at once. So they dug a deep pitfall across the trail and covered it over with earth and grass as if the ground had never been disturbed. Then they kindled a large fire of brush near the trail and hid themselves in the laurels, because they knew she would come as soon as she saw the smoke. Sure enough they soon saw an old woman coming along the trail. She looked like an old woman whom they knew well in the village, and although several of the wiser men wanted to shoot at her, the others interfered, because they did not want to hurt one of their own people. The old woman came slowly along the trail, with one hand under her blanket, until she stepped upon the pitfall and tumbled through the brush top into the deep hole below. Then, at once, she showed her true nature, and instead of the feeble old woman there was the terrible Utlan Ta with her stony skin, and her sharp all finger reaching out in every direction for someone to stab. The hunters rushed out from the thicket and surrounded the pit, 
but shoot as true and as often as they could, their arrows struck the stony mail of the witch only to be broken and fall useless at her feet. While she taunted them and tried to climb out of the pit to get at them. They kept out of her way, but were only wasting their arrows when a small bird, Atsuji, the titmouse, perched on a tree overhead and began to sing, un, un, un. They thought it was saying Yunahu, heart, meaning that they should aim at the heart of the stone witch. They directed their arrows where the heart should be, but the arrows only glanced off with the flint heads broken. Then they caught the Atsuji and cut off its tongue, so that ever since its tongue is short and everybody knows it is a liar. When the hunters let it go it flew straight up into the sky until it was out of sight and never came back again. The titmouse that we know now is only an image of the other. They kept up the fight without result until another bird, little T.S.I. Kalili, the chickadee, flew down from a tree and alighted upon the witch's right hand. The warriors took this as a sign that they must aim there, and they were right, for her heart was on the inside of her hand, which she kept doubled into a fist, this same all hand with which she had stabbed so many people. Now she was frightened in earnest, and began to rush furiously at them with her long all finger and to jump about in the pit to dodge the arrows, until at last a lucky arrow struck just where the all joined her wrist and she fell down dead. Ever since the T.S.I. Kalili is known as a truth teller, and when a man is away on a journey, if this bird comes and perches near the house and chirps its song, his friends know he will soon be safe home. 67. None why you and you wi, the stone man. This is what the old man told me when I was a boy. Once when all the people of the settlement were out in the mountains on a great hunt one man who had gone on ahead climbed to the top of a high ridge and found a large river on the other side. While he was looking across he saw an old man walking about on the opposite ridge, with a cane that seemed to be made of some bright, shining rock. The hunter watched and saw that every little while the old man would point his cane in a certain direction, then draw it back and smell the end of it. At last he pointed it in the direction of the hunting camp on the other side of the mountain, and this time when he drew back the staff he sniffed it several times as if it smelled very good, and then started along the ridge straight for the camp. He moved very slowly, with the help of the cane, until he reached the end of the ridge, when he threw the cane out into the air and it became a bridge of shining rock stretching across the river. After he had crossed over upon the bridge it became a cane again, and the old man picked it up and started over the mountain toward the camp. The hunter was frightened, and felt sure that it meant mischief, so he hurried on down the mountain and took the shortest trail back to the camp to get there before the old man. When he got there and told his story the medicine man said the old man was a wicked cannibal monster called Nun Yunawai, dressed in stone, who lived in that part of the country. And was always going about the mountains looking for some hunter to kill and eat. It was very hard to escape from him, because his stick guided him like a dog, and it was nearly as hard to kill him, because his whole body was covered with a skin of solid rock. If he came he would kill and eat them all, and there was only one way to save themselves. He could not bear to look upon a menstrual woman, and if they could find seven menstrual women to stand in the path as he came along the site would kill him. So they asked among all the women, and found seven who were sick in that way, and with one of them it had just begun. By the order of the medicine man they stripped themselves and stood along the path where the old man would come. Soon they heard Nun Yunu Wai coming through the woods, feeling his way with his stone cane. He came along the trail to where the first woman was standing, and as soon as he saw her he started and cried out, You! My grandchild! You are in a very bad state! He hurried past her, but in a moment he met the next woman, and cried out again, You! My child, you are in a terrible way, and hurried past her, but now he was vomiting blood. He hurried on and met the third and the fourth and the fifth woman, but with each one that he saw his step grew weaker until when he came to the last one, with whom the sickness had just begun. The blood poured from his mouth and he fell down on the trail. Then the medicine man drove seven sourwood stakes through his body and pinned him to the ground, and when night came they piled great logs over him and set fire to them, and all the people gathered around to see. Nun Yinu Wai was a great Ada Weihai and knew many secrets, and now as the fire came close to him he began to talk, 
and told them the medicine for all kinds of sickness. At midnight he began to sing, and sang the hunting songs for calling up the bear and the deer and all the animals of the woods and mountains. As the blaze grew hotter his voice sank low and lower, until at last when daylight came, the logs were a heap of white ashes and the voice was still. Then the medicine man told them to rake off the ashes, and where the body had lain they found only a large lump of red wadi paint and a magic ulunsu ti stone. He kept the stone for himself, and calling the people around him he painted them, on face and breast, with the red wadi, and whatever each person prayed for while the painting was being done, whether for hunting success, for working skill, or for a long life, that gift was his. 68. The Hunter in the Dakwa In the old days there was a great fish called the Dakwa, which lived in Tennessee River where Toko Creek comes in at Dakwa I, the Dakwa Place, above the mouth of Teleco, and which was so large that it could easily swallow a man. Once a canoe filled with warriors was crossing over from the town to the other side of the river, when the Dakwa suddenly rose up under the boat and threw them all into the air. As they came down it swallowed one with a single snap of its jaws and dived with him to the bottom of the river. As soon as the hunter came to his senses he found that he had not been hurt, but it was so hot and close inside the Dakwa that he was nearly smothered. As he groped around in the dark his hand struck a lot of mussel shells which the fish had swallowed, and taking one of these for a knife he began to cut his way out. Until soon the fish grew uneasy at the scraping inside his stomach and came up to the top of the water for air. He kept on cutting until the fish was in such pain that it swam this way and that across the stream and thrashed the water into foam with its tail. Finally the hole was so large that he could look out and saw that the dakwa was now resting in shallow water near the shore. Reaching up he climbed out from the side of the fish, moving very carefully so that the dakwa would not know it, and then waded to shore and got back to the settlement. But the juices in the stomach of the great fish had scalded all the hair from his head and he was bald ever after. Wananahi Version A boy was sent on an errand by his father, and not wishing to go he ran away to the river. After playing in the sand for a short time some boys of his acquaintance came by in a canoe and invited him to join them. Glad of the opportunity to get away he went with them, but had no sooner got in than the canoe began to tip and rock most unaccountably. The boys became very much frightened, and in the confusion the bad boy fell into the water and was immediately swallowed by a large fish. After lying in its stomach for some time he became very hungry, and on looking around he saw the fish's liver hanging over his head. Thinking it dried meat, he tried to cut off a piece with a mussel shell he had been playing with and still held in his hand. The operation sickened the fish and it vomited the boy. 69. Ataga Chai, the Enchanted Lake Westward from the headwaters of Okanolufti River, in the wildest depths of the Great Smoky Mountains, which form the line between North Carolina and Tennessee, is the enchanted lake of Ataga High, Gall Place. Although all the Cherokee know that it is there, no one has ever seen it, for the way is so difficult that only the animals know how to reach it. Should a stray hunter come near the place he would know of it by the whirring sound of the thousands of wild ducks flying about the lake, but on reaching the spot he would find only a dry flat, without bird or animal or blade of grass. Unless he had first sharpened his spiritual vision by prayer and fasting and an all-night vigil. Because it is not seen, some people think the lake has dried up long ago, but this is not true. To one who had kept watch and fast through the night it would appear at daybreak as a wide-extending but shallow sheet of purple water, fed by springs spouting from the high cliffs around. In the water are all kinds of fish and reptiles, and swimming upon the surface or flying overhead are great flocks of ducks and pigeons, while all about the shores are bear tracks crossing in every direction. It is the medicine lake of the birds and animals, and whenever a bear is wounded by the hunters he makes his way through the woods to this lake and plunges into the water, and when he comes out upon the other side his wounds are healed. For this reason the animals keep the lake invisible to the hunter. 70. The Bride from the South The North went traveling, and after going far and meeting many different tribes he finally fell in love with the daughter of the South and wanted to marry her. The girl was willing, but her parents objected and said, Ever since you came the weather has been cold, 
and if you stay here we may all freeze to death. The North pleaded hard, and said that if they would let him have their daughter he would take her back to his own country, so at last they consented. They were married and he took his bride to his own country, and when she arrived there she found the people all living in ice houses. The next day, when the sun rose, the houses began to leak, and as it climbed higher they began to melt, and it grew warmer and warmer, until finally the people came to the young husband and told him he must send his wife home again. Or the weather would get so warm that the whole settlement would be melted. He loved his wife and so held out as long as he could, but as the sun grew hotter the people were more urgent, and at last he had to send her home to her parents. The people said that as she had been born in the south, and nourished all her life upon food that grew in the same climate, her whole nature was warm and unfit for the north. 71. The Ice Man Once when the people were burning the woods in the fall of the blaze set fire to a poplar tree, which continued to burn until the fire went down into the roots and burned a great hole in the ground. It burned and burned, and the hole grew constantly larger, until the people became frightened and were afraid it would burn the whole world. They tried to put out the fire, but it had gone too deep, and they did not know what to do. At last someone said there was a man living in a house of ice far in the north who could put out the fire, so messengers were sent, and after traveling a long distance they came to the ice house and found the ice man at home. He was a little fellow with long hair hanging down to the ground in two plates. The messengers told him their errand and he at once said, Oh yes, I can help you, and began to unplate his hair. When it was all unbraided he took it up in one hand and struck it once across his other hand, and the messengers felt a wind blow against their cheeks. A second time he struck his hair across his hand, and a light rain began to fall. The third time he struck his hair across his open hand there was sleet mixed with the raindrops, and when he struck the fourth time great hailstones fell upon the ground, as if they had come out from the ends of his hair. Go back now, said the ice man, and I shall be there tomorrow. So the messengers returned to their people, whom they found still gathered helplessly about the great burning pit. The next day while they were all watching about the fire there came a wind from the north, and they were afraid, for they knew that it came from the ice man. But the wind only made the fire blaze up higher. Then a light rain began to fall, but the drops seemed only to make the fire hotter. Then the shower turned to a heavy rain, with sleet and hail that killed the blaze and made clouds of smoke and steam rise from the red coals. The people fled to their homes for shelter, and the storm rose to a whirlwind that drove the rain into every burning crevice and piled great hailstones over the embers, until the fire was dead and even the smoke ceased. When at last it was all over and the people returned they found a lake where the burning pit had been, and from below the water came a sound as of embers still crackling. 72. The Hunter and Selu a hunter had been tramping over the mountains all day long without finding any game and when the sun went down, he built a fire in a hollow stump, swallowed a few mouthfuls of corn gruel and lay down to sleep. Tired out and completely discouraged. About the middle of the night he dreamed and seemed to hear the sound of beautiful singing, which continued until near daybreak and then appeared to die away into the upper air. All next day he hunted with the same poor success, and at night made his lonely camp again in the woods. He slept and the strange dream came to him again, but so vividly that it seemed to him like an actual happening. Rousing himself before daylight, he still heard the song, and feeling sure now that it was real, he went in the direction of the sound and found that it came from a single green stalk of corn, Selu. The plant spoke to him, and told him to cut off some of its roots and take them to his home in the settlement, and the next morning to chew them and, go to water, before anyone else was awake, and then to go out again into the woods. And he would kill many deer and from that time on would always be successful in the hunt. The corn plant continued to talk, teaching him hunting secrets and telling him always to be generous with the game he took, until it was noon and the sun was high. When it suddenly took the form of a woman and rose gracefully into the air and was gone from sight, leaving the hunter alone in the woods. He returned home and told his story, and all the people knew that he had seen Selu, the wife of Kana Ti. He did as the spirit had directed, and from that time was noted as the most successful of all the hunters in the settlement. 73. 
The Underground Panthers A hunter was in the woods one day in winter when suddenly he saw a panther coming toward him and at once prepared to defend himself. The panther continued to approach, and the hunter was just about to shoot when the animal spoke, and at once it seemed to the man as if there was no difference between them, and they were both of the same nature. The panther asked him where he was going, and the man said that he was looking for a deer. Well, said the panther, we are getting ready for a green corn dance, and there are seven of us out after a buck, so we may as well hunt together. The hunter agreed and they went on together. They started up one deer and another, but the panther made no sign, and said only, those are too small, we want something better. So the hunter did not shoot, and they went on. They started up another deer, a larger one, and the panther sprang upon it and tore its throat, and finally killed it after a hard struggle. The hunter got out his knife to skin it, but the panther said the skin was too much torn to be used and they must try again. They started up another large deer, and this the panther killed without trouble, and then, wrapping his tail around it, threw it across his back. Now, come to our townhouse, he said to the hunter. The panther led the way, carrying the captured deer upon his back, up a little stream branch until they came to the head spring, when it seemed as if a door opened in the side of the hill and they went in. Now the hunter found himself in front of a large townhouse, with the finest Detson and Lee he had ever seen, and the trees around were green, and the air was warm, as in summer. There was a great company there getting ready for the dance, and they were all panthers, but somehow it all seemed natural to the hunter. After a while the others who had been out came in with the deer they had taken, and the dance began. The hunter danced several rounds, and then said it was growing late and he must be getting home. So the panthers opened the door and he went out, and at once found himself alone in the woods again, and it was winter and very cold, with snow on the ground and on all the trees. When he reached the settlement he found a party just starting out to search for him. They asked him where he had been so long, and he told them the story, and then he found that he had been in the panther townhouse several days instead of only a very short time, as he had thought. He died within seven days after his return, because he had already begun to take on the panther nature, and so could not live again with men. If he had stayed with the panthers he would have lived. 74. The Tsundage W.I. Once some young men of the Cherokee set out to see what was in the world and traveled south until they came to a tribe of little people called Tsundage Y, with very queer-shaped bodies. Hardly tall enough to reach up to a man's knee, who had no houses, but lived in nests scooped in the sand and covered over with dried grass. The little fellows were so weak and puny that they could not fight at all, and were in constant terror from the wild geese and other birds that used to come in great flocks from the south to make war upon them. Just at the time that the travelers got there they found the little men in great fear, because there was a strong wind blowing from the south and it blew white feathers and down along the sand. So that the Tsundage Y knew their enemies were coming not far behind. The Cherokee asked them why they did not defend themselves, but they said they could not, because they did not know how. There was no time to make bows and arrows, but the travelers told them to take sticks for clubs, and showed them where to strike the birds on the necks to kill them. The wind blew for several days, and at last the birds came, so many that they were like a great cloud in the air, and alighted on the sands. The little men ran to their nests, and the birds followed and stuck in their long bills to pull them out and eat them. This time, though, the Tsundage Y had their clubs, and they struck the birds on the neck, as the Cherokee had shown them, and killed so many that at last the others were glad to spread their wings and fly away again to the south. The little men thanked the Cherokee for their help and gave them the best they had until the travelers went on to see the other tribes. They heard afterwards that the birds came again several times, but that the Tsundage Y always drove them off with their clubs, until a flock of sandhill cranes came. They were so tall that the little men could not reach up to strike them on the neck, and so at last the cranes killed them all. 75. Origin of the Bear, the Bear Songs Long ago there was a Cherokee clan called the Ani, Tsa Gui, and in one family of this clan was a boy who used to leave home and be gone all day in the mountains. After a while he went oftener and stayed longer, until at last he would not eat in the house at all, 
but started off at daybreak and did not come back until night. His parents scolded, but that did no good, and the boy still went every day until they noticed that long brown hair was beginning to grow out all over his body. Then they wondered and asked him why it was that he wanted to be so much in the woods that he would not even eat at home. Said the boy, I find plenty to eat there, and it is better than the corn and beans we have in the settlements, and pretty soon I am going into the woods to stay all the time. His parents were worried and begged him not to leave them, but he said, It is better there than here, and you see I am beginning to be different already, so that I cannot live here any longer. If you will come with me, there is plenty for all of us and you will never have to work for it, but if you want to come you must first fast seven days. The father and mother talked it over and then told the headman of the clan. They held a council about the matter and after everything had been said they decided, here we must work hard and have not always enough. There he says there is always plenty without work. We will go with him. So they fasted seven days, and on the seventh morning all the Ani, Tsa Gui left the settlement and started for the mountains as the boy led the way. When the people of the other towns heard of it they were very sorry and sent their headmen to persuade the Ani, Tsa Gui to stay at home and not go into the woods to live. The messengers found them already on the way, and were surprised to notice that their bodies were beginning to be covered with hair like that of animals, because for seven days they had not taken human food and their nature was changing. The Ani, Tsa Gui would not come back, but said, We are going where there is always plenty to eat. Hereafter we shall be called Yanu, bears, and when you yourselves are hungry come into the woods and call us and we shall come to give you our own flesh. You need not be afraid to kill us, for we shall live always. Then they taught the messengers the songs with which to call them, and the bear hunters have these songs still. When they had finished the songs the Ani, Tsa Gui started on again and the messengers turned back to the settlements, but after going a little way they looked back and saw a drove of bears going into the woods. First Bear Song He e. Ani, Tsa Gui, Ani, Tsa Gui, Aquandu Li e Lantijin and Ti. Ani, Tsa Gui, Ani, Tsa Gui, Aquandu Li e Lantijin and Ti, you. He e. The Ani, Tsa Gui, the Ani, Tsa Gui, I want to lay them low on the ground. The Ani, Tsa Gui, the Ani, Tsa Gui, I want to lay them low on the ground, you. The bear hunter starts out each morning fasting and does not eat until near evening. He sings this song as he leaves camp and again the next morning, but never twice the same day. Second Bear Song This song also is sung by the bear hunter, in order to attract the bears, while on his way from the camp to the place where he expects to hunt during the day. The melody is simple and plaintive. He e. Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa. Tsistuyi Nihandu Yanu, Tsistuyi Nihandu Yanu, Yohoho. He e. Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa. Kawahi Nihanda Yanu, Kawahi Nihanda Yanu, Yoho o. He e. Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa. Yahai Nihanda Yanu, Yahai Nihanda Yanu, Yoho o. He e. Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa, Hayuya Haniwa. Gategwa Nihanda Yanu, Gategwa Nihanda Yanu, Yoho o. Recited, Yulen Asahai Tadiya Stadakui Gun Nage Astatsiki. He. Hayuya Haniwa, four times. In Sistu E you were conceived, two times, Yoho. He. Hayuya Haniwa, four times. In Kua Hai you were conceived, two times, Yoho. He. Hayuya Haniwa, four times. In Waya Hai you were conceived, two times, Yoho. He. Hayuya Haniwa, four times. In Gate Gua you were conceived, two times, Yoho. And now surely we and the good black things, the best of all, shall see each other. 76. The Bear Man. A man went hunting in the mountains and came across a black bear, which he wounded with an arrow. The bear turned and started to run the other way, and the hunter followed, 
shooting one arrow after another into it without bringing it down. Now, this was a medicine bear, and could talk or read the thoughts of people without their saying a word. At last he stopped and pulled the arrows out of his side and gave them to the man, saying, It is of no use for you to shoot at me, for you cannot kill me. Come to my house and let us live together. The hunter thought to himself, He may kill me. But the bear read his thoughts and said, No, I won't hurt you. The man thought again, How can I get anything to eat? but the bear knew his thoughts, and said, There shall be plenty. So the hunter went with the bear. They went on together until they came to a hole in the side of the mountain, and the bear said, This is not where I live, but there is going to be a council here and we will see what they do. They went in, and the hole widened as they went, until they came to a large cave like a townhouse. It was full of bears, old bears, young bears, and cubs, white bears, black bears, and brown bears, and a large white bear was the chief. They sat down in a corner, but soon the bears scented the hunter and began to ask, What is it that smells bad? The chief said, Don't talk so, it is only a stranger come to see us. Let him alone. Food was getting scarce in the mountains, and the council was to decide what to do about it. They had sent out messengers all over, and while they were talking two bears came in and reported that they had found a country in the low grounds where there were so many chestnuts and acorns that mast was knee-deep. Then they were all pleased, and got ready for a dance, and the dance leader was the one the Indians call Kulas Ganahita, Long Hams, a great black bear that is always lean. After the dance the bears noticed the hunter's bow and arrows, and one said, This is what men used to kill us. Let us see if we can manage them, and maybe we can fight man with his own weapons. So they took the bow and arrows from the hunter to try them. They fitted the arrow and drew back the string, but when they let go it caught in their long claws and the arrows dropped to the ground. They saw that they could not use the bow and arrows and gave them back to the man. When the dance and the council were over, they began to go home, accepting the white bear chief, who lived there, and at last the hunter and the bear went out together. They went on until they came to another hole in the side of the mountain, when the bear said, This is where I live, and they went in. By this time the hunter was very hungry and was wondering how he could get something to eat. The other knew his thoughts, and sitting up on his hind legs he rubbed his stomach with his forepaws, so, and at once he had both paws full of chestnuts and gave them to the man. He rubbed his stomach again, so, and had his paws full of huckleberries, and gave them to the man. He rubbed again, so, and gave the man both paws full of blackberries. He rubbed again, so, and had his paws full of acorns, but the man said that he could not eat them, and that he had enough already. The hunter lived in a cave with the bear all winter, until long hair like that of a bear began to grow all over his body and he began to act like a bear, but he still walked like a man. One day in early spring the bear said to him, your people down in the settlement are getting ready for a grand hunt in these mountains. And they will come to this cave and kill me and take these clothes from me, he meant his skin, but they will not hurt you and will take you home with them. The bear knew what the people were doing down in the settlement just as he always knew what the man was thinking about. Some days passed and the bear said again, this is the day when the topknots will come to kill me, but the split noses will come first and find us. When they have killed me they will drag me outside the cave and take off my clothes and cut me in pieces. You must cover the blood with leaves, and when they are taking you away look back after you have gone a piece and you will see something. Soon they heard the hunters coming up the mountain, and then the dogs found the cave and began to bark. The hunters came and looked inside and saw the bear and killed him with their arrows. Then they dragged him outside the cave and skinned the body and cut it in quarters to carry home. The dogs kept on barking until the hunters thought there must be another bear in the cave. They looked in again and saw the man away at the farther end. At first they thought it was another bear on account of his long hair, but they soon saw it was the hunter who had been lost the year before, so they went in and brought him out. Then each hunter took a load of the bear meat and they started home again, bringing the man and the skin with them. Before they left the man piled leaves over the spot where they had cut up the bear, 
and when they had gone a little way he looked behind and saw the bear rise up out of the leaves, shake himself, and go back into the woods. When they came near the settlement the man told the hunters that he must be shut up where no one could see him, without anything to eat or drink for seven days and nights, until the bear nature had left him and he became like a man again. So they shut him up alone in a house and tried to keep very still about it, but the news got out and his wife heard of it. She came for her husband, but the people would not let her near him. But she came every day and begged so hard that at last after four or five days they let her have him. She took him home with her, but in a short time he died, because he still had a bear's nature and could not live like a man. If they had kept him shut up and fasting until the end of the seven days he would have become a man again and would have lived. 77. The Great Leech of Tlanusi Yi. The spot where Valley River joins Hiwassee, at Murphy, in North Carolina, is known among the Cherokees as Tlanusi E, the Leech Place. And this is the story they tell of it. Just above the junction is a deep hole in Valley River, and above it is a ledge of rock running across the stream, over which people used to go as on a bridge. On the south side the trail ascended a high bank, from which they could look down into the water. One day some men going along the trail saw a great red object, full as large as a house, lying on the rock ledge in the middle of the stream below them. As they stood wondering what it could be they saw it unroll, and then they knew it was alive, and stretch itself out along the rock until it looked like a great leech with red and white stripes along its body. It rolled up into a ball and again stretched out at full length, and at last crawled down the rock and was out of sight in the deep water. The water began to boil and foam, and a great column of white spray was thrown high in the air and came down like a waterspout upon the very spot where the men had been standing, and would have swept them all into the water but that they saw it in time and ran from the place. More than one person was carried down in this way, and their friends would find the body afterwards lying upon the bank with the ears and nose eaten off, until at last the people were afraid to go across the ledge any more on account of the great leech, or even to go along that part of the trail. But there was one young fellow who laughed at the whole story, and said that he was not afraid of anything in Valley River, as he would show them. So one day he painted his face and put on his finest buckskin and started off toward the river, while all the people followed at a distance to see what might happen. Down the trail he went and out upon the ledge of rock, singing in high spirits. Tlenu si gain gadg gage. Dakwa Nitlast Sti. I'll tie red leech skins. On my legs for garters. But before he was halfway across the water began to boil into white foam and a great wave rose and swept over the rock and carried him down, and he was never seen again. Just before the removal, sixty years ago, two women went out upon the ledge to fish. Their friends warned them of the danger, but one woman who had her baby on her back said, there are fish there and I'm going to have some. I'm tired of this fat meat. She laid the child down on the rock and was preparing the line when the water suddenly rose and swept over the ledge, and would have carried off the child but that the mother ran in time to save it. The great leech is still there in the deep hole, because when people look down they see something alive moving about on the bottom, and although they cannot distinguish its shape on account of the ripples on the water. Yet they know it is the leech. Some say there is an underground waterway across to Natalie River, not far above the mouth, where the river bends over toward Murphy, and sometimes the leech goes over there and makes the water boil as it used to at the rock ledge. They call this spot on Natalie the leech place also. 78. The Nun H.I. and Other Spirit Folk The Nun High or Immortals, the people who live anywhere, were a race of spirit people who lived in the highlands of the old Cherokee country and had a great many townhouses, especially in the Bald Mountains. The high peaks on which no timber ever grows. They had large townhouses in Pilot Knob and under the old Nequasi Mound in North Carolina, and another under Blood Mountain, at the head of Nodley River, in Georgia. They were invisible excepting when they wanted to be seen, and then they looked and spoke just like other Indians. They were very fond of music and dancing, and hunters in the mountains would often hear the dance songs and the drum beating in some invisible townhouse. 
but when they went toward the sound it would shift about and they would hear it behind them or away in some other direction, so that they could never find the place where the dance was. They were a friendly people, too, and often brought lost wanderers to their townhouses under the mountains and cared for them there until they were rested and then guided them back to their homes. More than once, also, when the Cherokee were hard pressed by the enemy, the Nun High warriors have come out, as they did at Old Nkwasi, and have saved them from defeat. Some people have thought that they are the same as the Yunwit Sunsti, the little people, but these are fairies, no larger in size than children. There was a man in Natalie town who had been with the Nun High when he was a boy, and he told Wofford all about it. He was a truthful, hard headed man, and Wofford had heard the story so often from other people that he asked this man to tell it. It was in this way. When he was about ten or twelve years old, he was playing one day near the river shooting at a mark with his bow and arrows, until he became tired, and started to build a fish trap in the water. While he was piling up the stones in two long walls a man came and stood on the bank and asked him what he was doing. The boy told him, and the man said, well, that's pretty hard work and you ought to rest a while. Come and take a walk up the river. The boy said, no, that he was going home to dinner soon. Come right up to my house, said the stranger, and I'll give you a good dinner there and bring you home again in the morning. So the boy went with him up the river until they came to a house, when they went in, and the man's wife and the other people there were very glad to see him, and gave him a fine dinner, and were very kind to him. While they were eating a man that the boy knew very well came in and spoke to him, so that he felt quite at home. After dinner he played with the other children and slept there that night, and in the morning, after breakfast, the man got ready to take him home. They went down a path that had a cornfield on one side and a peach orchard fenced in on the other, until they came to another trail, and the man said. Go along this trail across that ridge and you will come to the river road that will bring you straight to your home, and now I'll go back to the house. So the man went back to the house and the boy went on along the trail, but when he had gone a little way he looked back, and there was no cornfield or orchard or fence or house, nothing but trees on the mountainside. He thought it very queer, but somehow he was not frightened, and went on until he came to the river trail in sight of his home. There were a great many people standing about talking, and when they saw him they ran toward him shouting, Here he is. He is not drowned or killed in the mountains. They told him they had been hunting him ever since yesterday noon, and asked him where he had been. A man took me over to his house just across the ridge, and I had a fine dinner and a good time with the children, said the boy, I thought Utsi Scala here, that was the name of the man he had seen at dinner, would tell you where I was. But Utsi Scala said, I haven't seen you. I was out all day in my canoe hunting you. It was one of the nun high that made himself look like me. Then his mother said, you say you had dinner there? Yes, and I had plenty, too, said the boy. But his mother answered, there is no house there, only trees and rocks but we hear a drum sometimes in the big bald above. The people you saw were the nun high. Once four nun high women came to a dance at Natalie Town, and danced half the night with the young men there, and nobody knew that they were nun high, but thought them visitors from another settlement. About midnight they left to go home, and some men who had come out from the townhouse to cool off watched to see which way they went. They saw the women go down the trail to the river ford but just as they came to the water they disappeared, although it was a plain trail, with no place where they could hide. Then the watchers knew they were nun high women. Several men saw this happen, and one of them was Wofford's father-in-law, who was known for an honest man. At another time a man named Burnt Tobacco was crossing over the ridge from Nottily to Hemptown in Georgia and heard a drum and the songs of dancers in the hills on one side of the trail. He rode over to see who could be dancing in such a place, but when he reached the spot the drum and the songs were behind him. And he was so frightened that he hurried back to the trail and rode all the way to Hemptown as hard as he could to tell the story. He was a truthful man, and they believed what he said. There must have been a good many of the nun high living in that neighborhood, because the drumming was often heard in the high balds almost up to the time of the removal. On a small upper branch of Natalie, running nearly due north from Blood Mountain, there was also a hole, 
like a small well or chimney, in the ground, from which there came up a warm vapor that heated all the air around. People said that this was because the nun high had a townhouse and a fire under the mountain. Sometimes in cold weather hunters would stop there to warm themselves, but they were afraid to stay long. This was more than sixty years ago, but the hole is probably there yet. Close to the old trading path from South Carolina up to the Cherokee Nation, somewhere near the head of Tougaloo, there was formerly a noted circular depression about the size of a townhouse, and waist deep. Inside it was always clean as though swept by unknown hands. Passing traders would throw logs and rocks into it, but would always, on their return, find them thrown far out from the hole. The Indians said it was a nun high townhouse, and never liked to go near the place or even to talk about it, until at last some logs thrown in by the traders were allowed to remain there, and then they concluded that the nun high. Annoyed by the persecution of the white men, had abandoned their townhouse forever. There is another race of spirits, the Yunwit Sunsti, or, little people, who live in rock caves on the mountainside. They are little fellows, hardly reaching up to a man's knee, but well-shaped and handsome, with long hair falling almost to the ground. They are great wonder-workers and are very fond of music, spending half their time drumming and dancing. They are helpful and kind-hearted, and often when people have been lost in the mountains, especially children who have strayed away from their parents, the Yunwit Sunsti have found them and taken care of them and brought them back to their homes. Sometimes their drum is heard in lonely places in the mountains, but it is not safe to follow it, because the little people do not like to be disturbed at home, and they throw a spell over the stranger so that he is bewildered and loses his way. And even if he does at last get back to the settlement he is like one dazed ever after. Sometimes, also, they come near a house at night and the people inside hear them talking, but they must not go out, and in the morning they find the corn gathered or the field cleared as if a whole force of men had been at work. If anyone should go out to watch, he would die. When a hunter finds anything in the woods, such as a knife or a trinket, he must say, little people, I want to take this, because it may belong to them, and if he does not ask their permission they will throw stones at him as he goes home. Once a hunter in winter found tracks in the snow like the tracks of little children. He wondered how they could have come there and followed them until they led him to a cave, which was full of little people, young and old, men, women, and children. They brought him in and were kind to him, and he was with them some time, but when he left they warned him that he must not tell or he would die. He went back to the settlement and his friends were all anxious to know where he had been. For a long time he refused to say, until at last he could not hold out any longer, but told the story, and in a few days he died. Only a few years ago two hunters from Raventown, going behind the high fall near the head of Oconalufti on the East Cherokee Reservation, found there a cave with fresh footprints of the little people all over the floor. During the smallpox among the East Cherokee just after the war one sick man wandered off, and his friends searched, but could not find him. After several weeks he came back and said that the little people had found him and taken him to one of their caves and tended him until he was cured. About twenty-five years ago a man named Tsantawu was lost in the mountains on the head of Okanalufti. It was winter time and very cold and his friends thought he must be dead, but after sixteen days he came back and said that the little people had found him and taken him to their cave, where he had been well treated. And given plenty of everything to eat except bread. This was in large loaves, but when he took them in his hand to eat they seemed to shrink into small cakes so light and crumbly that though he might eat all day he would not be satisfied. After he was well rested they had brought him a part of the way home until they came to a small creek, about knee deep, when they told him to wade across to reach the main trail on the other side. He waded across and turned to look back, but the little people were gone and the creek was a deep river. When he reached home his legs were frozen to the knees and he lived only a few days. Once the Yunwit Sunsti had been very kind to the people of a certain settlement, helping them at night with their work and taking good care of any lost children. Until something happened to offend them and they made up their minds to leave the neighborhood. Those who were watching at the time saw the whole company of little people come down to the ford of the river and cross over and disappear into the mouth of a large cave on the other side. They were never heard of near the settlement again. There are other fairies, the Yunwi Amai Yain Hai, 
or water dwellers, who live in the water, and fishermen pray to them for help. Other friendly spirits live in people's houses, although no one can see them, and so long as they are there to protect the house no witch can come near to do mischief. Sawa Si and Saga Si are the names of two small fairies, who are mischievous enough, but yet often help the hunter who prays to them. Tsawa Si, or Tsawa Si Ustga, little Tsawa Si, is a tiny fellow, very handsome, with long hair falling down to his feet, who lives in grassy patches on the hillsides and has great power over the game. To the deer hunter who prays to him he gives skill to slip up on the deer through the long grass without being seen. Tsaga Si is another of the spirits invoked by the hunter and is very helpful, but when someone trips and falls, we know that it is Tsaga Si who has caused it. There are several other of these fairies with names, all good-natured, but more or less tricky. Then there is Datsada. Datsada was once a boy who ran away to the woods to avoid a scratching and tries to keep himself invisible ever since. He is a handsome little fellow and spends his whole time hunting birds with blowgun and arrow. He has a great many children who are all just like him and have the same name. When a flock of birds flies up suddenly as if frightened it is because Datsada is chasing them. He is mischievous and sometimes hides an arrow from the bird hunter, who may have shot it off into a perfectly clear space, but looks and looks without finding it. Then the hunter says, Datsada, you have my arrow, and if you don't give it up I'll scratch you, and when he looks again he finds it. There is one spirit that goes about at night with a light. The Cherokee call it Atsil, Daihai Gi, the fire carrier, and they are all afraid of it, because they think it dangerous, although they do not know much about it. They do not even know exactly what it looks like, because they are afraid to stop when they see it. It may be a witch instead of a spirit. Wofford's mother saw the fire carrier once when she was a young woman, as she was coming home at night from a trading post in South Carolina. It seemed to be following her from behind, and she was frightened and whipped up her horse until she got away from it and never saw it again. 79. The Removed Townhouses Long ago, long before the Cherokee were driven from their homes in 1838, the people on Valley River and Hiwassee heard voices of invisible spirits in the air calling and warning them of wars and misfortunes which the future held in store, and inviting them to come and live with the nun high, the immortals. In their homes under the mountains and under the waters. For days the voices hung in the air, and the people listened until they heard the spirits say, If you would live with us, gather everyone in your townhouses and fast there for seven days. And no one must raise a shout or a war whoop in all that time. Do this and we shall come and you will see us and we shall take you to live with us. The people were afraid of the evils that were to come, and they knew that the immortals of the mountains and the waters were happy forever, so they counseled in their townhouses and decided to go with them. Those of Anasgaya E. Town came all together into their townhouse and prayed and fasted for six days. On the seventh day there was a sound from the distant mountains, and it came nearer and grew louder until a roar of thunder was all about the townhouse and they felt the ground shake under them. Now they were frightened, and despite the warning some of them screamed out. The nun high, who had already lifted up the townhouse with its mound to carry it away, were startled by the cry and let a part of it fall to the earth, where now we see the mound of say TSI. They steadied themselves again and bore the rest of the townhouse, with all the people in it, to the top of Suda Yel E, Lone Peak, near the head of Chiao, where we can still see it, changed long ago to solid rock. But the people are invisible and immortal. The people of another town, on Hiwasi, at the place which we call now Du Stile, where Shooting Creek comes in, also prayed and fasted, and at the end of seven days the nun high came and took them away down under the water. They are there now, and on a warm summer day, when the wind ripples the surface, those who listen well can hear them talking below. When the Cherokee drag the river for fish the fish drag always stops and catches there, although the water is deep, and the people know it is being held by their lost kinsmen, who do not want to be forgotten. When the Cherokee were forcibly removed to the west one of the greatest regrets of those along Hiwassee and Valley Rivers was that they were compelled to leave behind forever their relatives who had gone to the Nunhai. In Tennessee River, 
near Kingston, 18 miles below Loudoun, Tennessee, is a place which the Cherokee call Gusty, where there once was a settlement long ago. But one night while the people were gathered in the townhouse for a dance the bank caved in and carried them all down into the river. Boatmen passing the spot in their canoes see the round dome of the townhouse, now turned to stone, in the water below them and sometimes hear the sound of the drum and dance coming up. And they never fail to throw food into the water in return for being allowed to cross in safety. 80. The Spirit Defenders of Nkyus Long ago a powerful unknown tribe invaded the country from the southeast, killing people and destroying settlements wherever they went. No leader could stand against them, and in a little while they had wasted all the lower settlements and advanced into the mountains. The warriors of the old town of Nkwasi, on the head of Little Tennessee, gathered their wives and children into the townhouse and kept scouts constantly on the lookout for the presence of danger. One morning just before daybreak the spies saw the enemy approaching and at once gave the alarm. The Nikwasi men seized their arms and rushed out to meet the attack, but after a long, hard fight they found themselves overpowered and began to retreat. When suddenly a stranger stood among them and shouted to the chief to call off his men and he himself would drive back the enemy. From the dress and language of the stranger the Nikwasi people thought him a chief who had come with reinforcements from the Overhill settlements in Tennessee. They fell back along the trail, and as they came near the townhouse they saw a great company of warriors coming out from the side of the mound as through an open doorway. Then they knew that their friends were the Nun Hai, the Immortals, although no one had ever heard before that they lived under Nikwasi Mound. Bureau of American Ethnology 19th Annual Report PL. 16. Nikwasi Mound at Franklin, North Carolina. From photograph of 1890 furnished by Mr. H. G. Trotter, owner of the mound. The nun high poured out by hundreds, armed and painted for the fight, and the most curious thing about it all was that they became invisible as soon as they were fairly outside of the settlement. So that although the enemy saw the glancing arrow or the rushing tomahawk, and felt the stroke, he could not see who sent it. Before such invisible foes the invaders soon had to retreat, going first south along the ridge to where joins the main ridge which separates the French broad from the Tecassegui, and then turning with it to the northeast. As they retreated they tried to shield themselves behind rocks and trees, but the nun high arrows went around the rocks and killed them from the other side, and they could find no hiding place. All along the ridge they fell, until when they reached the head of Tecassegui not more than half a dozen were left alive, and in despair they sat down and cried out for mercy. Ever since then the Cherokee have called the place de Olsani, where they cried. Then the nun high chief told them they had deserved their punishment for attacking a peaceful tribe, and he spared their lives and told them to go home and take the news to their people. This was the Indian custom, always to spare a few to carry back the news of defeat. They went home toward the north and the nun high went back to the mound. And they are still there, because, in the last war, when a strong party of federal troops came to surprise a handful of Confederates posted there they saw so many soldiers guarding the town that they were afraid and went away without making an attack. There is another story, that once while all the warriors of a certain town were off on a hunt, or at a dance in another settlement, one old man was chopping wood on the side of the ridge when suddenly a party of the enemy came upon him, Shawano, Seneca, or some other tribe. Throwing his hatchet at the nearest one, he turned and ran for the house to get his gun and make the best defense that he might. On coming out at once with the gun he was surprised to find a large body of strange warriors driving back the enemy. It was no time for questions, and taking his place with the others, they fought hard until the enemy was pressed back up the creek and finally broke and retreated across the mountain. When it was over and there was time to breathe again, the old man turned to thank his new friends, but found that he was alone, they had disappeared as though the mountain had swallowed them. Then he knew that they were the nun high, who had come to help their friends, the Cherokee. 81. Sulkal, the Slant-Eyed Giant a long time ago a widow lived with her one daughter at the old town of Canuga on Pigeon River. 